This story happened a few years ago. I would often go to Starbucks to get work done on my laptop. It was my favorite place to work because I liked their coffee and I didn't have the distractions I would have at home so I could get a lot more work done. One day in the winter, I was working like I often did. It was nighttime, probably about 7.30 or so. The Starbucks I liked to go to closed at 8.30, so it was pretty calm and not really anybody else was there other than me at the time. I sat in my favorite spot, which was in the back corner of the table with this one soft chair that they had. I had to go to the bathroom, so I got up and walked over to it, which was only about 10 feet away from where I sat. I was in the bathroom for maybe a minute or two and then came back out and returned to my laptop. I went back to work until I realized something. There was a portable USB stick that was in my computer. I knew it wasn't mine and it hadn't been there before. I took it out and looked around the coffee shop. There was nobody else in there besides me. I got up and walked around and then went to the counter and brought the USB with me. I asked someone working there if they had seen anyone go to my computer and handed them the USB drive. I was told they hadn't seen anyone, but they took the USB to hold on to. I looked from the counter and could see that the area I had been sitting in was obscured from the vision of whoever was working it. I went back and got my laptop and then left. I was hoping that whatever that was was a joke and they didn't mess up my computer in any way. When I got home, I looked on my computer again and noticed that there was a new folder on the bottom left side of my screen. It was titled with just a bunch of numbers, and I clicked on it to see a text document. When I opened it up, a message read, Hello, I know everything about you, where you live, who you are, and what you're doing. It really creeped me out, and I closed and deleted the file. Could this be true? Did the USB stick on my computer somehow reveal all of my information? I was terrified. As I was on my computer, suddenly something popped up on my screen. It was a video of myself on my webcam in a window. I tried to close the window, but I couldn't. No matter how many times I clicked or what I did, it just stayed there on my screen. It was the creepiest thing ever, so I slammed my laptop shut. I didn't use it again for a long time after that, and ended up taking it to a professional to have it cleared and reset. Looking back at that experience, I don't know exactly what happened, but I'm afraid whoever did that to me knew where I lived. I used to go to Starbucks all the time. I would say at least two or three times a week I would stop at Starbucks for coffee on my way to work. I would order online every time as I left my house and then pick it up on my way. I got it so often that some of the employees started to recognize me and I would be friendly with a few of them. Sadly though, the lines at the location I usually went to were always super long and one day I realized another Starbucks that was also on my way to work. I made the choice to switch locations to see if it would be faster, and it was in fact quite a bit faster every single day, and it saved me some time. After I would say about a couple of weeks of going to the new location, one day I forgot to place my order online. It wasn't a big deal, but I would just have to order at the drive-thru at the Starbucks. When I got there, the voice on the other end of the speaker of the drive-thru said hi to me and called me by my name. This surprised me because I had only been to that location three or four times at that point and it wasn't a daily basis or anything. I also didn't recognize the voice as it was a man's voice and all the people I knew from the previous location were females. I pulled up to the next window after I ordered and a man with a headset came to the window. I paid and he handed me my coffee and smiled. He once again said my name and told me to have a nice day. Then he winked at me. The man was rather tall and had sort of long dark hair with a slight beard. I have to say I had never seen him before, but beyond that, I really didn't think anything of it. It wasn't until every single time that I would go to Starbucks after that, he would be working and would always be the one to hand me my order. Each time he would wink at me or have an almost creepy grin on his face. None of this really bothered me though, but it did feel a little bit strange. Then I stopped seeing the man. There were different people every time when I got my coffee in the morning, and I didn't really notice the fact that I wasn't seeing this strange guy anymore. One of the times I went inside to pick up my coffee and was walking back to my car when suddenly I saw the man again. He was in the parking lot and he approached me as I was getting into my car. I didn't really recognize him at first. It took me a few seconds. He said hi to me and smiled and asked me how I was doing. 
I said fine in a confused tone and asked what he wanted. He then asked me how the movie I watched last night was. Then he winked at me like the past times and walked away. I stood there next to my car in shock. I had in fact been watching a movie the previous night, but I had no idea how he knew about it. I was really creeped out, and for me, this was the last straw with the man from being slightly weird to completely creepy. I had no idea who this guy was other than the fact that he worked at the Starbucks and was creepy. I decided to go back inside the Starbucks and ask another employee who he was. I first looked around the parking lot, but the man was gone. I then walked inside the Starbucks, which was relatively busy, but nothing too crazy. I went to the counter and asked who the man was with longer brown hair, a slight beard, and pretty tall. I was told in response that it sounded a lot like a guy named Jonathan, who had worked there, but had been fired for inappropriate behavior around the workplace. They said he had worked at another location close by, but had moved to that location shortly before getting fired. I briefly told my story. I was told by several people that they thought he seemed creepy and had apparently followed one of his co-workers home one night. It gave me the chills as I realized this Jonathan guy most likely was outside of my house the previous night and saw me watching a movie. So many thoughts started to race through my head, such as how did he know where I lived and had he followed me home or been to my house before? I had to go to work at that point, so I left, but throughout the day I texted with several of my friends about what had happened. Later that day I got home from work and asked my friend Lisa to come over and keep me company. I got home and shortly after heard the sound of Lisa pulling up. I was so relieved because I really didn't want to be alone in my house that night after what had happened. But then I received a text from Lisa saying that she would be there in about 15 minutes. I went over to look out the window and noticed a different car driving slowly down the street outside my window. I lived in a quiet neighborhood and there wasn't a whole lot of cars that went down the street, so I sort of noticed when they did. It was a black car and the windows were tinted. It parked across the street, but slightly past my house. Of course, I was paranoid and worried that it was the Jonathan guy. I watched the car from my window, hoping to see somebody, anybody get out of the car that wasn't Jonathan from Starbucks, but nobody was getting out. Then my phone started to vibrate and ring in my left hand as I held the living room curtain open with my right. It just about gave me a heart attack and I closed the curtain and looked at who was calling me. It was a number that I didn't recognize. I decided to answer it. The voice on the other end was the familiar voice of Jonathan. I heard him ask me why I was watching him and told me to come outside. I freaked out at this and screamed as loud as I could that I was calling the police. He then hung up on me and I opened the curtain slightly to see his car pulling away. I then called the police and they said they would be on their way. They arrived a short time later along with Lisa. I gave them as much information as I could on Jonathan and I stayed at Lisa's house the next few nights. Finally, I was told that Jonathan had been found and I would no longer have to worry about him anymore. He had worked at the first Starbucks I had been to almost every day and apparently asked to transfer when he realized I had gone to another one. I just wonder how long he knew where I lived or how many times he had been to my house without me noticing. Last year, I went to Starbucks for some coffee. I don't get Starbucks all that often, but I do from time to time. On this particular day, I was pretty sleepy but had to drive about an hour home, so I went for some coffee. It wasn't all that busy there, but there were a few other cars in the drive through ahead of me. I pulled in and waited. Eventually, it was my turn, and I ordered. When I got to the window to pay, I was told that my order had been paid for by the person in front of me. I wasn't asked if I wanted to keep it going and pay for the next person, but was just handed my coffee. I was pretty happy about it until I drove away and noticed that within the little cardboard thing that goes around the cup, there was a piece of paper rolled up into a note. Obviously I was driving, so I didn't bother reading the note, but once I got home almost an hour later, I read it. It was a small piece of paper which gave details about me and my family such as names, addresses, and phone numbers. I was told that I needed to come up with $10,000 or something very bad would happen. I couldn't believe what I was reading or how this happened. I had never been to that Starbucks location before and didn't even remember what car had been in front of me to pay for my drink or anything like that. But I was terrified, so I went straight to the police. When I did, I was told they would investigate 
and they told me a short time later that they didn't believe I had anything to really worry about. Still, I did worry about it, and I never did consider giving whoever it was the money. I didn't even know how to contact them. It's been a while since that happened now, and I guess maybe it was a joke or something, but I still don't know how to explain any of that, like how the person got my information, or why they chose me in the drive through that day. This happened during my freshman year of high school. Winter had just ended, so the air at night felt really cool, but not too cold. My old best friend, who we'll call Veronica, had texted me asking what I was up to, and she said she was hungry, to which I replied, me too. In order to better understand the story, I should explain the layout and distances from each location. I was at my cousin's house, which is about eight blocks away from Veronica's and McDonald's was probably about a half a mile away from both of our homes. Across the street from our McDonald's was a Target and various other fast food chains, and maybe about a mile and a half away was a Burger King. I don't exactly remember whose genius idea it was to sneak out at 11 o'clock at night in order to satisfy our hunger, but nonetheless, we did. Although I had never done it before, sneaking out was relatively easy for me. As for Veronica, well... Let's just say she wasn't new to it. Because it was late, I was in my PJs, which consisted of shorts and an oversized football jersey. In retrospect, probably not the best clothing idea for 11pm while sneaking out in a not so safe city, but I digress. We met up halfway and made our way to McDonald's, catching up about whatever boy problems an idiotic math teacher we had at the time. The streets weren't desolate, but not necessarily busting with cars either. I remember being worried that my mom would see me walking around at 11pm if she drove by. We decided to cut through Target's huge parking lot to save some distance and time. Now, the McDonald's and Target were a bit uphill, but only if you walked from west to east. We came from south to north, so it wasn't really a problem for us. Not that it would have been either way, but it's better to explain. As we were crossing the street from Target to McDonald's, we saw a guy, probably about 5'5", five five, so it was pretty short. He was wearing a blue hoodie and I believe some shorts. Veronica was maybe about 5'2 at the time, where I was about 5'3 to 5'4. Because all this happened years ago, some of the details are a little fuzzy. I didn't really think too much of the guy because Veronica and I were laughing away and talking about anything and everything, but I did take a mental note of him. So, being the geniuses that we were, neither of us actually checked to see if the McDonald's would be open. Well, to be correct, it was open, but just the drive through Yeah, we failed to do one simple yet very important necessity. No problem for us geniuses, though. Why, you may ask? Because Burger King wasn't that far away, and we really needed to satisfy our hunger, so why not? We started making our way west, going downhill. I was ranting away while Veronica kept glancing over her shoulder. She has this habit of doing this every time we walk anywhere, no matter the time of day. She then linked her arm around mine and then softly said to me, That guy is following us. I glanced behind, not making it obvious, but just to see if she was messing with me. Yeah, we kind of had a messed up sense of humor, so it wouldn't have been that much of a stretch. Unfortunately, she was telling the truth. She started to walk faster now, to which I tightened my grip around her arm and told her not to walk so fast or he would know we were on to him. As I mentioned previously, our city wasn't really one of the safest, so I grew up being taught to always be aware of my surroundings. I wasn't as street smart as my siblings, as I was more book smart than anything, but I wasn't a blithering idiot either. I then told Veronica that we should just go across the street and enter Target. As we crossed the street, I glanced behind us and I noticed that he was crossing too. At this point, Veronica was getting extremely worried. And me, you might ask? I was laughing. For some reason, I found this to be funny because what are the odds that the first time I ever sneak out, I'd end up being followed from a McDonald's? Suffice to say though, I ended up sneaking out again after that. What can I say? I wanted to get the whole high school experience. 
as we made our way through the large Target parking lot. I FaceTimed my cousin to share what was currently happening, as she knew I snuck out. While I was laughing and explaining, Veronica was pretty much in full-on panic mode. Eventually, I hung up abruptly as Veronica and I decided to run through the rest of the parking lot and ride into Target's doors. The guy still following us. As we made it inside the Target, we decided to walk around just in case he followed us inside, but luckily he didn't. We made our way back to the glass windows where the entrance was located at, and then we sat down to really grasp the whole situation. Veronica said she saw the guy walk past Target in the same direction we had originally came from. Behind Target is a park, which I always walk past in order to get home. I decided to call my older brother and asked what to do. He told me to call my cousin and then tell her to walk and then meet us at Target. I texted her instead and I told her to bring her giant of a boyfriend who happened to be spending the night. She said that she would meet us by the front. Veronica was really relieved but I still didn't really care about it at all. A few minutes pass and a guy walks in Target and makes his way over to Veronica and me. I don't remember exactly, but I think he was Caucasian and maybe about 5 foot 7. He explained that he was in the McDonald's drive through when he noticed us walk away and the guy following from behind. He said that he saw us cross over into Target as well as the guy and that he wanted to make sure we were safe. We explained our side of the story and then reassured him that we were in fact okay. He told us we shouldn't be out this late and that we should really call our family to pick us up. We said that we had family on the way and then thanked him for looking out for us, to which he told us to stay safe. I think hearing him witness the whole thing really made it feel real to me because that's kind of when reality hit me. My cousin ended up coming with her boyfriend and dad in the car, so yeah, we got busted. But I didn't get in trouble because, well, they were my cousins and that was kind of a goody two-shoes. Not to mention the fact that my mom probably would have been really mad at my cousins for not noticing I snuck out under their supervision. Veronica came to my cousin's house with me, where we just talked about what happened. I even FaceTimed one of our senior friends and told him about it too. Veronica and I no longer talk due to other reasons that didn't happen until years later. But during the rest of our friendship, we'd always recount that story and laugh about it. But it really is scary how easily something bad could have happened if we had only continued our journey to Burger King. And the realization that another person witnessed it made it all too real for me. I've been followed a few more times after this event, and it's really given me some extreme anxiety. I think it's pretty damn safe to say that I won't be walking alone anymore. Hell no. For some background info, I just turned 16 and my two friends Ashley and Sarah, my parents and little brother and I all went to Toronto for my birthday. We rented a hotel for the night, went swimming and went to the mall and it was all really fun. But now, on to the story. The night after we came back from the mall, we went into our hotel room, took showers and we were all just hanging out there. It was around 11pm and we were all really bored. I knocked on the door separating me and my friend's hotel room and my mom, dad, and brother's room to ask if me and my friends can walk around Toronto because we had nothing to do. My mom said yes, so as me and my friends were about to leave, my little brother asked if he could come too because he was also bored. I said sure, so my parents ended up coming as well because they had to watch my brother. So now we're all on the streets of Toronto, my parents and brother a few meters ahead of us while me and my friends were a few meters behind, just laughing and talking. I had started to get hungry, so I had told my parents we wanted to get food. We continue walking until we find some two-story building with a whole bunch of restaurants and fast food places in it. It was pretty big, and in the center there was a big escalator to get to the second floor. There wasn't a lot of people in there, but the few people that were on the first floor looked pretty sketchy. We don't see any fast food places on the first floor, so we go up the escalator to the second floor to see what's up there. My parents go to McDonald's and they sit at a table pretty far away from us. My friend Sarah wasn't really hungry, so she went and picked out a table for us while me and Ashley went to the ice cream place to get something there. As we were waiting, we had seen this group of three guys sitting at a table that was pretty close to the ice cream place. I noticed them looking at us and whispering to each other before two of them came up behind us to wait in line for ice cream as well. 
I thought it was kind of weird, but I didn't really think much of it. That is, until one of them started talking to Ashley. One of the guys randomly tapped her on the shoulder, then said, Hey, I've never been to this place before. What kind of ice cream flavor do you suggest me to get? No, I was a bit weirded out by this because, well, the guy looked creepy as fuck. He was a very tall Jamaican man who looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s, in very bummy clothes, and randomly talking to my friend who was 15 at the time. He was also screwing a lid on to some weird-ass small bottle as my friend was talking to him. My friend Ashley is very friendly, so she didn't really think much of it and she was just being nice to him and talking to him. And then the other guy that was with him came up to me. I had already got really weird vibes from his friend, so I didn't want to talk to him. The guy who came up to me was also a very tall Jamaican man, and he was wearing a white trench coat and a hat. He then says to me, Wow, you look really exotic. What's your ethnicity? I gotta know. I was super weirded out by this, and a bit uncomfortable. But I just laughed and said thanks, and told him my ethnicity. After that, he then says to me, Wow, that's a really beautiful mix. You're a very beautiful girl. Can I please get your number? There was no way in hell I was giving this 30 year old looking man my number. I told him right away no, but he just kept begging for it, saying he just wants to text me and talk. I told him I don't give my number out to strangers, but as I kept saying no to this man, I noticed the third guy that was sitting at their table then get up. He was yet another very tall Jamaican man in a beanie and he had a briefcase with him. I saw him make dead eye contact with me as he got up, walked to the escalator, and then went down to the first floor. I was about to walk away from this man because this whole situation was just really freaking me out, until the other guy who was talking to my friend Ashley then came up to me and then said, So, uh, hey, I got your friend's Snapchat, and I was wondering if I can get yours too. I told him no, that I don't give my Snapchat to strangers. He then kind of laughed at me and just said okay. Then this next question got me really scared. The man that was talking to Ashley then said to me, So are you two here all alone, or are your parents here? I didn't even know what to say at that point. My mind just kind of went blank and I froze. But my friend responded for me, saying that my parents are over by the McDonald's and that our other friend is at the table close by. The two guys looked over at our other friend and then waved at her. Sarah had seen the two guys do that, then looked at me. I think she could tell I was uncomfortable. But right as Sarah was about to come up to us and get us out of this situation, my parents went up to her and they told her they were going back to the hotel room, and that we can just walk back since the hotel was only about a 10 minute walk away from the place we were at, so my mom thought it would be fine. Sarah said okay, and my parents and brother made their way to the escalator. Sarah then came up to us and those two strange men, and then said, Hey, is everything good over here? Yeah, all good. We're just now leaving. I said back. Then the guy in the white trench coat then looks at me and says, Oh, okay. Bye, beautiful. I don't even look at him. Sarah, Ashley, and I just walk back to our table. I didn't feel like staying there anymore and told the girls we should go because I was really uncomfortable. So we start making our way to the escalator, but then we see those same two guys from the ice cream place following us. This is when panic mode then hits me. My parents are gone now and it's just us 16 year old girls in this random building with barely any people in it because it was so late. I tell Ashley right away that those same two guys are following us and she starts to panic too. We go down the escalator and they do the same. There's only two other people on the escalator separating us from those scary men. Then as we get to the bottom, thank God. I see my parents and brother waiting in the Starbucks line right next to the exit. Me and my friends run up to my mom to go and tell her that those strange men were following us. But right as I look over after telling my mom what happened, I guess the men noticed my parents were still here. So as soon as they got off the escalator, they went right back to the other one to go back up the second floor again. My mom told me that they were leaving to go back to the second floor, so we should just go back to the hotel room. My parents and brother left the building first, then me and my friends left after them. When we got out, my parents were about a meter or two ahead of us, and I noticed the same guy with the briefcase that I thought left the building earlier, standing right next to the exit door, just staring at us. This really scared the shit out of me because I thought he left a long time ago. 
He literally just stared at us the entire time as we walked past him. I assumed he didn't do anything because he realized my parents were there. But as we got further away from him, I looked back just to make sure he wasn't following us, and I noticed that he went up to some creepy all black car with really tinted windows, then knocked on the window. Then the guy in the driver's seat rolled down the window, and the man with the briefcase whispered something to him, and then he left the car and went right back to the building that we left from, and the car drove away. This really scared the shit out of me, because if my parents weren't there, I don't even know what could have happened to us, but it for sure wouldn't have been good. I don't know what those men wanted to do with us, or why the men in the briefcase went up to that car, but I don't want to know. We got back to our hotel rooms, and my friend Ashley started crying because it all hit her at once what just happened. Sarah and I tried to calm her down, and then I asked her, Did any of those guys ask for your number or Snapchat? Then she told me, Yeah, I gave him my Snapchat because I was really scared to say no. That's when it then hit her that she has her location on for Snapchat. I told her to go turn it off immediately just in case, but when she went to turn it off, it showed one of the guy's bitmoji was right next to hers, which meant that he was at or near our hotel right now. She turned it off right after that and then blocked him. Nothing else happened that night, thank God. I'm really glad my parents came with us to the food place and thank God they didn't leave the building just yet because who knows what would have happened to us if we were alone. So everyone listening to this, please be safe out there and especially at night. This happened about a month ago. I'm doing much better now, and for my future jobs, I will never take night shifts, as the dark alone gives me the creeps. I've applied for many jobs because I'm the legal age for working, as I'm in high school. I'm in desperate need of money, and I need to help my family out as well, so at this point, I would take any job I can get. Five jobs accepted me, so I decided to do a trial at my first job that was pretty quick enough to accept, which happened to be McDonald's. I need to say that the staff and the manager were all very nice, and my friend also works there, which was a total bonus. The only really downfall working there was probably the customers, which my friend agreed, but anyway. I didn't really know what to pick for the shifts, or even if I wanted the job, so I asked for a practice shift. My manager happily agreed and let me choose my times. Instead of daytime shift, I chose the night, which was a very bad decision. But hey, I needed to see what it was like working there anyway, so this will be easy since it's night, right? Well, I was terribly wrong. I got ready in my friend's uniform that she let me borrow, and she even drove me there. I'll be honest, the McDonald's was rather sketchy. When I say sketchy, I mean there's so many alcoholics and druggies around, and upon arrival it just didn't feel right. During the car ride, I had a gut feeling that it wasn't going to be a good shift, but my friend kept reassuring me that all will be fine. She dropped me off at the bus stop which was 5 minutes from my workplace and said that she would pick me up at 12am. It was around 10pm, so my practice shift lasts for about 2 hours. I agreed and said for her to pick me up at the same spot that she dropped me off at. As she sped off, I merely watched as her car shrunk into the distance. After I saw it was gone, I started walking towards McDonald's, but while walking, I began to hear footsteps behind me. I didn't really think much of it because it was a normal thing. The person was probably just walking to their car or McDonald's or even the shops, but I had a really bad feeling. I felt like I was almost being watched, and I stopped for a second. The footsteps stopped with mine, and I looked behind to see a guy around his mid-forties just eyeing me off. I got really weirded out as he just smiled at me, and then breathed very heavily. He was taller than me, and he looked rather stronger and bigger than me as well. He was around what looked to be a few meters away. I quickly looked away and ran off to my workplace. There was only about three people working, my manager and my male friend. It was about 10.30pm and I had already had a share of drunken rude people filling the orders up or even tried hitting on me, 
but he quickly left and shortly afterwards, my friend showed up and helped me. He helped me out with most things and I felt rather safe with him. He was actually an acquaintance of mine, but we soon grew to be best friends. After I was done taking some drunk guy's order, my friend pulled me aside and asked if I knew the guy outside. I was kind of confused at what he meant, and at first I thought he was just joking around. That is, until he pointed at the right window. My mouth went dry, and my face completely dropped. It was the same creepy guy that was following me before work. But I didn't tell him that. Instead, because I was an idiot, I kind of just laughed a bit and said that it was no big deal. He shrugged it off and we went back into the kitchen. It hit 11 p.m. No more customers were present and the same guy would not stop staring at me. At that point, I kind of just held my head down and just begged, hoping that he wouldn't come in. I could just feel his beady eyes run up and down my body. It was gross. It made me feel dirty. He's been there ever since the start of my shift and has been there for about 30 minutes, making it 10.30 now. I started to panic a bit as I was absolutely begging for him to not come in. In the middle of my thoughts, I heard something. My heart absolutely stopped as I then heard the sound of the door being opened. The creepy guy slowly walked towards my counter, eyeing my whole body until he was right in front of me, heavily breathing in, almost drooling. His breath reeked like alcohol and cigarettes. He had a musky scent that, to be honest, nearly made me vomit. Red flags were totally going off, but I just tried to continue with my nice act. He wouldn't stop staring at me. I glanced at my friend who was in the kitchen. He was pretty busy, basically making sure nothing was getting burned. I turned my attention back to the guy and, no matter what I asked him, he was silent. It probably went on like that for about five minutes straight. That is, until he finally said something. Such beautiful skin. So young. Short black hair. Such a nice complexion you have. Before I could even speak or try and call someone over, something I wasn't prepared for then happened. The old guy launched towards me and tried entering the counterpart, which happened to be the same part I was working at. He then looked at me like I was a piece of meat. Trying to climb over the counter wasn't easy for him though, eventually trying to grab me and getting stuck midway as I tried backing up. To my luck, I then slipped and totally landed on my butt. I tried my best crawling away, hoping that he wouldn't pass through. I was of course rather startled and afraid to the point that I couldn't even utter a single word. My friend dropped what he was doing as he screamed for my manager to then come over. My manager quickly showed up, which then made the old guy get back up and then flee. My friend quickly ran to my aid and he took me to the back room, which is what my manager told him to do in order to calm me down. Shortly after, we called the cops. I glanced at my friend as he looked pretty pale and rather puzzled, like he saw a ghost. My manager waited at the counter for the cops. That's when my friend quickly explained who the guy was. As it turns out, the guy was known for creeping on the female staff members while they worked. He would take pictures, ask for their number, offer alcohol, and even documented what they looked like. He was actually already banned from even entering the place or even being near it. The cops were already very aware of who he was due to his creepy behavior in the past. After the whole investigation and getting questioned, it was about 1am and I was let go. My friend was with my other friend while I got questioned, and on my way home, my friend held my hand and kept reassuring me that everything will be fine. Safe to say, I don't think I'll ever go back there again, and after this, I don't think I trust any night shifts. I think I'm going to work at a different fast food place as well. So to that creepy old guy who's hopefully in jail, please stay away from me. I used to work at a Starbucks here in Cardiff, and I've got to be honest, it's one of the better jobs I've ever had. The manager was brilliant, the other staff were nice and looked out for each other, so for a minimum-ish wage job, it was about as good as it gets. The only bad shifts to work were the first halves of Monday and Tuesday mornings, 
as the pre-work rush meant people were often at their absolute worst. I mean, don't get me wrong, people could be complete jerks at other times of the day or week, but the highest concentration of them was Monday and Tuesday mornings, without a shadow of a doubt. But rude customers aren't scary. Annoying and frustrating, yes. Chillingly cruel and calculating, not as much. Which is why this particular incident has stayed with me for so long and I always seem to use it as my personal point of reference for how terrible human beings can be to each other. So, it's a Monday morning and we're just coming to the end of the rush at around 9am. 30 minutes more and the caffeine fiends will start to thin out and we can get some coffee and make a smoke break of our own. I heard her before I saw her. Like... She was only just trying to get a handle on what had been pure harpy screeches just moments before. Some woman was on her phone, ranting away and not looking where she was going as she tries to find the back of the queue. In doing so, she cuts off this other bloke who politely informs her that she's queue jumping. I don't know if she actually didn't hear him or was just tactically ignoring him, but either way, this bloke has to tap her on the shoulder before saying, Excuse me believe I was ahead of you. The woman just shrugs this off at first, giving the guy a gesture like, I'm too busy to listen to you. I remember the look of anger on the guy's face as she gently but firmly grabs the strap of her handbag and tugs her out of the queue before taking her place. I'm a bit torn about the whole thing. Like, yeah, it was righteous, but laying hands on someone, I feel like there could have been a better way to resolve the issue. But it wasn't like the guy had picked her up and thrown her and due to the size difference, that was definitely a possibility. Anyway, she reacts like this had been the case, like him actually standing up to her with some horrific incident of assault and starts demanding someone call the police, even though she herself was on the phone and simply refused to hang up. A couple of staff members and customers manage to calm the situation down, and we get the guy's coffee before one of my colleagues serves the angry woman. I didn't serve her, but when she got her order... She turns to be like, Um, excuse me, this coffee isn't as hot as I asked for. No, I know better than to just argue with customers and especially absolute whoppers like her. So I do as I'm asked and heat the coffee up a little bit more for her. I hand it back. She dips a finger in it and once again tells me, This coffee isn't hot enough. Now bearing in mind, she just watched me run some steam through it, but again, I do as I'm asked and give her back some literally steaming hot coffee that she proceeds to absolutely overload with sugar. No wonder she was in such a stinking mood. Her entire life was probably one big sugar crash, hence why she was such an unbearable person to be around. But little did I realize, that coffee wasn't for her. And on her way out of the store, she took the lid off of her scalding hot syrupy coffee and threw it in the guy's face as he sat reading his newspaper. God the sound of that guy screaming was absolutely horrific. Like I didn't actually see the woman throw her coffee in the guy's face, so I thought someone had broken a leg or something. That's the only time I've heard someone scream in pain like that. When my old skating buddy absolutely shattered his leg on this visit to a Bristol skate park one year. But what followed in the coffee shop was pure chaos. People were pouring bottles of water onto this guy's face, ambulance staff and police turning up. I think the woman legged it as soon as she threw the coffee because, to my knowledge, no one was arrested, but the guy who had the coffee thrown on him suffered life-changing injuries. From what another colleague told me, the gross amount of sugar in the coffee meant that some of it actually stuck to his face like a kind of molten hot glue. He'd been left with terrible scarring for the rest of his life, and all because he stood up to some absolute monster in the queue that morning. That's what I find really scary, that some people out there are so unhinged that a seemingly normal interaction with them could end up with you suffering injuries you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. Just one moment of misjudgment, one little enough is enough moment, and boom, you're going to look at a very different version of yourself in the mirror for the rest of your natural life. This was a while back. 
My husband decided to surprise me with a Valentine's Day suite to a secluded treehouse resort in the upper Ozark Mountains. On paper, it sounded extremely romantic, a getaway for just the two of us with no distractions. I knew he was probably going to try to get frisky as well because, hey, it's Valentine's, so I wore something revealing and teased the whole drive up there. Unfortunately for us, you could say that the brochure lied. The treehouse looked nothing the way it was shown online. Instead of the sprawling, multi-tiered bungalow that spanned the tops of cedars, we basically got a rickety house on stilts. James was furious, and I was upset too, but we had already paid the deposit, and it's not like we could just cancel and go. This is a lot of money down the drain, needless to say, and made the start of our getaway a bit of a downer. Then as we got into the small room, I noticed that it was beginning to storm. Should we worry about this place falling down or something? I asked. I didn't want to be pessimistic, but it was easy to imagine this entire building collapsing because of a gentle breeze. Every time we walked, the whole thing kind of shook. We should probably stay close to the door just in case, he suggested. Even though things were pretty bad, I still wanted to try and get the best of our time together. After all, it wasn't just about the place. I wanted to really be with him, too. Let's get into the hot tub, I suggested. James didn't object and got the water running, but it seemed like it took forever for it to get hot, and then it only stayed hot for a few minutes. It was very disappointing to say the least. Well, let's just go get a bottle of wine, he suggested instead. I didn't feel like arguing, a bit more frustrated now that everything was turning into a disaster, so he ran out to the car in the pouring rain and brought back a bottle of Chardonnay and a corkscrew bottle opener. You look sexy drenched, I teased him. He went to the kitchen cabinet and got out two wine glasses, pouring us some before offering a toast to making better memories. As we started to drink it, I had this weird vibe, or I guess a premonition, so to speak. I was thinking it would be crazy if James somehow had bit the glass and the wine shards would disperse into his mouth and cut him. A few seconds later, that was exactly what happened. He was taking another sip from his glass when this thing abruptly shattered in his mouth and he started to choke. I felt the whole room was moving in slow motion. I panicked and moved to hit his back, hoping he would choke it up. Then I asked if he wanted me to call 911. He shook at his head negatively and kept struggling to vomit up the blood. Silently, he gestured to help him into the bathroom where he used his toothbrush to cause himself to gag. I stood there, holding up as shards of glass fell into the toilet. After that little ordeal, we cuddled up in bed and really didn't say much to each other. Honestly, I was starting to think this treehouse was haunted or something. And finally, James made the suggestion that we should go get some food and called around local places to see who would deliver. By this point... The storm had gotten so bad every time the wind shifted our whole cliff house and it felt like it was actually shaking. It was frightening, but I was trying to find the positive in this insane situation. It truly wasn't easy, especially after that choking incident. Looks like we'll have to do pizza, James announced after calling 15 places, and you could tell his voice was really hoarse from that experience. It certainly wasn't as bad as it could be, I suppose. I didn't really care because by that point I was just starving and could probably eat anything. It sounds great, I lied. And the driver claimed it would be there in 40 minutes so we grabbed a shower while we waited. For a moment it was nice to just forget about all the bad stuff that we had gone through. When the driver arrived to drop off our food, I was the one that answered the door. Not sure why I didn't bother to get dressed. I didn't see it as important I guess. He was a younger guy, probably in his mid-twenties and likely hadn't really been around women the way he was ogling me, and I wasn't even really wearing anything that revealing to be honest. Uh, how much? I said when he seemed to forget why I had even come there. He stammered off the total price and gave us the pizza. Uh, my wallet's in the car, one second, James said running toward our vehicle. The pizza guy followed. I was standing there holding the pizza box, watching them both out of the corner of my eye when I saw something strange happen. It looked like the driver had possibly hit James on the back of the head with something. 
and I later found out it was a tire iron because it had caused my husband to fall unconscious in less than a few seconds. It's hard for me to really properly describe that moment of terror. I knew what was happening, but I still couldn't believe it. This young kid marched back up to me as I stood there, transfixed and paralyzed, holding the pizza box. He had a knife in his hand that looked like it could easily slip my throat, and he demanded that I get on the bed and tie myself up. I climbed on the mattress as he instructed and did my best not to cry. I was sure this kid was about to have his way with me. He demanded that I use the bed sheets to tie up my hands and legs, and I was blubbering like a baby, telling him where my wallet was. J just take it and go. We won't call the cops, I swear. I told him. I didn't want him to hurt me and it honestly felt like if I had said one wrong thing, this kid was going to snap. This definitely felt like a crime of opportunity. He was nervous and skittish and was constantly waving the knife around as a threat as I finished up the bonds in my hands. I made sure that my feet were loose enough that I could still fight in case he had any other ideas. Then he took my wallet back to his car and returned with his smartphone. He started to video me. I don't know if it was for his own sick pleasure or what, but I was just too terrified to really say anything unless prompted. A few times he spit on me. Finally he decided that he'd had his fun and left before my husband finally came to. I sat there tied up on the bed for a good 30 minutes before James came stumbling into the room looking frantic and confused by what had just happened. We called the cops immediately, but would you believe they didn't even bother to send anyone that night? Instead, we basically got no sleep because I was sure that Psycho would come back. I attended to James's wounds and did my best not to think about the fact that we were basically stranded up here in the mountains with no money. James insisted that it was going to be alright, but I was having a really hard time seeing the positive to any of this. In the a.m., the cops finally came by the resort and wrote down everything we had told them, and we both did our best to provide a description of the driver and of his car. It really helped me to realize that I have a terrible memory because, for the life of me, I could only remember two or three things about this kid. He was white, he wore a baseball cap, and he had a southern accent, not exactly helpful. But the officers promised that they would keep us informed on any developments and we were supposed to stay there another day and night without any protection. I know it's crazy to think that this psychopath might come back, but I told James that I didn't want to risk it. I don't care about the deposit. I just want to go home. And he agreed. He had already told his mother about what had happened over the Valentines, and she wired some money to his PayPal so we could afford some gas. On the way back home, I was busy calling and canceling credit cards and trying my best to forget about the whole thing. James instead insisted that we both go take self-defense courses, which I was not totally against. It just made me realize that he had been just as scared as me that day. A few months later, after a lot of back-and-forth hassle with the company, we did actually get most of our money back. They admitted in their email that it wasn't the first time their customers had reported suspicious activity on the property. Next time we plan a vacation, I'm picking, I teased James. It's crazy how we kind of laugh about it now all these years later, but dear God, if things had gone differently, I'm honestly not even sure I'd be here today. My 2020 Valentine's was a little different because my family had to move in early February, so we postponed actual Valentine's until close to March. Then the pandemic hit and I was one of the first in our family to be exposed. My boyfriend said that we could still do our valentines over Zoom so we agreed to the next weekend. Honestly, I felt like one of those kids stuck in a bubble constantly. It was mind numbing to see others going outside and I couldn't. I didn't have any symptoms, I didn't understand why I was being locked away like some kind of criminal. Still. My boyfriend, Robbie, told me that he was going to make Valentine's special and insisted that we couldn't miss it, no matter the circumstances. Saturday rolled around and, as planned, I logged into Zoom, eager for the romantic surprise that he was going to pull off. Honestly, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I doubt it was like anything he originally intended. He had his camera set up right at an angle where I could see him in his entire room, two windows that were partially open to let in a breeze as he wore a silly blue suede shirt and matching tie. 
id candles going and soft, jazzy music playing. It was cheesy, so I couldn't help but laugh and giggle. Just trying to set the mood, he teased. Oh, so sexy, I told him, trying not to roll my eyes. Next, he waved a bouquet of flowers in front of the camera and said, Roses, your favorite. Don't they smell good? And that joke was actually in poor taste because thanks to COVID, my sense of smell was completely gone for a little while. Chocolates for you, he said next, waving a box of filled creamy chocolates near the screen. Then there was a strange noise right outside his window, like a scream, and he told me to hold on. I stopped and waited as he got up and looked out the window, and immediately noticed that panic was gripping his body. He ran past the camera and I heard him go down a flight of stairs. Next thing I knew, I heard more shouting from his open window. He sounded like he was having an argument with someone. Admittedly, my mind was frantically trying to figure out what was going on and I kept shouting his name, hoping he would get back inside. It actually took him almost half an hour to do so and I nearly called the cops myself. When he got back on camera, I wished that I had. Robbie had a bloody nose and a black eye and I immediately asked what happened. Someone just stole my car, he told me. I I'm really sorry, I gotta go, he said. I didn't hear from him until the next day, and the cops found his car parked not far from where I live. According to them, the thief had activated the GPS and gone to the last location Robbie had put it. I suspected that maybe they intended to rob me next. The cops said they found traces of gunpowder residue in the car as though they had been carrying a recently discharged weapon. Robbie confirmed that they had shot at him when he tried to stop them, and that just made my heart sink even more. I didn't even hear the pop go off. I'm not sure why at the last second they decided to just abandon the car, but Robbie admitted to me a month later that he thinks he knew why they stole it in the first place. I got you a promise ring, and it was pretty expensive. I don't know why I didn't think to bring it inside, but I left it in the passenger side seat. I think that must have been what they were after, he admitted. It truly was the most and least romantic valentines I'd ever had. It was a week before Valentine's Day, and junior high school was running along slowly as usual. We were beginning to prep for our cheesy little Valentine's Day thing. Our school's locker had those little vent slits in the door, and every year in between second and third period, the school would give everyone an extra half hour to slide those lame Valentine's cards into people's lockers. I never actually participated in handing out cards, but I still decorated my locker with my name, like most everyone else. That's because people often gave candy bars. I'm talking full-size candy bars, and I didn't want to miss out on that aspect of it. So, before the big day, I sat quietly at my first period desk and I created the most half-assed name card to tape to my locker. And when the big day did come, I waited to see which fish I would catch. And by fish, I meant secret crushes who had some chocolate to give. On Valentine's Day, after fourth period when the lunch bell rang, I decided to stop by my locker to take a look at the diabetic bounty. But there was only one thing in there and it wasn't sugar. Inside, there was a folded up piece of notebook paper. It looked like it had been torn from a journal and there was red lipstick on the upward facing flap. I was immediately disappointed, but my curiosity had me opening up the sliver of paper before I even knew what I was doing. As I held it, a girl walking by stopped and gasped and then she just kept walking. This was awkward and weird, but I thought nothing more of it at the moment. I looked down at the simple message scrawled on the note. It said, Low Water Bridge, 10 p.m. It's been a while. That was it. No name or signature. No X's or O's. If whoever this was really thought I'd go alone to that old bridge at night, they were crazy. I mean, for all I knew, the janitor threw this in my locker and he was planning to do something very illegal to me. I almost threw it away but not before showing it to my friend, Ethan. Ethan took one look at it 
and he made the same face that that girl had made when she walked by my locker. What, do you know something about this? I asked. I was confused. Maybe, he smiled. He looked conniving. Ethan was the kind of person who was never not joking. I'll let you in on it if you take me with you. Screw that mess, man, that's how people get killed. I couldn't believe he wanted me to go out there. Trust me, you're not gonna get hurt or anything he said, seemingly worried that I might refuse still. I'll even bring my dad's gun. Dude, we have to go. And when I get shoved into a pedophile's van, I remained adamant. He thought it over for a moment, and finally he rolled his eyes and replied, I'll pay you a hundred bucks. I'll protect you and pay you. I'm that sure about this. I just, I gotta see something. By now my curiosity was overflowing, so I gave in. Fine, I looked straight at him, but I swear to God, if this is a prank or something, I'm going to throw you over that bridge. After school at about 9 p.m. that night, I told my parents I was tired and that I was heading to bed early. I walked to my room, locked the door, and climbed out of my window. I made my way over to Ethan's house. His place was only a few blocks from mine. Then we headed together to Low Water Bridge. Now, Lowwater Bridge was a local old bridge that didn't serve much of a purpose anymore. Back in the day, it carried people over a deep creek, but now there was literally no water under it. It had dried up. Even when it rained, all that would flow below it was a two inch deep stream, hence the name Lowwater Bridge. Besides, no one ever even drove over the thing. Everyone was so afraid that the bridge would collapse even if they walked on it. It took us 45 minutes to walk there. The hardest part was hiding in the bushes whenever we saw a car coming. It was so close to curfew, someone would definitely suspect something, or knowing my luck, it would be a cop and we'd be totally screwed. Luckily though, no one saw us. We made it to Lowwater Bridge without too much of a hassle. Once there, we waited in some nearby brush. The wooden bridge looked so dilapidated. I was surprised that it could even support itself, let alone the air above it. As we waited for 10 p.m. to come, Ethan seemed to be acting strange. He was quickly looking over his shoulders and his eyes were so wide. At one point, he jumped when some small animal moved about in the woods next to us. What's up with you? I whispered. It's, it's nothing, man. Just keep your eyes on the bridge. He sounded so anxious. Soon enough, it was 10. I stood up, stretching my tired legs after squatting for 10 minutes straight. Before I walked over to the bridge, I turned back to Ethan and I asked, you will be watching me the whole time, right? Yes, dude, I promise. He was so serious now, not like he was at school. I actually believed him. Now I was beginning to get nervous. I started walking, trying to tread softly so that I could hear any and all noises around me in case there was any funny business. But it was quiet, unnaturally quiet. In between the slight crunches of gravel underfoot, all I could hear was my own breathing. Eventually, I came to the edge of the bridge. I didn't step onto it yet. I didn't really feel like dying today. I turned to where Ethan was, and he raised himself over the brush. He was making hand gestures toward me. He wanted me to step onto the bridge. I swallowed hard and continued. The first step made the wood underneath me creak and it echoed throughout the woods around us. It was terrifying. It felt like it took ages to reach the middle, but the moment I did, I stopped and I listened. It was no longer silent. There was a very faint sound in the air. It was rhythmic and high-pitched. It got louder by the second, until soon I could make a guess at the noise. It sounded like a young girl humming a tune I had no idea what tune it was, and that didn't really matter at the time. It sounded like someone was coming, but the humming itself seemed to be coming from every direction at once. I was beginning to panic. I turned to Ethan, silently asking him permission to get off the bridge, but when I saw his face from the bushes, my heart sank. His eyes were wide, and his mouth was open, and then I felt a cold breath on the back of my neck. I was done. I ran from that spot, not even stopping to grab Ethan, but thankfully he ran as soon as I did. 
We did not stop until we got to my house, where we literally collapsed from exhaustion. We were on my front lawn on our backs, trying to catch our breaths for the next 10 minutes. When we could finally speak, I asked him, what the heck was that? Who was behind me? Did I almost get kidnapped? He stared back at me with the widest eyes. No, 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 no. It was nothing like that, man. So it's all true, he said to himself. What? What's true? You said you'd tell me if I went with you. What's this all about? I was desperate for an answer. Then he explained it to me. Apparently, it was a local urban legend. Every year, someone would get a note in their locker on Valentine's Day. On it, there would be red lipstick and a message to go to the low water bridge later that night. No one ever did it though, so a lot of people believed it was just a prank and they would throw the note away. The story goes, it all started in the 1980s when a certain girl attended our school. Nobody knows her name, so we all call her Lisa Black. She was a troubled girl who was bullied by her peers. On a cold February 14th, she jumped over Lowwater Bridge, which at that time had deep flowing waters beneath it, and she drowned. Ever since then, every Valentine's Day, someone would receive that note in their locker that note with a request and a red lipstick stain. Personally, I'm not sure if I even believe that story. I don't know how I didn't hear it the other two years I'd been there. I mean, it could have all been a prank that was never revealed to me. But what I can't explain though was the sound of the humming that came from every direction and the look on Ethan's face of sheer terror. After all, I had never seen Ethan so serious before in my life. This started when I was in middle school. I was 12 at the time, so having a Valentine was everything to me. I was a social kid and I liked this boy. We'll call him Kenneth. And honestly, I thought he liked me back. Every day of that February after lunch, there were little notes that someone put in my locker. I thought it was weird because his locker was far from mine, but I was a daydreamer. I just thought that he liked me back, that he liked me enough that he would leave notes for me. The day before Valentine's, a kid that was very skinny and was wearing a black hood with a Lions logo stood in front of my locker, blocking me from it. Hi, he said, shivering. Would you like to go on a date? I had never seen this guy before. I was trying to see how awkward it would be if we were on a date and we didn't know what to talk about. Sorry, I have plans, I said, and I walked away. It was really weird. Later, I was walking home and I stopped to get something from Target. I was looking at some candy bars when I noticed someone that was as tall as me. He had this hood with a lion's logo on it. I left with the candy bar and I started to make my way home. I called my mom to tell her that I was going to be late. There was a shortcut that was an abandoned train station. I would only take it when I was going to be late. As I was walking, a bush next to me started to move. And I don't know why, but after what I saw at the store, I freaked out and I ran the rest of the way home. When I finally got home, I got out my phone and I saw a text. It was from an unknown number. There were pictures of me running and me walking around the store. I immediately showed them to my mom and she simply said it was probably friends. Friends or not, that's simply creepy. The next day I showed my friends the number. They looked at the number and said, that's, that's the weird kid's number. I know because he gave it to me and I never texted him. This really freaked me out. I still see him around the school, but when I do, I'll glare at him and I try to keep my distance. And number six, the break-in, submitted by Ralph. For this story, I will need to tell you a bit of background information. I am six feet tall, 16 years old, and I live in a very small country named Latvia. Probably some of you know it. I have shared this story only with close friends, other family members, and my parents. We live in a two-story house, and my room is on the second floor. My parents often leave me home alone because they travel a lot for work things. This happened on Valentine's Day, 2015. It was a cold winter night and I had just broken up with my girlfriend, so I was completely alone to watch the house. It was around eight that night. I was downstairs watching TV shows on Netflix when I heard a light knocking on my living room door. I got up to look outside and there was no one there. 
After an hour or so, I heard the tapping again. I peeked outside, only to see someone running by the bush where the road leads to another street. I thought someone was pranking me, so I didn't really care too much. After a half hour of watching TV shows, I got bored, so I asked my friend to come over. He lived about five minutes away from where I live. For safety purposes, I'll call him Jake. Jake was shorter than me and a year younger. He came over and we played some video games. After a while, I needed to go pee, so I went upstairs to use the bathroom. When I got back to the living room, Jake told me he heard tapping on the window. I wasn't surprised, and I told him before he got here, I heard the tapping too. One hour passed, and then we heard the tapping coming again, and we ignored it. After about three minutes, we heard footsteps upstairs, and that's when things got serious. We muted the game. The footsteps stopped. We thought the footsteps were in the game, so we continued to play, trying to listen at the same time. Then we heard something heavy fall upstairs in my parents' bedroom. I paused the game and me and Jake went upstairs. We checked every room. We checked my parents last. I peeked inside the room and saw nothing. It was pitch black and I turned on the light and went into the room with Jake behind me. Jake checked the closet and I checked everywhere else. As we were leaving the room, I forgot that we did not check under the bed. So I hesitantly asked Jake if he could just quickly look. He walked over slowly, obviously a bit anxious. He looked under the bed and he jumped up faster than I've ever seen him get up. He bolted out of the room without saying a word and I quickly turned off the light and slammed the door shut. Jake was already downstairs. I rushed down there to him and he was pale as snow. I asked him what was wrong and his answer made my heart sink. He said there was someone under the bed, smiling with eyes wide open. We rushed outside and called the police. We hid behind a bush that was in front of my home. As I was on the line with the police officer, Jake and I saw my parents' bedroom light come on. I asked them to come over as fast as they possibly could. We watched the house for about 10 minutes, but we saw no movement inside. When police finally arrived, two officers went to search the house and the third officer asked a couple of questions. After a moment, the two police officers came out of the house with a middle-aged man. He had a long beard with wide bloodshot eyes. His face was full of scars and bruises. Now I get why Jake looked so pale. One of the police officers told us that the man had a knife hidden in one of his pockets. He had broken in by an unlocked bedroom window but how on earth did he get up to the second floor? I have no idea. The police called my family, who said they'd be back in town as soon as they possibly could. Nothing like that has happened since that day, but I still get goosebumps thinking about and writing this, because it sounds like, even if I didn't invite Jake over, I still wouldn't have spent Valentine's Day alone. So this happened about a year ago. I know it because it was around Valentine's Day and I'd spend the week leading up to it just dreading it, stalking my ex on Instagram and generally just felt pretty terrible about myself. We'd split up a few months earlier and she kept the flat we'd lived in, seeing as she did most of the work finding it. Her friend moved in and I moved out. It was a simple but painful arrangement. I ended up finding a flat for myself way out, on pretty much the outskirts of the city, I don't know if you've ever been to London, but flat prices are stupidly high, and if you want anywhere that's more than just a bed and a toilet, you have to abandon any hope of living remotely central. So the Valentine's Day season came around, and one weekend I was feeling fairly sorry for myself, working my way through a bottle of Prosecco, I should have really been sharing when I made the decision. I changed the radius on all my dating apps to be as small as possible, and tried to see if I could get a Valentine's date lined up. Half the time you matched with someone and they'd reveal that they were on the other side of London to you and your attempt to organize a drink would fall through. It's too far or I don't have time tonight, maybe next week were phrases you'd hear all the time. So I'm not the most attractive guy. I think I'm honest enough with myself to say that and I have a pretty good gauge of when someone I've matched with seems too hot to be real. Usually my hunches confirm when they send me a message advertising some Russian dating site in the first minute. Anyway, I meet Becca, who seems lovely, and very much in my league, and who lives actually not too far from me. 
We agree to go for a drink at the Crown the day before Valentine's Day, so as not to have the awkward expectation of anything extra romantic, which is pretty much the local for anyone who lives near my overground stop, and I'm pretty excited to be honest. She seems pretty funny. Maybe not wife material, but we get along and for a while the thought of my ex off on her own Valentine's Day seems a lot less unpleasant. So, date night comes and I have my usual beer or two before for a bit of Dutch courage and head off to the crown. I send her a message to let her know that I'm on the way and she says cool, she's almost there. It's a little dark out and there's a thin mist of rain but I shrug it off. It is London after all. The walk to the pub doesn't usually take too long. You have to navigate loads of little back streets that ends up slowing you down a whole bunch and I spend a little extra time to avoid some alleyways just because I've heard stories about people getting mugged around here. But I arrive to the crown only a bit late and send her a message apologizing as I get in. She replies pretty quickly, instantly almost. Shoot, she says, didn't get a chance to message you. There's a bunch of guys in there for someone's birthday and they're being really rowdy, making me a little uncomfortable. I've nipped over to a restaurant down the road to see if they might have space for us. I mean, she's not wrong. There are a bunch of guys in here being loud and obnoxious and I guess if you were a small woman, it would make you pretty uncomfortable. Not only that, but a group are smoking outside and jeering and I could see how you wouldn't want to hang around outside for long. She sends me the restaurant's name and tells me to hurry. They'll save a table for us if I'm quick. This is where I get a little concerned. We never agreed to dinner. Not only that, but when I put in Google Maps, the location gives me two routes. One is pretty quick, and the other adds an extra 10 minutes onto your walk time. Easy. The only issue is the shorter route goes right through this old estate that's semi-abandoned. I say semi because although I'm sure people live there, I'm not sure who, and half the buildings are boarded up. I take one look at it and decide that there's no way I'm going through there. There are barely any street lights, if any, and I can barely make out much more than a few dark shapes. I decide to take the longer way around and apologize to her but let her know that I'll be a little later. She replies instantly again and tells me that I need to come now and that I should just be as quick as possible. I don't like her tone and tell her there's no way I'm walking through the old estate at night. Now I'm beginning to feel really uncomfortable and am aware of how alone I am on this route. Whilst it passes by several houses and shops, there's no one actually on the street itself. There aren't many people out on the night before Valentine's Day and, come to think of it, I've got no idea why the restaurant would be so full in the first place. I get that funny feeling in my stomach where you know something's wrong but can't quite put your finger on it. And for some reason, I walk in the middle of the road for the last stretch. I think maybe I felt a little safer there, or at least in my head I think I'd be able to see anyone who came towards me. Thankfully, no one did. I did manage to freak myself out a little, catching my reflection in shop fronts and car windows, and have to make a conscious effort to not look at them because I know I'll only freak myself out more. I'd have turned right around, but I realized that I was actually closer to the restaurant than the original pub and at this point I just wanted to see another friendly human face. I sped up my walking slightly, made sure to text a couple of friends just to be safe. All this time I'm walking, she's messaging me telling me just to hurry up and that the shortcut's fine, she literally just took it. But as soon as I mention I'm almost at the restaurant, she stops replying, just like that. One moment she's telling me to hurry and the next, as soon as it's clear I'm not going to use the shortcut at all. She's gone. Well, they're gone, I suppose. No way of knowing who it was. I get inside and like I suspected, the place is fairly empty. It's definitely not booked out. And when I ask if the waiter's seen any woman like Becca asking about a table, he shakes his head. Not tonight, he tells me. Only a couple of families and an older couple. I think about texting whoever was claiming to be Becca, but... Even opening the conversation gives me the creeps. The idea that there's a couple of days worth of chatting there, of whomever was on the other end pretending for whatever reason to be a normal person, 
gives me the chills. It's strangely weirder to think of someone that creepy pretending to be normal in a weird way. I think about walking back using the road, but I realize, looking out the window of the restaurant, that whoever was pretending to be Becca knows my exact location. They'll know I arrived and found out they were lying. I think about the fact that they might be watching me from somewhere, my silhouette in the window, and I ask if I can have a table whilst I order an Uber home. Even during the ride home, I hate the idea of my face near the window, and I try to lean into the middle seat. I get the driver to drop me as close as possible to my house, and my heart races the whole walk home. I never told them my address exactly, but the idea that they know the area I live in is enough to make me start looking at flats on the other side of the city. I think, as soon as I can, I'm going to move. Six years ago, I worked as a delivery driver for Domino's. For me, it was a pretty easy job to just drive around town delivering pizzas, plus I made some pretty good tips. I lived in the city, so I would never have to drive all that far. This was also my main way of earning extra money during my summers home from college, and I would generally work some pretty late nights. One night, I remember that it was a Friday, which are always really busy. I was driving all over the place around town for hours, until finally it started to quiet down after midnight. At about one o'clock in the morning, we got another order for a delivery that I took. It was one cheese pizza and an order of cheesy bread, and I put it in my car and started driving. Once I got closer to the location, I realized that it was not for a house, but a business. It was still in the city, but a more industrial side of town where there appeared to be a bunch of warehouses. I arrived at the address and saw that the special instructions on the order said that they wanted it delivered to the back door in the alley. I drove around back to find a dark alley with some dumpsters and then a small set of concrete stairs that seemed to lead to the building. I drove around back to find a dark alley with some dumpsters and then a small set of concrete stairs that led to a back door of the building. I'm not going to lie, it was a creepy scene with no other cars or people there in a back alley in the middle of the night. I had a job to do though, and I got out of my car and walked up the steps to the back door. I knocked on the door and waited there for a minute, but nobody answered. It was extremely quiet, and nobody else seemed to be around at all. I was beginning to wonder if I was at the correct building, so I looked around for the address to make sure. But just then, I heard a noise come from about ten feet away from me. I looked and saw a man come from behind a dumpster that was sitting on the other side of the stairs that I was on. He was wearing sunglasses even though it was night and started walking towards me. Based on the way he was walking, it didn't seem good and I backed away from my car. Then I saw another man come out from behind the other side of my car. He was also in sunglasses, but other than that, I couldn't really give a good description. They both were coming towards me at a pretty fast paced walk. I knew I wouldn't be able to get to my car, so I jumped over the railing of the stairs to the ground below, which was only about five feet. I then ran out of the alley as fast as I could. I could hear the men chasing after me as I did, and it sounded like there was a third person among them running as well. I was somehow able to outrun them to the end of the alley, and once I was there, I turned for the street and tried to run to an area where there was more people. I panicked and ran into the middle of the road, where a car was coming and started honking at me. I got out of the way just in time, and was lucky enough to get to the other side of the street. The men stopped from chasing me and were still at the other side. From there, I called my boss and told him what happened. I made my way to a nearby convenience store and waited. It ended up being a big deal as the building that I was instructed to deliver the pizza to had not actually ordered the pizza, meaning whoever lured me there was possibly setting me up to get robbed or something like that. The police were called and I quit the job shortly after. This happened about a year ago. It was a Friday night and I was hanging out with my girlfriend at her place and we were trying to decide what movie we were going to watch. We ordered Domino's, some pasta and a pepperoni pizza and I offered to go pick it up. There was a Domino's roughly five minutes away so it wasn't a big deal for me to drive over and get it and then I wouldn't have to spend money on a tip. When the food said it was done, I got in my car and left. I got to the small restaurant which by this time was roughly 11pm and was pretty quiet. 
I parked in the small parking lot beside the restaurant and walked inside. There was nobody at the counter as I walked in, so I stood there and waited. After a few seconds, I saw a woman briefly come out from the kitchen area and said she would be right with me in a moment, then she disappeared again away from the counter. I said that was fine and I stood there waiting. I looked around the small lobby. I wasn't in a big hurry or anything, so I didn't mind, and I knew that it being a Friday night they were probably really busy with deliveries. Then, as I looked behind me at the window going outside, I saw a man who had his face pressed up against the glass window of the store looking right at me. He had a scraggly beard and appeared to be in his thirties. He was just staring at me with a somewhat angry look on his face. I didn't know what to do and just turned back around. I was expecting him to come inside the store, but he never did. I faced the counter and then looked over my shoulder again to see that he was still there and not moving. Finally, the woman came back and asked me for my name of the order. As she did, she seemed to see the man in the window and asked who he was. I said I didn't know and I found it strange. She kind of laughed it off with a nervous and awkward laugh. Then I told her my name and she said she would go get my order. As she was getting it, I could see movement out of the corner of my eye. I saw the man suddenly dart away from the window and run away. I figured he was just some crazy guy and I was glad that he was gone. A minute or so later, the woman came back with my order and I took the boxes and left Domino's. I walked to the parking lot on the side where my car was and saw that the weird guy from the window was now standing by my car. I felt really awkward now because this man seemed to be a little crazy and I knew I'd have to walk right past him. I was also concerned with him being right next to my car. I slowly walked over and the man looked at me and smiled as I did. He didn't come closer to me though, which was a relief. Eventually, I was able to make it to my driver's door and get inside. I said goodnight to the man and drove away. He just stood there smiling at me. I began driving the five minute or so drive back home, but as I pulled onto a busier road less than a mile later, my car suddenly didn't feel right. The front wheel seemed like it was coming right off. I stopped the car on the side of the road and got out. I walked over and looked to see that all the lug nuts on my right front wheel were loosened almost all the way and the wheel of the car was starting to come off. I couldn't believe it. I immediately thought back to the man. I was kind of more out in the middle of nowhere now and was driving away from the businesses in town. I got up my phone and quickly called my girlfriend. I got back inside my car then and waited for her. Luckily she could come and pick me up with her car and she arrived just a couple of short minutes later and we went over to get a wrench. We were gone for only about 10 minutes, but when we got back, my driver's window was smashed. At that point, we called the police. They came out to the area and we told them the whole story. I believe that man I saw was trying to hurt me and he returned to my car and smashed the window after he realized I was gone. I'm grateful that I narrowly missed him. A few years ago, I worked at Domino's Pizza. I worked there for roughly one year, and for the most part, I liked it. One time though, I was working a night shift like I often did. It was sorta of busy and we would typically get a lot of phone calls for pizza orders and I would answer them a lot of the times. On this night, we got another phone call at about 10 p.m. I answered it, but on the other end, I didn't hear anything at all. I said hello several times, but there was just silence. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, I heard on the other end a loud and really creepy sounding laugh. I said hello one more time, and when I did, the laugh only seemed to get louder. It gave me the creeps and I hung up on them. I kept working and answered several more calls over the next few hours, until after midnight I got another call which was the same creepy laugh. I asked who it was, but of course they didn't answer. This time, I kept them on for a little bit longer but all they would do is laugh. Eventually, I hung up on them again, and that was the last call I got that night. Over the next few days though, it started happening more often. It happened about five times, and I told my coworkers about it. They hadn't experienced anything like it, and it would only seem to happen when I answered the phone. I was starting to get really annoyed and also seriously creeped out by these calls that kept happening. The person on the other end of the phone was usually laughing, but sometimes there would be a whisper which I couldn't make out what they were saying. Then they started just doing other random things like not talking at all or hanging up right away. 
I figured it was just a stupid prank, but I couldn't help but be a little bit scared. Then things got even worse. One night, when I was at home, I received a call, and when I answered it, I heard that same creepy laughing. I had no idea how they got my number, because it had only happened at work. I asked who it was once again, but all I heard was the same old laughing. Then they started whispering once again, and I couldn't make it out at all. Eventually, they hung up on me. I was really creeped out now, and didn't know what to do. I was home by myself, so that made me worry even more. I ended up calling my best friend and telling her all about it. She came over that night, but there were no more calls. The next night, I got the last call that I ever received from that person. It was more hysterical laughing, and it got louder and louder, until finally, there was a scream at the other end of the phone, and they hung up. This time, I was the most creeped out that I had ever been, and once again, my best friend came over. She spent the next few nights at my place, however, that was the last call that I ever got from the number, and they never called me again at work or at home. I sometimes wonder who it was and why they were calling me. I go to Taco Bell all the time. Most of the time that I go, it's during the late nights. I'm a senior in college, and I'm always busy with work and school. For the last few years, I've often drove to the Taco Bell drive through after long nights of work or studying. One night, about two months ago now, I was really hungry at about 11.30 p.m. when I got done with work. I drove to the nearest Taco Bell, which was about 10 minutes away, and pulled into the drive through this particular Taco Bell location was open until midnight every night of the week, but it recently had been closing early on some nights because they had been short in employees. As I pulled into the drive through without really thinking, I noticed nobody else was in the drive through and the lights to the restaurant seemed to be off. I knew they closed the lobby of the restaurant earlier than the drive through so I wasn't really sure if they were still open or not. I drove to the speaker and rolled down my window. I didn't hear anybody on the other side and there was a few seconds of silence. I said, hey, are you guys still open? And waited for a response. Several seconds more went by and still there was nothing. I knew at this point they must have been closed and I started to roll up my window when I heard something from the other end. There was a man's voice speaking, but I couldn't understand anything that he said. It sounded like when you have your mouth way too close to the phone and you can't understand any of the words. I asked them to repeat what they had said, but there was once again no response. This time, I decided to just drive away and go somewhere else. I pulled slowly through the rest of the drive through As I got to the first drive through window, I could see that there was nobody there and the lights inside were off. Then I saw the second window, and the lights were off as well, but there appeared to be a man in the window looking at me. As I passed by the window, I watched him quickly duck down as if he didn't want me to notice him. It was strange, but another thing struck me as being even more weird. The man was wearing what appeared to be a clown mask covering his entire head. I drove over to a nearby gas station and got food there instead. The next night, I found myself in a similar situation of getting off work later at night and was once again really craving Taco Bell. It was only 10.30 this time though, so I decided to go back and see if they were open. When I arrived, I could see there were several cars in the drive through already, and so I pulled in. They were in fact open and I was waiting in the line until it was my turn. I ordered, and when I got to the window to pay, I asked if they had changed their hours. The woman working told me no, they had not changed their hours, and they had just closed at nine the previous night due to a short staff. I mentioned how I had seen a man inside the window with a clown mask on at almost midnight, and the woman seemed surprised. She told me she had closed the place herself and left at nine o'clock, and when she did, nobody else was there. When I drove home that night, I couldn't help but wonder who it was that I had seen the night before in the window. I used to work at Taco Bell in the past. I worked at a Taco Bell that was about 15 minutes away from my parents' house. I worked there for a few years from my senior year of high school through my first two years of college. I liked the job a lot and made lots of friends, but with working late nights, I would occasionally see some weird things. But the strangest thing to ever happen 
was my last year working there. The Taco Bell location that I worked at was open until 3 a.m. and I would often be closing as I was on this particular night. I worked mostly just during the summer, so I didn't mind it too much. There was just the two of us working at the time. We usually didn't get too many customers this late, unless it was a weekend, and being a Thursday night, it was pretty dead for the last couple of hours. At about 2.55 a.m., literally right before we were about to close it down and go home, I saw a car pull into the drive-thru. As we were still open for five more minutes technically, I decided to not tell them that we were closed and take one last order. I spoke to the driver and asked what his order would be. I waited for a response for a while, but there was none. As I looked at the camera at the car, it appeared to still have the window rolled up. I waited a little while longer and was starting to get really annoyed because I wanted to go home and now I had to wait for this person to order. Finally, I saw the driver's window roll down, but it looked like there was nobody inside the car at all. The driver's seat was just empty. Nobody was in the passenger seat either, and I was really confused. I decided to say to the driver that we would be closing, and if they wanted to order anything, they would have to do it right now. I didn't get any response. Instead, after about 10 or 15 seconds, the car just drove forward slowly ahead. I was so confused as to what was going on. How was the car driving if there was nobody in the driver's seat? I shook my head and then told Damien that they didn't order anything, so we could close it up. Just then, we heard the sound of knocking coming from the drive through window. It was three loud and solid knocks. I walked over to the window and saw that the same car had stopped at it. I opened up the window and looked out, but saw that there was nobody in the car once again. The front window was down, and there was nobody in the driver's seat or the passenger. I thought it had to somehow be a prank. I stuck my head out of the window to get a better look inside the car and saw that there was nobody in the back seats as well. My jaw dropped and I couldn't believe what was going on. I got a creepy feeling and stuck my head back inside and closed the drive through window. I then watched as the car drove away. Damien and I were both extremely puzzled by this. We closed up after that and both went home. I don't remember anything else as strange ever happening. This story happened about five years ago. I was on a road trip with my friend Anna. We had been driving all day and late at night we both got really hungry. By this time it was nearly midnight. So as I drove, Anna looked on her phone for places nearby that were open. We were kind of in the middle of nowhere and unfamiliar with the area. As we drove on the freeway, it was pretty much just fields on both sides. Anna was saying that her phone was really slow and she wasn't really getting a signal out here. We kept on driving for about 20 more minutes until we finally saw an exit sign with several food places on it. We pulled off the exit and quickly saw that the only places that seemed to be open were a gas station and a little Taco Bell. There were several other buildings in the small town but all of their lights were off. We first stopped for some gas and then pulled into the Taco Bell drive through We got to the speaker to place our order and as I was beginning to talk, I heard what sounded like a scream coming in the background. It sounded like someone was screaming help, but it abruptly got cut off. After a few seconds of silence, a man's voice came back on to say that they were closed. Anna and I both found this very bizarre and we had a strange feeling about it so we decided to go inside the restaurant. We went to the door and saw that according to their hours, they were still open. When we tried the door, it was unlocked, but nobody seemed to be inside. The place was very quiet. I walked over to the counter and stood there. I thought I heard someone talking from the back, but I couldn't see them. Finally, a man walked to the front of the counter and told me that they were closed. He wasn't wearing a Taco Bell uniform though and didn't seem friendly at all. I mentioned that the hours on the door said they were still open, and the man just shook his head and said that it was wrong. He started to walk away when I mentioned the screaming I had heard and asked if everything was all right. The man paused for a second and then smiled a little and stated that it was just another employee joking around. He then asked us to leave. As we turned to walk back out, I once again heard another scream. This one was very loud and I could clearly hear someone screaming for help. The man then shouted at us to get out in a very loud and angry voice. We both ran out, but as soon as we had gotten outside, we decided to call the police. 
I just wasn't believing that those screams were a joke, and the man definitely seemed to be hiding something. We waited in our car in the parking lot for a couple of minutes until the police showed up. They went inside, and it wasn't long until we saw them leaving with the man we had seen. Later on, it was explained to us that there had been two employees working when a man came in and attempted to rob the restaurant. One of the workers struggled with him and was knocked unconscious, and the other employee was taken to the back of the restaurant when we pulled into the drive through I'm glad we showed up when we did, or the man may have gotten away with it. I'm a 20-something guy living in the middle of Tennessee. Before this bizarre experience, I'd been going to college full-time to be a paralegal. One day though, my mother broke her hip after falling down the stairs. She was 52 at the time, and my dad had passed a long time ago, so it was on me to take care of her. We didn't really have anyone else. I was forced to make myself a part-time student because I would have to get a job to help her afford some of her medical bills. At the time, thanks to my late dad, I had a fairly new car, and I figured it'd be fun and easy to deliver pizza. I loved to drive. Where I lived, there was a lot of scenery, and sometimes I even went on drives just for the sake of it. As you can probably guess, it was easy to get the job. I just applied at a few local places and called each of them the next day. Before I knew it, I was delivering pizzas wearing a Domino's hat. Delivering pizza wasn't hard. I can be completely honest with you about that, but delivering can be insanely stressful. You've got to get there at a reasonable time. You keep hoping that the order was made correctly because you can't just send it back to the kitchen when you're miles away from the restaurant. And last but not least, you find yourself praying that your next customer isn't a prank or a complete jerk. I can't tell you how many jerks I've delivered to. Jerks who didn't want to pay because I wasn't able to give them one more pack of Parmesan cheese. Well, there came a day when I had to deliver a large pizza to an address I did not recognize. The place was about 10 miles away from the restaurant in an area we all infamously called the Boondocks. It was an area that I'd personally never been to, but when I saw it on my drive, I would describe it as a country region of town where there's only a single trashy house every five minutes on the road. And I'm not trying to be rude. These places looked beat up, old, and ransacked. It was honestly hard to believe that people still lived in those places. I was fully expecting at any moment to witness a drug deal or to have someone step out in front of my car to stop me and try to sell me meth. Needless to say, it was a bit of a creepy place. Given that it was getting dark out fast, I was ready to get the delivery over with. I arrived at the customer's address rather quickly, thank God. Luckily, this house was far cleaner than all the ones previous. It was a small white home with a short paved driveway and a seemingly untouched screen door in the front. The yard was well kept and clean, and the grass looked to have been cut recently. Also, there were no cars in the driveway, but I still assumed someone was home to pick up the order. I got out hesitantly and I grabbed the pizza. The carrier was still hot enough to burn my skin if I held it in one spot for too long. This was good. It was probably our most common complaint we got that our pizzas were too cold or not hot enough when we dropped them off. So that was one thing I didn't have to worry about. With some flimsy confidence, I began to walk up to the screen door. When I was nearly at the porch, I could now see a faint light through the front window. And that's when I saw the silhouette of someone looking out at me, someone standing there, watching me walk up to their door. Good, I thought. This will be quick. I made it to the front door, cleared my throat for whatever reason, opened the screen door, then knocked on the wooden door. With the first knock, the door slid open. The door hadn't been closed at all, so when I knocked, it opened further. 
but I swear, there's no way it should have opened that much from a single light knock, because the door in a matter of seconds was wide open. I could now see inside. I could see the faint lighting from what appeared to be two dim lamps in the living room. I could also see a small, maybe 28 inch TV in the living room, displaying a silent flat blue screen. For several seconds, I didn't realize that I was holding my breath. I could feel goosebumps coming up on my forearms. What in the world was going on here? Uh, hello, I said. It definitely wasn't loud enough to get anyone's attention though. So instead, without stepping through the doorway, I knocked on the open door, hoping to let someone know that I was here. I waited for at least two minutes, but I didn't hear a soul. Nobody walking or talking in the house. No sign that anyone lived there. I stood there, frozen and silent, trying to listen. Behind you, a voice whispered. I felt breath on the back of my neck, cold, chilling breath. Immediately, I spun around. I did it so quickly that I dropped the pizza inside its carrier, but I didn't care. I ran back to my car and was ready to peel out of there, but I made the mistake of looking back at that dang house. I saw it in the window, the silhouette of a person standing there, still watching me, except now they were waving. I hauled tail out of there. When I made it back to the restaurant, I was written up for failure to deliver and for losing my pizza carrier. I thought I was going to be fired, to be honest with you, but I think my manager just went easy on me as she knew the situation with my mother. On one of my rare days off, one of the days I didn't have to work or take care of my mom or go to school, I went back to that strange neighborhood. I found that house again, but it took me a while to be sure that the place I was looking at was really the same place. Because even though it had been about two weeks since the incident, the place was a wreck. The screen door was hanging off of its hinges with holes in the screen. The white paint on the outside was now an off-white or nearly yellow with patches of chipped paint. And the lawn was now a jungle with random auto parts scattered about. I gathered my courage and drove back to the nearest neighbor I could find. I knocked on their door and excused my intrusion. Then I asked them if they knew anything about the strange house. To my surprise, they did. The house was the home of an old man who struggled with his drinking. Apparently, he drove his kids away from frequent abuse. And once those kids left his life for good, he took a shotgun and ended his own life. I was covered with chills as I listened to the story it was like some sort of ghost story you'd see on TV or hear from an urban legend, but this was real. I'd lived through it. After the man told me that that house hadn't had electricity on for the past year, I thanked him for the information and I bid him good day. I stopped delivering for Domino's after that. I didn't feel like delivering to any more strange places and I got a better job offer as a manager at a local subway. Still, sometimes I get a chill on the back of my neck, and I can't help but think about that voice saying, Behind you. My name is Kenneth, I'm 22 years old, and this story happened a couple of months ago. I had just gotten a job working nights at an Amazon warehouse near where I live. On my shift, there weren't that many of us. It would just be me on my own doing my work somewhere in the warehouse. I think it was my second night at work when the security guard who worked there introduced himself. His name was Vincent. He was a large man, slightly overweight, in his late 30s. He was friendly at first when we started talking. Mostly small talk and interests we both have. He asked if I wanted to go get a beer and maybe see a movie the following Friday, as we both had that day off. I agreed as I didn't have any plans and I don't go out too often. That Friday in the evening, me and Vincent met up at a bar near where we work. Everything went okay. We had some drinks, talked about sports and previous jobs we worked. 
Then we headed out to the movie theater. That's when Vincent started acting weird. We bought our tickets and headed to the theater. I needed to use the bathroom, so I went. I was standing at the urinal doing my thing when I heard a bathroom door open. I couldn't hear any footsteps, but I didn't think twice about it. Then I turned around. I saw Vincent standing there, watching me. His head was down, but his eyes were up, and he was just smiling at me. I jumped and I laughed, saying he startled me. But Vincent just stood there, looking at me. It was like he was angry, almost, with a weird smile. It's weird. You have to be there to understand. I just walked past him and said I would wait for him outside. That was the first red flag. Then as we were in the movie theater watching the movie, I swear he was staring at me. I wasn't certain, but I could see in the corner of my eye that he was turned staring directly at me. I was too freaked out to check, so I did my best to focus on the movie. The next thing that happened was Vincent started rubbing his hand on my thigh. That was it for me. I got up and I walked out. The next week at work, Vincent came up to me and asked if I wanted to go hang out. I looked at him confused and annoyed at the same time. I thought me up and leaving was obvious I wasn't interested and don't want anything to do with him. I told him no, I'm busy and carried on working. Fast forward a few weeks later of him asking me and hanging out and texting me, calling me, I really had enough. So the next time I saw him in work, I told him I don't want anything to do with him and to leave me alone. I turned away and carried on sorting boxes. Vincent walked away and I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Later that night, I decided to take a break and go to the bathroom. I sat inside one of the stalls to answer a few texts. I then heard some heavy boots stumping down the corridor, then into the bathroom. I opened the stall door to see what was going on. Before I could open the door, it was kicked into me, causing me to fall backwards. And then Vincent was on top of me, putting his hands all over my face, trying to cover my mouth and then he started strangling me. I was losing consciousness, but I still remember the look of Vincent's face as he was choking me. His face was red and his eyes were wide as they could be. I thought I was gonna die, but for some reason, Vincent let me go and left the bathroom. I sat up trying to catch my breath. I was still in defense mode because I thought for some reason, Vincent was gonna come back and kill me, but he never did, thankfully. I reported what happened to the manager. He looked on the CCTV camera and I called the police. You can see me walking into the bathroom and about a minute later, Vincent rushes in. At that point, Vincent had left the warehouse and went home. Well, that's what he told the police anyway. I'm gonna fast forward what happens next and say due to no proof of Vincent attacking me, the charges were dropped against him. He even got to keep his job. I felt that justice had been taken away from me and there was no way I was gonna continue at Amazon, especially with that maniac still working there. I left that job, obviously, and currently have a new job. I hope and pray for- In the run-up to Valentine's Day of 2015, I found myself with a rather unfamiliar feeling. Loneliness. From 2010 onwards, I'd been so focused on med school that I was content to barely have a social life and content to have a non-existent romantic life. I told myself that it could all wait until I was done with school and that frankly it would be irresponsible for me to curate distractions for myself while I was trying to reach the first milestone in my career goals. But after most of my high school friends had graduated and my social media feed began to swell with pictures of their dates, weddings, and pregnancy pictures, I began to feel like that I was really missing out. Call it social pressure or just plain loneliness, but I began to tell myself that it wouldn't be terrible if I just did a little casual dating especially around the most romantic time of the year. So I did what most younger folks my age do, and I downloaded one or two of the more popular dating apps. Being a woman and all, I didn't have any trouble getting matches. The trouble was actually finding a guy I liked after the opening conversation. So many of them seemed either too into it or clingy or way too cool and uninterested. The last thing I wanted was someone who'd badger me during intense periods of study, but... I also didn't want to just be some player's option either. I know that sounds like I was asking for the impossible and trust me, for a while I thought I was being way too picky. But then came a guy that we'll call Ryan and I only give him a fake name to protect the innocent. Ryan seemed charming, intelligent and respectful but he also took a while to answer my messages. I know that last part seems like a weird thing to count as a virtue but 
I wanted a guy who had his own stuff going on. I liked the idea that he was sometimes just too busy to talk, and I guess that's because I saw a little of myself in him, but I digress. Out of all the guys I spoke to, Ryan was 100% the leading candidate. So there came a point where I straight up asked him if he had any Valentine's Day plans. I'm quick to add that I didn't ask him out. I just asked if he had plans, then waited for him to take the hint. Thankfully, he did, and he told me he knew of this cute little Portuguese bistro-type place that did some of the best seafood he'd ever had. Now, he didn't know this. I have the most boring, anglophone surname ever, but I'm actually a quarter Portuguese, so I basically jumped on the offer and got super excited for the date. Valentine's Day fell on a Saturday that year, and I remember that because we ended up having to stew on a waiting list before our reservation was confirmed. Obviously, the will-we-won't-we drama had me even more excited than before, and when the time came to actually go meet him, I was feeling very romantic indeed. He looked amazing too. Three-piece suit, perfect hair, plus a little tactical stubble that accentuated his masculinity. Then, when he took off his jacket, hung it over the back of his chair, then rolled the sleeves of his white shirt up. My god. I thought I was going to explode with the desire right then and there. We talked, picked out some appetizers, and for about 45 minutes the date was going incredibly well. But then, I saw two people walk into the bistro that looked very, very out of place. Ryan had his back to the door so he didn't see them walk in, but I did. And right away, their state trooper uniform stuck out like a sore thumb. I'm sure you know the kind I'm talking about. The smoky bear hat with the super shiny tie clip thing. But as much as they initially grabbed my attention, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt Ryan in the middle of an anecdote. He definitely noticed me looking over his shoulder, but they were nothing but momentary glances, so not nearly enough for him to stop talking and looking around. Out of my peripheral vision, I see the cops being greeted by the restaurant's maitre d'. Then, I see the maitre d' pointing in our general direction. But again, nothing to be too concerned about. But then, the two cops started walking past a row of tables in our direction, and this is when I have to break eye contact and look up at them, because they stop right next to our table. Again, I've changed some of the details to protect the innocent. Sir? One of them said. Ryan looked up before the cop continued. Are you Ryan Smith of 111 Residential Street? Ryan responded in the affirmative, then asked if there was a problem. My heart and mind are both racing by this point, and in those few split seconds, I figured something terrible had happened to someone Ryan knew. That, or there had been like a break-in in his home or something. I never, ever would have guessed what the cop said next. Not in a million years. Then, as almost everyone in the restaurant is looking at us, wait and kitchen staff included, one of the cops says, Ryan Smith, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of... Enter girl's name here. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Etc, etc, etc. And I think my jaw must have been touching the tablecloth as I felt my face burning with embarrassment. Like I said, almost everyone in the bistro was looking at Ryan as the cops walked him out in cuffs. Then suddenly, once he was in the back of the cop car, they all started looking at me. I can safely say without a shadow of doubt that this was the single worst moment of my life so far. It was a cocktail of absolute horror for me. Everyone's eyes on me coupled with the embarrassment of having my date arrested while assuming everyone was thinking, what kind of girl goes out with a murder suspect? Is she dumb? Is she in on it? It was just awful. And then it hit me that if he really had killed some poor girl, was I his next intended victim? Did I just avoid being murdered by a matter of minutes, hours, days, or weeks? Was he looking at me with those big warm brown eyes while thinking, she's so smart and pretty? Or was he looking at me all hungry because he couldn't wait to hurt me? I barely remember walking out of the bistro and the next day when I returned to pick my car up, I had to ask the maitre d' if I'd walked out without paying. Turns out I hadn't actually paid. 
but the restaurant's owner overheard about the whole thing and told me that all the food and drink we'd consumed was on the house. It's a little acts of kindness like this which slowly restored my faith in humanity because, believe it, it had been badly shaken by the events of that Valentine's evening. I only really remember getting into the front seat of my car, calling my mom, then just ugly sobbing into the phone while she asked me, Are you okay? What happened, honey? Over and over again. Once I was finally able to get the words out, she told me not to drive home in such a state and to take a cab, and she was right. Even though I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol that evening, I was definitely in no fit state to drive. I suppose at that point I should just cut to the chase and tell you all what you want to know. And yes, Ryan was convicted of murdering the girl whose name I've chosen to admit. I was actually kind of hoping it was all just some horrible mistake, and that I hadn't seemed so dumb or naive to have gone on a date with an actual murderer. But nope. As the months went on, it progressed from an arrest, to a trial, to a full-on murder conviction. Ryan had gone on a date with some sweet, unsuspecting girl, taken her back to his apartment, then strangled her to death in the middle of being intimate. I remember my roommate saying that it might have been a kind of horrid accident, but it wasn't. Ryan had deliberately killed her, at a time when she literally couldn't have been more vulnerable. It might seem strange, but I did end up finding a kind of closure after the whole thing and I recommend this variety of cognitive behavioral therapy to anyone who suffered a similar trauma. I wrote Ryan a letter, or more accurately, I wrote a letter to a prisoner number and addressed it to the correctional facility he was being held at. I couldn't even bear to write his name, nor could I bring myself to write mine either. He'd know who I was, I was certain of it, and in the letter I told him in no uncertain terms that I hoped he would rot and burn forever. I told him a bunch of other things too, but those aren't fit enough to be reprinted anywhere remotely civilized. I don't know if he ever opened or read the letter, but the detective that I was in contact with informed me that it would most certainly be delivered. I hope he read my letter, and I hope it cut him up inside. I wanted him to feel as mortified and ashamed as I did in that bistro on that chilly Valentine's evening. I wanted him to read my words, and as he was reading... I wanted him to pray for the ground to just open up wide and swallow him whole, just as I did when all those people were looking at me with burning judgment in their eyes. I wanted so many things from that letter, but I only got one of them. Closure. Some of you might be wondering why I haven't named anyone or anyone in this account. It's for a number of reasons, but the primary one, I know this for certain, is that the family of the girl my date had murdered requested the privacy and space to grieve following his trial. Unfortunately, this wasn't respected by elements of the local and national media and the family ended up suing one of the more unscrupulous publications regarding an article they posted online. If you ask me, it was righteous litigation, and although I wouldn't be all that worried about them suing me, given how closely connected I am with the case, I'd like to respect their wishes for privacy and anonymity. On top of that, I'd like you to respect my privacy and anonymity, at least until my prospective killer is released. Because then, I'll go public, truly public, and no matter how much my prospective killer tries to carve out a new life, a new identity, or a new existence, I'm determined to make sure that everyone knows what a monster he really is. Back when I was still in high school, I used to work as a waiter at this super fancy restaurant on the corner of the common. I worked there for two Valentine's Days, and I've never understood why people didn't want to work them. Not the first year, anyway. Tips? They were awesome. So the next year, when I wasn't even on shift, it was real easy just to make a swap so I could get all those Valentine's tips. So, this guy comes in, good looking dude, but his girl was like, Rihanna level hot. It was all eyes on her all night long. There was almost a fist fight in the back to decide who got to wait that table. Okay, maybe not a fist fight, but I personally witnessed two games of rock, paper, scissors, and they were low-key intense. Anyway, the night goes on, we're working steadily, and the tips are just mounting up hour by hour. 
The dude was treating his girl to all kinds of bougie cocktails, insisting she have dessert, the most expensive entree, stuff like that. And the whole time we're just like, yes dude, boost that percentage, boost it. It wasn't my table so I couldn't keep track of the exact amount he dropped on her but I know it must have been like 5 hundy and change based on the pricing. But as they're wrapping up, I'm just waiting to see what kind of cut I'd be getting. When out of nowhere, a solo girl walks into the main dining area. She's not wearing anything fancy, she's looking like she'd actually been crying and I remember watching her look around the dining room for a second or two before honing in on the dude and his Rihanna twin. You know when you just know something messed up is about to happen and you can just feel the tension rising in the room before it suddenly explodes? I think everyone in the main dining room picked up on that as she powered over to the Rihanna girl and started screaming in her face. I remember watching our bartender, this big tattooed dude called Harley, walking over to her, getting ready to separate them or whatever. But before he got there, the crazy girl grabs one of the wine glasses from the table and just yeets it into the Rihanna girl's face. Harley goes from zero to a hundred trying to get over to stop it. This place was super fancy so it didn't have security or anything hanging around anywhere. In fact, we barely had any trouble at all. So when the situation exploded and diners were screaming and trying to get away, Harley was slowed down by all these people trying to get out of the dining room while he was trying to get in. Then in the meantime, the girl is just going ham on Rihanna with this broken wine glass before I actually come out of shock in time to act on it, she's picked up another glass and yeeted that one into her face too. Then get this, instead of actually helping his date, the guy actually just bailed out of the booth and ran out of the restaurant along with the rest of the customers. Total scumbag move, man, and something I'll never forget. Seconds later, me, Harley, and the rest of the waiting staff had basically body slammed the crazy girl away from Rihanna while she herself had slumped down under the table to get away from the attack. The cops eventually showed up, took the crazy girl away, and once the scene was safe and clear, the EMT showed up to treat the injured girl. I hadn't seen her at any point after the attack, not until the EMTs actually started treating her. And honestly, I couldn't even recognize her face. All around her eyes and nose, it just looked like ripped up red and... Her upper lip was almost cut all the way in half so you could see gums and teeth and stuff. It was one of the most horrific, upsetting things I'd ever seen. And every single Valentine's Day since, I'm reminded of that poor girl. And the horrific injuries she suffered at the hands of that psycho ex, or whoever she was. My grandfather grew up in Jacksonville, Texas back in the 1950s, and if you've never been there, you wouldn't be missing much. He grew up the eldest of five brothers and sisters on a farm with my great-grandparents. He passed away about a year ago, but I wanted to share a story he told me when I came home from college break. Naturally, Grandpa didn't come from much. His parents' generation suffered through the Great Depression, and farmers didn't fare off too well. But being the gritty Texas farm folk that they were, they thrived in it. Having a farm and a big pasture surrounded by pine trees made for a good childhood, as he told me. He would reminisce about the times of gathering the whole town's kids and playing baseball games to pass the hot summer days. Though as his health deteriorated, he began to talk more deeply with me, and would talk to me about life lessons, and one thing in particular, fear. He asked me if I had ever heard of witches. I said of course, but he stopped me, and as serious as he could be, he asked me again. Listen, I ain't talking about no Halloween characters. I'm talking about actual witches. I could tell it made him uncomfortable talking about it. It really screwed him up as a kid. He explained to me that he had three encounters growing up. The first time he saw her, he was ten. 
He and his siblings were playing around sundown. They were outside in the pasture. About 200 yards away from him, there was a tree line where a forest began. He said that he saw a dark floating silhouette by the tree line. He couldn't focus on it because of the lack of lighting, but he swore to me that the figure's head was cocked at a perfect 90 degree angle looking right at him. He said it was inhuman. He remembers rushing the little ones back inside and telling his parents. Their parents never let them out after sundown again. The second encounter came two years later. He and a friend who was their closest neighbor would walk on a trail through the forest to school every day. He said it was about a two and a half mile walk. One day as they were walking home, they saw a homeless person covered in quilts walking on the left side of the trail. Being very confused and uneasy as to why somebody they didn't know who was completely submerged in dirty quilts would be walking on this trail in the woods. As the person passed, he said they both smelled something that was a mix of rot and sour. Upon smelling the putrid odor, Grandpa said that he became very dizzy and incoherent, and the neighbor boy felt the same way. A few moments later, they hear a sinister giggle from behind them. <laughs> they turn to see this person, who was still completely hidden by the quilts, began running after them. He said the thing didn't stop chasing them until they busted down the front door of the farmhouse. He never saw the neighbor boy again after that day. The incident was widely spread around town and quickly became a warning for all those who would venture in the woods. The third and last time he saw the witch was when he was a senior in high school. Grandpa was going to be a Division I football player for the University of Oklahoma and quite frankly was the hometown hero. He said that he just met my grandmother and really wanted to enjoy the rest of his senior year. So he attended a prom after party in the woods with his classmates. Being that his class only had 60 people, everyone was there. He admitted that he got pretty wasted that night. He went to go take a leak a couple of yards away from the bonfire. While he was draining his lizard, he heard shuffling noises from nearby. As he tried to focus, he made out a small hut through the trees. There was a stream of smoke emanating from its chimney. He smelled a stench that he recognized from when he was 12. He told me that nothing else could have sobered him up so quickly. He proceeded to investigate the hut deep in the forest. As he approached, a dark figure appeared from the shadows. But he told me that no matter how hard he tried, he never could quite make it out. All of a sudden, the figure started to whisper. It intensified, and he felt a burning sensation on his arm. He felt as if his body was being branded. The figure then slowly faded back into the darkness of the forest. He became frantic and realized that he was now 100 yards away from everyone. He said that there was no way he had wandered off that far. He began screaming for help. He admitted to me that he even wet his pants. The creepiest part about this story is that the police investigated the hut that my grandpa discovered. Inside was a gore fest. There was dead animals strewn about the floor as well as human remains, who some believed to be the missing neighbor boy. They never found out who was responsible, and my grandfather moved away shortly after. My grandfather was a fantastic man, and I miss him a lot. He was the most kind, loving man I ever knew, and I know that he wouldn't make any of this up, and I've also always wondered where he got the burn mark on his arm. Some backstory before I begin. I work for a conservation corps based out of Austin, Texas. We do a lot of environmentally based projects, such as trail maintenance, wild firefighting, invasive species removal, etc. One day this past spring we were working in Jasper, Texas, doing invasive species removal on Nature Conservancy property. We were clearing any and all species that were not longleaf, shortleaf, or loblolly pine trees. The property was about 60 acres, so we were flying through this project trying to complete it. Most of our chainsaws had run into problems and were not working properly, so we ended up having to split up into groups. I worked in a crew of eight, and we only had four saws running, so groups of two was the reasonable way to run things. I was working with one of my co-workers, Joe. 
We were on an area of property that the crew had not been to yet. Our job was to cut a trail about a mile into the property and proceed to make our way around the 60 acres. We began to saw our way in at around 7.45 a.m. We had to hike in our fuel, bar oil for the chainsaw, our wedges, and our packs. We each carried a hatchet in case we needed an extra wedge or for any other reason, as well as flagging to mark the trail. At around 9, we had reached our halfway point and decided to take a short break. I shut off the chainsaw, took my chaps off, and drank some water to cool off. I placed my pack against the tree, and Joe did the same. We began shooting the shit. Nothing unusual. Just some stupid banter to get through the day. As we were talking, something snapped in the brush about 30 feet to the west of us. I instantly stopped talking and grabbed our hatchets. This area was known to have wild boar. We knew what to do in this situation if a wild boar was to show up. Nevertheless, we were scared. We slowly walked over to the brush, and as we approached, another snap came from our south, about 30 feet in the dense brush. At that point, we were starting to get nervous. We had no plan if two boar were to show up. We decided that it was best to grab our packs and find our way back to the crew. They would understand us ceasing work for two boar. As we slowly made our way back to our packs, snaps came from every direction. We had nowhere to go. My first thought was to grab the chainsaw and turn it on. I revved up the engine, but it promptly died. Great. Another saw down. In simple terms, we were screwed. We decided to make a run for it at that point. I counted down from five, and we both ran down the trail as fast as we could into the thick swampy brush. We sprinted as fast as humanly possible towards camp, but something made us stop. Joe and I, at the same moment, stopped running. We stood there not knowing what to do. Joe began to look around frantically, and as he did, I felt a cold breeze wisp down my back. A deep voice whispered something into my ear, but before I could even comprehend the words, I took my hatchet and swung blindly behind me. To my surprise and terror, it struck something hard. As I turned my head to see what creature had just met its doom, I heard Joe gasp. As my head swiveled, behind me was a tree. This may sound normal, but we had cleared this area of all life not but 30 minutes prior. The chances of us missing a 2 foot wide, 60 foot tall tree were zero. Realizing that this was only a tree, I looked back at Joe, ready to laugh. But as soon as I turned around, Joe was gone. I chuckled and started to call out his name. After about 2 minutes, I began to freak out. I began frantically searching the surrounding area but Joe seemed to have vanished into nothing. After another 10 minutes of searching, I decided that he may have been so scared that he ran back to camp, so I began to make my way back. When I arrived, everything was completely normal, everything but the fact that Joe wasn't there. I told everyone that Joe had gone missing after we had a run-in with some boar. We all spread out. We looked for Joe for an hour before deciding to call the authorities. They arrived shortly after. We set up search parties to find Joe. After about 10 minutes of searching, he was found. Joe sat on a tree stump, pale as the moon, staring off into space. I called out to him, but when he looked at me, I noticed blood running down his stomach. There was a tree branch sticking out of Joe's gut. I sprinted over to him as he fainted and caught him before he hit the ground. The police rushed Joe to the nearest hospital. Before we left, I noticed something odd. Joe had been sitting on a stump of a tree that I had rammed my hatchet into. The tree was no longer standing, and my hatchet was sitting in the dirt, covered in blood. My stomach dropped, and I immediately walked with my crew back to camp, leaving my hatchet behind. We packed up our campsite and left Jasper that night. We were never sent back to that property. Shortly after, an article surfaced in the news of a Nature Conservancy surveyor who disappeared in the same forest. They found him a week later impaled next to a tree stump. I can only assume it was the same stump that we found Joe next to. 
I experienced this back when I was 14. Now I am 23 years old. Back then I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Montana. Behind my home there was a forest. Now, I had never stepped a foot into those woods until that day. The only time I'd ever even gotten close to that forest was when I was tasked with walking my family dog Charlie. Now, Charlie was a big dog. I had never seen him cower before. On one of our walks, I heard a noise in the woods. It was the sound of a branch snapping. Uh, occasionally, whenever I took walks with Charlie, I would keep hearing these noises. One thing to mention though, is that whenever I took Charlie out during the day, nothing would happen. But during dusk or dawn or even nighttime, I would always hear this noise. The day I decided to head in was an extraordinary day because it was my 14th birthday. After everyone was in bed, I had snuck out with Charlie and we navigated our way through, or, well, tried to. We ended up getting lost and came upon an abandoned shed. Then, the last thing I expected happened. Charlie started whimpering. That was never a good sign. I had wondered if there was someone there, but I couldn't see anybody. I didn't think I would need any form of protection, so I didn't have any. And then, I heard the sounds. A crunch here and a snap there, and the animals went quiet. I was terrified, so all I could do was run to the shed and hide. Something got closer. I heard the leaves crunching. It was the only way I could tell how close it was. Then, a loud bang resonated through the woods. It was walking on top of the roof. I couldn't stop shaking, but I'd like to think that Charlie could tell how scared I was because he started licking me. Around five or ten minutes later, I hopped off the roof and I peeked out the nearest window. There was a human-like creature out there. Grotesque, with long limbs pale skin like the moon, jagged bones and joints. It was extremely thin. Its spine was protruding underneath its skin. Instead of bumps on the spine, they were like tips of a knife. I felt sick to my stomach and I almost hurled right then and there. I felt like I was seeing something I shouldn't. I managed to see its face. It was roundish. Its eyes were beady and black. They looked soulless, but I'm not completely sure. They were glassy like the eyes of a doll. Lifeless, and soon it had started to walk away, but not without turning back to me and letting out this demonic roar, like the roar of a lion mixed with the caw of a raven. I think it knew I was there. I don't know what prevented it from killing me, but whatever it was, I'm eternally grateful. Remember, if there are woods near you, and you hear strange sounds, never forget that there are things out there that won't be as merciful as it was to me. If anybody knows what this may have been, please let me know in the comments down below. I'm incredibly curious. It all started on the 7th of February. The small independent coffee shop I was working at had decided to throw up a few decorations for Valentine's Day. So myself and a few colleagues had spent pretty much our entire shift putting up pink and red bunting, writing romantic quotations around the edges of our blackboard menu, and other romantically themed stuff. It was a fun way to spend a shift, but as I clocked out and began the short walk back to my flat, I began to feel a slight pang of loneliness, knowing I'd be single and alone on the day itself. I consider Tinder or Bumble to try and bag myself a date, but the chances of securing myself a boy that I actually genuinely liked over the next seven days was slim to none, so I resigned myself to another Valentine's on my own. But when I got home to find a pink envelope in my mailbox, I must admit that it brought a little smile to my face. A secret admirer, like something right out of a cheap romance paperback, might not be every girl's cup of tea, but to be honest, it really cheered me up even if it was from a friend or the nice lady that lived on the ground floor flat. Only when I open the thing up, it just says, seven days to go. No romantic message, no kisses or hearts, just those three words scrawled hastily onto the paper inside. It's then I realize there's nothing on the envelope or the paper it contained that confirmed it was actually addressed to me. No name, 
no address, nothing. I started to feel a tad silly, like what if it wasn't meant for me at all? What if someone had sent their little Valentine's card to the wrong person? I told myself I was just being silly, but kept the envelope and card as I walked upstairs to my flat and got on with my evening. I honestly think I'd forgotten the whole thing by the next morning when I got up and set off to work again. But when I got home, there was a stark reminder that this was no mistake. Arriving back at my flat, I checked my mail to find yet another pink envelope inside. Not only that, but a small brown paper package was stuffed inside too. Again, I have to admit to being kind of excited about the whole thing. There definitely hadn't been a mistake of address or anything. I mean, the person must have had to put all that stuff in there themselves. Maybe I really did have a secret admirer, and that Valentine's was about to become something out of a fairy tale. But as soon as I opened the package, I knew something wasn't quite right. Inside was a small brown teddy bear. Only it wasn't newly bought, nor had it been looked after very well in what was obviously a long and grubby existence. To be frank, it was filthy. The thing looked like it hadn't been washed in years, decades even. The fur was all grimy and matted together, and one of its glasses was missing, probably having been pulled out by a child some years before. The note inside the envelope was pretty much the same as the last one, only this time it read, six days to go. That's about the time that I realized that whoever was sending these wasn't exactly all there, and what had previously been a kind of giddy excitement turned into nervous anticipation, and the more I let my mind dwell on it, the more and more frightened I became. This wasn't going to be some dream romance, in fact, it was more likely to be the polar opposite. I told a friend in work about the whole thing and they seemed to take it much more seriously than I had. They told me I obviously had a stalker, that even if this person was doing this stuff out of affection, it was still crossing a number of personal boundaries and I should consider contacting the police. But to tell them exactly what? That I had a note addressed to no one, from no one, with absolutely no other details than I'd found them in my mailbox. Alright, it wasn't exactly the dream romantic gestures that I think all girls kind of crave, but at the same time, why cause someone the distress of calling the cops on them? That felt kind of cruel. But after returning home that evening to something else in my apartment, I didn't feel so apprehensive about contacting them. I arrived home again that evening to find exactly what I expected in my mailbox. Another note, this time reading, yep, you guessed it five days to go. I stormed up to my apartment, grabbed a piece of note paper and a sharpie, and wrote out something along the lines of, whoever is leaving stuff in my mailbox, please stop. It was sweet at first, but now it's kind of creepy. No more, or I call the police. I made an effort not to come across as too rude or aggressive, but I also needed to make it clear that I really, really didn't appreciate their unwanted attention. I taped the note to the front entrance of my apartment building before I went to bed, hoping whoever it was would get the message and leave me alone. So, little side note, I get a shower before bed every night, every night without fail. I'm almost sort of a clean freak, I keep my bathroom pretty much spotless. So as I finish getting washed, something small catches my eye, something that might not even gain the attention of most people but to me it stuck out like a sore thumb. A flash of color in what is an otherwise pristine white bathroom on the window's ledge was a tiny, glassy dome shape just sat there on its own. I approached curiously, peering down at it for a few moments before I completely freaked out and ran out of the bathroom to call the cops. It was a small, glass eye, a minuscule amount of fabric woven into the back of it, I recognized it almost instantly as the missing eye from the teddy bear that I'd found in my mailbox. While I was on the phone to the police, I realized a few things about my prospective valentine. As I said, I get a shower every evening before bed. I like hot showers, the steamier the better, so naturally the bathroom windows spends a lot of time ajar to let out the moisture. 
Whoever managed to put that glass eye on the bathroom window ledge had known my evening routine. They had obviously been watching me for long enough to work out the exact place to put something so that I'd see it. But it was their method that really creeped me out. The way they used the small, Teddy's eye to tell me in so many words that they were watching me. I swapped the note out I'd written for one that simply read, The police have been contacted. Leave me alone. And leave me alone they did. But the whole thing had a pretty serious effect on my psyche for a long time afterwards. Sometimes I'd find myself staring at someone in the coffee shop or someone walking past my flat, wondering if it was them. If one day one of them would look over and smile. And I'd just know. They'd not given up. Just yet. This happened a couple of days ago to me and my girlfriend. We were house-sitting for my girlfriend's dad. My girlfriend's dad lives in a rather large house in a suburban neighborhood, just outside one of the major cities in Denmark. What I'm trying to say here is that his neighborhood isn't exactly scary or dangerous by any means, which only meant that this gave us a bigger scare than it probably would have had it been in one of the more dangerous parts of town. After coming home from buying groceries and stocking up on necessity for our weekend stay at his house, we went to the living room to lie down and have some quality time for ourselves, which we hadn't had in a long time. Now before I go any further, just let me clarify the lay of the land here. This house had a rather large living room, and a floor-to-ceiling window at the end of the room. Outside this floor-to-ceiling window is a sensor-triggered light system. As we were lying there watching TV, I get this weird feeling that something is watching me. At first, I try and shake it off, like it's no big deal, thinking to myself it's probably just because I'm in a new house, where I don't yet feel entirely at home. But as I look to my girlfriend, I see too that she is quite shaken up about something. After a few minutes of silence, she then asked me if I have the same feeling as her, like someone was watching us. I try to play it off as nothing, and I tell her that I'll just go grab a cigarette and check to see if anyone's out there, just to make her feel safer. As I turn my head towards the floor-to-ceiling window, I notice that the lights are on. Now this shakes me to my very core, and I quickly decide not to go out for that cigarette. By this time, I feel my girlfriend's hand squeezing my arm. As I turn around to her, I see her pointing at one of the windows, and outside is a silhouette of a person. My blood freezes. In that moment, I turn around and quickly grab my phone, and as I turned back, the person had disappeared. I call my parents, as I know they were out at a friend's house not too far from where we were. My dad tells me to lock all of the doors and windows, and just sit tight and wait for them to arrive. A couple of minutes go by, and nothing happens, other than me trying to get my girlfriend to calm down as I know how this affects her blood sugar levels, and I would rather not have her have a seizure while a creeper or burglar or even a murderer is walking around outside the house. The silence is then broken by the sound of windows being tampered with. At this point, I'm trying really hard not to freak out and cause any further panic. But luckily, seconds later, I hear my dad pull up outside the house. My girlfriend and I have since discussed who it might have been, and we've come up with a few possible suspects, one of them being my girlfriend's crazy mother, who has a severe mental illness. The other more possible suspect would be just a simple burglar. I don't really care who it might have been. I'm just glad whoever it was didn't manage to break in. This past August, I picked up a lot of side jobs house-sitting, while working at a ranch that gave horseback riding lessons. The families were all very nice and it paid well. This past November, I was house-sitting for a family and watching their Labrador retriever named Maggie while they were on vacation. They lived in a very nice neighborhood on the outskirts of a small town. The house was on the far end of the neighborhood and thick trees flanked the backyard and a dirt road ran behind the trees. I accidentally went down the road the first time and tried to find the house but there wasn't much down there, just an abandoned house with lots of deer in the front yard, and a small run-down ranch house. The first night, everything was great, 
but the second night, not so much. I had this weird feeling a few hours before I went to bed, but I wrote it off as spending too much time reading creepy stories on Reddit. I made sure all the doors were locked, blinds were closed, and I went to bed just after midnight. But as I fell asleep, I still couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. Maggie usually sleeps with me, but that night she just followed me up the stairs and to the bedroom, and then just sulked back downstairs. At 2.26am, Maggie woke me up by standing next to the bed and whining. I had just let her out before I went to bed, and I was pretty sure she didn't have to go to the bathroom. I rolled over and hoped that she would stop, but she didn't. I gave in soon enough, and as I climbed out of bed, I realized that the house was freezing cold. I followed Maggie downstairs to the kitchen. All the doors to the house were weird. You can't open any of them from the inside or outside without a key. Not to mention this was a very heavy door, not the kind that just gets blown open by the wind. The only thing that eased my mind was that Maggie didn't seem ready to kill an intruder, and she'll usually at least bark at you. So I did a quick look around. I was too scared to do anything more. Nothing seemed out of place. The owners often left credit and debit cards, as well as wads of cash lying on the counters, and it was all there. If anyone was going to steal something, it was right next to the door, and easy pickings. But since nothing was missing, I tried to brush it off as just forgetting to lock the door. I made sure it was locked this time and went back to bed. Maggie still didn't want to sleep with me, and went back downstairs. Less than an hour later, she woke me up again. This time, I didn't question her. I crept back downstairs more cautiously than I had before. The back door was open again. This time, the key that had been sitting on the kitchen counter was in the lock. Someone had been in the house with me. The police were called. They looked all around the house but found no one. Everything of value was still in place, so I was really worried about the intentions of whoever broke in. The family was shocked that something like that happened and have since moved to a large farm 20 minutes away and now have video surveillance. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago when she was still in high school and I was in middle school. Our mom worked as a house cleaner and always became friends with everyone's home she would clean. One of the homes was owned by an older couple who had no kids but had a huge house and a really nice pool that they would always invite me and my siblings to come swim in. The husband worked as a COO of a large airline company and they lived in a very nice neighborhood on a large lot surrounded by forest. When you were in their backyard, you couldn't see the other houses at all. Just trees. It felt very secluded. Their house was very angular and architecturally interesting, with multiple levels made from stone. Pretty much every room had huge floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out, so it was always a bit unnerving to walk by them since you couldn't see what was out there. The couple also decorated with old Native American art and masks, which was a little creepy to a middle schooler, but the couple were very nice and not so creepy, so I never got too scared. They had an older golden retriever named Samson that lived up to his name, as he was massive but had a sweet and gentle temperament. They also recently rescued a husky mix named Sadie, who was the polar opposite, Psycho Sadie, as we so lovingly called her. She had intense separation anxiety, and she would destroy their house whenever they left her inside, jump their short fence if they left her outside, and if they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car and howl non-stop until they returned. So since they were wealthy and had extra money, they would pay for me or my sister to come over and dog sit while they went out. We got 20 bucks an hour, so we were always excited to go over there and watch cable and swim in their awesome pool. Normally everything would be fine, and both dogs would usually just lay around. But occasionally Sadie would realize that I was a stranger and go nuts and start barking at me, and I watched her eyes literally turn red. I was convinced that she was going to attack me, but she eventually calmed down after I got up from the couch and showed her how big I was. <laughs> not. But I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend, while the homeowners were out of town for two days. 
They were paying my sister to stay there over the weekend. And I stayed with her the first night. Because it was a big house and kind of scary to stay there all alone. We stayed up late watching movies and eating junk food. The next day we swam in their pool and hung out. But for some reason I didn't spend the night again. And I'm so glad I didn't. Because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on their treadmill. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge sliding glass door that opened to their patio and pool. She had the TV on in their workout room. As she was running and watching TV, she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever the door was opened. She stopped the treadmill and went to look around and saw that the sliding glass door was opened. Now this door was huge. There was no way it could have opened by itself. So she was instantly freaked. However, the dogs were just lying there in the workout room. And she figured that they would have gotten up to investigate if someone had come inside. And because Sadie was a bit crazy and hated strangers. She thought that she might have accidentally left the door open. And just imagine the beep of the alarm. And that it could have come from the TV or the treadmill. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out. A couple of minutes later, she had the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around, but no one was there. She finished her workout, but couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She decided just to go to bed, as she was becoming a little creeped out, and just wanted to forget about it. She went around and made sure all the doors were locked. The owners didn't give her the alarm code, so she couldn't set it. She took a shower and locked herself in the guest bedroom, with both dogs just in case, and eventually fell asleep. A couple hours later, she awoke with both dogs growling at the door of the room. Now, it was fairly normal for a psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never barked or shown any signs of aggression, so immediately my sister knew something was up. She was shaking and trying to convince herself that the dogs had just heard an animal and that it was nothing, but then she heard the dreadful door alarm beep. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming, and he told her to hang up and call the police, as he was on his way over. She called the cops, and my dad made the 15-minute drive in just under 5 minutes. When she opened the bedroom door to let my dad inside the house, the dogs took off running and barking through the house, and downstairs to the basement. My sister ran screaming all the way through the house to the front door, to let my dad in. He quickly took a look around the house with his gun but did not see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around the property. They found that the back gate was open, as well as the sliding glass door again, but not enough to let the dogs out. Just barely a jar, like it had been slammed shut and bounced back open a bit. They said it looked like someone had entered the home through the sliding glass door, because the lock was tampered with, but they determined that whoever it was hadn't stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs locked up, the police said that they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband received a death threat because of a decision that he made at his job that put a lot of people out of work. They had gone to the police about it but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because the husband lost his job. And if you ask me, he deserved it. I live in a town of about 11,000 in rural Wisconsin. Not by reference, but for a job. We are moving when I get a better one. I was on my way to my employer's house. He runs the company out of his basement until we get a new office space. I was being tailgated bad by a ratty blue car and a white bald guy. I drive a Kia Soul, which has a flat back end, so if I can't see your headlights, that means you're a mere few inches off my butt, and you will get me tapping my brakes. This guy did. He honked at me. Whatever. I flipped him off and slowed down to five miles under the speed limit. There wasn't anyone behind me, so I wasn't ruining anyone else's day. He had chances to pass me on the country road, but didn't. After a few minutes with no other cars around and him still kissing my bumper at 50 miles per hour, I grabbed my cell phone and pretended to turn around quickly and take a picture of him. Then I pretended to call 911. 
I was in the country with no other cars around and this guy was getting creepy. I came to my turn but decided to see if this guy would follow me. I turned left and he followed. Then I came to a roundabout and thought I would lose him. I traveled the entire thing around twice and he still followed me. At this point I knew he was messing with me, trying to scare me. Well, I decided to let myself be late for my meeting. I began to drive to the police station. He followed me the whole way there. I pulled up and parked, ready to run inside. I thought he would leave. Nope. He parked right next to me and just stared at me, and he pulled up on my side of the car close enough that I would have a hard time opening the door all the way. He was in his forties, I'm guessing, wearing sunglasses and a creepy smile. He was wearing fairly neat clothes, nothing scary there. The interior of the car was pristine. I was anticipating to see a gun. I should mention here that I'm training to be a behavior analyst and while I work with kids right now, my hobby is criminal behavior and profiling. I was seriously trying to read this guy. A few seconds went by and I grabbed my phone again, this time intent on calling 911 from the police station parking lot. As I dialed, he rolled his passenger window down, said nothing, rolled it back up and took off. I went inside and told an officer what happened. Sadly, I was too focused on not crashing to get a plate number. Apparently, there had been a lot of complaints about tailgaters recently, multiple with a blue car. I filled out a report with the officer, and they gave me a card for victim services in a local woman's shelter, just in case he followed me home one night and I didn't feel safe, but I live in a secure building with my fiancé. I went out to my car, and there was a note on the windshield. All it had on it was a smiley face serious horror movie stuff there. I took it back inside, the officer said he'd call me a few times during the night and I should avoid going anywhere alone for a while. He did call twice and said he was patrolling my parking lot during his night shift. This is a small town and the attitude around here is very communal, so I feel safe that someone will back me up. If I ever see this guy again, no question, I will call 911 and lead him straight to the police station again. I also told my fiancé that I will post my work schedule, or even when I have to leave for another reason, and that if I don't text him within 10 minutes of my estimated arrival, to call 911. This happened like 16 years ago. I was 12 then. I was in the summer camp of my Boy Scout troop, but with both boys and girls. As are all in Spain, scouting here is actually a quite liberal thing. One of the most important activities during the summer camp is what we called the raid, basically going out of the camp to adventurously trek for a couple of days. My friends and I plan an amazing route through a beautiful mountain range called the Pyrenees in the northeast of Spain. Three days walking, two nights sleeping out of the camp. My raid group consisted of 15 boys and girls, all between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. We took food with us, knew how to read a map, how to build shelter, how to search for water, and pretty much anything necessary to survive for a couple of days, so no adults were coming with us, and that doesn't happen anymore. Our plans for the first day were to climb a mountain that was just under 10,000 feet high and sleep by a glacial lake nearly on top of it. It was a long walk from our camp, about 15 miles and quite steep, so at about 1800 we decided we were going to not reach the lake at a prudent time. We found a nice place to build a shelter, did it, and then cooked some dinner. We were in the middle of a beautiful mountain, about six miles from the nearest road, and let's add another five kilometers more to the closest village. We couldn't have been happier. We still had nearly two hours until sunset when we finished our meal, so we thought it was a good idea to send a smaller group to clean dishes and refill water to a spring we had seen while walking. I volunteered to go, and three other friends joined. We got a couple of light torches too, just in case, and headed towards the fountain. Night came while we were on our way back to the shelter. We could hear the rest of the group singing and having fun in the distance. Suddenly one of my friends stopped and pointed at something just by the side of our trail. This wasn't here on our way down. I'm sure of it, he said. There was a light reflecting pole from the road, torn into pieces. We went from being happy and relaxed to being mildly scared in just a second and rushed all the way to where the rest of our friends were. We told them about our creepy finding right away. We were just kids, so fear escalated quite fast. Who could be hiding in the same mountain we were at? 
and why. Two of the older guys, and they were 14 years old, thought it would be a good idea to go and take a look around to try to calm us down. Although being without them was even scarier, we also appreciated it. They went away with a light torch, a knife, and a whistle, so we could hear from further apart if they were in trouble. We remained seated inside the shelter, which was nothing more than a couple of tarps held by sticks near a big boulder, silent and scared. I remember hearing quite a lot of sobbing around me. I was thinking I didn't want to die there. One of the girls suggested that we could sing to try and think of something else. Some disapproved because we might not hear the whistles, but we did anyway, although not very loud. We were like that for about 10 to 20 minutes. The whistle interrupted our song. We heard it clearly. Two whistles coming towards us at a really fast pace. I remember taking my knife from its sheath and keeping it in my hands. Luckily it was our friends. They arrived nervous and exhausted from the run. They said they stumbled upon a long standing stick with lots of blood all over it, more than what our nerves could stand. Most of us started crying, some prayed too. They told us they were going back to look for whatever was in the mountains with us and confront him. In case things go bad, we'll run somewhere else so we can't find you, one said. We asked them to stay, but nobody was able to move a finger to actually stop them from leaving. There was no more singing, only weeping and barely audible prayers. I just didn't want to die there. I wanted to see my family. After a while, we heard some noises, followed by the voices of our friends. They came back at a calm pace, with relief in their faces. It was all just a misunderstanding, one explained. It's just a park ranger. We found him and he explained to us that he was just walking around as part of his duty, said the other, and the bloody stick was just from a rabbit he had hunted for dinner. It was quite a relief, and we relaxed. Someone even spoke about taking out our sleeping bags and going to sleep, and that sounded wonderful. But it wasn't long until one of the older guys said he was a bit suspicious. You see, he wasn't wearing a uniform, he said, nor a badge or anything that could identify him as a ranger, answered another. And who walks kilometers away from the closest road, late at night, to hunt rabbits? Are there even rabbits in this altitude? Terror came back in a second. They were right. That story didn't make any sense. Let's go back there and freaking threaten him, one of the older guys said. We asked them to stay with us again and got the same results. Once they were gone, someone said that maybe he had followed them and now knew exactly where we were. We all shivered in panic. Nobody was paying the slightest attention to anyone else anymore. Nobody cried and nobody prayed. I remember I only had one thought in my mind. I'd rather kill than get killed in this terrible place. We waited seated, silent, and ready to fight for our lives. We all had our knives out and ready. Minutes passed, and suddenly we heard people running and approaching. We heard screams of terror. From the sound, it was obvious there were more than two people coming at us. I hadn't been more scared in my life. I hope I could say goodbye to my mom, my dad, and my sister. My knife was ready to stab whoever came close to me. We finally saw our two friends running for their lives, being followed by two men. They came just at the front of the opening of the shelter and stopped. The two men chasing them did the same, and we could see their faces. They were our camp leaders, who had been following us all the time, but hiding, and the four started laughing at us and asking if we were scared. It was just a joke, the entire time. Everyone started crying, and some even had trouble to grasp proper breaths due to anxiety for quite a while. We were all not amused. And only after a couple minutes, the funny four realized what they had done. They had taken 13 children to the point of holding a knife and being willing to kill with it. We obviously relaxed a lot, but our fears became anger. It had been a joke way out of proportion or the most basic of common sense. They spent quite a while saying how sorry they were, but we didn't care. We wanted them to leave us alone. But on the other hand, we were still too scared to sleep on our own, so we reluctantly accepted that they all came to sleep with us. It took them months to regain our trust again. It was the worst night of my life, no doubts. I've never had nightmares about it, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Now that I'm older, I always like to think of what would have happened if two guys had been there to kill us. We were children, sure, but armed and ready to defend ourselves if need be. I'm a journalist, so I can't help but think of some headlines. Two murderers stabbed to death in the mountains by 13 children. Things were a lot different back then. And the scouts, 
has definitely changed for the better. When I was in my early 20s, I had a friend with a psychotic alcoholic father. She didn't live with him, he lived in a remote little coastal town. Now and again we would go together to visit him and stay the night. My relationship with him was creepy in itself, but that isn't the subject now. One night, when we were visiting, my friend and her dad had a drunken blow-up and kicked us out of the house. It was about midnight. We had gotten the lift down and didn't have a car. My friend's dad lived about four kilometers out of town a huddle of two or three shops by way of a dirt road. We started walking down the dirt road to the town where there was a telephone booth. This was in the days before it was commonplace to have a mobile phone. I was going to call my folks who lived about an hour and a half away and see if they would come get us. The whole way to town, my friend was drunkenly moaning and crying about her broken relationship with her father, and she didn't let up by the time we got to the phone booth. We sat on the bench next to the phone while I woke my parents up. They agreed to come get us and I sat down on the bench for the long wait. Shortly after this, a van appeared and parked just behind the bench we were sitting on, maybe five meters away. There were two young men in the front seats and they were looking at us. If that didn't make me nervous enough, the van door slid open and I saw there were a number of young guys in the back. I don't remember how many, more than two. The place we were sitting was deserted. There were no houses nearby, just more road. No people, nowhere to run, no one driving by. It was a crappy little nowhere town. I stood up so I could see them better and kept my eyes fixed on the van full of men, acutely aware of our vulnerability. What I saw was that they were looking back at us. They were talking among themselves, quietly at first. Then they started talking more and more loudly. It became evident that they were deliberately talking loud enough for us to hear. They were talking about pulling us into the van, and taking us somewhere to have their way with us and kill us. I can't remember the exact words, but that was the gist of it. My whole body was not shaking, but quaking with terror. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. I remember the face of one of them so clearly, I could draw it now. He was just sitting in the door of the van, looking at me with no expression, looking at me with dead eyes, looking at me like I was a thing. At this time, my drunk friend hadn't stopped sobbing to herself. Whether she knew the van was there at all, I couldn't say. I knew I had to tell her about the danger, but I was actually so full of terror I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. That was when the most incredible thing happened. My friend's father, who has never apologized to anyone in his life, appeared, drunk, in his car. It's hard to describe how unlikely it was for him to do this. He could hold a grudge like no one you've ever met, and he was such a stubborn mule. He and my friend had an emotional reunion. The whole time my eyes were fixed on the van. The men had stopped talking and were just watching us. Let's go, I said. We got in the car and started heading for my friend's dad's house. The van started up and began to follow us. I tried to explain to my friend's dad about the men, but he said, I'll just slow down and they can pass. They slowed to a crawl behind us, and then they began to shout out of the windows, screaming threats. They followed us all the way down the dirt road and then all the way down the driveway of my friend's dad's house. They just sat in the van behind us and we sat in the car waiting to see what would happen. All of my friend's dad's neighbors were holiday homes and nobody was in that night. We knew that if the group of men decided to get out of the van and carry out those threats, we would get no help. After a very long time, the van backed out of the driveway and they left. My parents came in a panic to the house when they couldn't find us at the shops. My friend's dad hid in shame and I went back to my family's house. I've been asked if I went to the police, but I can't remember. I don't think I did. It was a messed up time in my life, but that incident changed me forever. I'm a very fearful person now and very overprotective of my kids, and I don't want to change because I'd rather be like this than accidentally trust one of the millions of psychos out there. In 2014, after hearing all of the horror stories, I wanted to check the deep web out myself. In a way, I kind of expected nothing other than scam sites for assassins, people requesting CP, and some underground markets. However, I prepared myself for the worst and, frankly, I was more worried about getting in trouble with the authorities 
rather than having my mind bleached for the near future. Even after two to three hours of procrastination, nothing prepared me for what I saw. It was during the middle of the day when I began my search. Of course, there's no deep web Google or anything, but rather a wiki with a lot of links. The links are different than the links you may know of. These links have no way of knowing what lays behind them. Just numbers and a dot onion at the end. Of course, unless previously defined and listed on the wiki page. It was boring at first. A lot of dead sites, more than expected eBay style markets for weapons, military grade mind you, various services and of course a lot of drugs. I came across a chat room where I saw a darker side of people I never thought was possible. So many people that were mentally ill, threatening others, requesting CP. It was truly disgusting. Think of the people who walked down dark streets of a bad neighborhood, but with anything they desired at their fingertips. Two hours later, I came across one site that ended my little adventure in the wastes of human consciousness. A cult site, perhaps with little info other than an email address and some religious mumbo-jumbo. However, there was a video embedded in the site's homepage. Like a naive child, I clicked it without a care in the world. The video was shot on a crappy video camera. Perhaps it was shot in the early to mid-2000s. It was a man with a mask and a knife. As quickly as that scene showed up, another presented itself. He was cutting something in a similar fashion to a butcher. It was then and there I realized the body was bipedal and without fur. It was a human being. He was cutting the legs at the buttocks level. A new scene shows the decapitation of the head. Then another shot of the man with the mask, followed by a picture of a church with a weird symbol. This was a cult recruiting website. It was followed by more bodies being cut up and hung in ways more gruesome than you may expect. Shortly after, I turned my computer off and I stayed away from it for quite some time. This was my first and last visit to the deep web. I have never contemplated going back since. Number three. This was back before Google. Web pages were, for the most part, still very basic HTML and JavaScript. Hardly anyone used CSS. Only discussion boards and some banking sites had anything approaching mature front-end, back-end combinations. This is a real deep web story, not just one about illicit activities online. I was browsing random blogs, GeoCity sites and the like, just going from link to link. Eventually I came upon an odd page. It appeared to be random thoughts from different people, but for the time it was very well designed. Eventually I came upon an odd page. It appeared to be random thoughts from different people, but for the time it was very well designed. The messages seemed to be cryptic in nature, like several people trying to pass secret notes. I started through the source and hidden in the comments of a JavaScript were various IP addresses. I gathered all the IPs in a text file and began enumerating. Some were routers with banner messages I could tell net to, almost all at universities. The default Cisco credentials from back in the day worked on most of them, but I didn't poke around. A few of the IPs were web servers with little to nothing on them, mostly APAC on Linux or some BSD, at least one IIS server I can recall. I finally came up on a web server with a huge directory of HTML files and TIFF images, with a few smaller subdirectories containing the same. NSLOOKUP returned no reverse records for the IP. A visual route traced it as far as Colorado. The HTML files appeared to be records a psychologist or similar mental health professional would keep. The images were of faxes, apparently of both military and medical nature. As I browsed from a subdirectory back to the parent, at the top was a new HTML file named something like one hello there.html. The timestamp was from 
right that minute. I opened it and in plain text was the message, we see you. No quotes, all lowercase. About 15 seconds later, the server dropped. I didn't have a great childhood. I'm not one to complain about it. My parents did the best they could, but we ended up living in some pretty terrible places with not so nice families. Then right around the time I started secondary school, the kids I was hanging out with at the time started smoking cigarettes. Yeah, they were like 11 or 12 and they were smoking. Not just taking performative puffs on sticks either, I mean full on smoking like troopers. And being the divvy that I am, I joined them on more than one occasion and they basically taught me to smoke out by this old World War II pillbox. Then one time, we all go out to the pillbox and this kid gives us all a ciggy from the pack he'd stolen from his mom. I thought he was being a bit generous, but I wasn't one to complain. I just didn't think I could finish off a whole cigarette on my own since just a few drags on one had me feeling pretty woozy the previous few times. But I figured, a few tokes, I can peg it out, smoke the rest of it later. The next thing that had me kind of suspicious was how weirdly loose the cigarette seemed, almost like it had been tampered with somehow. Now, I know, I know, huge alarm bells are going off in the head of every right-minded person listening, but honestly, at like 11 years old, I couldn't even imagine what it might have been tampered with. I was really naive. I didn't know what Hash or Mary were. I didn't know about anything other than Siggies and beers. So I'm looking at this Siggy and then I look up at the lad who gave it to me and I remember asking, have you, ever, have you done anything to this Siggy? He says no. I say okay, then light up and start puffing. Immediately I start coughing, but my friend reassures me that it's just the last one in the pack. I'll never forget that. He said it like it was totally normal to have one loose, scrabby Siggy in the pack like it was tradition or something. So I tried a few more puffs, but started coughing again. So I gave up on trying to smoke it, tossed it away, then asked for some of my friends. I know something was definitely going on when he seemed annoyed that I'd thrown away my Siggy, and just when I was trying to work out what he might have done to it, I started feeling very, very funny indeed. Everything started to tingle. My eyes felt all puffy and my vision started to ferris wheel with each eye going in the opposite direction. I tried to talk but words just wouldn't come out and my tongue felt like it was swelling up in my mouth and suddenly I just got so thirsty I could barely think about anything else. Then no matter how many deep breaths I took, I just couldn't seem to get enough air and suddenly I found myself lying in the grass. Like I literally couldn't walk. I had no idea what was going on and when I started begging my friends to help me, they looked terrified and just ran away like I was dying or something. I can't stress this enough. I really did think I was about to die, even when my dad rushed onto the scene to take me back home. My so-called friends had been decent enough to run and get them, but all they said is, Pete's feeling sick and Pete fell down. Just a vague idea of what was actually going on. So, my dad's scared and I'm so terrified I'm just in tears. When he picks me up, goes to run off and stops. I remember how he sniffed my clothes and hair all studiously for a moment and I almost started to get aggressive with him because I remember I was so frustrated that we stopped moving. It was a weird experience because I felt like I was in some strange euphoric dream state and I really felt like if we stopped, I was going to get very angry. It was such a weird experience. And it was at that moment that he rushed me to the hospital. And it was the subsequent time that I spent in the ER that my parents found out and later revealed to me that the kid had actually dipped the cigarette in some sort of formaldehyde embalming fluid and essentially given me some form of PCP. Which for those that don't know, in some instances can make someone act with schizophrenic-like side effects. My parents said the doctor said I was really lucky that I didn't continue to smoke as it may have had even more serious side effects, even though, as time went on, I still felt very on edge in my time at the hospital and after the time I got out. My dad told me it freaked my mom out so much that all she wanted to know was how a kid my age had gotten his hands on that stuff, and I was forced to tell them about my friend, in which case the police visited his house, forcing his hand to reveal that he'd seen his younger uncle 
that lived with him using that stuff prior. I don't know what became of that kid and his family as I'm not sure if my parents had continued to press charges or how everything with them actually transpired, but the whole thing had just been apparently one horrible prank in the kid's mind, and although I'm not entirely sure if it was out of malice or some spirit of experimentation, that little prank amounted to one of the scariest memories of my entire childhood. I grew up in this super middle class area of my hometown. All townhouses and nice restaurants, but it bordered some really rough neighborhoods. All thanks to the school zoning, a lot of my high school friends lived in the nearby projects, so I'd go over there to hang out after school and on weekends. We had our little group of friends, but we were familiar and friendly with a few of the other crews that were into some considerably naughtier things than us. For example, there was this guy, Mike, and... Although we didn't hang out much, we always stopped to say hi to him and his boys if we ever saw them in the streets. But like I said, we rarely hung out with them because, for fun, they liked to steal cars. It might sound crazy when I say it wasn't malicious, but it's kind of true. Mike and his crew would, like, steal a car, burn rubber for a while, then park it right back where they had found it before the owner even knew it was gone. I remember one time hearing about how they felt so guilty about stealing one lady's car that they parked it up where they found it, but not before they topped off the gas tank to replace what they burned. They were crazy like that, but they weren't bad guys, and besides, we were just dumb teenagers at the time, so we thought that it was just cool to do. Anyways, it's summer break after our freshman year of high school, and me and my boys are just wandering around, acting like fools, but otherwise keeping out of trouble. I remember one of us had managed to use the fluff of his top lip to trick some old gas station attendant into selling him a pack of Marlboro, so we were headed down to this piece of scrubland we knew about to smoke up. About five minutes away, we started smelling smoke from somewhere, but like, black smoke. So we're all like, uh-oh, whose apartment is on fire? But we keep walking, seeing nowhere on fire, so... We just get more and more curious as to where the fire's coming from. Then, we see two of Mike's boys just tearing it across some yards, sprinting as fast their little legs could carry them. We shout over to them, and although they look over, they don't stop. They don't look happy to see us like they usually would. They just keep running. So immediately, we're like, Oh God, what hood rat stuff have they been up to? And it wasn't long before we put two and two together and figured out that the fire might well be something they did. Then right as we get to the desolate plot of land we'd been planning on going to, we see it, just this ball of flames under a brick wall. Then when we get closer, we realize the fireball is actually a burning car. We were pretty shocked. I'd never heard of them doing anything like that before. It was always illegal but relatively harmless fun. Why set a car on fire when they could have just returned it like they normally did. You think they crashed it? I remember someone asking, but no one could be sure. We just waited and watched as the fire department showed up to put out the fire, closely followed by the cops. I remember th we thought about running, but how it was pointless. It would just make us look guilty. Eventually, when the fire was out, the cops walked over and we just front as best we can, telling them we don't know anything about the car or those that set it on fire. I think the cop knew we were lying. I suppose you just get good at picking up on them when you hear so many because he just acted like we were withholding information, telling us that we'd be in a lot of trouble if we were protecting the guilty party, and we just shrug it off. It wasn't like it was the first time we lied to the cops. It wasn't even the first time we'd lied for Mike and his crew. But then out of nowhere, the other cop comes over to see how it's going and his partner's like, these kids know something all right. They're just tight-lipped. Then when the other guy responded, our response told them all they needed to know. Don't want to snitch, huh? The other cop said. Well, as long as they can sleep at night, because whoever's kid is burnt to a crisp in that thing isn't going to be sleeping for quite a while. I remember the sinking feeling I felt in that moment, how the color must have drained from my face because I could feel it leave my face. 
One of Mike's boys had been in the car when it caught fire. The other two just ran when they found that they couldn't pull him out. Then get this. We came to find out that the kid who burned to death in the car was Mike himself. He'd been the driver and the front end of the car had basically pancaked when he'd apparently deliberately crashed it into a wall. What he did that for, I don't know. Maybe he was high or something, but either way, his legs got trapped. The car caught fire and he burned to death. I guess his boys were just so scared and shook up that they just ran. And Jesus, thinking about it later, I realized that if he was conscious when they were trying to free him and he started burning before he passed out from the smoke, those guys would have heard him screaming as he burned. It was a whole thing, man, all up in the news for weeks after. Mike's boys turned themselves in after a while and I think they were so messed up that they just couldn't live with themselves ended up getting suspended sentences when they spilled their guts about how Mike was driving and how he was acting crazy. I don't know how true that is, I mean, it sounds true, but I don't know. I guess I'm just trying to say how Mike didn't deserve to die like that. And if I had to label one memory from my childhood as being the worst or most traumatic, it was watching that car burn, not knowing one of our friends was burning in it. September 2010, my boyfriend Dave, his best friend Tony, and my best friend Liz and I were all coming back to our hometown for our final year of college after spending the summer in London. We had a fantastic time, staying in my uncle's apartment, partying, and exploring such a big city. It was great. We stopped at a bed and breakfast that night about half of the way home and were planning to get home at about 6pm. We all woke up early, about 4, maybe 5, ready to set off again when we discovered that someone had obviously driven too close to our car and broke the right wing mirror off. Seeing as this was my dad's birthday present to me, and I had it barely two months, I was absolutely fuming. We asked the landlady where we could possibly find spares or something to use for the time being. She said she had driven past a makeshift scrapyard or something a while back. She wasn't sure if it was still there, but she drew us a rough map and we got back on the road. I wasn't very sure if she was right about her directions because the closer we got to the area she circled it in, the more desolate the surroundings were. The roads got more difficult and had gone from stone to dirt. Around us there weren't any farms anymore, just long weedy grass and patches of forest. It had basically become a moor. We were about to head off because of the wild animals, and I just have to get over being a paranoid driver and deal without my wing mirror when surely enough my boyfriend pointed out in front to a handwritten sign directing us two miles down the road to Cafe and Car Spares. We drove down into a little cove surrounded by forests and all got out, except for my friend Liz who was asleep in the back seat. There was a tiny cream hut with cafe spray painted on the roof, a caravan, and a hill of metal and bits of cars. As to be expected, we were the only visitors parked up in front. The sun was up, but no lights or people were around. I guess they were still sleeping. It was still about six anyway. We all walked up to the scrap pile and I had to fumble through it, looking for a wing mirror or any sort of mirror that could do for the time being until I could get it repaired. Tony picked up what could only be at least a decade old mirror and suggested we just take it and go. But me, being stupid and sincere, insisted I have to go give them some money for it. I can't just take it and go. I knocked on the door and waited. A big, hard-faced man answered the door and at first looked angry and tired, then smiled at me a two-toothed smile. He leered at me for a few seconds, then, seeing the boys approach, asked us what we wanted. Tony handed him the mirror and asked how much for it. He said nothing, just to get to know us, to which I thought fair enough. Two more men then left the patio door on the other side. They turned and smiled both skinheads with teeth like meth addicts, and came over. They stank. He gave them the mirror and told them to go attach it to our car. He then introduced himself as Ian, sat us down on the patio chairs, and offered us some sandwiches. I politely declined, but he insisted we must be hungry, and told me to come in, that women are best at making sandwiches. I declined again, finding him a little bit sexist at this point, and when he asked again, Dave, more sternly, reinforced that I said I don't want to come in. 
Ian muttered something and then came and sat on the chairs with us. It became awkward very quickly as he started asking questions. It started off innocently, like asking us how old we were, where we were from, and then became a little more uncomfortable. He asked if I had a boyfriend, to which Dave answered, and then started asking us both what we liked to do to each other, private stuff like that to which we didn't answer. We sat in silence until we heard Liz scream. When we turned around, I saw one of the men meant to be fixing the mirror with his hand in the back window grasping Liz's leg. The other was looking around nervously behind the car. We got up immediately and sprinted off the patio, Tony running after the guys, but they both headed into the forest. Liz was hysterical. She'd woken up to find herself on her own in the car and a man's hand running up her leg. I can't even imagine how terrifying that must have felt. I got into the back seat with her and consoled her while Dave came around the other side to get in and told us some nails were on the floor. We looked over and there were about 12 of them arranged around the tire, like the guy was ready to pop them. I couldn't really think why at the time, but now I wonder where they got all those car parts. We decided it was enough. We didn't want to spend any more time there, mirror or no mirror, and were ready to go when Tony was the last to get in the car. He closed the back seat door, and as we looked back and saw Ian re-emerge from the house with something long in his hands, running towards us. My vision adjusted when he got a bit closer, and then I realized he was holding a rifle. A hunting rifle. At that point, I actually burst into tears and hit the engine, slamming on the accelerator as hard as possible. The car started to go, and we got up to about 90, forgetting the dirt roads and just driving over whatever until that scrapyard was out of sight. We didn't stop looking behind us until we were safely on the motorway getting home. To this day, whenever I go to London, I take a train instead. I'm still terrified I'll meet them again. When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them when you were available, and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks where you would do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it covered roughly the same landmass as the state of Maryland, USA, about nine hours from Sydney City and the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot and the work was hard. So one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a water hole on the farm about a 25 minute drive north. I was keen for a swim but the other guys just wanted to relax for the afternoon. So him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes however he suddenly perked up and jabbed me in the ribs. You see that over there, beneath the two dead trees? I should mention here that if you're not familiar with inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer we realized it was a huge blue shipping container just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed, and I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about five weeks before, and he wanted to go and see what it was. Initially, we pulled to a stop about a hundred meters away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood, given it was his property, but in truth, I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. 
There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side, all motion activated so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all this security, someone obviously doesn't want us here, let's just go. He brushed me off, however, reminded me it was his farm, and whoever had put this here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on the huge door. He had bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high, and plastic storage boxes scattered around the far wall, and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desk to see if the computers could give us any idea of what was going on here. My heart was racing and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by CCTV so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy on the other hand was adamant we had to get to the bottom of this so I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while but in short neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my lay position is that it was endless lists of computer talk. It was like how the old Napster or LimeWire download screens look like, just constantly picking up and receiving data, then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then I was pretty sure no one else was there, as there was nowhere to hide really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided, against my better judgment, to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief sift through this box still makes me feel sick to my stomach. It didn't take me long to realize that this box was full of posters, DVDs and photos, all of explicit and hardcore child X-rated material. One thing that still gets to me is that it was all neatly ordered into folders and small boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, Mate, get out. Dude, child, what? Just get get out of here, dude. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception. We hadn't bought the satellite phone, so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour from the town closest to the farm, as I mentioned, very remote. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen, until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open, and there was fire inside. We had only two small extinguishers in the cars, and they did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, which, by that stage, most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described, and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property, and the landmass was huge, and there was no real way to tail them. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to our poor explanation of the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by that time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still there on the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget... 
what I saw in those boxes. Snapchat was still pretty new when this story took place. It was sometime in late 2011. During my freshman year of high school, I had one really close friend. Her name was Samantha. Samantha told me one Friday before the weekend that she would ask for a friend request the next day. She thought it would be really cool if we bandwagoned on the Snapchat trend. The sooner the better, because Snapchat was almost non-existent at our school. And when I got home that day, I got a friend request. The profile picture was of Samantha. This was odd because she told me that she would invite me to her contacts the next day. Without hesitating, I accepted it. I figured she just got to it sooner. After I finished my homework the same day, I got a message from that account. Two messages, in fact. They said, come to my house tomorrow, we can have a party. And the second was her address. I was really happy as I never went to her house before. We had just met earlier that year. And besides that, I wasn't often invited to parties. The address she gave me was to a house nearby, so I decided to walk over the next day. When I actually saw the house, I checked Google Maps multiple times to make sure I was led to the right destination because this place was very messy and the windows were covered in those thank you bags you get at markets. Something didn't seem right. It was very modest for Samantha's family, yet we attended a private school. I realized the address was correct, so I knocked on the door, although I was a bit hesitant. It opened very quickly and a man greeted me, almost like he was expecting me. He was about six foot three with blonde hair. He really didn't look anything like Samantha, who was a short, black-haired girl. I asked if they were related. He simply said, yes. It was in a very plain and odd voice. Then I asked him about the bags in the windows, and he said it was because construction workers were still renovating the house. Before I could ask or say anything else, he beckoned me inside, moving aside so I could go through the doorway. I entered the small house. Sitting near a frayed couch was a large terrier, which he said they just bought a few days before I arrived. He told me to sit down while he went to get something. I checked the time on my phone, but the moment I grabbed it, it vibrated with a message. It was a notification from Snapchat. It was Samantha. It said, here is my Snapchat. And I thought things couldn't get weirder. She'd already sent me a request. Did she make another profile? Why would she do that? So immediately, as confused as I was, I messaged her back. Your house is so weird. Where are you? I said. House, she asked. I have an apartment. My heart sank in my chest. Surely she was pulling my leg, just making a joke on me or something, I thought. That's not funny, I messaged back. Your dad's home, where are you? She didn't answer for a few seconds. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I got an answer. An answer that confirmed everything. What are you talking about, it said. My mom's been single for a while. I'm waiting for you by the door. Where are you? I lower my phone, eyes wide and breathing funny. What do I do? Did I really just walk into a stranger's house? A stranger that had laid bait for me. That's when I hear whispering from another room. The man stepped out of the room with two other men. One was holding a thick black bag with his hands, fully assuming the worst. I sprinted out of the house as fast as I could. Not once did I look back, even as I heard the footsteps behind me. Eventually, they faded away. I didn't stop running until I got back home, until I was inside the house with the doors locked. Once I finally got a breather, my chest never burned so bad before. My mom and dad looked worried when they saw me and they needed an explanation. In between breaths, I tried to tell them. They got the gist of it and they called the police. When the police got there, they were gone. That house had been abandoned. There should have been no one living there. Three weeks ago, someone added me on Snapchat called Addergreen. I thought nothing of it at first, but 
Then a few days later I got a bus to the gym since I couldn't be bothered to walk. It's four miles away so it's alright to take the bus. Sitting at the front with my headphones in listening to music to make the journey that less bit boring. From the bus stop to the gym I was messing around on my phone when I noticed I had a snapchat from Adder Green. It was only on for a few seconds, but the snapchat was a picture of me sitting on the bus. No text, just me. It was taken from a few seats behind and shown the back of my head and some of my hoodie. I instantly knew it was me, and I felt my stomach drop. I bombarded them with snapchats. They were opening my snapchats, but not responding. They got more aggressive because I was getting more and more pissed off. For example, who is this? Who are you? Answer me. For fuck's sake, just reply. You get the drift. After about a week, I got nothing, so gave up and thought one of my friends was being a dick. Then Snapchat number two. Didn't screenshot this one either. I know, I know I'm a moron, but I was drunk. Me and some mates were in a club in my local town, and this time someone Snapchatted to me a photo of myself at the bar. They were literally standing right next to me at the bar. I opened it the next morning and felt sick. Again, it was only for a few seconds. My friends were next to me in the photo so that eliminated the possibility of it being one of them fucking with me. About 30 minutes ago, I got another snapchat. This time I was ready and sober enough to take a screenshot. I'd been indoors all day, I was curious what it was. That is my house, my bedroom window and my name. I received this as I was lying next to my window on my bed watching Game of Thrones. I feel sick. Their Snapchat stories are equally as fucked up. Update number one. I sent them a snap saying, are you fucking serious? And they screenshotted it and ignored me. Update number two. Got another brick wall Snapchat. Only on for literally a second though. Date number three. Fuck. Lying in bed watching Game of Thrones and I just got this. I'm fucking done. Update number four. Today I got a Snapchat of that brick wall again. Update number five. Just got a Snapchat video of weird as fuck noises and a black screen. It's in their stories too. Don't think I can post Snapchat videos though. Update number 6. It's been quiet for a few days. Sent Adagreen Snapchats, but they're unopened. Who is this shithead? And what does he want with me? This happened last year when I was 14. There's this dating app for teenagers. I used it as more of a joke. It was connected to Snapchat, so whenever you matched with someone, you would add them to Snapchat so you could continue talking to your match. As I said, at first I was using it as a joke, but then I matched with this really good looking guy and I thought, well, would it hurt to try? So I accepted his request to be my friend on Snapchat. I sent a shy hi to him and waited for a response. It took him about two hours to respond and the only thing he sent was a blank black picture. I didn't think too much of it, and I continued on with my day. But the next day I get a message from him, a picture of a very familiar thing, my school. It was only a little jarring, but I figured he probably went to the same school and we had just never met. Then my phone began to vibrate like crazy during a class. To give a little perspective, we have glass doors and windows. They look out into the corridors during class, and when I checked my phone, I saw maybe 15 pictures sent to me from the same guy. They were pictures of me sitting at my desk in the classroom. The pictures kept coming. They seemed to have been taken from outside that window next to the door. When I looked over, I saw someone standing there just outside that window. He had a phone in his hand and he was pointing at me. Whoever it was was wearing a black hoodie the hood covered half of his face and the other half was pale and he had a sharp jawline. I could see thin lips curved into a grin and I saw my friend. She was looking at him too and her face turned red and she began to shake. 
we were the only ones who saw them because as fast as we tried to say something, the figure was gone. My friend stood up from her chair and went to the door to open it. It caught my teacher's attention and we had to explain what we were doing. We had to tell them what we saw. My teacher went out herself to look for whoever this was and then she even told the office. They let out a message over the speakers telling everyone to look out for this man. Ever since then, I haven't used Snapchat. It was one of the apps I used all the time before. It still creeps me out, though it may have been a joke and it must have been someone who knew me from before, but it was still horrifying. It had made me a lot more paranoid about strangers on the internet. When I was 14, my high school thought it would be a good idea to take a bunch of us New York City kids into the Catskills for a day. The idea was to introduce us to nature since some of us had spent our entire lives living in the concrete jungle that is New York City. Seriously, a lot of us had only ever seen forests and farms on the TV or in movies and now that I'm older, I realize how potentially damaging that is. I honestly feel like human beings are supposed to be in contact with nature that it makes us happier, healthier, and gives us a sense of place. But I'll quit my rambling and get on with the story. So one super early morning, we load onto our school bus for the drive out into the Catskills. This is in like November too, so it was still dark when I got up and the sun had barely risen when the driver got us on the road. I was excited at the time. I had aspirations to be in the military and the idea of getting to wander around the woods was such a cool concept to me at the time. In the end, it actually turned out to be pretty boring and really tiring. We walked for hours and hours with our teacher telling us about different kinds of trees, animals, and weather systems that the area was home to. But we didn't even really get to see any of those animals aside from the odd squirrel that was squirreling away nuts. It turns out some of them don't hibernate at all, unlike a lot of woodland creatures. Like I said, it was all much more boring than I first thought. That was right up until I saw something carved into a tree. It was carved in really deep, obviously with some kind of knife or something, right through the bark and into the wood. I'd never seen anything like it before, and it wasn't like I wasn't a smart kid. I used to read about different religions and occult stuff quite a lot, so I was pretty confused as to what it was. To describe it, it looked like a rough figure eight, but with like dots and lines carved around it in certain places, so that it kind of looked like an octopus, only not at all at the same time. I know that makes literally zero sense, and I wish this was when camera phones were a thing, because I'd probably still have the pictures with me to link people to. Out of curiosity, I call my teacher over and ask her if she recognized it. She gives the thing pretty much the same look as I figured I had, just having no idea what she's looking at, then obviously tells me no, that she's never seen anything like it before. But that in all likelihood, it's something a hunter carved into the trees so they wouldn't get lost. I had not really heard of anyone doing that before, but I kind of figured she knew best, so I dropped the whole thing and just followed the group as we walked on. After a little while, we ended up walking right to the edge of a cliff face near a mountain. It was this huge wall of rock that just seemed to rise up out of the earth, covered in moss and stuff. Our teacher starts pointing at the rock and telling us how we can tell how old it is by the different kinds of rock that the thing was made up of, but few of us were really listening. I only really started paying attention myself as we walked along the cliff face and I saw something familiar on it, something big too. It was the same symbol we'd seen carved into the tree, only like I said, this one was much, much bigger. Again, I showed our teacher, only this time, she didn't seem so calmly curious, and she seemed as freaked out as I did. Not only that, but the entire class saw it this time, but with it being the first time seeing it, they weren't nearly as scared, just the same curious I was. I asked the teacher quietly who might carve something like that into the rock, who might have the time or the skills or the equipment. She just told me she didn't know but not to mention the ones that we'd seen carved into the trees. Plural. She used the plural, and it honestly scared me more than it should have. I'd only seen the one carved into the tree, but 
she'd obviously seen a lot more than I had. I just found myself hoping we'd be heading back soon. It was early afternoon by that time and I wondered just how scary the woods would be after dark. Thankfully, I started heading back towards the bus not long after eating lunch. A little while into our walk, one kid stops the teacher and tells her he needs to go to the bathroom. It wasn't an ideal situation by any means, but with the kid being a dude, it was pretty easy to remedy. Teacher just tells him to go into the bushes nearby and deal with it, so he does. A few minutes later, we hear him tearing through the bushes back towards us, panting as he ran. He emerges with this terrified look in his eyes, like I've never seen anyone so scared before, not in real life. The teacher runs over and starts asking him what the deal is, but he can hardly get his words out. He just keeps breathing real fast, in and out, like rocking back and forth on the spot like he was losing his mind. The teacher is telling him to breathe, calm down and focus, and tell us what he saw. What he said shook our group to the core. There was a man, a real old man, or not so old, he had white hair and a beard and... And he, he didn't have any clothes on, but he w was covered in, like, tattoos. Oh, my God. Oh, God, what if he saw me? What if he's following us? The teacher had to quiet the kid before a full-blown panic attack took over the group, and we hurried back to the bus without stopping to look at anything at all. Nothing else happened on the walk back to the bus, but thank God but I remember being really curious as to what the kid thought he saw when he went to the bathroom. And I foolishly asked. He told me exactly the same thing, only went into a little more detail about the tattoos and stuff. I asked him if he remembered what they looked like to draw one of them if he could. He took out a notebook and pen, closed his eyes for a moment so he could really recall, then he drew something rough that I couldn't quite make out at first, but when he showed it, it was clear. It was a bunch of dots and lines, with a clear figure eight in the middle. For a good few years, I was a teacher at Lansdowne Middle School in Victoria, British Columbia. I loved my job. Teaching wasn't something I'd never really seen myself doing. It certainly wasn't a career I'd talked about with high school guidance counselors. I kind of fell into it by accident. Long story short, I couldn't get into the college I wanted to, so I had to basically choose between that and nursing, so I chose the one with less blood and guts involved. Every year we take a bunch of grade 8 students up to a place called Camp Barnard at Otter Point, just west of Souk. It's a scout camp built on land gifted by Senator George Henry Barnard, who was a prominent advocate of hunting and outdoor activities in general. There are a lot of fun things for the kids to get up to up at the camp. There's a playing field, a nature trail, a swimming pool, a lake for canoeing and paddleboarding, even an archery range and disc golf course. The kids absolutely adore heading up there for a few days, and there's always a palpable feeling of excitement every year in the run-up to the field trip up there. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't look forward to it too. That kind of stuff really brings out the big kid in me, you know? It was the last week of the school year when we piled onto a bus and drove over to the camp to begin our few days of fun. The weather is normally pretty peachy during that time of year, but last year there were some unusually strong winds blowing through the camp. This was very disappointing, as it meant that some of the activities would be totally out of the question. You can't play disc golf when the winds can effectively blow your disc right off the entire course, and neither can you paddleboard when your board keeps getting flipped over by choppy waters. That only really left a handful of activities open to the kids, one of which was archery, the other was orienteering. I'll be honest, I was excited to try archery again. I'd tried it the year before the first time, and I'd actually fought to get assigned to it again since I'd just found the whole thing so cool. I had my reservations about the wind, but they were purely minor concerns about it affecting the kid's accuracy. It'd really suck if a few of the more talented archers were unable to nail a bullseye or two thanks to the winds, but these were thin polycarbon projectiles. I doubted the wind would have any serious effect on them. 
but it wasn't the wind I had to worry about. You see, we had this one kid with us who was a real klutz. They sucked at sports, always seemed to be that kid who ended up in the nurse's office from falling in the schoolyard. Everybody knows a kid like that, right? And this was our clumsy kid. So the kid, who I won't name to protect their future reputations, steps up to the firing line with their bow and arrow in hand, fires off a couple of terrible shots, but I'm quick to offer encouragement. The instructor even takes a little more time to show him the correct stance, how to stand just right so that the arrow flies straight and true towards its target. But when the kid tries to imitate the instructor, he takes up the goofiest pose I think I'd ever seen. Body turn sideways, legs spread way too far apart, and they even instinctually squatted down as if to try to lower their center of gravity, as if that was going to help in the slightest. Then, just before they're about to shoot off another arrow, this huge, and I mean huge, gust of wind starts tearing its way through the camp, and I watched in horror as the kid began to sway, falling backwards and shooting his arrow way off target. The instructor kept his cool, managed to keep the kids from freaking out, but immediately shot me a look as if to say, time to call it a day. Next came the orienteering, about the only truly safe thing to do during this kind of weather. At least, that's what I thought anyway. Sure, the maps were flapping away in our hands as we tried to navigate our way around the course, but it was still pretty fun despite the weather. Fun, right up until I heard a crashing sound coming from just over a rise. The kids I was supervising looked around in confusion, their eyes full of fear as they wondered aloud what the sound was. I told them I wasn't sure, and we'd have to wait to check it out once the course had been completed. But that was a lie. I knew. I knew well what it was. I'd heard it before. It was the sound of a tree falling in the woods. It's frankly unmistakable. A deep, wrenching sound, then the clacking of the lumber hitting other upright trees before the final crash as it hits the dirt. I had this horrible feeling in my gut. There were kids all over the area, all taking part in the orienteering exercise in small groups, each overseen by a member of the camp or teaching staff, and it was probably the worst moment of my life so far to realize that my worst fears had come true. I saw a kid bounding over the rise, his eyes, these big, white circles beaming out from his terrified face. I called after him, trying to get him to tell me what had just happened, and he didn't say anything. He just sprinted back towards camp as fast as his little legs could carry him. I tried to keep the kids from worrying too much, but they couldn't concentrate on the task at hand. They seemed to know something was horribly wrong, just as clearly as I did. So, after a few more minutes of trying to control the situation, I just walked us all back to camp to try to get them settled in their bunks. I'll just cut to the chase at this point. The fallen tree had landed right on one of the kids, who I won't name to protect their family. And, believe it or not, he was dead just moments later from massive chest trauma and asphyxiation. The school district's critical incident response team was deployed on the Wednesday afternoon to support students, staff, and families. But with the yearly graduation ceremony that was only a week away, it was completely ruined for a lot of families, and even those that attended felt a sense of pervading sorrow and loss. And as for me, I've never really gotten over the fact that such horrifically random tragedies can occur to completely innocent children. I took advantage of the free counseling services provided by the school district, but they just didn't seem to help. I found myself looking at kids, wondering what completely random accident would take their lives before they even blossomed into fully grown adults. This happened when I was in the fifth grade. I was in a science class and one day we all took a field trip to a science museum. It had a bunch of exhibits and things like that. I really wasn't much of a science fan, but I will admit that I always liked going to the museum because it was pretty fun. We left school and drove down to the museum which was about 30 minutes away. Once we got there, we did the usual stuff. We were able to kind of split up as a group as long as we made it back. I went with a few of my friends in the class from one spot to another. 
Eventually, it was time to get lunch, and then we would leave shortly after that. Our teacher went around letting everyone know we would be leaving in 10 minutes and to meet back at the entrance. I had seen everything I was going to see, so I decided to just go back and get on the bus. That, that way I could play some games on my phone until we were going to leave. I left the building into the back parking lot where our bus had dropped us off. I got out there and saw a couple of buses. I started to walk over and saw the bus driver wave me over to him. I got on the bus, but as I did, the bus driver stopped me. He told me there would be no phones on the way back. I was pretty upset to hear this, and I didn't understand why, but I gave him my phone and then sat down. The bus driver then started the engine. I looked out the window and tried to think of why we weren't allowed to have our phones. Sure, sometimes the kids would get out of control with them, but I found this a little bit unreasonable. Just then, I felt the bus start to move. I looked and saw the driver was driving out of the parking lot and down to the street. I called out that the rest of the class was still inside, but he ignored me. Then I got a terrible feeling. I asked him to stop the bus and go back, but he just turned around and yelled at me to shut up. The bus was driving down the street and headed for the freeway. All I could do was look out the window and wonder what exactly was going on. I wished that I hadn't gone to the bus by myself and went back with the rest of the group. The bus driver merged onto the freeway and we started going at a fairly high speed. The longer we drove, the more scared that I got. Now I knew the real reason he had taken my phone from me. We continued down the freeway for I would say about five minutes. Suddenly, I heard the noise of a police siren. I looked behind me and saw a flashing light. The bus started to move to the side of the road and I saw a police car go with it. That was one of the greatest feelings in my life. The bus driver then opened the door and took off running into the field beside the road. I saw several police officers run after him and another run to the bus. They were able to get me back to safety and the bus driver was caught a short time later. Back when I was a kid, we took a school field trip to the zoo one time. My school was really small and basically the entire place went. It took us over an hour to get there, but when we were there, it was a day long event, which was nice for us because we didn't actually have to do any schoolwork. I think I was like eight years old and I was one of the younger people there. The first part of the day we spent looking for a bunch of animals, then we got food. After that, we started looking more at plants and things like that. I was more into the animals, so my friend Matt and I went back over to them. We first got back to the exhibit of sea lions, and when we got there, one of the zoo workers asked us if we wanted to help feed the animals. Of course we said yes, because as an eight-year-old kid, it seemed like something super fun to do. He told us to follow him and then led us into a doorway and down a dark and quiet hall. It was really weird to be in the back of an exhibit, but it got me really excited to feed the animals. We followed the guy deeper in and into a storage type of room that was even darker. He said this is where they kept the food. He told us to wait there for a second and left the room. Then we saw the door shut and heard it lock. We immediately knew something was wrong. I went to the door and tried to open it, but it was in fact locked. It was a really strong and thick door and neither of us would be able to break it. We banged on it, but I don't know how anyone else outside would be able to hear. After a while of that with no response, we decided to examine the room. It was very dark with no apparent lights, and we could barely see. It was probably just about 15 feet by 10 feet, and had basically just junk laying around. It just seemed to be another storage closet. We waited and waited, but of course, the guy never came back, and nobody else did either. This was kind of a long time ago, and neither of us had cell phones we could take out to call anyone or anything like that. We just waited in the dark room for what felt like forever. Occasionally we would yell or bang on the door, but nothing would ever happen. We did this for literally hours. At one point we stopped and actually fell asleep on the floor for some time. Eventually we got back up and went back to banging on the door and yelling. At last, finally, we could barely hear someone from the other side. We both yelled as loud as we possibly could. The door tried to open, but was still locked. Then whoever was there went away. We got really disappointed and thought that was it, 
until a few minutes later we saw the door open. There was another zoo worker and she asked us how we had gotten in there. We told her the story and she seemed really surprised. By that time we saw that the sun was almost set when we got back into the zoo. By that time we saw that the sun had almost set when we got back into the zoo. Apparently everyone had been looking for us for over two hours. We were able to get back home later that day, but the guy that worked there and locked us in had left and nobody could find him. It turns out he was caught a while later and had been addicted to some drugs or something like that. They said he had been acting really strange lately. I really don't know why he locked us in there, but we were very lucky to get out because that closet wasn't really used by the zoo anymore. This story happened many years ago when I was a boy. I was probably about nine or 10, and I remember for class we went on a field trip to one of the state parks. It was just a field trip where we were going to walk around and look at the sights and the wildlife. We went on these trips about four times a year and it was always pretty fun. On this day we went to a park that had a bunch of hills and different types of trees. We were going to walk on a path all around it. There was about 20 of us in the class. And after we all got to the park, our teacher told us to follow him and then led us down the path. I was with my best friend Daryl and we were talking during the walk. At one point we saw a cool looking mushroom a little bit off the path, so we stayed back to look at it. The rest of the class was going uphill and before we knew it they were out of sight. We went to run to catch back up with them, but we heard a noise coming from behind a tree off the path. I expected to see an animal but when we looked, there was a boy there around our age. He had a red shirt and jeans and he was hiding behind the tree. He wasn't in our class. We asked him who he was, but he didn't answer. We thought maybe he was with another school field trip over here or something like that. Daryl asked him if he was on a field trip and the boy stepped out from the tree and said, no, Daryl. Daryl was really surprised that the kid knew his name and he asked him how he knew. The boy then looked at me and said my name. It was a little strange, this whole thing, and we said we should all go back with our groups. The boy then went back behind the tree. He was definitely sketchy, but we told him he should come with us because we figured he wasn't supposed to be off the path by himself out here. He didn't come out from behind the tree, though, so me and Daryl walked over to him. But when we got behind the tree, the boy wasn't there. It was as if he just vanished into thin air and was gone. Daryl and I looked around for a bit, but then we knew we had to get back to our group, so we ran back. We told our teacher about it, and I know we ended up telling people who worked at the park about the kid, but I never heard anything about it after that. Daryl and I still talk about it sometimes to this day. This happened a while ago. I have since been diagnosed with PTSD because of this incident. I'm currently on medication to suppress the reoccurring nightmares. For some background, at the time I was only 9 years old. I am a female from Georgia. My mother met my stepfather at a church we recently started attending with her best friend. When this happened, they were just dating. It was a fairly normal church for the most part. It was a somewhat run-down building with an outdated interior and an old basement. The pastor was an ex-drug addict turned man of God who was honestly one of the nicest people I've ever met. It was a cold winter night. Saturday church service had just ended. We left the church and headed towards my mom's old Pontiac vibe. It was the kind of car that didn't have electric locks or windows. Each door had to be locked and unlocked on its own. We sat in the parking lot talking for some time. Since my stepfather lived in a different city back then, he and my mom wanted to maximize their time together. They were discussing upcoming holiday plans when I noticed a figure wearing a green coat moving between the cars parked nearby. I didn't think anything of it at the time, as it could have been our pastor or another churchgoer. My stepdad got into the passenger seat and we were about to take off when his door was suddenly pulled open. There was a man in a green hoodie that none of us recognized. He had dark skin, bloodshot eyes, and a shaved head. He looked completely deranged. He shoved a gun into my stepdad's abdomen. Give me your wallet! 
he demanded. Mind you, my stepfather is a Hispanic man. He speaks English well now, but he wasn't fluent back then, and he had a thick accent. So he simply responded to the man, No. My mom began freaking out. I was so scared that I kept trying to get out of the car. I started crying because my mom told me to stay put. Then the man began screaming. I said give me your wallet! But my stepdad stood firm. No. The man then directed his attention at my mother. Tell him I said to give me his wallet! Thinking that he couldn't understand him. My mother tried to get my stepdad to comply, but he refused. I'm looking frantically through our fogged up windows, trying to find someone to get their attention. But the man looked at me, then back to my mom. He then hit my stepdad with his gun, causing him to lean forward. He then pointed the gun at me. A nine-year-old girl in a pink and black dress who was talking about Christmas dinner just five minutes before. Somebody better give me something, or she dies. I lost it. I got out of my seat and exited the car. That's when I saw two other hooded men across the parking lot. They were walking towards the car, also carrying guns. I started screaming and immediately got back in the car. My mom yelled at me for getting out, and the man with the gun was still screaming at my stepdad. Are you listening to me, man? I'm going to shoot her right between the fucking eyes! My mom then offered him all the cash she had on her. She handed him $75 from her wallet. The man ripped away the cash from her, then assaulted my stepdad again with his gun. The mugger then slammed his arm against the car door to close it, but in the process the gun went off. The bullet went into the well of my mom's car. The three men ran off into the night. We sat there crying and trying to console each other. After about 30 minutes, we calmed ourselves down and left. We immediately went to the police station and filed a report. They said it was most likely gang activity and it would be very difficult to track down the perpetrators. The men could have killed my stepfather right in front of my mother. There was no justice. I was only a child when this happened. It's been 13 years, and I still wake up screaming and sweating from the nightmares. I'm just glad that my mom had her grocery money on her that day. Heaven knows what would have happened if she didn't. So for context, I'm a 22-year-old male, and I live in a large city in the Midwest. Now, I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I also drive for other similar companies, but that's besides the point. I have many, many horror stories from those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out driving for Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mom's with my new baby and wife. Nothing really special going on for the night, just the usual. I get a ride request. It happened to be a pickup from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive, find my passenger, and he has all of his belongings with him. Like several boxes of stuff. Now, my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not really too big. We get all of his stuff loaded up, barely, and we're on our way. Now, during the ride, the guy was crying and saying that his girlfriend was cheating on him and he had apparently walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because her name was on the lease, so I was taking him to a hotel. Now in my city, we happen to have a street that is pretty well known for having vices. Hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and shady motels. You know, the works. We get to the motel and he asked me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man. I say. I'll confess, I break the rules a little when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster, secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being, driving lift and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me, as well as having people try to fight me, rob me, and all kinds of other things. But like I said, stories for another time. This motel was on that street that I had mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed right out against the building, 
and I'm a pretty big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm on edge. He gets his key. The whole motel is ground level, so to help the guy out, I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff, so I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip getting stuff, I had saw a guy come out of a room just south of my car, then followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to. One of the ladies then pounded on the door, then opened it. That's when I then saw the guy raise a fucking shotgun right out of his long coat and then storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, then slamming the door behind them. Following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was honestly just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this man. Go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas. And he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice that he took the boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill in my pocket. I was frozen. I knew what may have been going down in that room. I had to leave or at least go to where I could get my gun. I know that the guy and the ladies both saw me and I know that they knew I saw the gun. I just had to get the fuck out of there. You know how it goes. No witnesses. I got in my car and then sped away as quickly as possible. I got a block or so away and then called the cops. I gave them every detail I could. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed out a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops investigated. They never found the gunmen or the women. They never answered the door that I saw them come out of. And the occupants of the room they went into said nothing happened and that I was full of shit. Well, I definitely wasn't. I know what I saw. I remember walking out of Walmart with a cart full of gardening supplies a few years back. My mom had sprained her wrist and needed stuff picked up for the start of spring, so it was down to me to go grab some stuff for her. I'm loading the stuff into the trunk of my car when I happened to notice someone walking past me out of the corner of my eye. Kind of took me off by surprise, so I turned around out of instinct and ended up making eye contact with this younger looking guy. He looked like 20 something, workout gear, shaved head, totally normal looking guy who looked like he'd been out for a run or something. I didn't want to seem all confrontational or whatever, so I smiled and said, hey, and just carried on loading all the stuff into my trunk. Next thing I hear is someone saying, was it you? I turn again, and it's the same guy, smiling back at me, having asked me that question. I'm like, was what me? And the guy responds like, you know. I sort of chuckle, thinking it was an honest mistake on the guy's part, thinking I was just someone else or whatever, so I tell him I don't know what he's talking about, then just carry on loading the stuff into my trunk. That's when I hear him walking towards me from his footsteps, so I turn around, hoping things aren't about to get confrontational. But those hopes were totally dashed when I saw the look on his face. He looked livid. And as I'm getting ready for the unfortunate event of having to fight a total stranger for no reason, the guy starts screaming at me. Don't pretend you don't know. You got me transferred. It's because of you I got transferred. He said a bunch of other stuff that might have you censoring this post, so I won't repeat it, but trust me when I say it was language that would have made a stevedore blush. I remember one of the scariest things being how he was still sort of smiling as he started shouting about being transferred, and then as he carried on screaming at me, he went bright red in the face, got this look about him like he was about to murder me, and he actually started spitting as he was screaming due to how out of control he was getting. I'm telling him to calm down that there's been some kind of mistake, and that's all without even asking what he meant by got me transferred. But then every time I try to reason with the guy, he almost takes it like I'm trying to gaslight him or whatever and it just makes him angrier. I don't even know how he managed to conceal it on him, but he pulled out this extendable baton from somewhere and whips it open right in front of me before charging at me. I just reacted running around my car and screaming for other people in the parking lot to call 911. That was the other scary thing. 
how most people just stood and watched with their mouths open instead of either calling someone or actually getting involved to help. Then the other really scary thing, the guy's screams as he chased me, they went from actual words to just this wild psycho babble. Just stuff that barely made sense and only had an actual understandable word every three or four screams. He was completely manic. And it really didn't hit me at the time, but I later found out that he was suffering from a complete mental break. He was way faster than me too, so if it wasn't for me being able to duck and dodge around parked cars, he would have caught up with me in seconds. And then because I didn't have anything to defend myself with, just bags of compost and seeds and whatnot, he might have actually been able to bash my head in and there's not a thing I've been able to do about it too. Eventually, some hero of a security guard from a movie theater of all places, he actually ran over and tried tackling the guy chasing me. But the psycho kid swung at him a few times with his baton and then the guy was forced to back off and try to tackle him when he had his back turned, which obviously wasn't easy because the kid was in this like super saiyan manic state. Every time he got close, the kid just clocked him, turned, and started swinging. But then, that gave me a window to put some more distance between us. The guy might have actually saved my life in that way. Anyway, the cops showed up after what seemed like way too long, but when they tried tasing the guy, it just had absolutely no effect on him. That was the other thing that scared me. I've actually seen a guy getting tased before, it's a long story, and when the wire things hit him, he just seized up and hit the floor like a statue. But this guy, it just had zero effect on him. Maybe it was a broken taser or whatever, but it was still pretty terrifying to see. The cops wouldn't go into too much detail with me, but the kid was known to him as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and I went from hating the kid to actually feeling really sorry for him incredibly fast. They'd been getting calls about him for the past two days, but he kept on running from the scenes of the calls and getting away before they could actually take him into custody. I don't feel any ill will towards him, and I hope he got the help that he needed. But I'm not kidding when I say he legit could have killed me that day. Easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me at Walmart. Last January, I was working as an associate at the Walmart over in Lake Charles. I was working second shift, so that's 1pm to 10pm, and it was about 7pm when people started to notice some kind of drama going off in the parking lot. The greeter noticed it first, and was actually getting ready to have someone call the cops, but the whole thing seemed to die down, and then, from what I heard, things sort of just chilled out. I asked a coworker if anything juicy had happened, and she said no, but that the drama was between two groups of teenage girls and that one of the groups had walked into the store. They weren't being loud or obnoxious or anything, not at first anyway. They were just walking up and down the aisles talking among themselves, and one of the girls seemed to be making a video of them just hanging out. I remember hearing one of the girls saying something like, man, I need my taser back but I just put that down to them talking smack after almost getting into a fight or something. The other thing I know is that loss prevention was watching them after one of them seemed to take something out of the kitchen utensils section, but they were just keeping their distance and observing until they tried to make an exit for the store. This is actually super relevant to what happened later on too, so keep it in mind. Anyways, I went back to what I was doing, then the next thing I know... There's all kinds of screaming coming from near the front section of the store. I walked around to see what was going on and that's when I see a group of girls in the doorway shouting at the group that was inside. They were all saying all this stuff like, where y'all at? Come out. They knew the other group had walked inside the Walmart and were obviously trying to find them. The greeter was trying to get them to calm down or leave, saying they could either stop making a scene or was going to call the cops but neither group was paying him any mind. Then, one of the girls in the doorway group starts saying something threatening, and the other is all like, I'm about to come out as soon as my sister gets here. But the other girl didn't want to wait for that. She just walks inside the store and marches straight over to this girl with dyed blonde hair. I'm like, ah snap, this is about to go off right here. 
and honestly just like that, the two girls start throwing hands at one another in that typical girl fight way, just flailing their hands at one another. Then the girl with blonde hair, she reaches for something in her pants, and although I didn't see it clearly, she swings at the other girl's chest, and it looks a lot like she just punched her. But then as soon as the hit connected, the blonde girl, like, backed up, then ran off while the other girl just sort of staggered back, then looked down at her chest. I didn't see the blood, not right away, I just heard the screams. What I did see was the girl who had been hit stagger a few steps, then just collapse on the floor. Then, when her friends dropped down and rolled her over, that's when I saw the blood on the floor. The EMTs were called, the girl was taken away in an ambulance, and we were all basically tasked with comforting the girl's friends as they were absolutely all shooken up that they just watched their girl get stabbed. Then, about 9pm, because we had to empty the store out so the cops could do their thing, I was told I could finish early so I could go home and basically and try and get the whole thing out of my head. But then like a half hour after I walked through the front door of my parents' place, I get an Instagram DM from one of the younger co-workers that I was tight with. They ask something like, you were working second shift tonight, right? And I respond, yeah, some messed up stuff happened. Then the next thing they send me is this long link that had Facebook in there somewhere. I figured it'd just be a sharing of a news story about the whole stabbing thing, but when I opened up the link, it opens up one of those Facebook Live videos and instantly I knew what I was watching. I knew what I was watching because, one, I recognize one of the girls from the stabbing at work, and two, they're saying things like, that was too much, and if she killed her, she killed her, and then like shrugging it off as if though it was her fault for coming at them and her friend was just defending herself. And then it got way worse. They were literally bragging how they killed someone, and they knew they killed someone too. I mean, I just thought the girl would be taken to the ER or something, but they knew she'd stabbed her in the heart because she aimed to stab her in the heart. We didn't find out until the next day that the girl who got stabbed had died on the way to the hospital. The most effed up thing though, none of those girls looked older than my little sister, who was a high school freshman at the time. Some of them barely looked like they'd gone through puberty yet. I mean, these were literally kids, literally effing children, and they just killed somebody and were proud of it. I think maybe it was just that they were trying to hide how scared they were, or trying to establish the whole self-defense thing before the cops came looking for them. But my god, seeing that kind of savagery coming out of a kid made my heart break for humanity a little. Those girls had ruined their lives with one little fight, and even worse, they'd literally ended another girl's. Taking her away from her family, friends, all she had going for her in life, all because of one stupid fight. I used to work the late shift at a Walmart here in Jacksonville, and Every night after finishing at like 1 in the morning, I'd walk to the exact same bus stop to call an Uber. Now, this whole story would never have happened if my dumb self didn't just get picked up from work, but I always like having a smoke as soon as I finished and it wasn't the kind of thing that management would have taken kindly to, me smoking right outside of the Walmart. It was the arrested and fired kind of smoke, so I used to walk to the bus stop. Anyway, this one night I'm sitting there, smoking away and the Uber is maybe only 3 or 4 minutes away. Seconds later, when I see this dude in the distance walking towards the bus stop, I immediately started getting bad vibes. Getting bad vibes from people when I was smoking up was hardly anything out of the ordinary, but I still figured that I'd keep an eye on him as he walked past, just in case he tried anything funny. He walks past me, but only by a few feet and then he stops and leans against the bus stand like he's waiting for the bus with me. Now, I know well that there's no bus coming, so why is he just standing like there like he's waiting for one? That's when the bad vibes about the guy seriously intensify because he was definitely acting weird. The only question was if they had any bad intentions for me. 
I'm getting more and more nervous watching the little blip on my phone screen getting closer and closer and as much as I'm trying not to make eye contact with the guy, I can see him looking over at me every so often, like he's sizing me up or something. I'm feeling pretty thankful by the time my Uber rounds a corner and I start to see its headlights, but as it pulls up, I actually think that maybe my paranoia might be starting to get the better of me, and maybe it's just me being the judgmental one instead of the guy actually posing any kind of threat. Then literally, as I open the door to the Uber, the guy says, You lucky kid. I look back, and he has this grin on his face that literally made my skin crawl. That's when I realize he did actually have something in mind for me. I don't know what it was, whether or not he planned on robbing me or just beating me up or whatever it was. I just know it wasn't good, and I thank Christ that my Uber showed up when it did. This occurred several years ago. I used to shop at Walmarts quite frequently. They really sold everything I needed and were all over the place, so it was always my first store to go to. At one point, I had to go out of town for a work conference. It lasted about a week and was about a 10 hour drive away. After it was over, I was driving back. I was on the way home about halfway and it got pretty late at night. I was prepared to drive through the night, but my car got low on gas, so I stopped at the next exit and filled it up. I was pretty hungry, but noticed that the convenience store of the gas station was closed. This town was really small and didn't seem to have much, but they did have a Walmart that was across the street. This Walmart was one of the strangest ones I had ever seen. It just wasn't the typical kind of Walmart building that they usually are in. The building seemed smaller and more as if it had taken over a building of a previous store that had been there. The parking lot was quiet, only a couple of cars, so I looked it up on Google Maps, and it said sure enough it was open. This seemed kind of surprising to me because it was around midnight, but I pulled my car into the parking lot and went inside. As I slowly walked in, I didn't really know what I was looking for, but I guess just some type of food. As I walked around inside, I didn't notice anybody else. The inside of the Walmart looked for the most part like a regular Walmart, but at the same time, a lot different. It was much smaller inside and arranged differently than most of the ones I had been in. Still, not a big deal though, and I tried to find something I could snack on. As I walked around, I didn't see anybody else in the store at all. It seemed a little bit odd to not even see a worker, but then again, it was midnight in a small town that I had never been in before. I had made it to the back aisle and was looking around when I heard the noise of someone walking. They entered the aisle from the far side from where I was in, and I noticed it was someone wearing one of those horse face masks that covers a person's whole head. I looked and it startled me at first, but then I chuckled. I guess it was some guy pranking people late at night. He stood there looking at me. Then he walked away. I told him it was very funny. I finally found a couple of things and picked them up, then I headed to the front of the store. As I did, I noticed another person walking by, also wearing a horse mask. I thought maybe it had to be the guy's friend and they were both in on the joke. I once again smiled and kept walking. I used the self-checkout and paid for my things, all while not seeing a single employee. As I was almost done, I saw another two people emerge from behind one of the check lanes. They were both wearing horse masks as well. By that time, I got a rush of fear run through my body. I didn't know what was going on, but it didn't really seem like a joke to me anymore. I looked back and saw the other two people in horse masks staring at me from the back near the aisles. I tried to not let them see the fear that I had. I calmly got my receipt and walked away and out the doors. I walked all the way back to my car, hoping that I wouldn't hear the footsteps of anyone leaving behind me. And to my surprise, I didn't. But when I got to my car, I realized there was a new car that was parked next to mine. I tried to ignore it as best as I could, and got to my car, unlocked it, and quickly got inside. As I did, I glanced over to the car parked next to mine. At first, it looked like it was empty, but then I saw a horse mask pop up in the driver's seat. I just about had a heart attack in that moment. I slammed my foot on the gas, and left that city back to the freeway and on my way home. 
I got home the next day and still wonder what was going on there. Last summer, I worked at a Walmart, mostly stocking shelves late at night. It was pretty easy and was really the first real job that I had. One night, I happened to be working at around 11 o'clock p.m. We were still open at that time, but we would rarely get many customers then because we closed at midnight. I was in an aisle where we sold pet supplies at the very back end of the store, just stocking a shelf. I heard somebody walking close by and then saw a man enter the aisle and start to approach me. I really didn't like when customers would ask me questions, but I would always do my best to answer them. He came closer to me, and when he did, I noticed that some of his clothes were ripped, and he seemed a little bit off. He said to me that he had a question for me. Then he began to ask something, but never really got to the question. He stopped himself and slowly said to me that he didn't like me. His face changed to an angry look. I had no idea what to do, but I figured this man had to be on some sort of drugs. He slowly walked behind the aisle we were in. I just shook my head and went back to work, but I could tell that the man was just standing there barely around the corner. As I took products out of boxes and placed them on the shelves, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, the man stick his head around the corner for a second and then go back. He still had a very angry look on his face. I did my best to ignore him and figured that he would walk away soon enough. About five minutes passed by, and as far as I knew, he was still there. Then out of nowhere, several items came flying off the shelf near me as if they had been pushed from the other side. Now this annoyed me. I said in a firm voice to the man that he should just get whatever he came here to get and leave. What he said in response was that he was going to get me, and then he called for me to come around the corner to the other side. I ignored it and started to pick up the items that fell. He called out a couple of more times for me to come out, but I just ignored him once again. About a minute later, I heard the sound of more people in the aisle next to mine. It sounded like four or five men were suddenly in the aisle. I decided to walk over and look, and saw several police officers start to take the man away. One of the officers walked over to me, and I asked him what happened. He told me that that man had assaulted somebody in a nearby restaurant a few blocks away, in a seemingly random attack, and then fled. He was found at the Walmart. It seemed like he was going for me next. I had a job a few years ago that was pretty tough. I worked some insanely long days and got home very late at night sometimes. One night I was working late and I left work so sleepy that I could barely stay awake. I began driving home and after about 10 minutes I knew I wouldn't make it all the way back before falling asleep. I pulled into the next exit where there was a 24 hour Walmart that I knew of. It was sometime after two in the morning when I got there. My goal was to just walk around a little bit to wake up and maybe buy an energy drink or something with caffeine in it. I got inside the store and began to walk around. I only saw a few customers at the front end of the store with some employees, but other than that it seemed almost completely empty. I was walking around the back end of the store for a little bit, slowly starting to feel more awake, when I noticed someone walking behind me. They were walking behind me at an extremely close distance that was very uncomfortable. I stopped and looked behind me. There was a man that was no more than five feet away. He stopped as well and stared at me with a blank look on his face for a second. He was about six feet tall wearing a brown suit jacket with a brown turtleneck. He then turned and walked away into a nearby aisle. I continued to walk around the store, but it wasn't long until the man was back again. This time, as soon as he got close, I turned to him and said, Can I help you? He once again just changed directions and walked away. I decided it would be best for me to just leave at that point. I went and got an energy drink and checked out. I was feeling more awake now though and also a little bit creeped out by the man. I left the store and walked back to my car. Something about the way the man was staring at me just kind of gave me the creeps. Luckily for me I was way more awake now and I was able to drive home without any problems. If that were the full story, it would be bad enough, 
but sadly it's not. I drove home, and of course when I got there, I fell asleep immediately. But I woke up about an hour or two later to the sound of a truck engine running very loudly. I looked out of my bedroom window to the street. I saw a truck sitting on the street in front of my window. In the front seat was the same man staring at me. He still had that blank look on his face. Almost right away after I looked at him, he screeched his tires and sped away. I've never been able to figure out who this man was or what he wanted from me, but I never did see him again. Anyone who's ever worked a night shift job will tell you that it eventually gets old. I remember being really excited about starting my first night shift job. I thought it would be so cool, like that episode of Spongebob with the hash slinging slasher or something. It was nothing like that at all. In fact, it got plain old repetitive after a while. I'm a male nurse and I had been working in a hospital nearby. It was a long commute and extremely unbearable. Once I finished my contract with the hospital, which was about a year, I decided to apply for another job, one that was a little less stressful and disorganized than the hospital. I got a job at a child psychiatric unit. Working with children with mental illnesses seemed like a cool job. Maybe cool isn't the right word, but meaningful. The hospital left me with this feeling of trying to save people who were going to die anyway. But with these kids, I could make a real difference that might turn their life around or find a way to let them cope with whatever is wrong with them. I was all around excited about it. The pay was even higher, which had me really excited too. The only problem was that the only shift available was the night shift. The hiring manager told me that there might be a day shift position available within a couple of months and I would be the first one to get consideration if it opened, but that was about it. So there I was helping kids, at night. The only issue with that is, is that they were all asleep for the most part. The only time I got to do anything was when one of them woke up or started misbehaving. This very quickly became the most boring job I had ever worked in my life. About a month went by, and something moderately frightening finally happened. It was a night like any other. I was sitting at my desk charting some stuff I had done with other kids earlier that night. I had heard a noise that I did not quite recognize at first. It sounded like some of the kids were wrestling or something, but on the bed, I got anxious as I did not want to go in there and see mentally handicapped kids doing, um, you know. Call me cynical, but that's where my mind went immediately. But when I got in there, I saw something that I don't think I can ever unsee. I turned the light on to see one of the older kids who was trying to smother another one. The kid who was doing the smothering had no previous incidents of violent behavior. I didn't personally know these kids well enough because I didn't work during the day but I knew their cases well enough that the kid doing the smothering had bipolar disorder. It was severe, but he had never had a violent outburst like this. It was just so unusual, but I immediately pulled him off the other kid, and then he started fighting me. He reached around his own head and punched me in the nose at a weird angle. This kid had to have been 11 or 12 years old, and I honestly was surprised at how much force he had behind his punch. He didn't break my nose or anything, but he bloodied it up. My adrenaline kicked in after that and I was able to restrain him without a problem. I called for a nurse from another unit in the building to come over and help me. I felt like this took forever but it was probably only just a few minutes. The entire time I was waiting though, I couldn't help but look at this little kid who had nearly murdered another kid. When the nurse got over, we gave him some medication that would knock him out and sedate him and put him to sleep. I asked the other nurse, Carla, what I was supposed to do. She was there for a few years before me, and I assumed she would have a good answer. We just did everything you can do, kid. Violent outbursts don't get kids thrown out of here very often. I was a little shocked. I argued with her a little, but that was that. I tried talking to the kid that was being smothered, but he didn't really have a whole lot to say about it. He said that he didn't really know the other kid that well, but they never had any negative incidents up until this night. This was a few years back and I will never forget how I almost watched that kid die. If I had just been there a few minutes later, he could have been dead right now. It wasn't long after that experience that I started looking for another job. I got one a few weeks later and I did my best to explain the situation to my case manager. She didn't seem to understand or care, and that's not my problem anymore. 
One day like any other, I was sitting in my room doing whatever when I got a notification from Instagram that I got a new follower. It seemed to be one of those random spam-like accounts. The username was Ty13053, and there were five pictures on the profile, all of different typical suburban houses. The profile had two followers, was following three people including me, and none of the pictures had any likes. Comments seemed to be disabled on all of the pictures. I didn't bother blocking or removing the account from my followers, as I had my profile set to public anyway at the time. A couple nights later, I got a notification that the random Ty13053 account liked my most recent picture. Just being curious, I click on the notification and then pull up the profile again. This time there was a new picture on the profile, and I instantly recognized it as a picture of my house. I DM the profile asking who it was, saying it was very funny. Of course, it had to be one of my friends messing with me. When the person running the account left my DMs on scene and didn't reply, I followed up with, this is harassment and a threat, and that I would have the police follow up on this. I ran to my parents' room to wake them up, as it was past 12 at that point. I showed them the picture of our house, and said someone was messing with me who knew where we lived. They tried to rationalize and said the same thing I thought, that it was someone from my school messing with me. My dad and I both went outside regardless to have a look around the property and on the street. It was a ghost town out there though, as it should be past 12 o'clock. We went back inside into our respective bedrooms. I wasn't actually going to pursue it with the police at that exact moment. It was obvious to me, at least in the moment, that someone who knew me was pranking me. I stayed up for a few more hours, and around the time I was about to go to bed, I got a DM from the account. It was an image, another image of my house. It was on the side this time. As I had the chat opened, he sent another, this time a picture of my window, with the glare from the TV in my room visible in the picture. I didn't dare get up and look out the window. Wouldn't you guess it, the next DM from the account was, look out your window turned off the TV to allow total darkness in the room. I didn't want to be seen by whoever was at my window. I quietly crawled off my bed onto the floor in the dark. As I was crawling on the carpet towards the door, a pounding on the window started. I don't want to say knocking, because these bangs on the glass sounded loud enough to shatter it. Inevitably, I turned, and of course, saw a person at the window. Facial features though, impossible to make out got up and ran out of my room and to my parents' room once again. I pulled my dad out of the bed and led him to my room. He heard the end of the bangs on my window, but by the time we got to my room, the guy at the window was gone. The banging was all my dad needed to believe me and take this seriously though. We called the cops that second and talked to the officers who came. They said the good news was since the person was contacting me through Instagram, they could track the person after putting a legal request into Instagram. So that same night, we followed the cop car to the nearest precinct, where we went through this long process. They took the account name and my details of the story, and literally the next day, we found out who it was. It was this kid named Luke who went to my high school. As much as I want to give the last name, that could lead to issues. Luke was a very, very weird kid that didn't talk to many people. He was just a very mean, unpleasant, and scary dude. Not scary like tough. Scary like some would even fear he'd do something crazy that would harm students or staff. I don't know why he targeted me. I never even spoke to the kid. But this really proved how dangerous he was. He hid my window so hard we found small cracks on it in the daylight. He was arrested and we got him for a harassment charge, an attempted breaking and entering charge, and I think a couple others. This happened back in the summer of 2018. At that time, I used to work out with my two friends, Jared and Spencer. We had just graduated high school and would go to the gym every morning together and work out. Sometimes we would hang out afterwards or get food. I remember that Jared kept saying he really liked Costco's pizza and he wanted us to try it. Personally, I didn't think it would be all that great and I didn't even have a Costco membership, but I was willing to try it. One day after the gym, Jared convinced us to go. Spencer and I were both hesitant, but we figured why not go with. 
As it turns out, when we got there, Jared didn't have a Costco membership either. He told us that all the times he had gone before, he had been able to sneak in without anybody stopping him and asking him for a membership card. The store looked pretty busy, so we all decided to try to walk in behind somebody else and hope that nobody would notice or care. We went inside behind several people and were able to make it in okay. We walked over towards the food area where they sold the pizza and other food like ice cream and hot dogs. But before we could get in line to order, a man approached us. He was a younger looking man who worked at Costco and asked to see our membership cards. At that point, we all came clean and told the man that none of us had memberships, but were just hoping to get a pizza. The man told us that we couldn't do that without a membership, but said he could offer us a daily pass to each of us that we could use. I wanted to just leave, but we all decided to follow the man to get our passes. He led us towards the side of the store and through a doorway leading to the back room. There was a hallway that we walked down from there, and then he led us into this weird type of back room. The lights were off inside the room, but the man told us to go inside. As we did, the man turned the lights on, and when the lights came on, it revealed about five large scary looking men inside the room all staring at us with ski masks covering their heads. They were not wearing Costco clothes or even any type of work clothes. We all turned to the door, but the original man stood there with his arms out as if he was going to block us. One of the men told us to do as they say. Jared turned and ran at the man blocking the doorway immediately and actually knocked him down. I followed and then Spencer ran behind me. We all ran past the man and back out the hallway. Finally, we made it inside Costco again where there were other shoppers and we felt more safe. We then looked back but didn't see any of the men, so we decided to just leave without getting a Costco pizza or anything. It was just so weird what had happened and I have no idea what those men wanted from us. We never reported it or anything like that either. I used to shop at Costco all the time. As a mother of three children, all under 10 years old, we go through a lot of food in our household. One night, I was shopping for some groceries like I often would. It was a quiet night at Costco, and not very many other people were there at all. As I was passing through one of the aisles, I came across some crates. I noticed that behind some of the crates, I could just barely see a man hiding behind them. I thought it was a funny joke because I had seen some videos where people would hide in stores like Walmart between the aisles, so I ignored the man and kept going. I was in the store for quite a while longer, and as I was on the opposite end of the store, I just barely noticed the man again. He was once again hiding behind some crates, and this time, I caught him staring right at me. I ignored it again and kept on going, but I suddenly felt a little bit creeped out. I didn't really get a look at the man at all because he was hunched over and hiding behind crates, but he seemed pretty average. As I finished up getting things, I couldn't help but start looking over my shoulder a little bit. It was just really strange to see a man hiding and looking at me two different times. I got the last of my several items on my list and then started towards the front of the store to check out. As I did, I glanced behind me noticed the man was there once again. He and I were the only people in the aisle, and the man appeared to be walking right behind me about 10 feet back. He was also just staring right at me, and when I looked at him, he didn't even pretend to be looking at something else. He just remained staring at me. I was about to ask the man why he had been following me, when he suddenly turned and ran in the opposite direction, and out of the aisle that we were in. At that point, I was just so happy that he left me alone, that I began to walk quickly to the checkout to leave Costco. It took me maybe 30 seconds to get to the check lanes, but as soon as I got there, I heard a commotion and some noise coming from about 30 feet away near one of the aisles. I saw the man who had been following me literally fighting with another man and throwing him to the ground. I watched as the man then got up after wrestling with the other man and ran away once again. He got out of sight, and there wasn't many people in the store at all, but I heard somebody in the distance yell to call the police. I got out my phone and then ran outside leaving my cart full of groceries. It didn't take long at all for the police to arrive, and I waited outside as they got the man out of the store. The man was basically crazy, and tried to attack two people before attempting to run away. If I hadn't turned around and caught the man following me, who knows if he would have attacked me as well. This story happened a few years ago. 
I was on my way home when my friend John called me and asked if I could pick him up some food from Chipotle. John lived in my same apartment building, so we would occasionally get food for each other and stuff. We also happened to be pretty good friends. I said sure because it was on my way home, but when I got to Chipotle, I realized that it was closed. That Chipotle was very close to a Costco and was sort of in the same parking lot. I drove into the Costco parking lot, which was also empty, and checked on my phone. Both places were closed, so I texted John to tell him that they were closed and asked him if he wanted me to pick him up something else. As I sat in the empty Costco parking lot waiting for a response, I noticed another car driving into the parking lot and pulling up next to me. I looked over, wondering why in the whole entire empty parking lot someone would park right next to me. I didn't recognize the car, and it didn't look like a police car or anything like that. When I looked over, the windows were tinted so I couldn't see inside. Then another car pulled in shortly after, followed by several more. The cars all parked next to me or very close to me, and in total there had to be close to 10 of them. At this point, I was feeling really confused and even slightly concerned. All the cars remained running, and finally, I saw a door open up. I noticed a man get out. He had on a cap and sunglasses. He walked right up to the passenger side of my car, and then I noticed another man get out of his car and aggressively walk towards my driver's side. The man at the passenger's window knocked on my door, and I slightly rolled down the window just a crack. As soon as it was open, the man reached his hand in as far as he could and then tried to push the window down the rest of the way. I knew at this point that I was in trouble and clicked to roll it back up. That's when the man quickly reached his hand out of the window and banged it on it really hard. I had enough at this point and put my car into reverse and started to back away. When this happened, the men raced back to their cars, but at the same time, I noticed another car start to drive towards the parking lot. All within about 10 seconds, all the men had returned to their cars and all of the cars drove off out of the parking lot in all different directions, leaving me alone. Just like that, they were all gone and I was just sitting there in the middle of the Costco parking lot all by myself. I was pretty freaked out and decided just to drive home. Luckily, I wasn't followed or anything like that, but I don't understand who those people were or what they wanted from me. After work, I like to go with co-workers to Waffle House sometimes. It's fun, relaxing, and relatively cheap. However, tonight I decided to go out with a couple of girls I work with. I don't have a vagina myself, but since we all closed up together, we thought we would go grab something to eat. So while we're eating, I'm facing the door, and in walk these two drugged out looking people, which isn't uncommon for Waffle House. But something about these two people in hoodies in the middle of summer in Texas really put me on edge. The two girls I was with were both pretty attractive, and the two guys also took note as they walked past. I've been in a couple of sticky situations and can always tell when shit is about to go down, and these guys gave off that vibe like no other. They sat behind me where I couldn't see them in any reflection. It was nerve-wracking. A few minutes went by before I realized that it was just our two groups in the restaurant. I glanced over my shoulder and saw they weren't eating anything, just drinking and staring at us. Fuck. I told the two girls I was with that we should try to hurry up and go because I was tired, trying not to freak them out, because assholes like those guys feed on fear. We got up, and I look over at them. They were still watching us with empty drinks now. At this point, I should say two things. I have an injured knee right now from practice that causes me to limp a little, and I train in Muay Thai boxing and compete internationally in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I am not one to be fucked with, but the limp definitely gives off the impression that I would be easy to overpower. So as we were paying, I noticed one of the guys point at me and make a stabbing motion, and the other guy smiled, and they both stood up, and walked towards us. One of the girls I was with was making sexual passes at me, which were very visual. I told her to stop as these guys got closer, and I saw one lick his lips as the other held one hand in his pocket. I told the hostess to keep the change and hurried the girls outside while trying to hide my limp as best I could. We got to the parking lot, and I told one girl to go to her car and gave the other the keys to my car and told them to hurry up and get in, 
since I couldn't run with my limp and that I would explain later. The guys came out as I was getting in my car and I saw one of them pulling something out of his pocket and heard him yell something I couldn't make out over the sound of us noping the fuck out of there. I texted the girl who I wasn't taking home and explained the situation and why I was acting weird. I hate to think about what could have happened if I had not been paying attention to my surroundings. Bad shit almost went down because of, I'm assuming, crackheads at Waffle House. This story is from a female's perspective. To preface, I was about 25 years old when this happened. My boyfriend and I had been out visiting with friends, and we left their house late, around 2 a.m. Now, I've never been much of a drinker. I was addicted to opiates at the time, but that's neither here nor there. So I did the driving. On our way back, we decided to call in some omelets from the Waffle House, which is the only place where we can get takeout in the super early morning. We arrived at the Waffle House and I went inside to pick up our orders. As I was paying for the order, a young man to my left began pacing and mumbling angrily, muttering something I couldn't understand. I didn't really think much of it, since most diner patrons are either drunk or truck drivers at that time of day. When I collected the food and turned to leave, I noticed a young woman outside of the diner. She too was angrily pacing back and forth grimacing and cursing. The young man followed me out into the parking lot. I sidestepped the woman to get to my car. The young man had gotten into another car, and the young woman sat in the passenger seat. Whatever, I thought. Tweakers. The car with the two tweakers screeched to a halt behind my car, pinning us to the parking spot. Within seconds, the man was knocking ferociously on my driver's side window and yelling at me. I rolled up the window and backed my car up a few inches. He continued to scream at me through the window, then leapt back into his car with his girlfriend. They peeled backwards and exited the parking lot. At that point, my boyfriend and I were amused more than anything else, and we re-entered the highway. Just then, we heard the same car roar up behind us. The man was driving like an absolute maniac to dodge other cars, traffic lights, and stop signs until he got so close to us that their car nearly rammed into our back bumper. I weaved in and out of the sparse traffic as safely as I could in an attempt to throw them off our route. Each time, he managed to pull up behind us again. He clicked his brights on and off and leaned on his horn. Inside our car, it was blinding and deafening. I sure as hell wasn't going home so that these tweaked, unhinged people would know where I lived. I swear it was almost like I could still hear him screaming, even over the blaring car horn. My boyfriend and I didn't do much talking, as I suppose we were both shocked and trying to figure out what to do. Fuck this, I told him. We're going to the police station. I doubled back, the car still bearing down on us. When I pulled into the police station, they followed. I locked my car doors. I picked up my cell phone and began to ring the station, because I sure as shit wasn't going to get out of my car. The man practically ran out of his car up to my window, again, banging and yelling. At this point, I had gone way beyond concerned and scared, to absolutely pissed. We want our goddamn money. You leave me the fuck alone. I'll let the fucking cops search me for your girlfriend's fucking wallet. The man then went silent. I'm on the phone with the cops right now. Uh, if you don't have it, I guess you don't have it. He then sprinted back to his car with his sour-faced girlfriend and burnt rubber out of there. I stayed in the police station parking lot for a while, talking to the cops on duty. When we finally left at about 3.30 a.m., I still made several loops through our town before eventually heading home, arriving after 4 a.m. Legally, nothing came of the incident, I had no idea what the couple's names were, nor did I get a license plate number. We gave the cops descriptions of their physical appearances and vehicle, but they seemed far more interested in making sure I wasn't drunk. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. I'm fairly certain that the maniac couple was pulling a strong-armed con job, or they were actually convinced that I'd mysteriously and magically stolen the girl's wallet, even though they were pacing and muttering as soon as I'd entered the diner and even before I paid for the takeout. 
and that methamphetamine psychosis was responsible for the bizarre severity of their behavior. Anyway, fuck those assholes. My omelets were cold and rubbery by the time I got home. So a few years ago, I used to work at the Waffle House in a college town, so weird people aren't really that unusual. To start off, there are only two 24-hour restaurants there, and I used to work third shift at the Waffle House. Sometimes, when a person's car would break down, the police would drop them off at one of these two places. They weren't supposed to, so they would drop them off within walking distance, but not actually outside, like some shitty loophole. So one night I was working with a cook and another waitress. We'll call them Mark and Cassie. Around 11 p.m., this old guy wanders into the lobby with a little bag. First off, we usually don't get older people after around 8 or so at the latest. Second off, this dude is creepy as fuck. He starts off with telling us about how his car broke down on the highway and the police dropped him off in the parking lot next door. I felt bad for him because it's the middle of the night and he's not from around here and he has no money. So I pour him some coffee free of charge. My co-workers are usually on drugs, so I assume free coffee isn't going to get me fired. This is when the guy just starts talking my ear off. I can barely get in a word edgewise, which is difficult since I'm usually the talker. He talks about what happened to him, and then starts trying to sell the tools he has with him in his bag. Of course we say no, but he just keeps asking about it. He also starts wandering in and out of the store. The first time he does, Mark, whose ex-military, searches his bag to make sure he doesn't have any weapons because he's starting to raise some eyebrows. There was nothing but tools, so we start to feel a bit safer. When he comes back in, I keep talking to him. Mark and Cassie note the fuck away to the other side of the store and watch. Keep in mind, this guy is literally the only person here. We don't start getting people until 1.30 when everyone leaves the bars. Now he's starting to talk about a lot of weird things. I tell him I'm interested in studying prisons, and he tells me the best way to do so is to get arrested. He then starts talking about how he used to be in prison, but he never says why. He starts to make us really nervous, so I start to draw him in case the dude decides to murder us. We'll have something because I'm good at drawing things I can see. There's a low little wall where we usually write out customer receipts so I can draw him without him noticing. Not that that matters since he's looking straight ahead while he talks to me. We start getting customers because it's about 1am. The bars are let out at 1, so anyone who drives gets there shortly after, while those who walk get there about 30 minutes later. And this guy keeps talking no matter where I am. He doesn't raise his voice or anything. He just keeps talking at the same level, even when I walk away to take care of other customers. At this point, I'm starting to think this guy is schizophrenic. I'm a psych major, so I mean actual schizophrenia, and not just crazy. And at this point, wanting to get away. But I really can't, because I'm afraid he might do something. He does, but not what I was afraid of. He starts just insulting customers. He tells one kid that he's fat, and starts asking him why he's so fat, and tells him he needs to lose weight. He then talks to a family of travelers and says, Your wife and kids are fine, but why are you so ugly? We decide he has to go. Mark tells him he has to leave, as we've warned him several times to leave the other customers alone. So Mark tells him to leave, or we're going to call the cops. The guy starts yelling at us, and glares at me, and asks why he should leave. But he finally just does after a while. But he comes back at half an hour later, and we have to kick him out again for harassing customers. He doesn't come back that night, so we decide he must have found a way home or contacted someone. So I finish around 7am and walk home. I live above the bars downtown, so it's a 30 minute walk, but along the way, I see the old guy. I dart behind a building and take the long way home. I don't think much of it because it's a small town and there's not a lot of places to go. I have to work again the next day, so I go home, sleep, get all my chores done, being an adult as usual. So about an hour before work, Waffle House calls me 
and my coworker Kevin tells me the same old guy has been coming around several times during the day, every couple of hours looking for me. I'm a 23-year-old female, so they're worried about what he wants. I call my friend Jason and tell him why I need a ride, and he brings me in. I ask what's been going on, and apparently this guy has been in at least 10 times asking to talk to me. He never says why, so I'm on edge, waiting because I have no idea what this guy wants. Is this a 60-year-old guy pissed off because I didn't defend him when he was kicked out? Is he asking because I told him my name? Or is it something else? Surprisingly, for the first few hours of my shift, we didn't see him, but he eventually comes in and ignores me. I'm super confused, but I keep an eye on him again. I've also brought pepper spray. Before long though, we kick him out again for harassing customers. This is all very confusing for me. He's been asking for me all day and then ignores me when he comes in. But after we kick him out, he does not come back. When my shift ends, my friend asked me if I need a ride home. I tell him no. This guy has left and hasn't come back, so I'm good. Well, that's what I thought until I saw him walking towards me after work. He yells out for me and starts coming at me. But I run inside a building that I know has another exit. I sneak out the other way before this guy can find me and thanking every god I can think of that I know the small town better than him. I still have no idea what he wants, but I'm not taking any chances. I sneak home through some back ways. I call work and let them know what happened and ask for the next few days off. They agree and later tell me the old guy kept coming in for the next few days and they finally called the police and they took him away. We've lived in our neighborhood for nearly four years. A few houses down and across the street is a Filipino family. They're pretty nice and whenever we see each other we always have small talk and we know each other by name. We moved in right before I gave birth to my oldest so they always ask for the baby and they love seeing them. We have even had meals at each other's homes before. This summer, they had an older family member, maybe 55 to 60 years old, come to visit. We noticed him right away because he would always go for long walks and lingered a lot. One evening, the mother of the family introduced him as her father. He had recently moved and would be staying with them for a while before heading north to her sister's house. He was pretty new to the US and spoke a little English. Just enough to get by. He seemed nice enough, but as soon as we walked inside, I told my husband that he gave me a really weird vibe. I had never felt that way of any of the seven other family members from the home. I've been in their home and shared meals with them. They're very sweet and welcoming. My husband also told me that he did seem a little off, but we just chalked it up to cultural differences. Fast forward about a month. My mother-in-law and my mother came to visit at the very same time. They're in the driveway with our son. I run inside because I'm pregnant and I suffer from severe morning sickness. I come back out 15 minutes later and they're having a frustrating conversation with this man. He was trying to get one of them to drive him to the store and he would use a food stamp slash EBD card to buy their groceries and wanted them to give him cash. They both told him that they weren't interested, but he just kept asking and lingering. When I went outside, I called out to my husband to come out, and when he saw us, he walked away very quickly. Both of our mothers told us what had happened and how forceful that he was being with them. The next few days that I see him walking, we always wave and say simple pleasantries, but every time I would wave, he would take it as a sign to come over and try to have a conversation. I began to let him know that what he did with our mothers is very illegal and to be so forceful was really unnecessary. He said that he understood but he would linger. It would always be at a moment where I was trying to strap my toddler to his car seat and I was rushing to get him to school. It would always take me about 10 minutes to get him to get the hint that I couldn't talk and he would slowly walk away and just linger in our driveway. It eventually got to the point where I would watch to see if he had walked past our house on his morning walk before venturing outside. I really just hated the awkward conversation. 
He would always seem to round the corner just as I finished strapping my son in the car and I was getting in. I would wave and then jump in quickly and drive off. It just felt really off, like he was waiting for me. One of our neighbors across the street one night told me that she got a weird vibe from him as well. And again, he always lingered. She told me that he did similar things with her when they were outside as well. They were opting to hang in the backyard with the kids just to avoid it altogether. Now, I usually work from home, but one day I went into the office and I was then alerted by the ring camera. This man was standing and looking in through our kitchen window just peering, and I could hear our pit bull barking at him. When he saw our dog, he jumped back, and I used the microphone to say, Can I help you? What do you want? He looked absolutely shocked and then scurried away. I called my husband, and I told him to play the video. We both thought it was really creepy. Whenever we saw the family walking that evening, we decided to bring it up to his daughter. She spoke to her father and he claimed that it never happened. We then showed her the video on her phone and he said that he must have gotten lost. The daughter seemed pretty annoyed by him and the entire situation, so him being weird kind of calmed down a bit after that I could see that his daughter was really annoyed by his behavior and as they were walking there was a really heated conversation. She later told me that he tends to be overly friendly and he really means no harm, but she talked to him and he would leave us alone. I asked if he had some kind of mental issue or maybe Alzheimer's since he was always getting lost. She told me no and that he had always acted like that and that she couldn't wait until her sister was ready for him to be sent up north to her. There were a few other neighbors that had also complained to her and the homeowners association as well. Well, about two months later, I drop my son off to preschool. I get home and I have to rush in because I feel really sick. Usually I leave my car door open, but something told me to lock it as soon as I got out. I did so as I was rushing inside. I would also normally leave the door unlocked if I was just going for a quick throw up session. But again, my instincts told me to lock the bottom and top lock. When I was in the bathroom, right by the front door, throwing up my life, I then hear a rattling at the front door. Someone is turning the lock back and forth. Of course, my ring chimes and I then look at it in between heaves. What do you know? It's the old man and he's trying to get into our home. I go over to the microphone and then say, You're at the wrong house. To which he responds with, Let me in, now. I want to tell you something. Now, I kid you not, it was the best English sentence I had ever heard from someone who wasn't that good with English. I started to feel better pretty quickly, and I was now on high alert. I responded with, What do you want to tell me? He looked right at the camera. Let me in your house, now! This is where I started to panic. He knew he was at the wrong house, but still, he was continuing to try and break in. I respond, Please get off my property. I don't feel comfortable with you here, and I'm not letting you in my house. He then starts rattling at the door again really hard and tries to pull it open, and then starts knocking on the bathroom window. This is where I get pissed. Get the hell off my damn property right now. I'm not going to let you in. If you don't get the hell out of here right now, I'm calling the cops. He then steps back, gives the camera the middle finger, and scurries off. He disappears and I run upstairs and see that he's simply walking back to his house. I let our pit bull out of our bedroom as he had been going crazy during this whole ordeal. I call my husband and he tells me to call the daughter and tell her what happened. I call her and I tell her what happened and she told me not to let him in, ever. She began to warn me that he's been very inappropriate and forceful with all of the women in her family, and she didn't want me to get hurt, especially being pregnant. She eventually comes over about an hour later, and I show her the video. She's absolutely fuming over this, and very apologetic, and she begs me not to call the cops. She promises me he'll be gone within the next day. The next day, he eventually flies out and his daughter told him that he's no longer welcome in her home. 
He now lives up north somewhere in Maryland with his other daughter, and probably harassing other people as well. I honestly really don't know what would have happened if I didn't follow my instincts that day. I'm just really glad I'm okay. The story happened to me when I was in third grade. I was about eight years old at the time. My regular babysitter was ill, so my mom asked one of our neighbors who had kids and babysit a lot of the neighborhood kids if she would watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house when my mom came to pick us up. I asked if I could stay a little bit longer and finish Madagascar as we had just started watching it. She said that it was fine, but I was to walk straight home right after. It was like maybe half a block, so not that far at all. So as the movie finishes, Brandy said that I needed to get home really fast because it was dark out. As I'm walking home, this other neighbor, Dennis, is just standing outside in his front yard. Now, I had seen Dennis around the neighborhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They have a daughter that was like maybe four-ish at the time, so I didn't ever play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighborhood. Dennis starts calling out to me, saying, Hey, what are you doing? I'm just going to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a little bit? No, that's okay. My mom told me to come straight home. Aw, oh, come on. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Uh, no thanks. Come on, I have a daughter who would absolutely love to play with you. We can even make snacks. At this point, I was just like, red flag, abort mission, and I started booking it home really fast. Then he starts following me. Not quickly, just kind of walking like Michael Myers. It was creepy. Luckily, I eventually made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light on, he completely backed off. I'd like to mention that behind our houses was a giant wooded area with paths that led to a nearby lake. So, I mean, this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something. I try not to think like that, but like, what other motives could he have had, you know? Fast forward until I'm in high school and working at a restaurant in town. I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. As it turns out, they were secret shoppers at our restaurant. I don't think he really recognized me working there, though. Anyways, I know this isn't your typical horror story of someone getting dragged into the woods, but still, as a child, this was a very creepy experience to go through. If you're a young child walking home alone, always watch your surroundings. You just never know. So, about a year ago, my apartment complex decided that they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and my rent is pretty ridiculous here, so I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I really love. I posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent pretty soon, and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner. I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit, and he asked if he could text me some pictures that his neighbor took because the chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel really stupid for doing this, but eventually gave him my phone number. I kid you not. I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. Now, I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone. So I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person then said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? Huh? It really took me by surprise and I didn't really know what to say. He started to just shoot the crap on the phone talking about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day. I finally interrupted and then said, So, about the condo? He pretty much completely disregarded that and then said, I really don't think that my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you, but I don't have to tell her, right? I said that I have to go and then immediately hung up the phone. 
and as soon as I did, he then started texting me. It was really bizarre and quite alarming to me. I blocked his number and then moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. Now, I'm 32 years old, but it was really creepy to me, and I even called my parents to tell them about it, and just how unnerved that it made me. And the worst part about it is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. So, I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible in my profile, but I checked, and sure enough, my address and unit number were totally public. Unable to really contact me in any other way, he started messaging me again on Nextdoor, asking me if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't really block or report people on the app, so I just decided to delete it. So one night about a month or so later, I had a knock on my door at around 10pm on a weeknight. I looked out my peephole but couldn't really get a good look. I saw that it was a man who slightly had his head down. Either way, I don't answer the door for anyone that I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 o'clock at night. Feeling panicked, I decided to call my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman and we always look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was some kind of delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to try and get a good look at the guy and that spooked him because he literally ran away. I honestly have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me that it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt that I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know that my address was visible on next door. I'll never be that casual or lazy about privacy settings like that ever again. I'm 28 years old, but when I was about 5 years old, my mom and I lived in this duplex that was off a main road and kind of in a wooded area. We lived on one side and the other was a woman and her son. He was studying to be a teacher. My mother had me pretty young, so she was about 25 years old and the guy was in his early 20s. He would often come and talk to my mom. My mother said that he would ask a lot of questions about me and ask my mother if it would be alright for him to take me for walks in the woods. Of course, my mother always declined. My mother worked in the operating room at the local hospital and was on call a lot, so most of the weekends I stayed at my grandma's house. One night while I was at my grandma's house, my mom was home alone, sleeping. She woke in the middle of the night and said she doesn't remember if she heard something or felt someone in the room, but she woke up. She could see feet wearing socks that were sticking out from the end of her bed. She grabbed her bedside lamp and was about to hit the intruder when our neighbor then yelled her name and then said his name. He couldn't really explain why he was naked and only wearing socks, but he begged my mother not to tell his mother about it. My mother of course called the cops. She ended up going to court and making a victim impact statement against this guy because she was absolutely terrified that he'd become a teacher and be around children. She says that she's pretty sure that he was there for me that night and was so happy that I wasn't there. We ended up moving pretty much immediately after that happened. She just couldn't stay another night in that house. I'm just really glad that nothing happened to me or my mother. Who really knows what would have happened if he would have succeeded in whatever he was trying to do that night. This happened to me back when I was around 12 years old. I was going through some of my old cringy notebooks and journals with my girlfriend, and I found my old journal entry where I wrote about this day, and all the memories came flooding back to me. I used to live in what I thought was a really safe and secure private community. I wasn't allowed to just wander around too far from home without supervision, but because our neighborhood was a gated community, my parents would let me walk around within the gates anytime that I wanted, even if they weren't home. One day I was riding around the neighborhood after school when I saw a middle-aged woman crying on the floor of her porch with the front door wide open. I was pretty concerned and got off my bike to see what was wrong. She said that she was having problems with her husband and immediately asked me to come in so I could keep her company while she calmed down. My stranger danger sirens were completely going off, so I declined. 
She kept pushing me. Please, please, just for a moment. I just need someone to talk to. Now, I was raised to always respect elders and to be a good person, but I was also raised to know about stranger danger. So, being a young, naive kid, I actually felt pretty conflicted about whether I should go in or not. Ultimately, I declined repeatedly enough that she instead asked me to wait outside with her and then sit with her until she felt better. I agreed to this, since I felt very safe in my own neighborhood. She asked me to wait on the porch for her while she walked into the house and visibly grabbed a couple of framed pictures from off the wall. She then sat down next to me inside the house while I was sitting on the porch just outside of her door. She then started showing me the pictures. One was of a kid older than me in the local high school football uniform, and the other of a man and the same kid. She went on to tell me these stories about how she met him and how they spent their honeymoon in Hawaii, and how her kid was so good at football, one of the best on his team. She was very worried that if her and her husband got a divorce, she wouldn't be able to see her kid anymore. And then she started bawling again, this time onto my shoulder. This actually caused me to let my guard down quite a bit. For some reason, once I knew she had a kid, I felt a bit more comfortable around her. She was talking for a while though, and I was beginning to start to feel a little awkward as she was on and off crying on my shoulder, and I didn't know how to react in the situation. What the heck did I get myself into? I kept thinking to myself as I nodded my head pretending to listen. I was more concerned about finding a good excuse to tell her I had to go home. She kept calling me such a young nice boy and telling me, you have no idea how important it is for you to spend your time with me, which made me feel a little bad about just leaving her. She kept telling me that she wanted to reward me and make me some dinner if I just came in, which I continued to decline. Finally, I told her I had to go and she asked me if I knew anything about how to turn on her cell phone as she just got her first cell phone very recently. I told her I did and I could help her out before I left. She told me to wait yet again, and this time left for quite a while. I kept thinking I should just walk away, but part of me didn't want to be rude, especially since she lived right around the corner from my house and possibly even knew my parents. My anxiety levels would spike as I got closer and closer in my head to convincing myself to just stand up and walk away. Then it would just dissipate and I'd tell myself, No, I can't just leave. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she brought me her phone, which was an Android. I had only had an iPhone 3G at the time, and it was my first smartphone, so I was a little worried that I wouldn't know how it worked. I just held the power button down for a second, and lo and behold, it booted right up. She asked me then if I knew how to check text messages. I found and opened up the messages app, and there was only one number not saved as a contact in the app. She then pointed to it and said, That's him. That's my husband's number. Read me his text. I open it up. She had received basically the same text over and over again. Just multiple variations on hello and please respond. She angrily said to me, Read them to me right now. I want to know what he said to me. I then tell her. They basically all just say hello with a question mark. She just reaffirmed in a stern voice. Read them to me. I started reading them. Hello? Hello? Please respond. She just has her eyes closed and she's nodding sometimes, commenting with things along the lines of, That jerk. He does miss me. Well, screw him. He had his chance. She then turned quickly from this crying distraught woman who was worried about her husband leaving her into an angry and spiteful person who felt like she was in the right. There was a couple of times when I stopped reading and I would ask if she wanted me to stop and she would just snap at me, keep reading, then I would continue. I started to feel like her husband was a crazy person with this many messages. I must have scrolled and read dozens of messages almost identical, spanning back days. My heart was racing. I felt like I was involved in something I shouldn't be involved in. I really wanted to go home, but every time I stopped she would get really angry and tell me to keep going. That's when I came across the very first message that wasn't hello. Stop messaging me, you crazy woman. Leave me alone. I've reported you to the police and got a restraining order. If you come anywhere near my family, you will be arrested. My heart sank. That's when I realized all the messages I had been reading so far were being sent from her phone. I paused in shock, and she again snapped at me. Keep reading. 
I told her I couldn't because it was getting very late and my parents had dinner for me. She again just said, Why don't you just come in for dinner? I'll make you something. You can let them know later you are helping your neighbor. They won't be mad, I promise. Only this time she was a mixture of angry and desperate. I told her they would be worried and wonder why I was gone for so long. She pleaded a couple more times for me to not leave her, and she started crying as I stood up. Honestly, I felt really bad about it at the time. I rode my bike home as quickly as I could. My parents had just gotten home from work a little while ago and asked me where I was. I didn't tell them the truth because honestly I was a little worried that they wouldn't let me hang around the neighborhood when they weren't home anymore. A few days later I came home and there were three police cars out in front of her house. My heart sank. I asked my parents later that night if they knew what had happened. My dad just said, oh there was just a break in or something. I later asked one of my neighbors to see if I could get some more information about what happened. Apparently one of my neighbors fell in love with a homeless woman after inviting her in for a shower and a place to stay. He got her some new clothes and a phone and was trying to help her get a job. Turns out the reason she was homeless was because she suffered from mental illness. He then kicked her out when she started having delusions of his kid from a previous marriage being her kid as well. Honestly, he sounds like a really crappy person. She began harassing him after this, so he left the house to his parents' house and then sent the kid to his ex-wife's house. Apparently, he was worried for his ex-wife and his kid's safety. He had every right to because shortly after he left, she broke a rear window of his house and then came in. She had been living in the house for nearly a week before a neighbor noticed the broken window and called the police. She apparently trashed the whole house by that point and was arrested. I almost didn't believe it, but I went behind the house and saw the broken window. I guess the guy broke his lease and moved out immediately because he was worried she would come back after getting out of jail. I don't know if she ever did try and come back, but I really hope they disclose this to the new tenants. Honestly, I still get pretty freaked out to this day. Who knows what would have happened if I went into that house. About five years ago, when I was 16, I was living in western Pennsylvania in a heavily forested area. On this particular night, I was home alone with my younger brother, while my mom was out at a baby shower. I was in the kitchen making dinner for myself when I heard a knocking on the front porch. This wasn't a common knock, like someone might be waiting for me to open the door. It was more like a few loud taps close to one of the front windows. I paused and glanced around. From where I stood in the kitchen, I could see the front door and one of the front windows. All the lights on the ground floor were on, and with it being dark outside, all I could see in the windows was a reflection of the inside of my living room. I waited for a few moments, but when the sound didn't come again, I shrugged it off and continued concentrating on the stove. After maybe five minutes, long enough for me to forget about the sound, it repeated itself. This time from the front window at the far side of the house. Mark? I called out, thinking it might have been my brother. There was no response. I walked over to the front of the house and peered outside with my hands pressed to the side of my face, but I couldn't see anything. I turned as my brother came down the stairs. Did you just hear something from around back? He said. I held up a finger to indicate that we should pause and listen, and almost on cue, we heard footsteps calmly walking across the wooden floor of our wraparound porch, just outside the dining room wall. There's someone out there, I said quietly, more angry than scared. It was at this point that we should have locked all the doors and called out the window that we were calling the cops, but I was a stupid headstrong kid and pissed off that someone was messing with us. I remember my brother asking if the person outside was trying to distract us, but I was already at the gun cabinet. I should point out that I was raised with guns, and I knew how to properly handle one. I pulled out the 9mm from the drawer and loaded it. I'm going to scare him off, I told my brother. Lock the front door behind me. Before I could even give him a chance to argue, I was marching to the door with a gun in my hands. I threw open the door and stepped out into the porch. My brother then flicked on the outside lights, and right there, about 8 feet in front of me, was a sickly thin guy wearing a hoodie with light blue eyes and a soul patch on his chin. He had been in the process of stepping onto the porch, but the moment he saw me he spun around and ran like a bat out of hell. 
I took off running a few yards after him, then stopped, pointed my gun in the air, and fired off a shot. That's right, fuck off! I cried out. I waited until he disappeared into the trees before turning around to face the house. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that for a few moments my heart stopped. I felt that momentary wave of ice water through my veins, and the painful thudding of my heart in my chest as it tried to correct its rhythm. There was at least eight other people standing around my porch, and a handful more scattered around the yard. They were mostly men, but there was also at least two women, all dressed in dark jackets and hoodies, looking mostly like they were in their early 20s. None of them said anything, instead they all just stared at me, their hands mostly in their pockets, and I couldn't tell if any of them had weapons, then they all just scattered. Some jogged away, but most of them just walked off in different directions out into the woods. I legitimately forgot for a handful of seconds that I was holding a gun, until I raised my hands to my face and felt its weight. I sprinted back to the front door and pounded on it until my brother let me back in. I had no idea what to tell him. I had just fired a gun up into the air and none of them had cried out or made any sound whatsoever. Had they had been drunk or something and were trying to pull a prank, they would have said something. It would have been like, Whoa, sorry man, wrong house, put down the gun. But all they did was just look at me, like I had just ruined their surprise attack. And more disappointed than scared, they all just wandered off. I had no idea what to make of it. My brother turned on all the lights in the house and called the cops, who to their credit arrived within 10 minutes and swept the perimeter. There were footprints everywhere, and they asked my brother and I numerous times if we had just had a party. I kept telling them a dozen or more people had just been loitering around our house in the darkness, but the cops didn't seem to take it that seriously. They asked if the strangers had threatened us, and I had to admit that they didn't in any direct way. They confiscated the handgun after I told them that I fired off a round, but they eventually returned it. I have no idea to this day what those people were doing that night outside of our house. My brother suspects that they were part of some kind of cult and maybe have been setting up to perform some kind of ritual, and maybe that we were set to be human sacrifices. I thought it more likely they intended to break in and rob us, but saw the gun and bailed. That doesn't explain the silence, though. None of them uttered so much as a sound as they looked at me and just, as if instructed by some signal, scattered all at once. I've read that during alleged UFO sightings, people can become hypnotized by lights that appear above them and they wake up hours later in entirely new locations having no idea what happened or how they got there. I can't dismiss that kind of possibility. They all seem to be hypnotized. That group of people has never returned, and I haven't even caught a glimpse of anyone I recognized from that night in town. We bought a dog not long after. I'm 20 years old, female, and this was the last time I willingly stayed in a room alone with a child. I used to babysit on the weekends when I was 15. Most of the families that I babysit for were nice, sophisticated families who had sweet children that I loved. However, the Cooper family were the exception. Mr. and Mrs. Cooper had two children, Michael, who was 10, and Antoinette, who was 4. Michael was quiet, though misbehaved and crazy demented. Antoinette was loud, cheerful, and the complete opposite of her brother. She was so innocent. I truly adored Antoinette, yet I despised Michael. He was an absolute terror. I'd watch over the two children on Friday nights for three hours while their parents went on a date, meaning three awful hours of psychological, emotional, and physical torture from psycho Michael. There were many times that I would catch Michael staring at me while I was sitting at the dining room table doing my homework. I'd tell him to quit it, but he wouldn't stop until I moved out of view. Michael was really cruel to his sister. He would push her down the stairs, pull the heads off her Barbie dolls, and cut up her clothes. Michael would also hit the cats with a sock full of quarters. One cat actually ended up dying from internal injuries. He would growl at the neighbor's dog on a good day, and tape stuffed animals to windows with scissors sticking out of their heads on a really bad day. He was a horrible little kid to say the least, but the scariest part about babysitting the twerp was the night that he came for me. 
Let's keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to even be there that night, but Mr. and Mrs. Cooper called my mom and asked if I could babysit for them since their other arrangement had fallen through. My mom agreed without even asking me. I was supposed to babysit from 5 o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night. It was storming out, so the television had no signal, and my cell phone didn't have any reception, and Antoinette was staying with her grandmother, leaving me alone with a psycho child for five whole hours. I'm glad to say that the first few hours went by pretty quickly and without incident. He was fed, bathed, and put to bed at around eight. Michael had fallen asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. I breathed a sigh of relief and lay down on the couch with headphones in, not knowing it would be a mistake. The music was loud enough to drown out any other sounds. I stared at the ceiling for a while because there was no use in trying to delve deep into the realm of social media. I drifted to sleep at some point only to be scared awake because of an intense pressure resting on my throat. Michael was standing over me with a wide smile, gripping the handle of a kitchen knife. I wasn't able to ask what he was doing due to the sudden fear that filled me. He pushed the blade harder and harder against my neck until I could feel a burning sensation. He laughed maniacally before running out of the room. I wiped the small amount of blood from my neck while searching the entire house only to panic when he was nowhere to be found. The sound of the cat's screeching caused a breath to hitch in my throat. I quickly grabbed the baseball bat from the linen closet and hurried up the stairs. My hand hesitantly grabbed the doorknob to Michael's bedroom. I pushed the door open, which I still regret to this day. My screams of terror were drowned out by his laughter. Michael was sitting in the open doorway of his closet, with the carcass of the cat lying in his lap. I really do wish I could say that the horror had ended there, but it didn't. No. That twisted boy chased after me, attempting to slice my back open with every step he took. The deranged psychopath managed to get close enough to plunge the knife into my shoulder. Needless to say, I ran out of the front door and didn't stop until I was hunched over trying to catch my breath a block away from the police station. I packed up my things a few months after that moved into an apartment with my now husband 1,000 miles away from the town that I grew up in. I had to move 1,000 miles away from Psycho Michael in order to feel safe, but even that made me crazier. I attended therapy for several years afterward. I couldn't sleep without the lights on because the image of him holding a dead cat had permanently seared itself into my mind. I was paranoid for months, afraid that he would jump out from behind a corner and yet I still harbored the idea of having my own children one day. Truth be told, I honestly did care about the Cooper kids, but after the injuries I suffered, physical and psychological, my parents and I had no other choice but to press charges, at the very least to pay for medical bills and counseling. Michael, being as young as he was, was committed to a psychiatric treatment and juvenile detention for nearly three to five years from what I heard, but... After all the legal processes were complete, I couldn't bring myself to digging any deeper as to not relive that memory. Looking back on the incident now makes me feel silly for even being scared of a ten-year-old. It's strange how life works sometimes. It's strange how I just froze there. I eventually realized that I don't want children, and I absolutely refuse to babysit for anyone. Babysitting wasn't the job that I had imagined having while I was a senior in high school. I was paid a decent rate by the hour for watching kids that only needed to have an adult around while their parents were out. I know exactly what you're thinking. Why would you willingly waste your time watching children when you could have been working retail or some other halfway decent job? Am I close? Well, as you can imagine, the majority of kids I've looked after were happy, normal children, but my sister's children... Let me get to that. Here's a little background just to help you better understand why I don't foresee myself having children anytime soon, if ever. I'm a male and a social outcast at that. I was 16 when my mom told me that I'd be babysitting for my older sister. Naturally, I shrugged it off as it were no big deal because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? My sister needed to go out of town on a business trip for two days, which then caused my mom to decide that I was the right candidate for the job. 
I learned very quickly that kids are hungry literally every five minutes and they have no respect for the babysitter and they are totally out of control without their parents around. That was a bummer. Kids are perceived as sweet, innocent, and all-around pure, yet I have first-hand experience on just how truly creepy some kids can be. I had been around my nieces and nephews dozens of times before, so there wasn't any reason for me to think that they were a bit peculiar, aside from the fact that I walked in on Nat, short for Natalie, attempting to sacrifice her sister to the devil in order to bargain for immortality by shoving Lux's hand into a blender. Luckily, I was able to pry her away from the blender before she could turn it on. I had been watching them for less than 20 minutes when that incident occurred. Fast forward to this first afternoon, the kids were playing in the toy room, so I decided to watch television before doing my homework. I was in the middle of a funny movie when I cut the side of my neck with scissors. He drew a pentagram on the floor with ketchup, chanted something in a language that I didn't recognize, they probably made it up, and locked Jay in the basement. Tony was the good kid who explained that Mike was trying to summon a demon, someone that is close to the devil so that he could bargain Jay's soul for immortality. Mike angrily hissed at me when the plan didn't work. I swear to God, those freaking creepypastas they watch really don't help them. It was then that I learned that they had a crazy obsession with vampires, the need to be immortal and trying to draw blood from people is their way to fulfill the desire to be like the people in movies or books. These kids were actually trying to figure out ways that they could become immortal without having to stay so small for all of eternity. I thought that was a bit unhealthy. I still have no idea how the internet or horror movies when their parents weren't looking really activated this, but I'm honestly still scared of what could have happened. Nat was the eldest child. She was the bad influence on her siblings. She was the entire reason why everything went down on the second night. I was studying for a calculus test that I had the next day. The kids were supposed to be playing in the backyard, which was the mistake. All I really remember about studying is that I had been exhausted from chasing around those brats the night before because I ended up falling asleep at the kitchen table. I woke up sometime in the afternoon with my hands and feet tied to a metal pipe in the basement while my deranged nieces and nephews stood over me with a weird look in their eyes. I struggled for a good ten minutes to free myself from that stupid rope as they chanted some weird language again. I assumed that they were really trying to sacrifice me, however, I was relieved when I saw one of the cats knock a candle off the windowsill. The carpet and lengthy silk curtains immediately caught fire, which caused the kids to untie me. We rushed out of the house and to safety just in time to watch the house burn, literally to the ground. I stood motionless for what seemed like hours before eventually the police were called by the neighbors. I called my mom to come get the kids before being questioned by police for over three hours. The detective that was interrogating me surely was about to arrest me, but the fire department later ruled that the fire was an accident. My sister angrily barged into my room once she arrived home and informed me that I was no longer allowed to babysit her kids again and literally almost beat me senseless if it wasn't for my parents stopping her fury. I cried tears of joy at the news and never babysat again. I tried to explain the story to both the detectives and my family, though my nieces and nephews' stories all apparently corroborated against my own and there was nothing I could do. Needless to say, I never visited their family again, both by being shunned and by choice. Natalie and the other kids all grew out of the vampire phase from what I heard once they hit junior high and acquired less creepy, less dangerous interests. I'm 28 years old now, incredibly far away from my family, married to the most amazing woman, yet I still refuse to think about having children. You never know what they're going to get into. I've had a lot of scary experiences, but I really think this one's the scariest. It was October 2015 and my sister was giving birth and I was babysitting her son who was nine at the time. The second night I was there, this happened. I put my nephew to bed in his room and then the dog in his cage in my sister's room, which I have to get past to get to his room. I then go downstairs and I get on YouTube on my computer. Well, about an hour later. I hear a door slam. 
I just assume it's my nephew going to the bathroom. I then hear another slam. I assume it's just him wanting privacy, and I then hear a third door slam yet again. I don't know how to explain it, but I kind of just knew that it wasn't my nephew. I kept hearing things being moved around, kind of like a dresser being moved across the floor. I then start to remember that this house was built not as a regular house back in the day. The attic is apparently connected to the house next door. All you have to do is go up the attic, walk a little, then lift the top and climb down the ladder. I had no choice but to go check on my nephew. I'm still hearing noises as I go up. I hear the dog in his cage going absolutely crazy like he was trying to get out or something. I walk halfway up the stairs, then all of the noise just stops. I look in his room, and he's sleeping with his door open. There was no way in hell I was going to walk past that pitch black room. In my mind, as long as he was safe, that's all that mattered. I then walk back downstairs. As soon as I walk back downstairs, I then hear footsteps running, followed by a door slam. Well, the next day I decided to tell my sister and brother-in-law. After I told them, what they said next to me chilled me to my core. Without any concern in the world, they went on to tell me that it was the spirit of our dead neighbor. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't I just call the cops already? Well, I wasn't really thinking straight at the time. I was just way too scared, and I guess now it's a good thing that I didn't. A few weeks later, my mom had told my oldest niece, who was 16 at the time. She said that whenever she was in there, she always felt the feeling of being watched. To this day, I still don't know if I believe it was a ghost, or maybe an actual living intruder. All I know is that I for sure wasn't alone that night besides my nephew and I. Never again will I babysit there. Screw that. I think I was only 13 years old when this happened. I would be paid extra since I was going to be babysitting so many kids. I don't recall how many, but there were a lot. The reason why I was trusted with so many was because I knew them since my parents and their parents were all friends growing up, making us kind of form into a group. Now, I was the oldest out of every single kid, which was the reason I was in charge. Of course, it was going to be a long night knowing that our parents would be at some bar far away until like around 2 in the morning and then stay at a hotel. For some background, I knew the kids and they knew me. I being the oldest, 13 at the time, and the youngest being around 4. There was definitely a little bit of an age gap. The majority of the kids were around 9 to 10. Anyway, the parents left and when they did, it was already around 4 in the afternoon. About two and a half hours later, I made dinner for them. We sat down, and everyone ate their pasta. Because all the kids were together, and they all knew each other, things got pretty crazy. I won't go into detail on exactly what went down, but some of the kids were just totally wild. I didn't really mind it, though. It was pretty funny at the same time, but that's besides the point. So, after a couple more hours, it was getting pretty late. I recall it being around 11.30 when kids were starting to settle down. I had to take care of some of the kids who injured themselves by doing some really stupid stuff that was really dangerous, and I couldn't make it in time since I had to deal with some other problems as well. But I would consider myself a very caring and kind person because I always did what I needed to do to calm them down. So like I said, it was around 11.30 when they were starting to settle down, and then not too long after, they were starting to pass out. I brought and carried them upstairs and put half of them in one of the two kids' rooms. For the sake of keeping the real names out, basically we were at the house that belonged to the Abel's family. Ava and Dom were the kids in the family, making it their house. I put half the kids in Dom's room and the other half in Ava's room. They passed out very quickly after that. I went back downstairs to chill out and then listen to some music. After listening to music for a while, Ava comes downstairs, and this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. I had to look because I was listening so loud that I couldn't even hear her calling my name. She then said in a really scared tone, Something keeps being thrown at the window in my room. I'm really scared. I was a little uneasy to be hearing this since this was such a weird thing to be happening at this time of night. 
I gave her a hug and I assured her that everything would be alright and that I would go check it out. The bedrooms were on the third floor, so this was especially weird since the room's windows were really high up. I went into Ava's room and I saw that the kids were sleeping. I guess no one else had heard the something hitting the window. I started to think that Ava was just making this up or something. I went back downstairs and I went to the couch where Ava was. I was a bit surprised to see that Ava wasn't there. This is when I then hear something from downstairs. It sounded like a muffled girl scream for help. I quickly ran down there to see Ava in the garage, then being dragged out of the garage by a dark figure. Someone had forgotten to close the garage door, so it was just open. I was so scared and I went into full on panic mode. I then went back inside to go grab a weapon or something that I can use in quick defense. I found this spear looking thing that's used for fires and also pushing wood in other areas. I picked it up then ran outside to look for Ava. I soon saw Ava in this really dark figure which was taking Ava in the backwoods. I then hit the dark figure in the back of the knee practically stabbing the figure since it had a sharp edge on the side of it. The figure fell back and let out a yell of pain which is when I grabbed Ava and then practically carried her back into the house. Very stupidly. I left the weapon I had outside. Since I was in a panic, I think that I just didn't have time to think about it since Ava was the main priority for me. I get back inside and close the garage door, hoping that was the end of it. I decided not to call the cops because I get really nervous when it comes to cops, so I just wanted to avoid that. I ran upstairs but try not to make too much noise to see if any of the kids were awake due to hearing the commotion from outside. There were only about two kids who were awake, and they asked what was happening. I told them to just fall back asleep and that there was a situation that happened. They really wanted to know what, but I just told them I told them in the morning. I really don't blame them. I think I would also want to know what was happening, especially after all that commotion. So anyway, I go back downstairs on the couch where Ava thankfully was this time, and she falls asleep with the comfort of me there the whole time. Fast forward to the morning. It's around 7.30 and I can hear some commotion from upstairs. The kids were up and playing. Ava had woke me up and she was really happy to see me there. I think I really made her feel safe. After that night, me and Ava's connection was a little bit different from before. As the story is becoming better, the final spook is yet to come, so get ready. I walked downstairs to see if anything had been stolen. I check and I didn't really see anything out of the ordinary. Well, nothing out of the ordinary, except for one thing. There happened to be a paper that was in the garage. It was taped to the sliding door and I think that's why I paid attention to it. I started to read it and it said one word, revenge. I was really scared reading this because how the hell could someone have put this here? Then reality hit me that someone had to have come inside after the garage door had been closed, which is when I thought we were safe. I haven't shared this story with Ava because I don't want her to feel scared or threatened more than she probably already does. I do still have a few questions left unanswered though. Who did this? Why did they target this house specifically? And last but not least, did the intruder purposely try and take Ava out of everyone there? Why did he want her specifically? I know I'll probably never have my answers to these questions, but it's absolutely chilling to think about. I'm a female and I'm 15 years old. This all started a couple months back when I got my very first job as a babysitter. I babysit on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. Keep that in mind. The people I babysit for don't even live that far away from my house. Their house is like a block away from me. So by now you've probably guessed that I walked to work. Now, I've always been a very cautious person and also a paranoid one, so keep that in mind too. The first time it happened was after a month of doing my job. One day I got done babysitting and I just walked to my friend's house that's a couple of blocks away from their house. So as I'm walking there, I hear someone behind me. I should also mention that I was snapchatting my friend to let her know how far away from the house I was. Anyways, I hear someone behind me so I turn around and see this guy on a bike right behind me. I didn't think too much about it but I was keeping him in mind 
I don't pay much attention to him and I keep Snapchatting, just in case he tries something. I then turn to the left, and so does he. At this point, I'm really aware now of what this guy's doing. I'm pretty sure he's following me. The guy looked tall as hell, and I'm only 5'5", five five. so again I make a turn, and so does he. By now I'm getting pretty panicked and I'm very much aware that this guy is following me. Anytime I slowed down, so would he. If I sped up, again, so did he. My friend's house comes into view and I speed walk over there with him telling me. I reach her front door and I start knocking and then I hear someone say, Hey, you better watch out. I'll get you. And I turn around and the guy was right behind me in front of her house. By this point, I'm very panicked, but I just keep knocking, and before she answers, this guy then pulls something out. At first, I didn't know what it was until I looked a little closer, and you guessed it. The guy literally pulled out his penis. Right as he does that, I pull my phone up and I catch him in the act, and my friend then opens the door. She lets me inside, and she asks me why I'm shaking. I then show her the video, and she tries calming me down. Fast forward a week later as I'm walking to my job and I see him yet again. My heart instantly drops and I just speed walk to the lady's house which I work for. He didn't really say anything. It was more like he was just watching me this time. This happened every single time that I would walk to work. But he wouldn't try anything because it would be daytime and most of the time someone was around. That all changed when they asked me to babysit their daughter at 10pm. I wasn't really going to walk to work alone so I asked the lady if she'd come pick me up instead. She did, and of course nothing happened. We then started doing that until I was calm enough to walk by myself to work. The following week, she asked me again to babysit at night, so I decided to take a knife with me just in case something happens, and I told my mom goodbye. I walked out in the really dark street, and the lights in that area weren't really good, which is why I was so scared to walk there in the first place. But anyways... I was walking to work, and I then hear a crunch behind me. My body then immediately tenses up. I knew someone was there, but I really dreaded thinking it was him. I decide not to look back, but instead just speed walk again. For a few minutes, I didn't even hear anything, but I then turn around, and there he fucking is. I don't say a single word, and just straight up bolt to their house. I tell them what happened, and she told me not to worry, and that he wouldn't do anything then left me to babysit. Fast forward the second day and I walked to work and nothing happened this time. I was checking all my surroundings like a really crazy person, but no one was there. I then turned to knock on their door and from the corner of my eye, I see movement. I look and this guy's leaning out from behind trash cans and I, and I barely caught him. My heart started going crazy. I then knocked harder on the door and I saw him from the corner of my eyes just looking at me. He probably didn't even know I saw him, but I did. Fast forward the next day and the walk to work wasn't really that much. I didn't see him, but the walk back, that's a different story. I was walking back and I think it was about 12am. I texted my mom that I was on my way home and she told me to stop by the store. Now, this store is like right across from our house, so it wasn't really a big deal. This weird creep follows me, all the while making kids noises and saying really weird things like I love you over and over again. I just walk to the store and this guy literally stands right in front of the store. I get very angry at this point and I tell the cashier what's going on. He then looks at the guy for a minute and then tells him to leave. He says he wants to buy something, but the guy just tells him to leave. Well, he doesn't leave and he just keeps on standing there. So I then say to him, Why are you following me? He then says back, I'm not following you. And I said, Yeah, sure you're not. And I just stand in line and get my stuff and then walk out the door. The guy has the audacity to continue following me, all while making kissing sounds and then repeatedly saying, I love you. I die for you. I was just so fucking mad at this point that I snap back and say, Look, fuck off you creep. Leave me the fuck alone already, with a very angry tone. This doesn't even have an effect on this guy, and he just keeps repeating the same shit. I then tell him, Look, I know where you live, and I'll tell your mom about this, 
because I've actually seen him leave the apartments that are near the store. Anyways, he doesn't even care what I'm saying, and he's making eye contact with me the entire time. I just walk to my house, and I finally get there, but right before I get inside and slam the door, I then say to him, If you ever follow me again, you're gonna fucking regret it. He responds to this by laughing, then saying, Oh yeah? What the hell are you gonna do? And proceeds to blow me a kiss. I then just walk inside, feeling very numb. I had just finally got home and I just started sobbing. My sister asked what was happening and I told her everything. She's extremely overprotective with me and she got really pissed off after I told her. She tells me that she's going to walk me to work and that if we see him, she's going to kill the guy. Obviously, I know that's not true, but it really made me feel better. All of this happened last week and today in a couple of hours, I have to babysit again. I know it doesn't seem like much, but I'm still really scared of what will happen to me in the future. I really don't even know what to do at this point. If any of you guys that are listening have some advice, please tell me what to do. I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and if anything else happens, I'll definitely give you guys an update. Be safe out there. In June of 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin accompanied his family on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in the southeastern United States. The name Great Smoky Mountains comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the range, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance. Interestingly, this fog is caused by chemicals emitted from the local flora, chemicals that have a high vapor pressure and easily form vapors at normal temperature and pressures. Yet even having heard the scientific explanation behind the phenomenon, seeing all that fog clinging to the hilltops is a very eerie sight indeed. Hailing from nearby Knoxville, Tennessee, the Martin family had a long-running tradition of celebrating Father's Day by taking camping trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. In 1969 would mark young Dennis's first trip into the woods in the company of his father, older brother, and grandpa. The group drove out to Cades Cove, an isolated valley located in the Tennessee section of the park, then hiked out towards Russell Field, where they set up camping and began preparing for their first night under the stars. The following morning, they set off for a place known as Spence Field, a picturesque highland meadow and popular camping spot which was bisected by the rolling hills and jagged mountain peaks of the Appalachian Trail. When the group arrived at Spence Field, Dennis and his older brother set off to explore the campsite and reportedly talked to many of the other campers who had pitched their tents nearby. This is how they got talking to a ragtag group made up of other campers' children who made fast friends with the Martin boys. Dennis' father was pleased to see his son getting along so well with the other kids, and having his sons occupied meant the adults could get on with the important task of assembling their four-man tent. Once the task was completed, Dennis was still playing with the group of other kids, and his father says he watched as the group gleefully took up hiding positions from which to playfully ambush a group of approaching adults. When the grown-ups entered the kids' make-believe kill zone, they all jumped out, growling and roaring like wild animals as they set upon their laughing parents. All but one. All but little Dennis. His father watched with growing concern as the seconds ticked by, and Dennis had yet to emerge from his hiding spot. Eventually, he couldn't bear it anymore, and after rising from his camping chair, Dennis's father marched off the spot where he had last seen his six-year-old son and began calling out his name. But what started out as stern, fatherly commands soon degenerated into terrified pleas, and as he continued to call out in desperation, the other families began to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once Dennis's grandpa knew he was missing, he set the group into action, sending one group two miles up the Appalachian Trail with his son, while he led another group back towards the Cades Cove Ranger Station, arriving there around 8.30pm that night. Thus began an extensive, well-publicized search and rescue operation, in which National Park Service personnel was supplemented by National Guard soldiers and even a unit of Green Berets. At the peak of the search operation, more than 1,400 people were operating in the few square miles around Spencefield. 
but not a single one found anything that could lead them to the missing boy. However, in the aftermath of the operation, the search efforts drew a great deal of criticism from search and rescue experts far and wide who said the large number of personnel involved potentially obscuring tracks and ground that was already difficult to track over due to heavy rain. Shockingly, a shoe print belonging to that of a child was actually found at one point, but the track was dismissed as belonging to one of the Boy Scouts that was helping with the search. Later, however, investigators kicked themselves when they found that the tracks were determined to have come from a child who was missing one shoe, which disappeared on the banks of a stream. Some suggesting it was possible that the tracks belonged to Martin, and this theory was supported when a discarded child-sized shoe and sock were found just three days later. Although search and rescue personnel continued their search for more than two weeks, scouring the hillsides night and day in continual shifts, no further clues to Martin's whereabouts were ever found. The Martin family was so understandably desperate for answers that they offered a $5,000 reward for any information that would reunite them with their beloved Dennis. This got the attention of a handful of so-called psychics, who some might argue sought to exploit the Martin family's grief and maybe cashing in if they guessed the right area of the Smokies to search. Surprisingly, none of these psychics ever proved to be of any help. Many years later in 1985, a man who had apparently been illegally collecting American ginseng in the park claimed to have come across the skeletal remains of a child while exploring the woods. The man said he should have reported the find, but was terrified of being prosecuted for his prohibited herbal hobby. Not only that, but he was also unable to point investigators in the direction of the site he'd found the bones in the first place. There have been many theories that have attempted to explain what happened to young Dennis Martin that day. Most detectives, both amateur and professional, believe that Dennis became disoriented whilst looking for a hiding place, maybe even forgetting his way back to camp when he emerged from it. Either way, Dennis then strayed further from the camp and could easily have fallen down one of the many steep slopes and ravines that dotted the area surrounding Spencefield. However, Dennis was wearing a bright red t-shirt when he went missing, not something that would be easy for search and rescue teams to miss. Dennis would have to be completely covered in foliage to remain undetected with that color of shirt, and despite it being feasible due to his small size, the likelihood of that is extremely low. Others are quick to remind us of the presence of black bears in the area, as well as copperhead vipers and feral pigs, all of which would have posed a considerable threat to six-year-old Martin. Park rangers told investigating police that an underweight bear had been caught in a boar trap in the Spencefield area just two weeks earlier. Although the bear was released safely, the incident suggested that it may have been struggling to find enough food, prompting to turn to a less familiar source of food. Yet however tragic and brutal the aforementioned theories are, Dennis's father believes something considerably more sinister. Based on the eyewitness account of one Harold Key, who says he heard a loud scream on the very same afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Dennis's dad firmly believed that his son was kidnapped by an opportunistic predator. Shortly after he heard the scream, Harold Key claimed to have seen a disheveled bearded man with wild unkempt hair fleeing through the woods in an apparent bid to remain undetected by the nearby campers. Harold's family went on to explain that they saw a flash of red on the figure's shoulders, which some believe was actually Dennis himself, slung over the shoulder of this mysterious figure as they carried him away. Harold later speculated that the man may have been a moonshiner, explaining his reluctance to be seen. Despite the report, FBI investigators ultimately dismissed it, saying that as much as Harold meant well, his account was frankly unreliable as his timeline of events were off. But one retired park ranger lamented the failure to properly follow up either the footprints or the sighting of the rough-looking man, arguing that as the location of the sighting was downhill from where Dennis disappeared, it was possible to cover that distance in the time frame, even carrying a child, but that the individual in question would have some impressive strength, stealth, and endurance. So if this is the case, who is this hairy mystery man, this bearded vagrant who was apparently capable of such an impressive physical feat, even if it was in the context of the despicable abduction of a child? 
Given the lack of investigation into his sighting or his tracks, it seems we might never know. But even if we did get to the bottom of the mystery of a man living in the Appalachian Mountains with a penchant for kidnapping children, I don't think the answers would bring us any solace. Maybe the closure would be worth it, especially for the family, but nightmares can be a high price to pay, and wondering what happened to young Dennis Martin can give even the most hardened true crime reader some very sleepless nights. So in 2012, my then-girlfriend and I went on a big year-long road trip through the States, working on farms along the way for room and board, and ended our trip by driving across Canada, west to east, stopping back in Nova Scotia where we lived. At some point we got a puppy, and around the time we got to Alberta, with an extra mouth to feed, money was running out. Since I'm a carpenter, I decided to find a place to rent, and I would get a job for a few months before we kept going on our trip. We scrolled through Kijiji, the Canadian Craigslist, and eventually found an ad for a place. There was this one guy who lived in a very cool looking house and was only a short drive from where I had found a job at. He wanted someone to move in with him to help out with the bills. We started corresponding with him by email. I told him that I was going to work in the area and my girlfriend would be staying home with a puppy. Being desperate and having become accustomed to trusting strangers throughout this long trip, we agreed to send him a deposit and take the offer. We got to this place a few days later. It was in the middle of nowhere and there were no neighbors, but we had known that before. This guy looked to be about 30 to 35, small framed, and just looked like a regular working country dude. Except his expression was weird. It was like he was scared or something. He almost looked like he was ashamed of himself. He was fine with our dog being inside, though he had a dog that wasn't allowed inside. This struck me as weird since this is the cold Canadian North. Right away, he met us at the door, and I felt there was something off about him. It made me uneasy, especially since I would be going off to work every day, leaving my girlfriend alone with this creepy guy. But she didn't seem worried, and I didn't want to be controlling, so I let it go. The first night we were there, he wanted to have a few drinks with us. We obliged politely. He brought us a few cans of shitty watery beer, and meekly drank his while sitting across the kitchen table from us. We tried to relax the situation, and asked him a few friendly questions about himself. His answers were brief and quiet. He seemed to want friendship, but also seemed completely unsure of how to get it. He went over a few rules he had. Number one was to stay out of his room, which was obviously fine. Number two was that we were not allowed to go into the basement. Kind of weird. And number three was to stay away from the barn. By this point, I could imagine the headlines, Nova Scotian couple found murdered, bound in barn. That night, I didn't sleep very much. I wasn't supposed to start work for a couple of days, so I just stayed up reading and playing with our pup. I heard his truck pull out of the driveway pretty early in the morning. I headed for the basement because I just had to know what was down there. It was pretty bare. Just a few washing and drying machines and some lawn chairs. But I opened a closet door and found a weird nurse costume that looked like it was for sexual purposes. A roll of duct tape, a set of handcuffs, a shotgun, and a box of shells, all sitting together on the same shelf. I woke up my girlfriend and explained that she no longer had any say in the matter and that we were leaving before he got home. We sent him a message after we left, lying, saying that one of our family members had gotten sick and we were moving back home. He never offered to return our money and we had no more contact with him. I'm still waiting to see him in the news. My ex thinks that I worry too much, but her parents thanked me profusely. And I still wonder, what was inside that barn? Number 2 The following story is told from a female's point of view, narrated by special guest Darkness Prevails. 
I got married when I was 19, and my husband and I had no clue what to do with our new life together. We dropped out of college, and our studio apartment was too expensive. We thought it was the ideal time to travel and have adventures before settling down. We came across a post on the internet from a man who was looking for workers on his horse ranch. He would provide all meals and lodging in exchange for labor around the ranch. It looked like just the solution for us. He claimed to be very knowledgeable in trades and would teach us to build machinery, woodworking, welding. We actually did learn to weld, which is pretty cool, etc. The pictures were beautiful. The log cabin he built was spacious and we would have a nice big bedroom. There were lots of other people in the photos and in our correspondence with him, he always mentioned other people and referred to himself as we. He advertises on multiple platforms and everything looked really legit. We booked our flight. There was nobody else there. He was in his 60s, but mentally and physically very fit. One of the first things he said to us was, I never judge people based on their past. Do you believe people can change? I sure do. It seemed harmless enough. He took us grocery shopping and told us to pick whatever we wanted. We immediately got the vibe that his kindness was forced and that he was being over generous. I'm going to get right into listing the weird stuff we noticed. He built the house himself and his bedroom had a door to the only upstairs bathroom, which he didn't lock from the inside. He would invite us into his room and on his table was an old video camera with about 30 little tapes strewn about. He would always talk about how much he loved the Japanese, how he specifically marketed toward them and had a few Japanese ladies in the past. He often brought up people who had stayed with them before and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. One day he told us to get in the truck because we were going into the city. We were way out in the country, so it was a long ride, but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come with us and work on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. We are introverts, and it just felt very odd to approach people and ask them to get in the truck. He got upset by our disapproval, so we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He went to talk to people on his own. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give away to a very temperamental and aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy, but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. It was also extremely apparent that he did not view women as equal or anywhere near equal to men. He had had military training and was a big, strong man, cunning, always thinking. Now, our parents never wanted us to go. They realized it to be a potentially dangerous situation, but we thought we had done our due diligence. However, we never even thought to Google this guy's name. I get an email from my mom one day, freaking out and telling me to do a Google search, then get on the next plane home. A quick search showed us his arrest record, strangling and sexually assaulting a young woman, followed by headlines reading, do not go to this horse ranch. This man is dangerous. We were thoroughly creeped out and booked a flight home. We were then presented with the dilemma of how to tell a potentially dangerous man that we wanted to leave. I forgot to mention that he would tell us daily about how we could live there permanently and start a family. He would fantasize about Christmases with our future children and raising them on the ranch. We thought it was established that this was a very temporary thing and we had families back home who missed us. This is the weirdest part for me. I made up a lie about an emergency back home and when I told him, it was like he could see right through me. I'm convinced that he not only knew I was lying, but he knew I was going to lie about needing to leave before I ever opened my mouth. This look came over him that I have never seen on a person before. He was angry, but hiding it. He was hiding so many thoughts and emotions that I couldn't tell if I should be frightened or relieved. Before I finished my sentence, he said, when do you need to go to the airport? Monotone. I told him right now. He took us and put on his friendliest personality and told us that if we ever wanted to come back, he would buy our tickets. We said we'd be in touch. Just recently, I googled his name again and discovered a page, a forum, for people who had gone to his ranch, mostly couples like us with eerily similar experiences. They spoke about how he says not to judge people on their past, the grocery store, the bathroom, 
and how they heard him listening behind his door during their midnight bathroom trips, the videotapes, and how they watched them and saw young Japanese girls flexing their arms, looking through his search history and seeing nothing but Japanese pornography. They talk about how he would make rude remarks to the girlfriends and about creepy rituals in the woods, which we experienced. It was like a full moon ritual inside a circle drawn on the ground. They spoke about being driven to the city and asked to jump out when thin young ladies walked by and tell them to come back to the ranch. I could go on and on. He is still operational. This forum I found was aimed at gathering stories and preventing future visitors to the ranch. The police do not have enough evidence to convict him of anything. I know I left a lot of creepy deeds out. I didn't want this to be too long and I'm not a great storyteller. I'm unsure whether it'd be appropriate to name the man or the ranch, but the blog where all the others have written about their encounters is probably much creepier than my story. We got away with much less weirdness because I don't believe I was his type and he may have feared my husband. If anyone is interested, I may be able to give a few hints so it can be found. Number one. I graduated high school almost a year ago. I really had no urge to attend college or military and basically got stuck in my boring hometown for months, where I slowly became dependent on Xanax and booze and was destined to repeat the cycle of white trash that my parents had set up for me and their parents before and so on. I knew I had to leave my hometown, so I decided to sign up for a website you may have heard of called www.oof.com Worldwide Opportunities in Organic Farming. You pay a small fee and they tell you about available organic farming operations that will feed you and allow you to stay with them in return for a certain amount of work around the farm. The place I decided to commit to was a Hare Krishna community in the Deep South. I got there and my car almost immediately broke down. It was a 30-year-old Chevy Blazer I bought on Craigslist for about $500. I later found out that it was beyond repair by this point. The closest town was about 20 miles away, so I found myself stranded, surrounded by the most unbearable hipsters. To be more specific, I would say about a third of the population of this community were either first or second generation Indian immigrants living near the temple for religious reasons. Another demographic were aging hipsters also there for spiritual purposes, but also running the small-scale organic farm located on the property. Everyone else, however, self-absorbed, condescending, right out of college but vapid as shit hipsters. I basically kept to myself, but occasionally was forced into conversations about vibrating crystals and their three-year spiritual journey no doubt being funded by their parents. I had been there for weeks and was desperate for a real conversation, and then Michael showed up. I had heard stories about Michael. A couple of days before I showed up, he had left to retrieve an impounded car in a large city about an hour away. Everyone said he was lazy and insane, and would spend hours in his room doing yoga instead of coming down and working with the rest of us. He showed up late in the evening, going on about how he was really going to get involved with the farming and how he was going to throw himself into the Krishna consciousness. He was in his early 30s and looked like a balding Hasidic Jew, his unwashed sideburns curled. He spoke like a stoner cartoon character, his sentences always punctuated with, and, uh, or, and like giving his utterly fried brain time to figure out what the others wanted to hear. He reminded me of the many friends I had left back home. We became fast friends, as he was the only person there who didn't give me the urge to bite my fingers off when he spoke. We were both from Texas, so we talked about the loony conservative teachers we had in high school, football, and of course, drugs. Every now and then, he would bring up subjects that really threw me off, he wasn't able to get his car out of the impound garage, so he schemed the best way to break it out. These plans involved firearms, pipe bombs, and telepathy. He told me he came to the Hare Krishna temple to befriend some of the gurus and learn Reiki meditation, a form of meditation used to control the minds and bodies of other people. 
He told me he believed he had used Reiki once to seduce a woman at a party. This is when I understood his reputation. I simply nodded and laughed occasionally when he went off on these rants. I knew that one day I would reach a saturation point for his absurdity, but I could probably endure it for a week more. A couple of days later we were eating lunch with one of the gurus. I was telling Michael about my trip to the giant field where the Branch Davidian used to be. He wasn't sure what the Branch Davidian was, so I explained to him about Waco, David Korsh, and the botched siege operation by the FBI and ATF that led to the death of 76 Davidians and 4 ATF agents. He was enraged upon hearing this. Like, the government is always trying to silence people preaching the truth, man. Like, that's so fucked up. I wanted to explain to him that David Korsh was a sociopathic cult leader, interested in power and nothing else, but he wasn't having it. Now I was getting angry. He was throwing a tantrum about a subject I had just explained to him, and now he was telling me that I'm wrong and that Korsh was a martyr. That's when I saw the truly insane Michael. He was spitting, red as a beet, pacing back and forth. I left the table and got back to work, but he followed me. After half an hour of this absurd argument, I couldn't handle it anymore. I'm not having this conversation with a fucking lunatic, Michael. How can I expect logic from you? You came here to get superpowers. The look in his eyes changed from anger to hatred. He got real still and then came at me. Michael was a big guy, much bigger than me. He lunged at me and I ran. As I ran, I went through my pocket, praying that I had grabbed my knife before I left my cabin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't walk around my old neighborhood without some sort of protection. Plus, it was a pretty useful tool on the farm. Luckily, I had grabbed it. I turned around and he saw it. He stopped and contemplated for about three seconds. He then turned around and finished his lunch. The next day, I pulled the temple president aside and explained to him what happened and that we should probably get rid of him. It didn't take much convincing. No one really cared for him and he wasn't much help on the farm. I felt kind of bad snitching on the guy. He was in a pretty desperate situation. He had no car, no money, and I can't imagine he had many friends. The temple president also informed me that he had been an alcoholic for 10 years and came here to get sober. I found it very strange that he never told me this. Later that day, I saw through my window someone drive up and hand him several suitcases for him to pack what little he had. I saw them both drive off to God knows where. Weeks went by and the whole encounter kind of faded from my conscience. Late one night, I got a text. Hey, this is Michael. We can get my car out for like $280. Wanna go traveling? I never responded. I'm not sure how he got my number, but I figured he looked me up on Facebook or something. A few nights later, I was in the temple office using the Wi-Fi to send some emails. I was making my walk back to my cabin, and from the pitch black, I could hear a lot of loud banging coming from the barn. I remember thinking it must be an animal, but also thinking that it must be a pretty big one to make that much noise. I entered my cabin. The actual door to the cabin doesn't have a lock, but my bedroom door did, so I used that one. I was pretty unsettled by the banging, but I figured my imagination was getting the best of me. Later that night, I woke up needing to take a piss. The cabin didn't have a bathroom, but we did have a shared outhouse. I didn't feel like putting on shoes and walking around in the dark, so I figured I would just piss in the sink. I know it's gross but I'm the only one who uses that kitchen. I opened my bedroom door and nearly pissed myself right there. Michael, completely naked, was crouching in the corner of my kitchen, facing the wall. I made a noise I wasn't aware I could make, something you would hear Shaggy make on Scooby-Doo. The noise alerted Michael to my entrance. All he did was glare at me and shake his whole body. 
I slammed my door and locked it almost immediately. I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to pacify me with Reiki meditation. I called 911. I didn't open my door or even approach it until I saw the red and blue lights outside my window. Michael wasn't there when they arrived. My guess is he ran deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. I explained to the police Michael's story and what happened that night. There wasn't much they could do since no one seemed to know anything about Michael. I didn't even know his last name. I had to leave the farm shortly after. Calling the police was really frowned upon since I believe many of the old hippies thought they were still avoiding the draft. I didn't mind leaving either. I couldn't sleep knowing Michael might still be out there in those woods, angrier than he was before. I stayed up for almost three days while I waited for my friend to come pick me up. The story I'm about to tell is not as scary as it is sad, but don't be fooled. There were many moments during this time that I was scared out of my mind. Although I'm here to put some fear into readers, it's also a great opportunity to educate everyone on the dangers related to a common milady. So, turn out the lights and get comfortable. Here comes my scary tale of the nicest but creepiest roommate I've ever had. Upon graduating high school, my parents hit me with the ultimatum, you're a man now, it's time you start paying us rent or move out and get your own place. Heck, I wasn't about to pay my folks to live with them, so the hunt for an apartment started immediately. Fortunately, I had a job for a couple of years, so I had some money saved up. I think my parents thought I would choose to stay at home and they'd be able to get a piece of it, but I'd been looking for an excuse to get away from them and they gave it to me. It wasn't long before I found a place with a friend of mine riding his couch. This wasn't my long-term plan, of course, but it gave me a chance to get away from my parents. Within that month, I found a guy from work who had just been forced to kick his roommate out of their place for not paying as part of the rent. This dude was really cool and possibly the kindest guy I'd ever met, but he wasn't a pushover. We talked about each of our predicaments and decided I would take his former roomie's place, and it's where I would stay until just recently. We got along great, probably because we were a lot alike, and it also helped we work different shifts. Our days off were spent on the couch playing Halo and throwing down many bottles of beer. Drug tests at work prevented us from enjoying things of an herbal variety, but we managed to have a good time anyway. Nothing out of the ordinary happened for the first few months, but one night, I got a shock of a lifetime. I had crashed out early one night after working a 12-hour shift, the third of that week. I'm not sure what the time was, but at some point, a loud banging at my door drew me from my sleep. In a slow and groggy state, I rolled over to see what had caused it. That's when I came eye to eye with my roommate. I was so shocked I could have jumped out of my skin. After taking a second to catch my breath, I yelled at him. Dude! What? But the reaction I expected never came. Turning on my overhead lamp, I still received no feedback. Utterly confused, I walked up to him and stared directly at his face. He just looked ahead, standing like a statue, saying nothing. This is when I realized that he must be sleepwalking. Although I considered waking him up, I seemed to have remembered that you weren't supposed to do it, so... I slowly turned him around and walked him back to his room. When we got there, I told him to go to bed and believe it or not, he did. Very pleased with myself and still horribly tired, I went back to my room and locked the door. The rest of the night was happily uneventful. The next time I saw him, which was about two days later, I timidly mentioned it to him. I was unsure if he was even aware he did it and I didn't want to embarrass him. To my relief, he was well aware of his condition. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Like most things in his life, he was able to laugh it off. He did, however, apologize for scaring me and assured me that I handled it the right way. I more than likely wouldn't have been able to wake him up anyway. In the future, he would be sure to lock his bedroom door and suggested I do the same. There was no guarantee it would keep him in or out, but it was worth a shot. I'd had no other run-ins with my zombie roomie for another four months, and when I did, I handled it the same way as I had before. 
After thinking about it for a while, it seemed stupid to get mad about the situation. It wasn't something he could control. Besides, there were certain protocols I could take to keep him out of my room at night, and once I did, I never received another nocturnal visit again. Sadly, by the end of that year, it would cease to be a worry in either of our lives. On December 3rd, I had only just returned from a three-day vacation, a vacation my boss had forced me to take because I was grossly over-accrued on my vacation time. I didn't tell him, but I was hoping to combine that time with the other three days I had coming so I could drink all the way through the holidays till January 3rd. Since my plans had been ruined, my mood was on the bad side. I was vegging out on the couch when I got a phone call from work. The moment I saw the number on my phone, it put me in an even worse mood, but I decided to answer it in case it was my roommate that was the one calling. Is your roommate there? He hasn't shown up for work today. Unfortunately, it was my boss. I was quick to remind him in the kindest way possible, of course, that I was not his mother and I had not seen him in a few days. My boss asked me to check his room and see if he was still sleeping, and I did because he was my boss, but he was nowhere to be seen. His bed was still messed up, which was strange. His anal retentive nature would never let him leave the house without making it. I promised my boss I'd call him if I heard from him, and I hung up. As soon as I hung up, I called my roomie, but got no answer. Doing the only thing I could, I left a message and went on with my day. There was still no return calls that evening. It really was unlike him to drop off the map like this, but he must have had his reasons. The next morning, I checked in on his room to see what time he'd finally came back, but everything still looked as it had the day before. It was definitely a head-scratcher. This type of behavior was very unlike him. You never know, though. I'd only known him a couple of years. Maybe he had a dark side I'd never seen. Shortly before I left the apartment for work, my phone rang. I checked the caller ID. It was a number I didn't recognize, but then an idea hit me. He must have lost his phone. And I answered it, trying not to laugh at him. Is this Anthony Curtis? The voice on the other end was not who I expected. I said yes, and his next question was if I was a friend of my roommate, and I answered yes once again. Before he could ask me another question, I asked him one. Who are you and what do you want? His answer threw me for a loop. I'm sorry, Mr. Curtis. My name is Detective Jones with Littleton Police Department. I'm afraid your roommate, Daniel Grant has been in an auto accident and I regret to inform you he passed away at the hospital in the early hours of December 3rd. All I could say back to him was, What? Shock could not begin to describe what I felt that moment. I guess I had gone silent because at some point I heard him saying, Hello, are you still there? After I took a deep, jagged breath, I was finally ready to answer him. Yeah. I'm here. What happened? Where did this occur? I was full of questions. He should have been in his room at that time sleeping, not in public. I continued to ask the cop questions. All we know at this time, sir, was that he was involved in a single car crash. He collided with a power pole as he ran off the road. His next series of questions would begin to unravel the mystery. Are you aware of any reason why Mr. Grant should have been on the road that time of night? I told him, oh, That's the strange thing. He should have been home sleeping. He had work that afternoon. He had never went out at night regardless. Well, it was strange that he was driving only wearing his boxers. That's when the whole thing clicked into place. I think I understand now, detective. He was a sleepwalker. He must have been driving in his sleep. Our discussion continued for a few minutes longer and then I made the terrible call to his parents to notify them of the accident. They drove into town from Pueblo the next day. The arrangements were made to return his body to Pueblo and the date and time of the funeral was set for three days later. Just to show how loved he was by everyone who knew him, our supervisors halted all work for that day to allow everyone to attend the funeral. I'm not a fan of funerals overall, but this was one I would never have dreamed of missing. 
Sending my best friend off right was the least I could do for him. The complete facts of the story were soon released and it seemed to have played out just as I feared. Danny had sleepwalked his way out of his locked bedroom door, out to his car and down the road. I had no idea sleepwalking could go this far, but after a discussion with my doctor, I learned how serious the condition could become. Despite the fact neither of us had any idea of how dangerous his sleepwalking could be, I can't help but feel a small amount of guilt in relation to his death. Maybe if we had done some research, we could have put some safeguards into place. But honestly, how safe would a pair of two 20-year-olds really have been? One of us probably would have passed out after a long night of video games and drinking and left the doors unlocked. The fact is, Danny's death was a freak accident, plain and simple. I stayed in our apartment for a couple of years more and just recently decided to let it go once my girlfriend and I found a house to rent together. I guess I stayed around so long without finding another roommate because it would have made his death more real. My girlfriend and I would often do the same things Danny and I did on my days off and it was almost as fun as the old days but in the end I realized as long as I stayed in that apartment I would never truly be able to accept he was gone. So last month the decision was made to pass the place on to another pair of young guys from work. They had been having a hard time finding a place to rent and since I'd been in their position not that long ago it was the right thing to do. I truly hope they have as much fun in that place as Danny and I did and that their friendship doesn't end in such a tragic way as ours. Back in 2018, I ended up flying over to Greece for a week-long solo vacation. There were a few hotels I had my eye on while I was planning the trip, but then for the same price, I could get an entire apartment on Airbnb, and some of the stuff they had available for rent was absolutely amazing. For the price of an entire ensuite hotel room, I could get an apartment that looked something like a legitimate millionaire might choose to stay in during a visit to a French Riviera or something. Greece doesn't exactly have the strongest economy, so it kind of made sense that it would be going so cheap, but even so, compared to the other listings, there's no way to describe it other than suspiciously affordable. Like any other sane person would have done, I immediately went to check the reviews, and even with all the 5-star reviews and glowing praise of the apartment's owner, I still thought the whole thing was just way too good to be true. But then again, there were only two windows where the place wasn't booked, so not only did that show that the other people were generally interested in the place, but it also meant that it was a case of poop or get off the pot, so to speak. I could book the place, check it out, then if it turned out to be some well-distinguished nightmare, I could just maybe just find myself a hotel chain with a simpler but more reliable kind of room and just use the place to rest my head after long days of exploring my ancestral home. The flight over to Greece was the first long flight I'd been on, and the whole process just completely exhausted me. It's weird that just sitting on a plane for almost 10 hours can do that to a person, but I guess it was mainly the stress that took it out of me. Worrying that I'd lost my passport or my e-ticket, constantly worrying that I'd left something crucial back in my apartment, all irrational first-time flyer stuff, I know, but after the relief of landing without a hitch and making it to the Airbnb okay, I felt like I could sleep for days. Even the elation of seeing the apartment didn't keep me up for long, and my god was I elated. It was everything I could have possibly hoped for. A magnificent mosaic of black and white tiles and wrought iron spiral staircases. Hell, they could have charged double the asking price and people still would have paid it to stay in a place like that. But then the question remained, why exactly were the owners charging such a low rate? I know, I know, it was a huge question, one that any right-minded person would have still been asking themselves, but I guess the place's beauty and my exhaustion made for this perfect cocktail to wipe my brain of thought and... I told myself that I could always properly survey the place the next morning after a good night's sleep. I remember waking up just before dawn to the sound of something scraping really close next to me. 
I mean, maybe scraping isn't the right word, but I ended up leaning over to the bedside table, switching on the light and seeing what was definitely a cockroach running for the darkness below the bed. I hate bugs, and cockroaches have to be the top of the list for me. And suddenly, I understood why the pricing of the Airbnb was so low. The entire building probably had an infestation that they just couldn't get rid of, and maybe they couldn't afford to have the place bug bomb, so they were hoping for a few quick bucks from Airbnb so they could afford it. That little theory of mine made much more sense when the owners refused me any kind of refund, giving me some bullcrap excuse of how Greece has lots of bugs in the summer. Other guests didn't have a problem with it. They knew what they were doing, acting as if though a roach infestation is just like having a few houseflies, and trying to get a refund became a whole other story, just not nearly as scary as the one I have to tell here. So, if it wasn't already clear, there was no way in hell that I was about to spend another night in a place that had roaches so close to the bed, and luckily, I hadn't actually unpacked by that point, so I was able to just grab my stuff, jump in the rental and drive down through town towards the harbor front where I knew that there were a bunch of hotels. Only as I'm driving, I can feel that there's something wrong with my left ear, kind of like it felt cold on the inside. I started thinking that maybe I had some kind of ear infection, that the exhaustion and the stress of flying had messed with my immune system. But then, I was driving, on my way to book a new hotel room, and start some epic email battle to get a refund, so it wasn't like I was in much of a position to do anything about it. But the thing was, it was still like 5 or 6 in the morning at that point, so it's not like any of the local clinics were open for me to get looked over. So, when the weird feeling in my ear started getting worse, I decided to pull over near the harbor front and stick a cotton swab in my ear to see if there was any blood or pus or whatever. And apologies to those who found that a little gross, but if you did, stop reading now, because things are about to get way, way worse. I pull over, fish around in my hand luggage for a little Tupperware box of bathroom-related stuff, pull out a cotton swab, then gently push one into my ear. But then when I did, I felt something actually move inside my ear. At the time, I couldn't tell if it was because I'd actually pushed a clump of earwax or something further up my ear canal. But then, when I pulled the cotton swab out again, I see these two real thin, dark brown things stuck to the tip. I remember looking at them and thinking, what the hell are those? Until suddenly, the thought hit me like an entire brick wall falling on me. I kind of wiggled my head again and felt that same weird movement to my left ear. And that's when I realized something that was like a worse nightmare come to life. There had been roaches near my bed when I woke up. Something was moving in my ear. The two little skinny things on the cotton swab were roach legs. And there was a freaking cockroach inside my ear canal. I was in complete denial for a minute or two. Actually saying no, no, no out loud. Trying to talk myself into being something else. But then, when I actually accepted what was happening, I started to hyperventilate. It took me a while to calm down, but when I did, the next move was to grab the pair of tweezers I had with me, carefully insert them into my ear, and try to get the roach out all on my own. I can barely even describe how horrifying it was, trying to work the tweezers in, touching the roach, then feeling it trying to scuttle further into my ear canal. It was like it was trying to burrow into my brain. I know that's not exactly how ears or brains work, and that they're not remotely connected in such a way, but in my groggy, terrified state, that's exactly what it felt like it was trying to do. The more I tried, the more it seemed to crawl away from the biting pincers of the tweezers, and I realized that if I was actually going to get this roach out of my ear, I'd have to drive to an actual hospital. That's how I ended up driving over to the Patras' University Hospital, and throughout the whole of that drive, I was acutely aware of the thing trying to burrow its way further into my ear canal. At this point, I feel like I should make it clear that while none of it was actually painful in any way, it was by far the worst kind of mental torture that 
I'd ever experienced in my whole life. Walking into the ER was the first piece of real luck I got, as because it was real early on a Monday morning, there was next to no one else waiting to be seen by the doctors. After some mother-daughter combo got themselves seen to, I was called up to the desk to tell them what the problem was. The first nurse I spoke to didn't speak English all that well, so I had to wait a few more minutes while she found someone that did. The next nurse spoke amazing English, but when I explained what the situation was, she had this look on her face that told me she just straight up didn't believe me. She asked me if I was in pain, and I said no, but that I felt like I was going to puke. She still seemed skeptical, but then she took me to see a doctor who looked in my ear with an otoscope, and although I don't speak Greek, the muted reaction the doctor had told me that there was definitely a cockroach in my ear. Using the nurse as a translator, the doctor told me that the most important thing was for me to keep calm. As they put some wristband thing on me, I was told that getting the roach out would be relatively easy and they could 100% get the thing out, but I had to try and keep calm. If I didn't keep calm, I wouldn't be able to keep still, and to get the roach out, they were going to need to use some pretty delicate instruments that might damage my ears if I didn't keep perfectly still. Hearing that was hardly relaxing, but the nurse advised me to control my breathing and focus on the fact that everything was going to be okay, and that actually really helped me regain my focus. After that, another nurse took my blood pressure, which turned out to be alarmingly high, but then I put all that down to the stress of the whole situation, and we all agreed that I didn't require any kind of medication for it. I had no idea exactly why they were doing all these tests on me, and I'm sure they had their reasons, but I was just desperate for them to get to the actual extraction already. Thankfully, that's the next thing they did, and the nurse explained all the stuff the doctor was saying, how they were going to use the stuff called lidocaine as a prep for getting the roach out. The lidocaine would act as a numbing agent, making it so the extraction didn't hurt while also killing the roach. The lidocaine did its job alright, but before it did, the roach went into overdrive trying to escape the fluid and this is probably the worst it felt for me, and I'm so glad that it was over after that. But literally being able to feel the thing dying in my ear, like speeding up and speeding up and just suddenly slowing down as it died, I'm not sure there are even words in the English language to sum up how horrifying it all felt. After about two minutes of feeling the roach die, the doctor took these big curved tweezers, then started removing the roach, but not in one go. He did it piece by piece. Once the whole thing was out of me, or at least as much as they could pull out, the nurse showed me what they'd removed on a napkin. I guess it would have been about an inch long when it was intact, which I know isn't all that big, but it was still a cockroach running around my ear canal, so I don't care how small it was. After that, my ear canal was given one final check over just to make sure that there was nothing left behind. And they basically told me that I was free to go with a prescription for oral antibiotics and a type that I would need to put directly into my ear. My whole left ear basically felt numb for the next 24 hours, but then as the week went on, it didn't really feel any better. I guess it was just the aftermath of having my ear invaded by both a cockroach and a pair of surgical tweezers. But then the half-dead scratch session in my ear just didn't stop, so when I got back to Baltimore... I went over to my doctor to get checked up again. So, about a week after I got back from Greece, I went for my appointment and told her about the whole cockroach trauma. But just to be safe, she asked a physician's assistant to flush my ear in the hopes that removing any wax buildup would help my hearing and get rid of the pressure. Then, once my ear had been flushed, they each took a look inside. I can't even begin to explain how much my heart sank when I heard the physician assistant say she saw what she believed to be a spiky insect leg inside my ear canal. I felt sick. The whole ordeal wasn't even over, and all I wanted was for it to finally just be over. My doctor ended up flushing my ear again and pulling out six more pieces of the roach that the Greek doctors hadn't even seen, and this is almost two whole weeks after the whole incident first took place. I guess what I'd been looking at wasn't the whole roach, and I just wanted it to be the whole roach out of pure wishful thinking. I just quietly cried while the whole thing was going on, and my doctor was amazing because she actually gave me a hug when the whole thing was done. 
She's been my family doctor for years, so we had quite a close relationship like that for those wondering why she was getting a little too personal. But she also comforted me because she told me that there might be more of the roach in my ear and that she was going to make me an emergency ear, nose, and throat appointment for the next day. When the appointment was over, I went home and tried as best I could to relax before heading to the ENT clinic the next morning. When I got there, they sat me in this real comfortable examination chair, then the ear, nose, and throat doctor placed some sort of microscope next to my head. He didn't say much at all. The whole examination basically took place in silence, right up until he said the dreaded words of, there's something in there, all right. The next thing I know, he's using what looked like a large pair of scissors with a blunt end to fish around my ear canal for the rest of the roach. That time, no kind of numbing agent was used, so it was actually painful sometimes, and because of the piece of equipment he was using, I could hear the pieces of roach crunching as he gripped them and pulled them out. Even when he finished and had flushed my ear out with water again, to the point that he was 99% sure that he had gotten everything out, I still didn't feel that much better. That surprised me because I figured that once it was all out I'd actually start feeling free of the whole thing, but I didn't. Instead, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that the remnants of that roach existed in my ear for like two weeks, meaning there was still a chance that I was going to develop a nasty ear infection. I've only ever really gotten over the whole thing over the past year or so, but even so, I'm deathly afraid of any crawling insect that might find its way into my ear, especially cockroaches. I'm not nearly as bad as I used to be, but it's definitely still a thing for me, and honestly, I don't expect to be completely over it anytime soon. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. Last year, I was invited to a wedding in Oregon. I wasn't from there and I decided when I went there I could stay a few extra days and make it into a little vacation. I was interested in exploring the area nearby, and I was able to find a really good deal on an Airbnb only 15 minutes away from the wedding venue. The wedding was on Saturday, and I arrived at the Airbnb on Thursday afternoon. It was a smaller looking house in a nice little neighborhood, and I had the whole thing to myself. The first day, I went to a nearby city and met up with another friend I knew who was in town for the wedding as well. I returned to the house that night sort of late and tired from the long day. I got into bed, turned on the TV, and fell asleep within probably 15 minutes. I woke up the next morning without an alarm, which felt great, and I got up and made some coffee. When I was drinking it, I took a step out into the front yard because it looked like a really nice day outside. After I did, I was on the front step, and I noticed there seemed to be some sort of note taped to the front door. I picked it up and read it, not sure of what it could be. The note said, quote, I broke into your house last night. You should fix your locks. And then they had written a little winking face on it. I freaked out when I read this and immediately went back inside the house and started looking around. I was sure the front door had been locked because I remembered unlocking it to go outside just a few minutes ago. There was only one other entrance to the house, which was the back door. I ran over to it and checked, but that too seemed to be locked. I then started searching up and down the entire house and like I said, it wasn't a very big house, so it didn't take me too long to look everywhere. After searching all the rooms, closets, and even cabinets, I didn't see anyone, or a trace of anyone either. I was creeped out, but after time, thought maybe it was some kind of prank by somebody who lived on the street, and knew that this house was rented by people a lot. There was no way to know for sure, though. I've always been a really deep sleeper, plus the house didn't have a whole lot of furniture in it, so if somebody had been here, I probably wouldn't have known left the house shortly after that to go do more stuff in the nearby city and also see some local parks. I took all my valuable stuff with me just in case, and I also contacted the Airbnb owner about the note I received. I was hoping they would reply to me before I got back home, reassuring me that the locks were fine and it was probably just a prank. After another long day of trying local restaurants, visiting local parks, and other cool buildings, I once again returned to the house that night. When I looked, the Airbnb owner never replied to me 
and I was a little bit scared to go to bed. But I was tired and was able to convince myself it was probably just a joke, seeing as though everything in the house seemed fine, and just as it was when I left it. Wedding was the next day, so I once again watched some TV and then drifted off to sleep at about 11.30. The next morning, I woke up without an alarm again. But this time, I looked at the clock and saw that it was just after 6 a.m. I didn't need to wake up until 9 and was about to turn over and go back to bed, but just started feeling a little bit paranoid. I decided to get up and walk around the house to make sure everything was okay. As I left the bedroom and walked down the hall, I immediately noticed that the back door of the house was wide open. When I saw this, I wanted to get out of there immediately. I knew the back door had been closed and locked before I had went to bed. I ran into the bedroom, packed up everything I had in probably less than five minutes, and went to leave the house. As I was about to walk out the front door, I started to hear the closet door in the living room begin to open. I never turned around to look, and instead, sprinted out of there to my car. I didn't see anybody exit the house, but I drove away, and then contacted the owner of the house again, telling him what had happened. Then I contacted Airbnb customer support. For the rest of the trip, I stayed in a hotel. This story happened just last month. My wife and I were planning to take a little vacation just for the weekend. We found an Airbnb up in a really nice area with a lot of great land. The place was way up north, about four hours away. It was a house, sort of like a cabin, and was up on a hill with a really nice deck overlooking the massive amount of land nearby. The area was mostly woods, hills, and just land. We also really liked it because of how secluded it was from the rest of the houses. There weren't really any other buildings or houses in sight. In fact, most areas over there were just vacation homes or cabins. We drove up there early Friday morning and arrived to the property at about 10 a.m. When we got there, we had a great time just relaxing and enjoying the area. It didn't take long, though, before our trip took a turn for the worst. That night, as we were just sitting in the living room of the house watching a movie, all of a sudden we heard a knocking sound. I couldn't tell where it was coming from at first, but after pausing the movie and getting up, I could tell it was coming from one of the windows. I walked down a hallway to where the noise was coming from. As I got closer, I was able to locate the window, and then the knocking stopped. I reached the window where it was coming from, but I didn't see anything when I looked outside of it. However, I didn't have a good feeling about it, because the house was so secluded, and most parts of it were surrounded by trees and bushes. I knew anybody being around here at all would be suspicious. As I walked back to the living room, my wife asked me if I saw what was causing the knocking. Just as I was telling her about it, we then heard a loud pounding coming from the front door. It sounded as though somebody was trying to break the entire door down. I walked back over to the kitchen area to try and look out the window and see, but once again, when I got at an angle to actually see who was at the front door, the noises had stopped and whoever was there was now gone. After this, we didn't hear any more noises for a while. I thought maybe whoever it was had now left, but about 30 minutes later, we heard the sound outside, just barely, of a man yelling. I couldn't tell what he was saying, in fact, I'm not sure if he was saying anything at all. We knew somebody was trying to mess with us, or get inside the house for some reason. We would hear noises or bangs against the house, but whenever we looked out the window, whoever was there somehow disappeared. This happened a couple of more times, and my wife and I were getting concerned. We didn't really feel comfortable going to bed with all this going on. It was getting late though, and I decided if we were in fact going to sleep there, I would go outside and take a look around. I went out the front door and took a walk all around the house, but saw nothing strange and didn't hear anything either. I hoped that meant whoever was there was now gone, and I went back inside. We decided we would go to bed, but if anything else happened at all, we would call the police immediately. Once we had both got to bed and turned out all the lights, almost right away, there was a sudden sound of glass breaking coming from the opposite end of the house. My wife grabbed her phone and started calling the police. I shut the door and locked it, and then started packing up all of our stuff. There was no chance I was going to continue to stay here with all of this going on. We didn't really hear any noises though as we waited for the police to arrive. It took them a while to reach the house with it being way out there, probably like 20 minutes. Thankfully, nobody tried to enter the bedroom we were in during that time. When the police arrived, my wife and I left the room with our bags packed. The police showed us a window in the living room of the house which had been broken and there was some glass on the ground around it, but after searching the house, they didn't find anybody inside. I didn't feel safe though. After the police left, my wife and I did the same we checked into a hotel. A 
couple of years ago, I traveled to a city for a prospective job. I had a potential job offer and was going to stay a total of two days to look at the area in case I were to move there. I didn't really spend a whole lot of time looking for where to stay. I kind of just went onto the Airbnb app, found a place that looked good, and then went for it. I do remember, though, that the owner seemed like a really nice guy. When I arrived, the place itself was decent. It was a little place right by the city. I got the keys and got inside to drop off my stuff. After that, I went out for a few hours and then returned that night. I went to bed that night pretty early. I've always been kind of an early bird and I'm used to it. However, I woke up in seemingly the middle of the night, which is unusual. When I woke up, I looked around confused after seeing it was still dark outside and clearly nighttime. I looked at the clock to see that it was 2.30 a.m. and I remember, just as I was looking at the clock, I heard the sound of the front door to the house being opened. The house had been completely silent and hearing that was a scary moment. I knew nobody else was supposed to be in the house. I'm not really sure what I was thinking. Maybe it was because I had just woken up and wasn't thinking clearly, but I grabbed the blankets and covered myself with them like a little kid. I then heard footsteps starting to come closer to the bedroom that I was in. My heart started to race like crazy and I was terrified. I sort of came to my senses and knew that hiding under the covers was a bad idea, but what could I do? I had no time to prepare for this. As the footsteps got closer, it was clear to me that they would likely come in the bedroom. The only thing I thought to do was pretend to still be asleep. Maybe, just maybe, if somebody was going to rob the house or something like that, if they saw that I was fast asleep, they would just ignore me. I also felt this was my only option, because I had no time to run to the closet and hide, or grab something to use as a weapon. I didn't even have time to dial 911, as my phone was charging on the desk, not within my reach. Once whoever was there reached the door, I heard it open, and I closed my eyes and pretended to be sound asleep. I heard whoever was there take two steps inside the room or so, and then they just stopped. I didn't hear any more noises or movement for about a whole minute. Very carefully, I opened my eyes just a crack. I was careful to make it look like they were still closed, but I wanted to see whoever was in there. As soon as my eyes cracked open, I saw somebody standing right in front of the doorway, facing me. I looked at them for a couple of seconds, then I recognized them. It was the man who owned the Airbnb. I remembered him from his picture. He was just standing there staring at me with no expression on his face. I was careful to close my eyes without making it look like they had ever been open. I was terrified and also very confused as to what he was doing here. He stayed there for probably five more minutes and didn't move. It felt like forever and I was just waiting for him to do something. Finally, I heard him turn around and then walk away. I laid in bed listening carefully to wherever the man moved throughout the house. He went straight for the door and then just left. After that, I stayed up for about two more hours before I could get back to sleep. Luckily, the guy never returned. The next day, I contacted the owner of the Airbnb and asked him what he was doing in the house during the night. He denied being there completely. I reported him after that and did not return back. That was the last time I used Airbnb. Okay, so this might sound like a bit of a weird one, because it's not like a spooky story. Our Airbnb wasn't haunted or anything, and I don't believe in stuff like that to begin with. But when me and my girlfriend stayed at an Airbnb in Belgium, something happened that creeped us out so much that we had no choice but to leave the apartment and check into a hotel. I've had a mate of mine tell me I overreacted over this, but just put yourself in my shoes first proper morning of our little weekend getaway to Bruges. Me and the old ball and chain are getting ready to go out for breakfast when we realized that neither of us had packed any toothpaste. It was one of those I figured you'd do it kind of things. But it was no big drama since we could just brush our teeth and help ourselves to sketchy mints the owners had left for us. But I do remember my girlfriend looking around in the bathroom just in case the owner had left us any and saying some throwaway thing like, I wish they'd left us some toothpaste. Boring, I know. I'll get to the point. We go after breakfast, have a wander around Bruges, grab some toothpaste, then head back to the Airbnb. 
That night, I go to take a shower before bed and saw that my girlfriend had picked up the weirdest toothpaste that I'd ever come across in my entire life. Honest to God, it looked like something you'd get out of a second World War ration pack with this eye-watering old-fashioned menthol smell to it. I have my shower, walk back into the bedroom where my girlfriend is half asleep and I kind of poke fun at her for buying vintage toothpaste. She's knackered and half asleep like, what are you on about? Telling me to shut up and go to sleep, etc, etc. I had a wee giggle to myself, then got into bed and tried to get some sleep. It was the weirdest thing because how did she not realize she picked up such weird old toothpaste? And that's when it hit me. She didn't. She didn't realize because she didn't buy it. Which means someone else bought it and then put it in our room. Which meant that someone was listening to my girlfriend when she was in the bathroom and it's not like the place was small, and the bathroom was near the front door to the apartment or something. God forgive anyone who wake up my missus in the middle of the night, but I decided the circumstances warranted waking her up. She was annoyed at first, telling me to leave her alone, but once I explained the situation, she just sat up rigid in bed, like completely freaked out. We racked our brains as to how someone might have hurt us, but couldn't come up with anything. Like I said, the place wasn't small and the walls were pretty thick, so how had someone hurt us? The landlord lived miles away and as far as we knew, no one else had keys. It's something that bothers me to this day to be honest, but I still can't work out how someone hurt us. And I did ask the landlord about it who told me no one had been in the apartment. We were convinced it was him though, enough to just pack our stuff and leave. I know he hadn't exactly brandished a knife at us or anything. What happened would most likely make for a terrible horror movie, but like I said before, put yourself in my shoes. Someone is listening to you when you go to the toilet, and for all you know, they're watching you too. And God knows why they're doing it, but it can't be a good wholesome reason. A thousand nopes, seriously. Just thinking it over had me and my girlfriend getting out of there. It didn't ruin the trip too much, like we realized early what was going on, so I think we got off quite lightly. The extra hotel money was the real scary part, though. More than a decade ago, on one of the hottest days of the year, I was taking my kids down to the 7-Eleven near our apartment block to get some big gulps. Just as we were walking past a public park, right near a tree line, this completely normal, well-dressed looking couple came out of the trees and starts walking right towards us. I actually couldn't believe it when the guy suddenly told me to give him my wallet and anything else in my pockets. I mean, I thought it was a dumb joke of some kind. They looked so well-dressed that they could have been office workers or something. I actually let out this nervous laughter, then asked if they were serious, and the guy answered my question by pulling out what looked like a fishing knife from his jacket pocket. When he opened it and pointed it at me, I shoved my daughter behind me to protect her as best I could. But then just as I was going to do the same for my son, the woman grabbed his other arm and began pulling him towards her. I honestly felt like my heart was about to explode with fear. There's no other way of describing it. And I suddenly just lost all sense of self-preservation as I leapt forward to attack this well-to-do looking woman who just grabbed my boy. The next thing I know, I felt what I can only describe as a cold punch under the ribs of my left side, and I looked down to see that the guy had buried his fishing knife in my stomach. What came next feels a little bit like divine intervention, as two joggers had spotted what was going on and came over to intervene. This scared off at least one of the unassuming muggers, but as I turned to check on my kids, I just sort of felt like my legs fall out from underneath me, and I hit the ground hard. I remember hearing someone screaming and thinking it was my daughter, but when I looked, the woman who grabbed my son was on the ground crying and wailing with blood pouring out of her mouth. I honestly don't remember hitting her, but she seemed pretty adamant that I did and she was actually trying to make out like she was the victim of the whole situation, maybe to avoid getting arrested when the cops showed up. The police that patrolled the park showed up not long after that and the cops actually started asking the woman what happened like we were a couple or something. My kids had to tell them that she was the partner of the guy that stabbed me, 
and this definitely threw the joggers off too because they had definitely assumed that that was the case too. The whole time I just kept begging someone to call an ambulance because I was pretty sure that I was bleeding to death. I got taken to the hospital and, to my complete disbelief, I was questioned about the incident as if though I was a suspect. I had no idea what this was about until a while after, when it looked more and more likely that I was going to be charged with battery for the woman since it turns out she actually had a decently well-off family and had gotten into some vicious cycle of addiction with some trust fund junkie she met in the city. Her family actually tried to sue me when the charges didn't stick, but it was thrown out and she was sentenced for attempted kidnapping not long after. As for me, I had a tube in my chest for two weeks after my surgery to remove the knife, but I thankfully made a full recovery. Honestly, when I look back at it, I'm just glad my kids didn't get hurt in any way, and I still run through all the horrific scenarios in my head where they didn't walk away from that situation unscathed. One of the most chilling moments of my whole life was while working at 7-Eleven. Some guy walks in wearing a suit, staggers over to one of the fridges and grabs a ton of those Starbucks cold brews out of one of them before dumping them all on the counter in front of me. The stink of booze off of him was just wild and as I'm ringing him up, I asked if he'd either had a really good day or a really bad one. He's let out this really hearty laugh and then tells me, a little of both. He then goes on to explain that he'd just gotten out of court and that he's been acquitted of accidentally shooting one of his hunting buddies on a trip that happened a few years ago. I was so stunned that I didn't really know what to say. I just went with the first thing that came to mind, which was, I'm sorry. He laughs again, shakes his head, and then asks me, You know what the funniest thing is, though? I shake my head, taking the ten he gave me before grabbing his change from the register, and when he tells me, I swear I almost dropped his money all over the floor when he spoke. He tells me, It was no accident. Then just starts laughing to himself while he pockets the change and scoops up all the cold brews from the counter. I was so taken aback that all I could do was just stand there, watching the guy as he walked out of the store and towards his parked car. Then my mind switches to thinking, Please get into the passenger seat. Please get into the passenger seat. But nope. He climbs right into the driver's side, starts the engine, then drives off. I'm not saying I have a photographic memory or anything, more like I was repeating his license plate number back to myself as I grabbed my phone and plugged it into the notepad app. Then I called the cops, told them they had a drunk driver on their hands, then just let karma do its thing. There was nothing I could do about him taking one person's life and getting away with it, but I sure wasn't about to stand by and let him kill someone else as the result of being a reckless idiot. One of the worst days of my life came right out of nowhere. I was working in my job at a local 7-Eleven just burning away the daylight hours with no passion in life, no purpose, no nothing. Then suddenly, I feel this terrible headache coming on. I take a few painkillers, then got back to what I was doing. Some customer comes in, I ring them up for a coffee and a pack of donuts, and then that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in the hospital, and the nurses were prepping me for surgery. I was told I'd been diagnosed with a bleed in my brain and that the surgery would involve drilling a hole in my skull to drain the fluid. Then, just as they were about to put me under, the head of neurology got in touch with someone and called off the surgery completely. What actually happened is that I'd suffered an aneurysm, and according to my doctor, who told me this much later on, I would have probably been dead on the table just seconds after the surgery commenced. With a brain bleed, the solution is to drill holes in your skull, which relieves pressure and prevents your brain from swelling up and squeezing against your skull. If it does that, it can lead to some pretty serious brain damage, which is obviously very bad news. But in the case of an aneurysm, which is what is actually going on, 
That kind of surgery can prevent sufficient blood flow to your brain due to the sharp drop in blood pressure in your brain tissue. This then basically starves your brain of oxygen, leading to acute tissue death, which obviously just straight up kills you. That head of neurology legitimately saved my life that day, and the whole thing dramatically changed my outlook on life. A person can still feel perfectly healthy, perfectly normal, and then one little weak blood vessel in your brain and boom, it can all be over for them. Life is a terrifyingly fragile thing, one that can really just end at any moment. I quit my job at the 7-Eleven when I was recovering in the hospital, then asked my dad and mom if they could put me up in my old bedroom while I trained to be a comic book artist. They thought my choice of career was a little outlandish and I don't blame them, but I think the shock of almost losing me to some random medical thing made them reevaluate a few things too. These days, I work as a full-time comic book artist, and although I don't make a ton of money, I feel like I'm actually living the life I want to, the one I was supposed to live, not one that's being dictated to me by my need for money or prestige or acceptance. I suppose I'm telling you all this because I hope everyone on earth can live that way too. And it honestly breaks my heart that some people don't have a choice in the matter. Because the idea that someone's life could just end while they were working some terrible retail job or doing just about anything they didn't want to do, I don't just find it heartbreaking. I find the concept utterly terrifying. Probably because I was just one surgery away from that exact same thing happening to me. I had a guy come into the 7-Eleven I was working at, and when I was ringing up the items he wanted, he started getting all fresh with me, saying stuff like, you're real pretty and what time do you finish work? I lied to him and told him I was on till 11 even though I was finishing at 6, which was only like an hour away. He said he'd come back then and we could go out for a beer or something, but I advised him not to since my boyfriend would be coming to pick me up around then and he really wouldn't like the idea of some random guy hitting on me. That didn't seem to bother the guy too much though, and he made some dumb comment about how he'd make my boyfriend see things his way or something. I just nodded like, yep, I'm sure you will, and I could see him getting kind of angry before he walked out of the store. It didn't bother me too much, as he was only going to come back to the store later on to find out I wasn't there, and by that time, I'd be safe at home and away from any pervy creepers. But then at 6, when my shift finished, I walked outside with my purse only to see a car door open about 20 or 30 feet away. I swear I just about felt my stomach tie into a knot when I saw the creeper step out. I did a straight up 180 degree turn on my heel and started walking back into the store, then just went right behind the counter into the manager's office after telling my coworker, just say I'm on break. He seemed real confused for a second, but as I shut the door and listened right at the edge of it, it was maybe only 30 seconds at the most before I heard him say, Oh, her? She's just on break. I'm sure she'll be out in a minute. Normally, I'd take the bus back home, but that night, I knew I'd have to get an Uber if I wanted to make it home without being seriously harassed. So I called the Uber, waited for it to arrive, then tried to just walk out as fast as I could. I didn't see the guy in the store and I asked my coworker real quick, are they waiting for me? And the guy shook his head, still confused but kind of getting the gist of what was actually happening. They asked if I wanted them to call the cops and I shook my head, just gunning for my Uber as I pushed open the glass door. I didn't see the guy anywhere and I was so set on getting into the Uber that I didn't look left or right as I walked out of the 7-Eleven so I had basically no warning that the guy was about to grab my arm and jerk me back. He looked really, really angry as he growled, You lied to me, and called me a bunch of names as I tried pulling away from him. Luckily, my Uber driver saw absolutely everything, and he stepped out of the driver's seat to be all like, Hey, let her go or I'll call the cops. He did let me go, and just smiled at the Uber driver as he told me, This isn't over. I don't like being lied to. I wish that was all bluster too, like he was trying to act hard just to save a little face, but he wasn't, and for the next three months, he made my life 
a living hell. He kept showing up outside of the 7-Eleven, to the point where I had to blow a ton of my wages on Ubers to and from work. Then there was the time he actually tried to follow me home, and I had to actually tell the Uber driver what was happening so he could drive into the city just to shake the guy's tail. I tipped that guy massively, even though he initially refused to accept the payment for the ride, he insisted on cancelling until I burst into tears and begged him to take the money in my tip. I couldn't make it someone else's problem. I couldn't have that on my mind as well as all the other stuff. I developed something of a relationship with that one specific Uber driver and he became kind of a father figure who always accepted my ride requests whenever he was working and made sure that no one followed me home. He was also the guy that told me that I needed to get the cops involved and I thought that this guy was going to hurt me that he knew people with the same mentality and that they only ever actually gave up when the law got involved. I didn't even know why I was surprised when I found out that the guy had a previous conviction for stalking and he seemed to know the legal process like the back of his hand. He knew the process of getting the restraining order through the courts would take weeks at a minimum and he'd come visit me in the 7-Eleven just to taunt me sometimes and he'd only leave once I'd threatened to call the cops on him. That was just about the only thing that seemed to really get to him too. The fact that he'd been arrested and convicted over something like that before. I wanted to tell him that he was pathetic, that he'd never ever have a good normal woman all to himself, that he'd always be some deranged psycho who got off on terrorizing those who couldn't defend themselves. But I didn't. In fact, I was told by one of the cops I spoke to, do not antagonize this man under any circumstances, we don't know how far he'll push this if you make him angry. If it's possible, do not engage him whatsoever. So like I said, that was my life for like a whole three months. Until the day finally came when my mom got the call from our family's attorney saying a judge had finally approved the restraining order. For those wondering, it took so long because this guy had no history of actual violence and the whole arm grabbing incident wasn't actually classed as an assault for whatever reason. The day it finally came through though, he must have gotten some kind of notification of it because he just stopped showing up at the 7-Eleven. Seeing him waiting for me outside whenever I finished was such a regular occurrence that when he finally didn't show up, I actually cried with relief. I told Carl, the Uber driver, that I thought I was finally free and we had a miniature kind of celebration on that final drive back to my house. He still picks me up from time to time too. Sometimes when I've been out drinking with my friends and it's awesome to be reunited with him after such a sickening ordeal. I suppose half the reason I'm sharing this is to help other girls avoid going through the same thing I did. Don't hesitate to get the cops involved with something like a stalking issue. There are literally laws in place to help deal with things like that. But the big thing, don't ever show a soft side or seem like you're playing hard to get. If a guy shows you any unwanted attention... Either completely ignore him, or make it clear that you'll just call the cops. Heck, carry a stun gun or pepper spray if you're legally able to in your state, and just show that SOB that you're carrying so they leave you alone. I just don't want any other girl to go through what I went through because I honestly lost almost four months of my life to this guy's mental abuse. I'm a 24 year old male and this happened to me a few years ago when I was around 21. I remember because it was shortly after my birthday in December. It was really cold outside and there was snow on the ground as we had just had a snowstorm pass through our area. I lived with my parents at the time and my mom is not really a fan of driving in the snow so she asked me if I could drive her to the gas station for her to pick up some cigarettes for her and my dad as well as a few other items they might have needed. I said sure as I wasn't really doing anything at the time and I grabbed my keys then following her to the car. I remember the cold air hitting your face pretty hard that night so it had to be at least around the teens which made the snow and whatever else was on the roads really slippery. This is important to know for later on in the story. The nearest gas station was about 5 minutes away from us but given the conditions of the roads it took us about 10 to get there. Once I was able to park the car, my mom got out of the car, then made her way inside the store. 
From where I was parked, I could see her inside the store standing in the line that was leading up to the register. I kept the car running as it was really cold and I just didn't want to be sitting in the car without any heat. I was browsing on my phone while waiting for my mom to get done and right around that time I had seen her finally approach the register. There was a black truck that pulled up into the parking spot right next to my car. I found this a bit unusual given that the parking lot was empty, so I mean there was really no reason for them to park right next to the spot where I was. But I kind of just chalked it up to them wanting to be as close to the entrance as they could given how cold it was that night. No one got out of the car at first, but I didn't even notice this until I looked up to see my mom walking out of the entrance back to the car. I glanced over to the truck's passenger side window and I could just make out a figure sitting in the passenger seat and they were facing in my direction. My mom opened the door then got inside before then asking me what I was looking at. I told her about the truck pulling up well over a few minutes ago around the same time that she approached the register but that nobody had gotten out. She first chalked it up to maybe they were just waiting for someone inside the store to come out. But when I mentioned seeing a figure in the passenger side of the car looking towards our direction, she then began to sense why I was so spooked out by it. She told me to just back out and get out of there and that we didn't need to worry about them once we drove off. As soon as I put the car into reverse and then began to back up, the passenger door swung open and hit the side of my car. A tall, very built man stepped out from the car as soon as the door made contact with my car. I hit the brakes as soon as I felt the contact and the man stood there before throwing his hands up at me and then staring in my direction. I didn't really know what to do as I'd never really been in any sort of accident before and my mom was sitting right there next to me and could see as well as I had that the door had not been opened until we had already started moving. The man slowly walked up to my window and just stood there. I cracked it very slowly and I told the man that I was sorry but that I didn't see the door open as I was backing out. For a brief moment he didn't really say anything, that is before he simply asked, Roll down your window a little bit more, I can barely hear you. I knew this couldn't be true as it was really quiet in that area and I wasn't even speaking in a low tone. I told him that I'd prefer to keep it cracked as I really didn't want to let cold air get into the car. This really angered the man and he immediately spoke in a more angered tone now. He was telling me to roll down my window yet again. I again told him no and this is when things then took a turn for the absolute worse. Without any warning whatsoever, the man smacked my window really hard with his hand. Startled, I immediately jumped back and rolled the window up. My mom was right beside me just absolutely yelling for me to just back out and leave but I was really afraid of hitting the man in the process as he was still right next to my car. The man kept smacking my window really hard a few more times before he then tried punching it. It was right at this point where I realized that if I didn't get my mom and I out of there fast, this guy was definitely going to hurt us. I could see the cashier inside the gas station heard what was going on and he looked to be on the phone with what I could only assume was the police. But there was absolutely no way I could wait for them as the man was now both punching at my window and now kicking my door. It was like some switch had been flipped on in this man's head and he had just totally lost it. I told my mom to hold on as I put the car into reverse again and backed out of there as fast as I could, just barely missing the guy by a few inches. I pulled fully out of the parking spot before the man ran out in front of our car and slammed his hands right on the hood. I sat there frozen not knowing what to do as the man looked right back at me. I turned the car wheel then sped around him trying to avoid him the best that I could before booking it the hell out of there. After that, I honestly thought that was the end of it. But as we made our way down the road to a stoplight, I was able to see headlights that was fast approaching from behind our car. And once it was close enough behind us, I could then see that it was the same truck the man was in. There appeared to be two people inside of it. I assumed the man I encountered must have been the passenger and I guess the driver was someone I hadn't noticed before. I told my mom that it was them behind us and she started to freak out and call my dad, then letting him know what was going on. We were still probably about 10 minutes away from our house given the road conditions, but I knew that there was no way that I could get us back to our house in that amount of time before these guys tried to ram us off the road or whatever else they had planned for us. 
My dad told my mom for us to attempt to head back towards our house and that he would try and meet us halfway in his truck. She told me this and I agreed that this had to be our best option, given that I couldn't turn around and head back to the gas station still not knowing if the police had even been called or not. So once the light turned green, I punched on the gas and sped off. I'm going to be completely honest. I really wasn't being that cautious of the road at this point, as there really weren't any other cars at this point of the night. There were a few times where the car slid from the ice on the road, and I knew that it would only take one turn of the wheel to lose control, but I wasn't going to slow down and let these guys catch up to us. After about a few minutes of driving, we were able to see headlights right in front of us on the other side of the road. I was thinking that it had to be my father, and as we got a little closer, we were able to make out his truck beyond the lights. Very surprisingly, the truck was still behind us, still keeping pace with me given the road conditions. I could see my father cut across a midsection of the roads and then stop shortly off the side of the road. I started to slow down right as we approached and then pulled off to the side of the road, the truck still following me. As I came to a stop, the same man from before that was in the passenger seat hopped out of the car then started making his way to our car. The driver opened his door but before he could step out, both of the men stopped dead in their tracks at the sound of my father's voice. I suggest that both of you hop back in that car and drive right on out of here before I put a bullet in the both of you. I could see my dad walking out into the light radiating from both his and my headlights. He had his 9mm pistol pulled and named right at the man's head as he stood right next to my car. I pretty much just watched as both of the men just stood there for a brief moment as my dad slowly inched his way towards them. The man then very slowly backed away towards his truck before then speaking to what I assumed was my father. You're really lucky you got here when you did. The man laughed and jumped back into his truck before it quickly backed out and drove off in the other direction. My dad walked to my window and he asked me and my mom if we were okay. I remember telling him that other than being scared shitless, I think we were fine. Shortly afterwards, my dad followed us back home just to make sure no one else followed us. I really have no idea what those men's intentions were or why the man acted the way he did. All I know is that if I hadn't reacted how I did to get my mom and I out of there, I just really hate to think what those men would have done to us. So as some background, my family live about a state away from me, and at the time that this happened, I had just turned 18 years old, and my mom would finally let me drive to go see them, which was about a five and a half hour drive. No biggie. I was like, bet, I can smoke and drive that easily. And I did just that. About halfway there, I needed to stop to get some gas and get snacks. As you can guess, I had the munchies. I wasn't really familiar with the drive or where the gas stations were on the way there, and they were kind of spread out. So as soon as I felt like it wasn't smart to wait until I found another gas station, I pulled off the highway. I've always been sort of suspicious of people in general because I have not had an easy childhood. I grew up learning just to kind of feel when things are not right. So I wasn't really worried about being by myself because I knew how to handle myself. So I pull up to this relatively empty gas station, maybe one or two other cars, but it was a larger one with one of the antique shops in it. I parked at a pump, locked my doors, and go inside. There was no one at the counter yet, and there was a sign on the counter saying that they would be right back. So I just go and pick out a snack and a drink. Well, when I previously walked in, I noticed a man late 20s kind of just wandering around in the store. I saw him glance over at me when I walked inside, but didn't really think about it. Not really paying him any kind of attention, I went and opened the door to the soda when he comes right up next to me and opens the one next to mine. This wasn't particularly weird to me, but the fact that he was literally all the way across the store when I came in, and then as soon as I go over there he does too, I was like, okay, I'ma go look for a different drink. So I go to the tea section and stand there for a sec, and he follows me to the one right next to me yet again. Only this time he looks at me, smiles a really creepy closed lip smile, and then says, Hi there. I do also want to say that even though he could have easily just been trying to be nice or flirt or something, 
I had an instant creepy vibe from him when he first walked over and that intuition has never failed me before. At this point, I just look at him, nod my head, then grab something and go to the counter, thinking to myself that I can just grab a snack later. He comes right up behind me with just one of those jerky sticks. Literally didn't grab even anything from the refrigerators that he was looking in right next to mine and just stands super close to me. And I mean, he was literally right up behind me. I could feel his body heat and his breath on the back of my neck. I'm literally just waiting for this freaking cashier to hurry up and come in here so I can get the heck away from him. So I decide to start calling for someone. No one answers or comes out. The dude behind me is texting on his phone and he's just looking around and at the door like he's waiting for someone. Finally, I'm just like, screw it, I'm out of here. I leave my drink on the counter and walk out. He follows me. At this point, I literally run to my car and I remember feeling him grasp my jacket, but with the momentum of my arms swinging, he wasn't able to get a firm hold on me. I hop in and lock the doors, turning my car in record speed. We make eye contact and out of the corner of my eye, I can see two men run from around the corner of the gas station. All three of them run at my car, which is not very far from where the first guy is, and I just floor it out of there, almost nearly wrecking my car on the corner. I don't know what they were planning on doing, but I imagine I was about to get kidnapped. I called the police because I don't know where the cashier was, and I just had a really bad feeling that they did something to them. By the time the police got there, they were gone. I now always carry a knife on me whenever I go on that drive. I grew up in an extremely small rural town in Florida, on a farm. The population of our town was less than 1,000 people. The closest city, Gainesville, Florida, was about an hour away. The nights were pitch black dark because there were no street lights or light pollution like in the city, except for the light of a million stars. My great-grandfather passed away when I was about eight years old, leaving my granny heartbroken. We lived a field away from my great-grandmother, who was about 75 at the time. Unfortunately, Granny had already started getting early Alzheimer's and sometimes didn't act like herself. The family, besides me, decided that it would be best if I moved in with her so that she didn't have to be alone in the evenings and at night. Granny lived in an old farmhouse that she had helped build by hand with my granddaddy in the 1930s. The house was constructed of wood with a tin roof. We did have electricity at this time, but no air conditioner or telephone. The front door was wood, and the top half of the door was a glass window pane with a small decorative curtain across the very top, the kind you might see on a kitchen window. Needless to say, anyone could see inside the house as clearly as we could see them. The door lock was the original one made by my granddaddy. It wasn't really a lock at all. It was a piece of wood nailed to the frame that you turned horizontally when you closed the door, meant to keep someone from pushing the door open. I slept in the room with my granny. Our bedroom was at the very front of the house, right next to the front door, and my bed was pushed directly up to the window that looked out over the front porch and yard. I always felt safe because my family and aunts and uncles lived in the adjacent farms all around us. In 1990, that all changed. I was 10 years old by now. Granny was getting more forgetful, sometimes wandering around the house at night. In the nearby city, something awful had occurred. A man had broken into apartments of several college students in Gainesville, murdered them, and done horrible things to their bodies. There were no suspects. The police called him the Gainesville Ripper. Rumors spread through the community like wildfire. Some said the killer was dressing up like a cable man or electric man to get people to let him in their door. Fear and anxiety grew daily as the police had no leads. My dad decided it was time to teach me how to use our family weapon just in case. Dad took me out in the woods, and I practiced. That night, I fell asleep with the weapon beside the head of my bed, 
with clear instructions to not open the door for anyone we didn't know. As a ten-year-old, I felt like this was a pretty big responsibility, and my anxiety kept me from sleeping much those next few nights. They reassured me that I would never have to use the weapon, but better to be safe than sorry. Until the next night, which was the most terrifying night of my life, up until this point. I was laying in bed looking at the digital clock on Granny's dresser, 3.05 a.m., in bright red digits. Granny had gotten up to wander around the kitchen. She did this often, and I just let her do what she thought she needed to do. I heard a tap on the front door window pane. I listened intently, and then silence. Suddenly, the porch light flipped on, illuminating through my little window. What was Granny doing? I scurried out of bed to the front door just in time to reach for Granny's hand as she was trying to turn the piece of wood keeping the door locked. At the same time, I looked out the window, my eyes meeting the eyes of a strange man standing there. The porch light was behind him and I couldn't see his face very well, but his hair was long and unkempt. I did not know him. He jiggled the handle and pushed hard on the door with all his weight. I was terrified, and I excitedly screamed at Granny, asking what she was doing. She told me Granddaddy was at the door. She sometimes thought Granddaddy was still alive. There was no convincing her it wasn't him. With the man pushing furiously against the door, I had to drag Granny with both hands into the bedroom so I could reach the weapon without giving her a chance to open the door. I grabbed the weapon and ran into the living room, aiming directly at the front door, my finger on the trigger. The stranger was gone. I had no telephone to call for help. We were trapped. I sat in the recliner by the front door, staring out into the darkness beyond the porch light, with weapon in hand for the rest of the night. Unable to swallow, shaking so hard I could barely aim the weapon, I waited for the man to return, to try one of the flimsy windows or the back door. Every moving shadow, distant dog bark, bump in the night, or snap of a twig, had my heart racing and blood rushing through my ears. The wind would blow and make the screen door creak open and fall shut with a bang. It was torture. My arms ached from holding the weapon. My nightgown was soaked with sweat and I was on the verge of bursting into soul-wrenching sobs, but I had a job to do, guarding us from the Ripper. Oblivious, Granny tottered around the kitchen getting ready to make breakfast, because Granddaddy would be wanting his coffee soon. I didn't argue or care what she did as long as she stayed away from that front door. I never saw another glimpse of the stranger, but I felt like he was out there, watching us. After staying wide awake all night, terrified, holding vigil, I made sure Granny was back to sleep, slipped out the back door, and ran straight across the hayfields home to Mom and Dad for help once the sun came up in the morning. The police eventually caught the Gainesville Ripper, and it was not the same man I saw at our front door that night. My family hired an elderly lady to stay with Granny, and I moved home permanently. To this day, I don't know who was at the door on that pitch black night, but I still panic, looking out of windows at night, into the darkness. I would like to start by saying that all the names in this story have been changed. Last year in 2021, I was living in a townhouse in New Mexico with my twin sister, we'll call her Carrie, and our two childhood best friends. Robbie and Izzy. The time in that house was full of your typical young adult ups and downs, but amplified by the turmoil of the pandemic. That house was full of good, bad, and ugly times, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. However, the last few months were absolutely terrible before I ended up leaving the state. Let me start with a little backstory. Carrie had been in a relationship with a man, who we will call Jay. Jay and Carrie had a very unhealthy relationship, 
which ended with him being kicked out of our house after an altercation between him and Carrie. Police were called, and we thought that would be the end of it. Let's just say he didn't take being thrown out of the house and dumped too well. One day, on the off chance that I had a day off from work, I was in the kitchen most of the day doing some deep cleaning and self-care. While I was able to do the first part with ease, I could not for the life of me shake the feeling of being watched. I have struggled with anxiety symptoms due to PTSD, so I wrote this off as me just having a bad day. That was until Robbie came home, throwing the door open and shouting, Tell me why I saw Jay circling our block. I was in shock. I ran to the window looking over our street, and sure enough, Jay's car was speeding off. We told Carrie about it as soon as she got home from work that day, and she then revealed to myself, Robbie, and Izzy that Jay had been stalking her. I was not surprised given the details of this situation, as Carrie then told us about this next situation, which shook me to my core. One night, I want to say this story was about two weeks prior to him circling the block. Jay had been watching Carrie from afar while she went out with friends. Carrie must have forgot to lock the door when she came home. She says she woke up from a deep sleep and could have sworn that she saw someone standing over her bed. She said she didn't want to tell us right away because she had first assumed that she was dreaming or even having an episode of sleep paralysis. She would later receive a message from Jay scolding her for not talking to him when he came to the house the other night. That other night in question being the same night Carrie had come home. I started locking the doors even when everyone was home after Carrie told me that story. He was in the house while we were all sleeping sound in our beds, unaware that someone who we all didn't want anywhere near us was just sulking in the corner of my sister's bedroom. Watching over her, he could have done anything, but he chose to just watch her. That was deeply unsettling for all of us. Now I had already made the decision that once my lease was over, I was going to be moving in with my partner in a different state. At this point, we had all been packing up our things and preparing to move, go our separate ways. For more context, the landlord had installed a security system. Nothing high-tech by any means, but any time a door or window was open, the alarm would say in a robotic monotone voice, Side door open, or Back office window closed. Things like that. One night, I was home alone. Carrie was at dinner with Robbie and Robbie's mom, and I had no idea where Izzy was until this series of events happened. I was in my bedroom when suddenly I heard what sounded like tapping on my window. I figured it was the branches tapping like they usually did when there was even a small gust of wind, but the tapping was constant timed almost. I still shrugged it off again, trying not to make myself anxious while I was alone in the house. It was then that I heard the security system go off. Back sliding door open. From the other room. Weird. We all usually come in through this side door when the kitchen and living room meet, as our front door was next to impossible to open from the outside. I brushed it off, thinking maybe Carrie and Robbie had forgotten their keys and just came in through the back door. I called out from my bedroom. Carrie? Robbie? How was dinner? No response. As soon as the words left my mouth, the silence was deafening. I walked out to the hallways where all of the bedrooms led and called out again. Carrie? Robbie? Is he? Again, nothing. I'm getting a bit freaked out now, but I'm thinking that they maybe didn't hear me. But that silence. I will never in my life forget the silence that rang through that house as I inched closer to the living room. As I'm finally standing in the living room, the only sounds I had heard in the span of a few minutes 
was my own heart beating out of my chest, my footsteps, and the AC kicking on. I finally reached the living room, and I had checked find my friends. To my horror, Carrie and Robbie were still at the restaurant with Robbie's mom. Izzy's phone had broken during this time too, so I had no clue where she was still. Knowing what I know at that moment, I called out one last time, but I couldn't bring myself to turn the corner and go into the kitchen. Izzy? Are you home? Silence again. I figured maybe I was just hearing things at that point. Then I heard it. Ugh. Came a hushed whisper from the kitchen, followed by the most hurried footsteps behind me, going out the back door. I froze. Who was that? It all made sense at that point. The tapping on the window. The door opening with no noise from whoever opened it. And now this. I knew at that moment that I was not alone. Something came over me and I snapped out of this frozen reaction. You better get out of my house! I screamed at the top of my lungs. I grabbed the baseball bat that I kept in the hall closet and started shouting that same sentence in ten different ways, opening all the doors and switching on all the lights, making sure that whoever this was had left. I finally made it to the kitchen and found out the sliding glass door was left wide open by whoever came into it. As soon as the adrenaline had worn off, the shock then set in. I booked it out of the house locking the doors before throwing open my car door and ripping out the driveway without putting on my seatbelt. I called all my roommates, whose phones still worked. I later found out that Izzy had actually left town for the weekend, and I had missed that conversation. So I know whoever was in the house was not my sister or either of my other two roommates. Robbie called the police as soon as we got off the phone, of course, there wasn't much they could do because nothing was stolen and I didn't see who was in my home uninvited. I drove to my coworker's house and I broke down telling her what happened and I waited for her to update me on what she and Carrie were going to do. They opted to stay at the hotel with Robbie's mom that night. I don't know who it was that broke into my house that night. Was it Jay? Some drunk college kid who stumbled into our yard, thinking it was their place? Someone with more sinister intentions, who got caught at the right time? I am not sure. I think that is what keeps me up sometimes when I think too deeply about that night. I know it wasn't an anxiety-induced thing. I saw the door, and I heard the whisper at the footsteps hurrying out the same door they came in. I am just happy that I live with my partner in a different state now, in a relatively safe neighborhood. But even that, some nights, is not enough to allow me to feel safe when I am home alone. I was around 17 when this incident happened. I was in junior college and had rented out a tiny apartment in a standalone building. This building was right behind a construction site meaning that not many people were around this place, especially in the night. For context, I was living with another girl, let's call her Nancy, who was completing her education too. One day, I had to go attend a friend's birthday party. There were about 12 people that attended the party that evening. I didn't expect it to be late by the time I'd get back home so I did not see it as a problem that my friend wouldn't be able to accommodate me in case something were to go wrong. However, things did not go as I had planned. Being young and stupid, I gave in to my friend's request to stay at the party until late that night. This meant that I would be on my own when I was to go back home, since there simply was no space for me in my friend's tiny apartment especially not when she had five more people staying over that night. To avoid going back alone, I brought two of my companions for a sleepover, Sandra and Kathia. 
our Uber dropped us off in front of the construction site. Since that night, the conditions were less than ideal to drive to the building I lived in. The workers had just been careless and left piles of concrete in the way. We were left with no choice but to cross the construction site to get home. I remember how Sandra kept saying that she was a little apprehensive and she should have taken her pepper spray along with her. I tried to act brave, but honestly was a little scared. Kathia, on the other hand, was carefree, and we followed her lead. We were walking through the construction site when we saw something that took us aback. We saw a bizarre, flickering, blazing light coming from one of underneath the construction buildings. It was really odd, as there was no chance that it was a construction worker at 2.30 a.m. in the middle of the night. Before we had time to register what was going on, we heard something that made our hearts stop for a moment. It was a shrill, frantic cry of a woman coming from the same building. Judging by the sound of her voice, she was in excruciating pain. What happened next gives me nightmares to this day. We saw someone falling from the building, literally meters away from us, causing an earth-shattering thud. Sandra almost yelled in terror, but Kathia was able to quickly grab her mouth to make the sound fade. Thinking on her feet, she grabbed us both by the arm and pulled us behind a half-constructed wall of another building. Just to be sure that no one could see us, we stayed behind this wall for what seemed like forever. Suddenly, we saw someone wearing a bright yellow jacket exiting the building, with a gas cutter in his right hand and an amputated arm in the left. We couldn't see his face because the place was not well lit and it was almost pitch black there. Honestly, considering the absolute horror that we were in, that was the last thing that would cross our minds. After another eternity of making sure that we were now safe, we made it back home, still trembling with fear. We called 911. The police came and investigated. After a few days, we learned that it was a homeless woman who was murdered brutally that night. Her arm was cut off with a gas lighter, and she was pushed out of the fifth story and left to bleed and die. However, to this day, after several failed attempts, investigators have no clue as to who the murderer was. Last summer, I went to a house party in the Gary Owen neighborhood of Limerick, here in Ireland. We were right in the middle of lockdown restrictions, and I know it was really stupid and selfish of me to go, but I was just so in need of a stress release. I'm a really social creature, and I need to spend time around people. Like I was actually going mad being stuck inside all on my own. I do actually really regret going, but breaking the virus restrictions aren't the reason I wish I hadn't gone. Because I saw one of the worst, most horrifying things I have ever seen in my life at that party. And it's something I don't think I'll ever get out of my head. So the party is going swimmingly for a few hours, and I'm occupied being the little social butterfly that I am. But then I walk into the kitchen to get another drink, and this big argument is unfolding between this couple that seemed to be based around allegations of infidelity. It was super intense and awkward being in there with them, so I just quietly grab my bottle of wine from the fridge and then head back to where I was gabbing away with some new friends. I didn't really think much of it. House parties can be weird like that after all. One room people are passed out. Another one had people dancing around while some rooms host little arguments between couples that usually don't turn into something hideous. Only this one did. The guy in the argument storms out of the party, and then for a few hours everything is good vibes again. But then at some point later in the night, the guy comes back to the party. People know his face by this point, so they don't really have any reason not to let him in and I'm guessing he didn't give them any clues as to what he was about to do. Otherwise, they would have never let him back into the house. 
The guy then searches the house to find the girl he had been arguing with. I'm not actually sure if they were a couple. I just heard them arguing about sleeping around. When he finds her, he confronts her, starts screaming at her, then reaches into his jacket, takes out a bottle, and then appears to douse her with the contents. People thought he was just being a jerk and throwing vodka on her. The outrage partly stemming from the wasted alcohol as well as the undue aggression. He then legs it from the room while she's screaming. From the people I've spoken to about it, the ones that were in the room when it happened, they first thought her screaming was her being a bit melodramatic about having some drink chucked on her face. But then, she took her hands away from her face, and it's covered in what looks like burns. It wasn't alcohol he had thrown onto her face that night. It was acid. Luckily, someone there was a chemistry graduate. They realized what was happening almost straight away, and then grabbed something from under the kitchen sink that would neutralize the acid. I don't know what it was exactly, but it was some other chemical that probably didn't do her much good either, but it definitely stopped the damage from being any worse than it was. I heard the poor girl had to have a skin graft from her leg, though. Like even with the help she got, her injuries were absolutely horrific. The guy who did it went on the run for a bit, too. Like the Gardai, what we call the police in Ireland, didn't manage to get cuffs on him for like a month. And we were all so relieved when they finally did. I can't imagine what kind of monster does something like that after an argument to use actual acid to try to permanently disfigure someone's face. That takes a really special kind of evil, don't you think? Back in the late 70s, I was a little girl around 7 or 8 years old. I loved spending time out on my uncle's farm, as I found it to be a source of stability in my life. My mom couldn't sit still, as my grandma would say. We moved all the time, 12 times just in one year alone. My uncle worked a full-time job and had to run his farm, so when drifters would come by, he would offer a place to stay and good home cooking, courtesy of my aunt, in exchange for an extra helping hand around the farm. One Saturday after a long day of work, my uncle took one of these farm hands out for dinner to the local restaurant, which was also the bar gas station and market he lived in a tiny village with the only other establishment being a church at that time my uncle returned home without his farmhand we'll call him tom moving forward stating that he had stayed behind at the bar to hang out with the other patrons later that night my cousin rick came home and had decided to sleep on the couch in the living room instead of risking waking my aunt and uncle as he tried to sneak to his bedroom you see, Rick was only about 15 or 16, if I remember correctly, and had gotten home way past his curfew. He had only been laying down for about 30 minutes or so, when the front door opened. It was Tom, and he was covered in blood. Now my cousin knew that Tom was a farmhand and could possibly have been butchering an animal, but he couldn't understand why he'd be doing that at this time. All he knew is that something told him to keep his eyes closed and pretend to be sleeping. So he did. Tom stood there for an unusually long amount of time just staring at him before he finally walked away. Rick could then hear what sounded like the washing machine start up, then the shower turning on. He recalls thinking the entire situation was odd, but did eventually manage to fall asleep. The next day started out like any other until my aunt returned home from church. She had to deliver the terrible news to my uncle that his lifelong friends that owned the local restaurant, bar, market, etc. had been brutally hacked to death the night before with an axe. They were a husband and wife that had their home attached to their business. Upon hearing the news, my cousin Rick thought back to Tom coming in that night covered in blood. He took my aunt aside to tell her what he had witnessed and to see if maybe Tom would have been working that late. 
but of course, the answer was no. She called the sheriff's office, who came out right away. Luckily, some blood was left on the washing machine, and even though DNA evidence was nothing back then like it is today, they were still able to trace the blood to one of the victims. The thing that scares me the most about this is that it came out in court that Tom had stated to the sheriff that when he returned to my uncle's home that night, if anyone had been awake, he was going to kill them all, and now wishes that he had. You see, I was sleeping on the couch opposite of my cousin that night. My mom never let me spend the night again. About 10 years ago, when I was 12 years old, my family took a trip out east to visit some other family that lived out there. My aunt and uncle offered us to stay at their place because it was decently big and it was just the two of them living there after all of their kids had moved out. It was an old house in a nice little neighborhood and it had a woods in the backyard. After we arrived there, there were two empty bedrooms. My parents got the larger one and I took the smaller one. I remember we walked around the city the first day and met up with some other family, then we went back to their house. The next night, my parents, aunt and uncle were all invited with a few people to dinner. When I realized I would be the only kid at the dinner, they told me I could stay home for the few hours. I was happy with this because I would rather play on my Xbox than be bored with a bunch of adults. There was a TV in my room, which was a pretty nice one and after they left, I started playing Call of Duty. About 20 minutes in, I heard a car door shut, which sounded like it was coming from the driveway. I went over and looked out my second floor window down to the driveway. The sun was setting, so it was kind of hard to see, but I saw a car parked on the side of the street between my aunt and uncle's house and the neighbors next door. A man had gotten out of the car and started walking up the driveway. I didn't recognize him, but I figured he was some sort of door-to-door salesman. I was definitely not going to answer the door, but I continued to watch him, all the way until he arrived at the front door. But when the man got to the front door, he didn't knock. He appeared to just look inside, and then walked around the side of the house towards the back. Suddenly, I got a bad feeling. Why would this man want to go into the backyard? The only details I could really make out about him is that he was wearing a black jacket and jeans with a camouflage baseball cap. I went out of the room and into the bathroom across the hall which had a little window in it overlooking the backyard. I looked around for the man and then I saw him. He was walking fairly close to the house and went to the back door. I saw him look inside of it and then appear to try the handle. To my surprise, I saw the door open and the man walked right inside. I think I went into shock for a couple of seconds when I saw this, because I really didn't think the door would be left unlocked. I heard noise coming from downstairs, the sound of the man coming inside. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, and the only house phone I knew of was downstairs. So I ran back into my bedroom and hid under my bed. I hoped the man wouldn't come upstairs and would just leave. I could sort of hear noises from downstairs of the man moving around. He seemed to be walking around near the kitchen and the living room. Then, I heard him start to walk up the stairs. This scared me more than anything. He got up the stairs and walked down the hall. I heard him open a door nearby and then the door next to my room. Finally, my door got opened. I held my breath as it did, but as quickly as it opened, it was shut. I didn't know if the man was inside my room or outside because I was facing the wall until finally I heard the door to my uncle's bedroom open. The man appeared to stay in there for a while and then walked back down the hallway and downstairs again. I kept hiding under the bed and hoped he wouldn't come back upstairs. I was feeling slightly relieved until I heard the footsteps come back up the stairs once again. They seemingly stopped directly in front of the bedroom door that I was in. Then came one of the scariest moments of my life. I heard the man on the other side of the door say, I know you're in there and under the bed. Then the man told me to come out in a very creepy way. I didn't move, however, 
probably because I was frozen with fear. I was thinking of what I could possibly do when I heard a voice come from downstairs. It was the voice of another man and he was yelling. I heard him say, hey, and what's going on? I heard the man upstairs then walk back down to the base of the stairs and down them. I stayed in hiding. I heard some yelling come from downstairs and then heard the voice of the second man yell he had called the police. About ten minutes later of me shaking under the bed, I heard sirens and the police entered the house. I came out and talked to a lady police officer about what happened. The man that had broken in had left, but the other man had stayed. He turned out to be the next door neighbor. My parents arrived about twenty minutes later. I was told that the next door neighbor had seen the suspicious man enter the house and went inside to investigate. When he saw that the man had broken in, he yelled at him. The man that had broken into the house used to work for my uncle and had been fired about a year earlier. It was truly a miracle that the neighbor came in the house when he did, because he possibly saved my life. Worst field trip I ever went on was a day that would also turn out to be one of the worst of my entire life. I went to high school on the north shore of Staten Island, and around about that time in my junior year I started getting mad into CSI. Not just like, oh cool I like this TV show. I mean I wanted to be one of those guys. That show taught me that being a total nerd could be kinda cool. Everyone I know that was into the show had this super glamorous idea of what being a forensic investigator entailed, and for the longest time, I really wanted a part of that. Which is why I jumped at the chance to join my high school's forensic science club. We didn't do anything all that cool at first, just played around with fingerprint powder and did some pretty fun but pretty basic chemistry experiments. But I didn't join for that. I joined because the teacher in charge of the club had promised a field trip to the country's coroner's office, which would include a tour of the morgue. I didn't even know they gave tours of morgues, but I figured they have to run some kind of recruitment-based PR, right? So on the day in question, we all load onto one of the school buses and head off to the coroner's office. We'd been warned that we were going to be seeing some pretty graphic stuff, and despite having already collected permission slips, the teacher wanted to give us one more chance to back out while we still had the chance. We all just sat there all smug and, personally, wild horses couldn't have dragged me off that bus. But if we had any idea of what we'd be seeing in that morgue, if a glimpse into a crystal ball had shown us how that day was going to go down, not a single person would have remained on that bus, I guarantee it. Anyway, we get to the morgue, and obviously we don't get to the good stuff right away. We go through the day-to-day -day routine of a mortuary worker, what it's like for those on the lowest rung of the ladder. Then things get more complicated and we start getting to see some of the labs there, albeit through a toughened glass window, but I was still salivating over all their Gucci lab equipment. CSI made it look all high-tech for TV, but the real thing was somehow even more impressive, despite not being quite as glamorous. After the lab stuff, we took a quick lunch break in tandem with the mortuary team. The afternoon promised to bring all the more macabre stuff that the more ghoulish of us had been looking forward to, and you could definitely feel a few ripples of excitement running through us as we ate our pre-packed food. When we returned, the excitement was only ramped up when one of the staff gave us yet another warning concerning what we were about to see, because he was going to share some organ samples with us. From what I can remember, the way it works is this. Say you die in a pretty distinct way, like cancer attacks a specific organ. The medical examiner will sometimes remove this organ for preservation, so they can continue to study the cause of death long after a person has been laid to rest. What that means is that the coroner has a storage space with literally hundreds of organ samples in it. I mean, it is wall-to-wall -wall organs in there, some of which are in a pretty gnarly condition, and we were going to get a chance to look at every single one. At first, it was every bit as fascinating as I imagined it would be. Sure, it was morbid, and once or twice I had to remind myself that everything in there had once belonged to a living, breathing person. It also made me think how fragile we are as people, how there's so much that can go wrong with our bodies. Honestly, it's kind of a miracle we can even get out of bed in the morning. Then, right as I'm musing all that over... The gentle hum of whispering among the students was suddenly broken by his distinct, 
Oh my god. It wasn't like a scream or a horrified OMG. It was more like a disgusted surprise, which is why I initially thought someone had just found a particularly gruesome specimen. But it was worse than that. Much, much worse. Another person yelled in disgust, only this time it really does sound horrified and instantly I'm on my way to the source. Two girls are standing in front of a shelf full of specimens, staring in horror at one in particular. I couldn't quite make out which one and the next thing I know, the girl who shouted this lets out the most blood-curdling scream and goes hurtling out of the room followed by her friend. Before I can get a chance, other kids are crowding the area trying to work out which specimen had the girls freaked out. Slowly they start to see it too, and the group starts buzzing with exclamations and chatter until our teacher demanded to know what was going on. The group goes silent before turning to look at our teacher. Then, as they slowly made space so the teacher could see what they were looking at, one of the kids pointed to the offending jar. It was a brain. Just floating there in isopropyl or formalin or whatever they were using as a fluid preserve. It didn't look all that gross, freaky sure, but it didn't have any of the tumors or necrotic tissue that some of the others had. In fact, it actually looked relatively fresh compared to the others. But the issue wasn't so much the organ, but who it belonged to. See, the brain belonged to a kid who died in a car crash. The vehicle he was driving got plowed into an SUV coming the wrong way, and his little sister was in the car with him when it happened. She survived, thank God, but she had to watch her brother die, right in front of her eyes, before rescue could arrive to pull her out of the wreckage. The medical examiner put the cause of death as blunt force impact wounds to the head, hence why his brain was of interest. But this kid wasn't just some random kid. This kid went to our high school. The girl who ran out had been a close friend of his, and the crash was only two months before the field trip. She was only just getting over his death, only just becoming able to get out and socialize again. The forensics field trip had been the first big thing she'd been excited about since her friend's death, and then she shows up and finds his brain in a jar. It was like something out of a bad horror movie. I mean, people were just messed up. The girl who screamed went completely AWOL with her friend. I think her mom went to find her after talking with the teacher because the bus left without either of them. Everyone else was in a sorry state too. Most of the girls were crying. Heck, even some of the guys were too, kinda. I can't blame them though. It was an incredible thing to see. Incredibly terrifying, really. But it was knowing you can just end up as a brain on a shelf. A labeled specimen. That's what got me. I didn't really know the guy. But I knew he deserved better. Obviously, the incident caused a huge stink, and the kid's family said that they were even going to sue the county and school district. Rightfully so, if you asked me. But the trouble was, the guy was an organ donor. I mean, good for him for being unselfish about it, but that legally meant that after he was dead, his organs basically became property of the state. And at first, anyway, his family were told they weren't allowed to have their son's brain back. All they wanted to do was bury him again and they had to get an emergency order signed by the governor or somebody so they could get him in one piece again. I can't imagine how horrible that must have been. Not one funeral for your dead son, but two. The family weren't done litigating, though. They wanted to get paid. I don't even think they really wanted the money either, or rather, they didn't need it. I just think they wanted to bleed the state government for what they did. I mean, they didn't even tell his parents that they were going to harvest his brain let alone put it on display for high school kids to look at in less than 10 weeks after his death. It took them a while to get the case to court and I remember being happy for them that they might get a little justice, but then word swept around town that they didn't get a dime. Some judge said that the state were well within their right to cut that kid's brain out. Like I'm sure it wasn't phrased like that, but whoever had the balls to tell a kid's parents, so what if we butchered your boy, suck it up. There's a special place in the dark recesses of the afterlife for that guy. Oh boy. That court thing was only a few years back. And that's why it became the worst day of my life. Because it wasn't just finding the jar or seeing people's reactions to it. It was the fallout. 
It was knowing that poor kid's parents were reliving the torture of losing their kid over and over again for like a decade straight. And that's the real nightmare here, not just finding a brain in a jar. And knowing that just makes the world seem a little bleaker. Back when my daughter was just 11 years old, I got a call from one of her teachers while I was at work. It was the first time I'd ever gotten a call from them as my wife dealt with all the school stuff while I focused on my building firm. So when the teacher mentioned something about my daughter being on a school trip, I had to interrupt her to tell her I barely knew anything about it. I know that seems rude, but I was in the middle of dealing with a customer and time is money as they say. The teacher then tells me that my wife isn't answering her phone but that something very very serious has happened. Like she'd already mentioned, my daughter had gone on a field trip that morning with the rest of her year's group. She had been accounted for in the morning, but following another roll call after their lunch break she was nowhere to be found. Obviously I'm already furiously anxious at that point, but I'm managing to keep it together right up until I ask where my daughter is lost. Nosley Safari Park, the teacher responded. I literally couldn't believe my ears, like I actually had to ask her again just to be sure of what she'd said. When she confirmed it, my legs turned to jelly. Nosley Safari Park has all kinds of wild animals that can just wander right up to cars. If my daughter had somehow just gotten up out of her seat whilst inside the safari park, there's no telling what kind of danger she was in. It was honestly one of the worst days of my life. All I could think about was getting the call that they'd found her body and the closed casket funeral she'd have to receive. It'd be in the papers, no doubt. Every parent's worst nightmare, I'd say. A national scandal, they'd make the grieving process infinitely more painful. Obviously, I got in touch with my wife about it before her teachers managed to, actually, and she was every bit as distraught as you can imagine. Of all the places for your kid to get lost, a place where lions are allowed to roam freely on some old country estate or something. The wife was in work at the time and was so upset that she was sent home. She called up our daughter's school just to make sure she wasn't there, but there was no sign of her. Obviously, they'd pretty much confirmed in our heads that she was gone, and we'd be the next set of parents to be crying on the nightly news, begging people to come forward. I was just numb with terror. And even with all my workaholic tendencies, I couldn't find my focus. So I decided to drive home and meet my wife at the house to make sure she wasn't too hysterical. She really had taken it badly on the phone and I was almost as worried about her as I was my daughter. Then, as I'm driving home, I see my phone on the driver's seat next to me start lighting up and buzzing. This is before I had a car with a Bluetooth stereo and there was a police car like three cars behind so... I didn't fancy getting pulled over in the middle of getting the worst news of my life. The wife kept calling too, over and over again, and I just had this horrible sinking feeling that she'd gotten the word that our worst fears had been realized. So again, I keep it together, focusing on getting home in one piece, but then I pulled into our driveway and I see that the door to our house is slightly ajar. I don't know what it was about that little indicator, but it put the fear of God into me. Was my wife so upset she hadn't shut the door? Had the police just walked in after telling her our daughter was dead? It all sounds quite irrational, I know, but I was in a terrible state at the time and that's all I could put it down to. So instead of actually getting out the car and going inside to check on her, I called the wife from my driver's seat. I felt like a condemned man being walked the gallows as I waited for her to answer, and when she did, she was floods of tears. I mean floods, and I knew the worst had come, I just needed to hear her say it. But instead, all she said was, she's here, she's at home, and thank god she's fine. I practically fell out of the car seat and bolted into the house. There, in the living room, are my wife and my daughter, both with tear-stained cheeks, and I'll tell you what. I'd be lying if I said my eyes didn't get a bit leaky in the moments that followed. Now I bet you're all wondering what exactly happened and how she ended up back at home and not at school or at the safari park. So my daughter had just started secondary school here in the UK and the safari park trip was supposed to be something of a social occasion in which kids could get to know each other while setting a positive atmosphere for the year ahead. 
But as it turned out, after the morning registration, my daughter and her friends had something of a falling out, and right before they were due to get on the coach, someone said something very mean to her. So instead of following her friends onto the coach, our daughter just slipped away without anyone noticing. She said she spent about half an hour or so in the library, but was so upset that she decided to just walk home. Having known about the spare back door key we keep under a plant pot in the backyard, she was able to let herself into the house. Then right about the same time she's making herself beans on toast to cheer herself up, her teachers do their second head count of the day, and that's when the whole saga kicked off. It was most definitely one of the worst experiences of my entire life. I know she was okay in the end, but I can't understate the terror you feel as a parent knowing your child is either missing or in danger. I mean, it's completely irrational. I'd like to think I'm quite a patient and understanding person. You have to be in the building trade. But the teacher told me my daughter was lost. I actually wanted to murder her. Like most schools, my high school used to have this extracurricular program that we used to call Outdoor Adventure. Outdoor Adventure consisted of a group of students and a few teachers who would get together after school once a week to go for short hikes in the area. And towards the end of the season, we would all go on a weekend camping trip, which was hands down the best part of the whole group. We would get our permission slips early in the year so we would know exactly where we were going that season, which kind of gave all of us something to look forward to during the stressful times of the year. In 2015, we ended up going to this rather small campground that was in the mountains near the Delaware River. It was such a quiet and scenic place. There was nothing like it. The first day was amazing. We all got situated and familiar with our surroundings, and then we went on a few walks. But day two, which was a Saturday, was the one that everyone was anticipating to be the best of the whole trip. We were going kayaking down a stretch of the Delaware and we had all been looking forward to it since we saw it on the schedule. The final day came and we all made our way to the two vans that were taking us to the two spots where we would park. We parked one van where we planned on ending our trip down the river and then all piled into the other and drove upstream. After we got to the small bank on the river where we had planned to set off, we all began inflating our kayaks and getting into the water. And in no time, we were off. Now we had been warned that since it had been a rainy season, some parts of the river might be moving a bit faster than usual. But it was nothing that we shouldn't have been able to handle. Plus, we had multiple experienced chaperones with us in case something bad did happen. So none of us expected anything bad to go wrong. But I guess that sometimes when everything goes wrong. I was in the back of the line of kayaks as we made our way down the river. The only person behind me was one of our teachers, Mr. Flint, who ended up stopping to use the bathroom in the woods and said he would catch up. One of the chaperones in the front of the line began passing back the message from one student to the next that we were going to be hitting some minor rapids, but to be ready for them. In no time, I could start to hear the sound of running water turn into more of a rushing sound. I wasn't concerned though. It really wasn't going too fast. It just didn't feel like a lazy river anymore. That was when things went from fun to horrifying. Out of nowhere, I felt a slam in the bottom of my kayak as it must have hit a rock. And before I could react in any way, it was flipping to the side. I was under the water, but still inside the kayak that was still drifting quickly downstream. I did everything I could to free myself from the inflatable vessel. And just as I broke loose, my back was slammed against a rock. I began tumbling around in the current and I had no idea where my kayak was at that point. I tried to find my center, but when you're being pulled by water and bouncing between rocks in murky water, it's near impossible. I could hardly tell which way was up. 
let alone move in that direction. I was at the mercy of the river, and I don't think I was going to make it out, had it not been for Mr. Flint. At first I thought a paddle from the kayak had hit me in the chest, but to my luck, it was Mr. Flint's arm grabbing onto my shirt and pulling me above the surface. It was a highly stressful moment, but he did his best to get us to the end of the rushing water as fast as he could. And once he did, we both loaded into his kayak and caught up with the rest of the class. Every holiday season, the town next to ours hosted a county event that was called the Winter Wonderland. It was a small festival that would be held in the center of a small town in upstate New York, and it was mostly just baked goods being sold by vendors, while local talents and artists would perform. It was usually a lot of fun, and almost every elementary school district in the county would go during the day and see Santa and all that fun stuff. That year was just like any other. It was so much fun at the actual Winter Wonderland. The hot chocolate was delicious. The people working as Santa's elves were very charismatic. It was great. The bus ride home was a different story though. As you might know, around December in New York, it gets dark pretty early. And this was a field trip where our parents had to pick us up at the school afterwards because it would have been too late to catch a bus home. So we left the winter wonderland around four in the afternoon so it was already getting dark, and right before we left, it started to snow. This was nothing new though. It snowed all of the time, so none of us kids were worried. I'm sure the bus driver was doing his best, but sometimes accidents happen. As we were making our way down a hill that had a small bend towards the bottom, we all felt the bus shake a bit, and as we got closer to the bend in the road, the bus wasn't turning. The bus driver told everyone to hang on tight and before we knew it, we were flying over the side of the hill. The bus tires tore through the freshly powdered snow on the ground as we barreled toward the trees ahead of us at what felt like light speed, but was probably like 20 miles an hour. I'll never forget the image of a bunch of my classmates scrambling to their seats, trying to get our seatbelts on, but most of us weren't fast enough. Most of my classmates ended up with just a few bumps and bruises. As for me and two other students, we went flying. You see, I was in an aisle walking around, even though the teachers told me not to, and when the bus lost traction, I couldn't make it to a seat in time. I was facing the back of the bus when it made an impact with the trees ahead of us. All I remember is being ripped backward off of my feet from the force, and then I woke up in a hospital bed four days later. When the bus hit the tree line, I, along with two other students, were launched through the front windshield of the bus. One of them ended up being just fine somehow. All she needed was a few stitches. I apparently went head first into a tree and had to be placed into a medically induced coma for a few days while doctors worked on my skull. As for our other classmate, he didn't make it out of the ambulance. He was the first of us to go through the windshield and I believe the impact of the glass plus the impact of the frozen ground caused too much damage, both internal and external. Our school district never attended winter events that required buses again. In fifth grade, our school took us on a field trip to a science museum, and it's one that I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. The more I think back on that day, the more I realize how dangerous the situation was for all of us who were there. You see, since the museum was a big place, each class was split into multiple groups each with a different chaperone. My group consisted of me, my friends James and Peter, and we also had a new girl in our class named Elisa who was with us. One of my biggest regrets from that day was not paying more attention to Elisa. But as a kid, the only thing I was paying attention to was all the shiny things at the museum and making dumb jokes with my friends. What everyone had failed to notice was that our class had picked up one extra person who was tagging along with us. 
Most of us just assumed that it was one of the other students' parents that were there to chaperone, so none of us really thought twice about an extra adult, especially since he had been following us around to all the exhibits and interacting with us and our chaperones as if he belonged there. He was giving us all sorts of lessons about what certain exhibits were all about, and everything seemed normal. That all changed about 20 minutes before we all expected to load back onto the buses and head back to the school. It was at the time that Peter's mother, the woman who was our group's chaperone, noticed that Elisa was no longer with our group. She tried her best to keep calm about the situation, and she let other chaperones and the teachers know what was going on. And soon enough, security and museum staff were looking all over the place for Elisa, but after searching for about an hour, there was no sign of her. That was when the police got involved, and they ended up looking at the security footage of the museum that day. It turns out that that charismatic man that we thought was a chaperone was someone who followed our class into the museum that day. The footage from the camera showed the man kneeling down and talking to Elisa before the two both made their way outside into the parking lot. It was there that she seemed to get into the man's car on her own without being forced. The police believe that he lied about something to make Elisa believe that he was taking her back to the school or home or something of that nature. There was no sign of the man's car or Elisa for a few weeks, but then word began to spread quickly around the town that police had found her body off a small trail in the woods, off a side road just 15 minutes away from the museum. Not too many details were made public about the state of the body. The school was in trouble for not keeping a closer eye on their students during the trip, and the entire grade was shaken up about what happened. None of us really gotten to know Elisa, but we all wish we had. This happened when I was in the fifth grade. I was in a science class and one day we all took a field trip to a science museum. It had a bunch of exhibits and things like that. I really wasn't much of a science fan, but I will admit that I always liked going to the museum because it was pretty fun. We left school and drove down to the museum which was about 30 minutes away. Once we got there, we did the usual stuff. We were able to kind of split up as a group as long as we made it back. I went with a few of my friends in the class from one spot to another. Eventually, it was time to get lunch, and then we would leave shortly after that. Our teacher went around letting everyone know we would be leaving in 10 minutes and to meet back at the entrance. I had seen everything I was going to see, so I decided to just go back and get on the bus. That, that way, I could play some games on my phone until we were going to leave. I left the building into the back parking lot where our bus had dropped us off. I got out there and saw a couple of buses. I started to walk over and saw the bus driver wave me over to him. I got on the bus, but as I did, the bus driver stopped me. He told me there would be no phones on the way back. I was pretty upset to hear this, and I didn't understand why, but I gave him my phone and then sat down. The bus driver then started the engine. I looked out the window and tried to think of why we weren't allowed to have our phones. Sure, sometimes the kids would get out of control with them, but I found this a little bit unreasonable. Just then, I felt the bus start to move. I looked and saw the driver was driving out of the parking lot and down to the street. I called out that the rest of the class was still inside, but he ignored me. Then I got a terrible feeling. I asked him to stop the bus and go back, but he just turned around and yelled at me to shut up. The bus was driving down the street and headed for the freeway. All I could do was look out the window and wonder what exactly was going on. I wished that I hadn't gone to the bus by myself and went back with the rest of the group. The bus driver merged onto the freeway, and we started going at a fairly high speed. The longer we drove, the more scared that I got. Now I knew the real reason he had taken my phone from me. We continued down the freeway for I would say about five minutes. Suddenly, I heard the noise of a police siren. I looked behind me and saw a flashing light. The bus started to move to the side of the road, and I saw a police car go with it. That was one of the greatest feelings in my life. The bus driver then opened the door and took off running into the field beside the road. 
I saw several police officers run after him and another run to the bus. They were able to get me back to safety and the bus driver was caught a short time later. Back when I was a kid, we took a school field trip to the zoo one time. My school was really small and basically the entire place went. It took us over an hour to get there, but when we were there, it was a day long event, which was nice for us because we didn't actually have to do any schoolwork. I think I was like eight years old and I was one of the younger people there. The first part of the day we spent looking for a bunch of animals, then we got food. After that, we started looking more at plants and things like that. I was more into the animals, so my friend Matt and I went back over to them. We first got back to the exhibit of sea lions. And when we got there, one of the zoo workers asked us if we wanted to help feed the animals. Of course we said yes, because as an eight-year-old kid, it seemed like something super fun to do. He told us to follow him and then led us into a doorway and down a dark and quiet hall. It was really weird to be in the back of an exhibit, but it got me really excited to feed the animals. We followed the guy deeper in and into a storage type of room that was even darker. He said this is where they kept the food. He told us to wait there for a second and left the room. Then we saw the door shut and heard it lock. We immediately knew something was wrong. I went to the door and tried to open it, but it was in fact locked. It was a really strong and thick door and neither of us would be able to break it. We banged on it, but I don't know how anyone else outside would be able to hear. After a while of that with no response, we decided to examine the room. It was very dark with no apparent lights and we could barely see. It was probably just about 15 feet by 10 feet and had basically just junk laying around. It just seemed to be another storage closet. We waited and waited, but of course the guy never came back and nobody else did either. This was kind of a long time ago and neither of us had cell phones we could take out to call anyone or anything like that. We just waited in the dark room for what felt like forever. Occasionally, we would yell or bang on the door, but nothing would ever happen. We did this for literally hours. At one point, we stopped and actually fell asleep on the floor for some time. Eventually, we got back up and went back to banging on the door and yelling. At last, finally, we could barely hear someone from the other side. We both yelled as loud as we possibly could. The door tried to open, but was still locked. Then whoever was there went away. We got really disappointed and thought that was it, until a few minutes later we saw the door open. There was another zoo worker and she asked us how we had gotten in there. We told her the story and she seemed really surprised. By that time we saw that the sun was almost set when we got back into the zoo. By that time we saw that the sun had almost set when we got back into the zoo. Apparently everyone had been looking for us for over two hours. We were able to get back home later that day but the guy that worked there and locked us in had left and nobody could find him. It turns out he was caught a while later and had been addicted to some drugs or something like that. They said he had been acting really strange lately. I really don't know why he locked us in there, but we were very lucky to get out because that closet wasn't really used by the zoo anymore. The tie. My family and I went to go visit some relatives we had in a foreign country. I was born and raised in the USA, but we still go back often to visit relatives. My dad didn't want to keep paying for a hotel, so a few years back, we bought an apartment. This trip was our first time staying at the apartment. The way the apartment is set up is as a living room where the entryway is. It was the only air-conditioned spot. My dad went back to the US to finish up some business as he was going to meet us there at a later time. So it was my mom, my three brothers, and I. The landlord who gave my mom the key was sort of creepy from her description, but it didn't really alarm anyone that much. Another important thing to the story is, my mom got the key and met the landlord alone since we were taking care of things at my uncle's house. It had been a few weeks and my mom couldn't stand her room since there was no air conditioning. I didn't blame her, so we all slept in the living room. Nothing out of the ordinary happened until about four weeks into staying there. At around 2am, 
My mom was waking me up, but with a finger over her mouth, basically saying, keep quiet. My mom never does this, so I shut up and made a hand motion, asking what was going on. She pointed to the door, and someone was jiggling the doorknob. We had forgotten to lock the door, but thank God my older brother got into the habit of using chain locks from his college days. It should be noted that my brother was dead asleep in another room, so I was now the oldest male. My mom was distraught and I was thinking about what to do. I was thankful that at least the chain lock was there, but I think the man on the other side noticed that that was all. I see a face pressed up from the small gap. It was the landlord. He finally gives up after about 10 minutes, or so I thought. The next thing I see is a coat hanger trying to open the chain lock. I finally decide to do something, so I body check the door, slamming it shut. I lock the actual lock and yelled in a foreign tongue and the man seemed surprised to hear a man's voice. I guess he assumed my mom was alone and the only one to check in. He scrambled down the stairs. All said and done, he was gone by 2.30 a.m. I looked out the window across the street at the landlord's house. He just stared at me, and then turned off the lights in his house. When we woke up, I told my brother. We called the police, but they said we didn't really have any evidence. It was our word against his. My mom wasn't sure it was the landlord, but I swore it was him. I had seen him. My dad arrives four days later, and I told him the story. He met with the landlord and agreed he was creepy. My dad actually believed me. My mom didn't feel safe anymore, so we left that apartment the day after my dad arrived. As we drove away, the landlord gave me a little smirk and wave. By now, it was daylight. A few years ago, my roommate Chloe and I moved into the perfect apartment in a six-unit building. It was on a street we immediately fell in love with. Chloe and I are both in our early 20s, who moved from a small town to a major city in the last five years, so we felt like real adults living in this place. Within the first couple of weeks, we began to suspect we were in close proximity of an ongoing domestic dispute between the tenants and the unit upstairs. At this time, we hadn't seen or met them, so we really had no idea the context of the relationship. A man's loud, angry ranting, with no shortage of aggressively insulting comments, responded by inaudible mumbles, prompted us to think a woman may be in a potentially violent environment. Chloe and I decided we would try to listen, in case things ever escalated too far, and maybe try to offer the woman help in the meantime. That's if we ever met her. Over the next six weeks, we continued to hear him, but we had not seen anyone and there were no real developments. When he was really loud, we tried to record him on our phones. One Sunday afternoon, I was home alone cleaning my kitchen, which was located at the back of our unit. The man upstairs was having a very loud and long rant, and for the first time, I heard a clear response. I could make out a woman's voice telling him to shut up and leave her alone, in an almost annoyed rather than fearful tone. He did not appreciate that and began yelling at her, which eventually led to him banging something against his floor. Eventually he did one so hard that my kitchen lights began to flicker. I could see debris falling from the ceiling. This freaked me out and I called my boyfriend Ted. When Ted answered, I whispered into the phone, don't say anything, just listen. The man upstairs continued to yell. But it wasn't until there was another bang that Ted could hear. I said into the phone, That's my upstairs neighbor. He's been going on like this for a long time. I've been trying to record some of it. Here's where the story really takes a turn. Considering how clearly we could hear him upstairs, it makes sense he could make out what was being said below him. All six units were connected by a stairway outside at the back of the building. I heard very loud steps running down them. Next thing I know, there are three heavy raps on my door and an angry voice saying, So you can record my conversations, but you can't answer the door. I was instantly paralyzed and worried he would come by the window where I was standing. 
After about 20 seconds, I heard the steps return upstairs, and that familiar voice call up. No one's home. I collected myself from the shock and fear of what just happened. I left my apartment to make some calls. I decided to phone my landlord first, as he seemed like he would know what to do if we were having issues with another tenant and I was very confused about what was happening. I told him the chronology of events since moving in, and he provided me with some very interesting information. The tenants above us was a mother and son, Rita and Ivan. Ivan is 36, and him and his mom have been living in the building for 10 years. During that time, Ivan never had a job, and in the last couple of years had caused some problems for the landlord specifically him and the previous tenant of our unit, who had moved out over a year ago, had butted heads several times, which is why my landlord had decided not to mention anything to us. He knew Ivan had some issues, but assumed it was an isolated and contained issue. The last thing the landlord had told me was that while the previous tenant was in our unit, Ivan had approached them, accusing her of installing something in his wall to listen to him. Maybe I'm dense, but this did not set off immediate alarms, something more serious was going on with Ivan. I was still believing the woman's voice I heard belonged to someone in danger, so I called the city non-emergency police line, who sent a car over to make sure she was safe. She was, and they promptly left. After our call, the landlord began to build a case to evict my upstairs neighbors, on the grounds they were impeding on other tenants' ability to enjoy their space. Things upstairs had been mostly quiet for two days, until I was in touch with the landlord again over the phone. He provided me with some more information, specifically that he believed when Ivan was ranting, it was towards the previous occupant of our unit, rather than Rita. This obviously seemed odd to me, but we were still trying to piece everything together, so we had to keep an open mind. The landlord also reiterated how Ivan really changed in the past couple of years, and had caused problems before. His reasoning for not giving us a heads up before moving in was that since the last tenant had moved out, he had been quiet and kept to himself. In the days after this call, the ranting started up again as we waited for an update on the eviction process. That Friday, we received confirmation that Rita and Ivan had been served with their first warning of eviction, so we expected to hear some action. Sure enough, that night, while I was in bed, I heard Ivan's voice from above. Shh, I'm trying to listen. At this point, I'm definitely concerned, but I really had no idea where this was going, and how quickly. The next evening, Chloe called me while I was at work. She told me she thought she heard a knock at our back door. I told her I wouldn't be home for a couple of hours, but if she was concerned, I could leave early, or she could call the non-emergency line. Chloe told me she was going to see if anything happens, and that she would be okay. At around 10pm, I came home, and by midnight, I was on the phone with the non-emergency myself, because Ivan had come downstairs to my back window, where I was standing, asking us to leave him alone, because we were harassing him. Chloe and I had been in our kitchen, talking about our days, having agreed we would try to live our lives despite the situation. At one point, the subject of upstairs briefly came up, and the next thing I knew, the man I had only ever physically seen once, with long, dark, greasy hair, and a look of emptiness in his eyes, was standing at my back window, next to where I was sitting. My immediate response was to pull out my phone and start recording him. Yeah, you can record me, he said. Can you leave me alone? You and your friends harass my home every day. This got my adrenaline going, and suddenly I heard myself call back. Bye, Ivan. I called the police and we waited for them to arrive. When he went back upstairs, he started ranting to Rita and said some very weird and unsettling things. He said we were sexually harassing him, and that us, the landlord, and the previous tenant were all associated. He then mentioned the bat we have beside our back door, which he wouldn't have seen at the window. Therefore, he had listened to us mention it. He also knew my name, having only ever seen me once. The police arrived and essentially told us there was nothing they could do. They knocked at Ivan and Rita's door, 
However, no one answered, and they stayed silent. The officer advised us to go to the station the following day and have a specific officer assigned to check in on us and monitor everything. They left, and I called my boyfriend to come and stay over for the night. In the hour after the police left, Ivan ranted sporadically, repeating much of the same things we'd been hearing in the past week. Ted came over. He heard for himself what was going on and agreed it was very unsettling. Banging came from upstairs, and Ted said he was going to go out back for a smoke, that if Ivan came outside to call 911. Ted had injured his back the previous week and was concerned if Ivan was going to try to come downstairs again. He decided to bring the bat with him. Minutes later, Ivan had come outside and was standing at the top of the stairs, yelling that he was going to knock us out. He started coming down the stairs when Ted picked up the bat, telling Ivan to stay upstairs. I called 911, and our downstairs neighbor came outside to help us, having heard the commotion. The police arrived, and I experienced some of the saddest minutes of my life. For starters, when the police went upstairs this time, Rita answered and completely defended her son. The woman we had initially been concerned was at the receiving end of domestic abuse, told the officers we were not leaving her son alone, that he'd almost been attacked by my boyfriend. The police said there was nothing they could do and left us for what felt like bait in order for our concerns to be taken seriously. They left. We heard Ivan amp up again. This time he was saying he was going to kill this downstairs, so we packed up and left for the night, each staying with a friend. That was a tough night, as we both came to realize this apartment we thought was so perfect had a pretty fatal flaw. We had no idea how this was going to end. We met up the following day, and after encouragement from our families, we went to the police station, needing real help with a potentially dangerous situation. It was eventually arranged that charges would be placed on Ivan for uttering death threats. Chloe and I each gave a testimony, and the officers told us it would be going to the apartment to arrest Ivan. They advised us not to stay there for the night, if possible, in the event he refused to be taken by them, as this could escalate things. Without a warrant, the police had no way of forcing Ivan to go with them, but I had a feeling he would be, since I heard him at one point mention that he was the one protecting their home. Sure enough, when the police came to the building, we packed over night bags. Ivan let them take him away, despite his mother's protests, which included accusing us of lying and threatening them. We packed up our things, watched him get taken away, and we left, never spending another night at that apartment. Since all of this, there have been a few updates. First of all, we moved and the landlord was very generous in his reimbursement to us, having known Ivan had issues that he greatly underestimated. Aside from not wanting to be sued, I really believe the landlord to be a decent guy who just made a judgment call that went completely wrong. We received a few updates on the legal proceedings, both from the charges that were pressed and the landlord's eviction process of Rita and Ivan. Ivan was released the following day on bail with a number of conditions, and we're waiting for a court date, I guess. The landlord is also waiting for a court date, having filled all the pre-required documents. The final piece to this completely bizarre sequence of events was the Facebook profile we found, having looked him up on a whim. Ivan hadn't posted in three years, which lined up with the timeline of when the landlord said he began causing problems. He had some unsettling posts that we provided to the police in addition to frequent mention of a relationship he was in. He has dozens of posts about the person, with no response, including no likes on any of it. It's strictly posts made to an anonymous person who had no interactions, nor did anyone else. Having researched what I believe Ivan is suffering from, I am curious if this relationship ever existed, or if it was another delusion. That's the story. Thank you for listening to it. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel and it's essential in reaching a wider audience. 
Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. Here I turn 10 years old. My mom and I moved into a spacious two-bedroom apartment in what is statistically considered one of the safest cities in America. We moved out just a few years ago after my grandmother passed away, but I spent 12 years living in this place. The apartment was one of five in our building. You know how a duplex has two units in the same building, split down the middle. This building was quartered into four units with an added unit on the lower level. We had the unit above the lower level. Our landlord at the time was kind of a If something broke and needed fixing or replacing, he would come and attempt to fix it himself instead of just hiring an expert. And all the while, he'd make comments about how women break things. What can I say? Anyway, at the time of the story, I was 13 years old. Our dumb landlord rents out the lower level unit to a lovely young couple. Their names were George and Lisa. On the night they moved in, I remember they had music just blasting from their new home as they moved furniture and boxes down the stairs with their friends. It was uncharacteristically loud for the neighborhood, but none of us other residents actually had a problem with it. They seemed pleasant enough. The pleasantries lasted about a week before George and Lisa started having these blowout screaming matches. My mom and I would hear her start screaming and cussing him out. He tried to get her to back off and calm down, and then they moved on to the next stage, which was slamming. Always after an hour or so of this, things would go quiet. Then Lisa would be heard in the back of the house, where the bedrooms were, just sobbing. There was one day where I heard Lisa walking around outside, having a conversation with herself in different voices. A few more weeks and we began to notice that George and Lisa got a lot of strange visitors at strange times who always seemed intoxicated and sometimes banged on our huge living room window without knowing whose window it was. When it was very quiet, I heard scraping sounds coming from the kitchen area. A lot. One time I heard George and Lisa having the most obnoxious sex I've ever heard. The night things went too far for us was when a woman showed up at 3 in the morning with an empty milk jug and started ringing every doorbell to our building, scratching at the front door, trying to get in, moaning and yelling for George and Lisa. She disappeared after a few minutes, and suddenly we hear the back door to the building, jiggling. You could tell there was more than one person trying to break in. My mom called the police and we gathered our things and went to a restaurant for breakfast, exhausted after no sleep. We then went and booked a hotel for the night. We just couldn't deal with them again. After we complained to the landlord and the police multiple times, things got quiet and really awkward between us and the neighbors. And that's when the FBI showed up. I go to answer the door and the man and woman ask if they can talk to my adult. I say sure and lead them to my unit, which we always kept open during the day anyway. And right there, they open a binder and show us photos of George and Lisa. They ask if we happen to have seen them before, and we tell them they live downstairs. It turns out they're both living under false identities, major fraudsters, and dealing cocaine. Shortly after this, George and Lisa moved into the apartment building across the street and they were arrested within a month. This happened a few years back. I was 23 years old, married, and had a stepdaughter. I'm a female, divorced from my ex now, and I don't see my stepdaughter anymore. But at this time, I was living with them, my cousin, her husband and their son. We had a townhouse on a dead end that led to some train tracks in my hometown. The neighborhood was decent, but had a lot of houses close together and was highly populated with children. There were usually toys, bikes, and skateboards hanging around on the sidewalks and on the front lawns of houses. This included our house. 
We resided in the second and third floor of the house, while our landlord's daughter occupied the first floor. Shortly after moving in, two tenants moved into the basement apartment. A middle-aged couple. They seemed alright, but were eerily quiet at first. They started showing some signs of drug use and just started showing some odd behavior. For example, they would scream at the top of their lungs at each other over petty things, like wanting a ride somewhere and the other not wanting to give that ride. We were starting to scare our kids. I had a bad feeling about the guy, John. In our state, we have access to criminal records. We can search anybody's state police record. I exercised that right and found out that this guy had pending sexual assault charges against him. Now I was terrified, scared of the kids playing outside. Scared of the kids being in the same building as this guy. Weird things started happening. Like we would wake up in the morning and the kids' toys would be broken. Not just broken, but destroyed. Skateboards would be completely broken in half. My wagon was completely mangled. And toys were thrown down an embankment we had behind our house. We all had a feeling it was him, but we couldn't prove it. Tension had already started to build. It was clear we didn't like seeing each other, but everyone was so passive-aggressive about everything, until this day. I was dropping my ex off at work while my cousin kept an eye on the kids. They played at the neighbor's house in their fenced-in yard. My phone rang when I was a few blocks away from home. It was my cousin, and I remember her saying, I think we're going to have a problem. I asked her why, and she said, John is throwing down the embankment and knocking over the garbage bins. My first thought was, those things are full, he must be making a mess, and boy was I right. I pulled into my driveway to see all of our recyclables scattered across the edge of my driveway. It made my blood boil. I got out of the car and looked over at his door on the side of the house. I saw him throw something out of the doorway, and we met eyes. As soon as that happened, I took that chance to confront him. I punched. I punched this six foot five man in the face. It didn't exactly drop him, but it did knock him down. He fell back and kind of bumped into his van. He fell on his ass in front of it. To put things into perspective, I'm five foot eight, and at the time, I had some extra weight on me, so I wasn't a tiny helpless girl. After this, he got up. With a vengeance, he threw punch after punch after punch. So did I. I was starting to get weak. My arms felt like spaghetti and I couldn't see a thing. I could hear my stepdaughter screaming and my cousin yelling for help from the upstairs window. I wiped my eyes and to my surprise, I saw my other neighbor restraining John. He was still trying to attack me even after being restrained. He was bleeding badly. I didn't realize it right away but my nose was broken. My four foot nine cousin was standing in my front yard with a metal chair over her head. My stepdaughter was taken inside with my other neighbor's kids. John was screaming at me. I was just screaming back at him, calling him crazy, a diddler, and telling him nobody wants him here. It felt like a segment of Jerry Springer in between a KY Jelly wrestling match. I ran upstairs to look for my cousin's husband. The scared little man that he was, he was in the window calling the police. When I realized he was useless, I headed back out. John was gone. He took off. The rescue and police arrived to where I was questioned. Then I was taken to the hospital. I was released soon after and was about to head out to pick up my ex, whom hadn't even known what happened yet. But I couldn't find my keys, my car and house keys. We checked everywhere and couldn't find them. I started feeling like John stole them before he took off. But they were with my phone. Why wouldn't he have taken my phone? I called the police station and they informed me he was picked up. I took a shot in the dark and asked if they found my keys on it. I described my keys. Green New York Yankees bat keychain. They confirmed yes, he did have them. They asked me if I would like to press further charges. I, of course, said yes. There was a no-contact order active, but technically they could not make him leave the house. That was up to my landlord. 
My landlord kicked them the out, not before they could squeeze some stalking and harassing it. My good neighbors turned their security cameras on, facing our house. One morning his girlfriend was standing in front of the house, yelling at us. When we watched it on the footage, what we couldn't see was that he was standing right at our door. She was the bait. He was the hook. Thank God we didn't bite. They moved out, and it was peaceful for the rest of the time they were there. I still see them here and there, usually walking and usually looking angry. Good. So in 2012, my then-girlfriend and I went on a big year-long road trip through the States, working on farms along the way for room and board, and ended our trip by driving across Canada, west to east, stopping back in Nova Scotia where we lived. At some point we got a puppy, and around the time we got to Alberta, with an extra mouth to feed, money was running out. Since I'm a carpenter, I decided to find a place to rent, and I would get a job for a few months before we kept going on our trip. We scrolled through Kijiji, the Canadian Craigslist, and eventually found an ad for a place. There was this one guy who lived in a very cool looking house and was only a short drive from where I had found a job at. He wanted someone to move in with him to help out with the bills. We started corresponding with him by email. I told him that I was going to work in the area and my girlfriend would be staying home with the puppy. Being desperate and having become accustomed to trusting strangers throughout this long trip, we agreed to send him a deposit and take the offer. We got to this place a few days later. It was in the middle of nowhere and there were no neighbors, but we had known that before. This guy looked to be about 30 to 35, small framed, and just looked like a regular working country dude. Except his expression was weird. It was like he was scared or something. He almost looked like he was ashamed of himself. He was fine with our dog being inside, though he had a dog that wasn't allowed inside. This struck me as weird since this is the cold Canadian North. Right away, he met us at the door, and I felt there was something off about him. It made me uneasy, especially since I would be going off to work every day, leaving my girlfriend alone with this creepy guy. But she didn't seem worried, and I didn't want to be controlling, so I let it go. The first night we were there, he wanted to have a few drinks with us. We obliged politely. He brought us a few cans of shitty watery beer, and meekly drank his while sitting across the kitchen table from us. We tried to relax the situation, and asked him a few friendly questions about himself. His answers were brief and quiet. He seemed to want friendship, but also seemed completely unsure of how to get it. He went over a few rules he had. Number one was to stay out of his room, which was obviously fine. Number two was that we were not allowed to go into the basement. Kind of weird. And number three was to stay away from the barn. By this point, I could imagine the headlines, Nova Scotian couple found murdered, bound in barn. That night, I didn't sleep very much. I wasn't supposed to start work for a couple of days, so I just stayed up reading and playing with our pup. I heard his truck pull out of the driveway pretty early in the morning. I headed for the basement because I just had to know what was down there. It was pretty bare. Just a few washing and drying machines and some lawn chairs. But I opened a closet door and found a weird nurse costume that looked like it was for sexual purposes a roll of duct tape, a set of handcuffs, a shotgun, and a box of shells, all sitting together on the same shelf. I woke up my girlfriend and explained that she no longer had any say in the matter and that we were leaving before he got home. We sent him a message after we left, lying, saying that one of our family members had gotten sick and we were moving back home. He never offered to return our money and we had no more contact with him. I'm still waiting to see him in the news. My ex thinks that I worry too much, but her parents thanked me profusely. And I still wonder, what was inside that barn? I was 19 years old at the time. I had a really good opportunity to go to college, but things fell through a couple of months into it, and 
Basically, I wasn't allowed to go back at that college. I'm not going to go into the details, but I found myself stuck. I was living at home with my parents and working at McDonald's most of the time. I was really disappointed in myself, especially because I didn't have anyone else to blame but myself. I seemed to be your typical college dropout that ended up working at fast food. But while I was working there, I had a couple of really strange experiences. So the first one happened like this. There was this really creepy customer. He was an old man and he just seemed like the most insane individual ever. You just have to think of the physical embodiment of Florida man. He always wore this bathroom robe with a stained white t-shirt underneath. Or shoes. He had these really old Nikes that seemed like they had been completely covered in mud and never washed. Everywhere he stepped, there was some residue coming off of his shoes. I don't know how far he lived, but this guy came in to eat at McDonald's four or five times a day for as long as I worked there. I never personally had any horrible experiences with him. It wasn't like he was this unruly customer. He always asked for extra ketchup, but it's not like that was a crime or anything. The story is weird because I remember talking about him with some of my co-workers. I had one friend there that I became rather close with. I remember talking with her about this creepy guy that had just came in to eat McDonald's all the time wearing his pajamas. When you work with the public, there are so many people and faces that you see all the time, and none of them mean anything, it's just another customer. But when you have someone like this, it almost makes the job a little bit more bearable, as weird as that might sound, a little bit more consistency to the job. Plus, making jokes about someone like that was kind of fun. But there was one day when the jokes weren't funny anymore, because he stopped coming in. They couldn't find out why either. I mean, when you see someone multiple times a day, every day for months on end, you get a little surprised when they stop showing up. It all just seemed, I don't know, unusual. I remember talking to my friend about it. Neither of us could imagine why he stopped. I remember getting a phone call at 2 in the morning that night, though. I guess my friend had gotten curious and looked around online. She's a bit of an insomniac. I guess he had been arrested on multiple drug charges. She had found a picture of him in the public database for our county's police department. In the mugshot, he was wearing that exact same bathrobe that we always saw him wearing. That was interesting. Really weird to think that someone I saw and interacted with multiple times a day was an actual dealer. But I guess that was that. My other experience working at McDonald's was really bad. Not going to lie to you. It really freaks me out and really made me question humanity. So it happened like this, right? I was working the graveyard shift. It must have been around 12am and we didn't have any customers. We already cleaned all the machines as much as we could and there really wasn't anything to do. We lived in a smaller community, so there weren't too many people coming in to eat at such a late hour. We had a few here and there, but we were mostly just sitting around, particularly slow this night. I remember going over to check the garbage cans for the other side of the store. Occasionally, we would forget to empty that garbage pail. It was directly behind a booth and out of sight from the area we normally worked in. I remember going over there and... There were two big bags of garbage that needed to be taken out. They were too heavy to take out at the same time, so I did what any sane person would do. I carried one out at a time. I remember bringing the first one. I threw it into the dumpster and I remember hurting my back a little when I did it. I went for a little bit of a theatrical throw and really felt it there. I went back into the store to get the second bag of garbage and I made my way outside. I got about 10 feet away from the dumpster when I saw something that shocked me. I dropped the bag of garbage. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was a mutilated puppy. I wasn't sure if it was alive or not. It wasn't moving or anything. I took a step closer to try to see a little bit more and I just felt my heart drop into my stomach. It was the most horrifying thing I'd ever seen in person. It was definitely dead. It wasn't leaning up against the dumpster and it was just a horrifying thing to see. I ran back inside and asked my coworkers what we should do. We decided to call the police but they didn't really help much. We were really freaked out at who could have possibly done this and why they would put the puppy there of all places. 
The part that still freaks me out is that whoever had done this had been waiting for me to go back inside of the building, and in the few seconds before I came back out, put it right next to the dumpster. I figured they must have been watching me. Didn't know what else to think about it, though. Our McDonald's didn't have an outside camera other than the drive through so there was no hope of trying to identify the person that did this. But it still makes me sick to my stomach to think what that person could be like. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance and enjoy the rest of the video. So, at the time, I was a 16-year-old female working in McDonald's. Now, at the McDonald's I worked at, when you're on headset, you're normally required to be at the first window to also take payment. My job position was customer care manager at the time, so my job was meant to be on the front desk, but 99% of the time, they required me behind the tills. So, I was having a normal day, working a long shift, but still having a normal working day. I happened to be on headset and first window that day. Anyway, my headset buzzes letting me know there's someone at my drive through lane. I go through to the first window to answer my customer and this is how the conversation ensued. Me. Hello, welcome to McDonald's, what can I get you? Him. Oh wow, you've got a beautiful voice. His voice was very grunty and husky sounding, not off-putting though. We have all sorts of customers come through McDonald's every day, so nothing gave me the creeps at this point, but his voice was very recognizable. Thank you, sir. How very flattering. What can I get you? Uh, I haven't decided yet. Can I just come around to the first window to decide? I want to see who I'm talking to. Now, we weren't very busy, and at this point the creeper hadn't actually creeped me out yet. I mean, all he had done really was pay me a compliment, and we quite often had people complain that they liked the face-to-face -face contact. So, it was definitely not unusual to get a request like this. Mmm, yes yeah, sir, that's fine. Wow, you're just as beautiful as you sound. Thank you sir, have you decided what you're going to have to eat? Are you an option? I laughed this off. It was my first job and I wasn't the rude kind of person when someone was paying a compliment. I must also point out that this man must have been around in his 60s. I remember that he had one lazy eye that looked to the left, painfully awful teeth and patchy dark brown hair. At this point, I was getting a little bit uncomfortable now, but was still more than willing to take his order. I'll have a cheeseburger. Okay sir, are you paying cash or card? Without answering my question, he started asking where I'm from and how old I was, etc, etc. But it wasn't until his last few questions that I really got weirded out now. What time do you finish work? Half seven, why? I didn't actually finish at half seven, but half seven was the first number that came into my head when I blurted it out. I finished at eight and would probably do some overtime as well, but I wasn't about to let him know that. You know, I can meet you if you want. I can pick you up outside and we can go somewhere. All the while he's saying this, he has this horrendous grin on his face and keeps winking at me. I'm really sorry, sir, but I'm not allowed to meet with customers outside of work, as it's against our employee policy. This was utter BS, but I needed to get him to leave me alone, and this was the only thing I could think of to say at the time. He carries on being insistent, but not getting the picture. I cut the conversation short. Anyway, sir, sorry to be rude, but can I have the money for your cheeseburger? Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. See you at half seven. Off he drove to the next window. I was gobsmacked. I'd already said I wasn't going to see him. I was a little bit shocked, but I was not going to go over there and give him the satisfaction of talking to him again. My coworker came to me and said, Ooh, that guy had a major crush on you and wanted your number, but I didn't give it to him. He's old enough to be your dad. Anyway, I explained exactly what had happened and how uncomfortable it made me. Half seven came and my coworker is spooked. 
Creeper is waiting in the car park for me, just like he said he would. He sat halfway down the car park and you can just see him staring in. Now, our car park wasn't very big. It only had four rows of parking spaces, so he wasn't that far away and would have clocked me the minute I walked out the door. At this point, I'm really freaking out and head to the back of the store where hopefully he can't see me. I had to stay at the back of the store for about 40 minutes before we knew it was safe to come out. Fast forward a week later, and the creepers return to the drive through And guess who's back on headset at window one? Me. I heard his voice and recognized it straight away. Hey, I was hoping I'd hear your voice again. Why didn't you meet me the other day? Just one second, sir. I'll be with you in one second. I immediately handed my headset to my manager and gave him a quick briefing on the situation. He gladly took the headset and dealt with the customer from start to finish. When my manager came back to let me know he had gone, he said the creeper had been asking my name, my address, and my surname. My manager said that he was the most creepiest guy he had ever met and I was never to have anything to do with him again. If he came to work while I was there, afterwards my manager would have me head to the back room while he dealt with the creep. He always asked about me, every single time. I'm a 16-year-old female working as a customer care manager on the front of house for our McDonald's. Now, where I am from when you are front of house, you're required to wear a light-stripped top, a yellow neck scarf, and a pencil skirt just below the knee, which has a small split up the back. I always buttoned my shirt right up to the very top so I always looked very modest and I would never say a McDonald's uniform is attractive. Anyway, when I worked at McDonald's I always put my all into everything I did. So I knew tills, drive through drinks, serving, etc. I've also always been someone that will happily have a conversation with someone to make their experience enjoyable and hopefully make them want to come back. I was working on tills when this creeper came through the door. He was a tall blonde bodybuilder, at least around 50 years old though. He came to the till and ordered and didn't look very happy, so I asked the obvious questions. How was your day, etc. He had made small talk and we got to chatting about both of our days. After that, he then tells me, It's nice to see someone small around here for once. Everyone else is so grumpy. Nice enough compliment. I was used to it. He was right though. Not many people here enjoyed this job, but, I mean, it is McDonald's. He starts coming in around once a week on a Wednesday morning. Each morning he would come in, we would have a chat. If I was on the floor, meaning front of house, we would sit and chat at a table, and my managers were fine with this, as they knew it made each customer's experience unique. We got to know each other's names. His name was Michael. I started college on a Wednesday and Thursday and worked at McDonald's part-time. So, my shifts changed. I worked Mondays, Tuesdays, and Saturdays instead of Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And sometimes extra days if they needed me. Michael started coming into McDonald's every day to find when I was working. First red flag, but I figured he was just lonely and needs someone to talk to. Anyway, he worked out my shift pattern and came in on Tuesdays instead after asking me why I wasn't in on Wednesdays because he missed our chats. He'd do this thing where he'd let someone else go in front of him if it meant that he could come to my till instead. He would wait to one side to get served by me. Odd, but I didn't think too much of it, just thought he was a man that liked to be served by someone with a smile and had taken a liking to me. Again, we chatted when he came in. Now, this is where it got a bit more weird. We were sat down talking and he decided to really open up to me. He told me how him and his wife were going through a messy divorce. He started going into details of why. He told me he had punched his son. Now, this guy was big, like he looked like a bodybuilder. I can't remember exactly what had happened, but he had ended up smacking his wife too, I think. And here he was telling me all about it. I mean, I'm no counselor. After proceeding to tell me how big his house was, probably to try and grip my attention, he started telling me how he was living in the basement of the house that he owned and it wasn't fair. I'm going to hit her again if this carries on. Well, apparently the wife and son wanted him out and they were going to have it and not pay him for it, blah blah blah. He wasn't letting that happen, his son won't talk to him, blah blah blah. He then started asking me for advice. Again, 
a 16-year-old girl. I didn't really know what to say, so I just sort of said, well, everything happens for a reason, I suppose. And as I went to get up, he asked me to sit back down. Now, I had already been sat there for near on half an hour, and I know I said my managers don't mind, but that's pushing it a bit. So I told him I really had to go. He carried on trying to get me to sit back down, but to let me go in the end. Now, this may seem totally unrelated, but trust me, it will make sense later on. You know how in McDonald's we have the sauce pumps, right? Well, they're connected to a big bag of sauce which has a popper on the top of it. You basically pop the tube into the popper of the bag. But Jesus Christ, this thing is fiddly. It can take me about 10 minutes just to get it connected, then to put the heavy bag in the holder on the side is another 5 minutes. It's a nightmare. Now back to the story. The sauce had run out and I had to fiddle about getting it in. Where the sauce dispenser is is right opposite from where Michael always sits. I could feel his eyes burning into my back as I did this, and any time I turn around he would always be looking at me with a smile. It made me feel a fair bit uncomfortable, but hey ho, it's my job and you deal with this stuff all the time. Trust me, he's not the first person I've had perving at my bum. He came back a few more times, and each time he did, I felt more and more uneasy. He started being a bit more personal now, telling me he thought I was a pretty young girl and we should meet up for coffee at some point, and I politely declined. Michael then said this, Can I ask you something personal? Um, depends what it is. I can't really promise I'll answer. <laughs> are you a virgin? I'm not answering that. What size are your boobs? I have a boyfriend, and I'm not very comfortable answering these kinds of questions. Do you love your boyfriend? Would you leave your boyfriend for me? My boyfriend is behind the counter, and I don't think he'll be very happy with you asking questions like that. Well, just make sure he treats you right. You're a lovely girl. Anyway, I won't be coming back here for quite a while, so can I have your number? No, I don't think my boyfriend would be happy with that either. After that, I go to the back room to calm myself, as this was very unnerving for me. He was an older guy being very strange and asking super inappropriate questions of me. He knew my age as I had told him previously. The day continued. He had left. He had left and I continued and went home. When I woke up the next morning, I had a message on WhatsApp, a message on Facebook, and a friend request on there, and an Instagram follow as well. It was Michael. I don't know how, but he had found all of my personal accounts just through my first name. The only way I can think of him finding it out is asking a colleague what my surname is and getting my number out of one of them. Maybe he was friendly with one of my other workers and got my number from them. I don't know. He had sent me a message saying how he needed to see more of my pictures, but he saw my main pictures for them and my WhatsApp photo. He had also sent me another message about how he loved looking at my butt when I was bent over crawling on the floor to fix the sauce bags, and saying all the things he would love to do to me. At that point I noped out, and I blocked him on everything. I still sometimes get messages from other accounts he has made, wishing me a Merry Christmas, etc. Even though he should have gotten the gist of me not wanting to talk to him. Luckily for me, I moved away about a week or so after that happened. Thank God. So I worked in a McDonald's in the UK, and the area my McDonald's is located isn't the best. There's a lot of druggies, alcoholics, and just overall idiots who cause trouble. I'm usually pretty good at fending for myself and shacking things off, but this encounter really, really freaked me out. So it was a couple of weeks ago, and I was working on the drive through window where you collect your food. It's not uncommon for guys to make sexual comments or any windows when they come through the drive through because they don't really have to face any consequences. However, this one guy came through the drive through and commented on my beautiful BJ lips, and he then asked me to meet him out back to put them to good use. I declined in the politest way I could manage and told him to move along as he was holding up the queue of cars. He then moved and I thought that was the end of that whole ordeal. Five minutes later, the same dude comes around again and makes even more sexual comments about me, my hair, and all the creepy things he'd like to do to me. They were quite creepy and very disgusting. They were mostly about the things he'd do to me. 
I was shocked and quite visibly sickened, so he drove off and I told my manager that I felt uncomfortable by this customer, and I asked to be moved to a different station in case he came back around. Well, apparently he did, because the boy who switched stations with me also had an encounter with this guy. He was asked where I was, what my name is, if this guy would give him my phone number, and if he knew where I lived and what time I finished. The boy thankfully only told him my name and that I had moved on to the front counter, but that was before he realized this guy was a total freak and decided not to say anything more. Now, this is where the story gets really weird for me. The creepy guy came into the store and came up to the till that I was stationed on. He made similar remarks about what he wanted to do to me if he were to ever get his hands on me. He didn't stop until other customers interrupted him and told him to back off and walk away because I was getting really upset and shaken. He wouldn't leave, so I tried to walk away, which is when this guy tried to jump over the counter to try to get to my side of the store. Luckily, my managers and a few other staff members grabbed a hold of him and stopped him getting near me, but that didn't stop him from fighting back and still trying to touch me and get near me. At one point, he was even calling at my coworkers with his long, nasty nails. Other members of staff alerted the staff safe, a sort of panic button that connects us right to the police, who are then sent right away. Fortunately, because I work in a very rough area, police patrol very closely to where I work, so they managed to get to the store pretty quick. They detained the guy and found a few knives stashed all over his body. Army knives, pocket knives, and even just small regular kitchen knives. As they were dragging him away, he continued to scream about how he was going to wait outside the store for me every day and that we belonged together, and just screaming all of the rantings of a madman. My manager sent me home in a taxi, and I've never seen this guy, his car, or anything else of his ever again, which I thank my lucky stars for. Number 4 This happened about 18 months ago. I lived alone when I was 19, and one night I decided to walk down to McDonald's like I do on occasion. I lived about one kilometer from McDonald's. It was a bit of a sketchy area, a lot of people roaming the streets and a lot of addicts and criminals. I started walking and saw two guys probably around my age on the other side of the street. In this situation, it's important to note that my house and McDonald's were on the same main street, opposite tree-dense campsites on the beach. I could feel their eyes as I walked past, but I didn't look up. They crossed the road and started walking behind me. They were close enough for me to hear them they were close enough for me to hear them laughing and whistling. They waited at the corner as I went into McDonald's and I could see them watching. I left McDonald's through the back door, walked straight up the side street and around three blocks before I braved going back through the main road. I came out in front of them and again, they started following me. They were steadily gaining on me. I walked as fast as I could without running because I knew they would catch up to me. I came to a corner with a 7-Eleven and turned in. As soon as I was out of their sight, I ran straight behind the store and hid between a dumpster and a bush. I just stayed there for around 20 to 25 minutes. I slowly emerged and went up to the next side street. I followed that street down until I came to a few more shops behind the main street. They were standing under a post light directly in my way. I then froze and walked backwards slowly and carefully trying not to be seen or heard. Again, I ran around another side street and ended up looping around my house and jumping my back fence. After that, plus a couple of other similar experiences, I have serious anxiety about leaving the house by myself. I don't think I'm going to be doing that anymore. Number 5 This all literally just happened within the past hour. I got out of work at 6.30 p.m. and went to McDonald's to get an iced coffee. I pull up to the drive-thru and there's a red truck in front of me with a cap on the bed. It's super wide so I can't see their mirrors and thus can't get a glimpse of who is inside. I'm minding my own business listening to Unsolved Mysteries on YouTube when I see that the red truck has pulled up to the second pickup window. You know, there's the window where you pay and then the two separate windows where you pick up your food. I didn't think anything of it and just assumed they had a big order, and the McDonald's employee asked them to pull up so that I could get my iced coffee. I look up to see the truck's reverse lights come on. Okay, they must have pulled up a little too far and are backing up a little, 
They keep backing up without signaling to me that they're backing up. I slowly back up as well and luckily no one's behind me. They keep backing up and backing up until they're finally parked at the first pickup window now. The McDonald's employee looks out the window at me, shrugs, and gives me a look like, I don't know why they did that. A few minutes go by. At this point I'm just thinking about how strange it is and not part of common etiquette it was to back up without signaling to anyone you needed to do so. They could have easily hit me had I not been looking straight ahead curious as to what they were doing. Now five minutes goes by. No one is being given any food. I just want my iced coffee, so I'm kind of annoyed that they backed up, thinking maybe they were told to go to the second window since I only needed the iced coffee, but they suddenly felt like refusing to do so would get McDonald's to get them their food faster, and thus they backed up to the first pickup window. I don't know. Anyways, I continue to sit there and wait for my food when I see the passenger door to the truck open. Out comes an older man who looks to be around 65 to 70 years old. He was wearing light khaki covered overalls and a dirty white t-shirt. He starts walking slowly over to my car. I'm thinking, maybe he's going to apologize to me for not signaling that they needed to back up. He gets to my passenger door window, turns so he's facing the window head on, and then just stares at me. I'm waiting for him to signal me to put my window down, thinking he had something to say. Well, he doesn't do anything. He just stands there and stares at me. He starts to lift his hand towards the door handle. I quickly lock the door. He scowls and walks back to the truck and gets back into the passenger side. They immediately drive away the second he closes his door. They didn't get any food. They didn't get anything. They just left. I pull up to the drive through to finally get my iced coffee and it's been well over 10 minutes at this point, but I finally head home. At this point, I have more questions than answers now. Why did they back up without signaling? Why did they need to back up at all? And why did he get out of his truck? Why was he about to open my door? Why didn't he say anything? Why didn't they get their food or drinks? It might not be the creepiest thing to have happened, but this whole ordeal made me so anxious that I was shaking the whole ride home. I just wish I had some kind of insight or understanding to exactly what happened here. Definitely my most creepiest experience while at McDonald's, and I really hope I don't have another one. Number 6 This happened last month, but I totally forgot about it until I read the recent story about the old creep who backed his truck up in the drive through while the OP was waiting to get a coffee, then got out and made to get into her car. My story isn't anywhere near as creepy, but still pretty creepy to me. Anyway, my daughter and I went to the drive through for a late night snack. As I was ordering, this guy ran out from the side of the building and jumped in front of my car. My little Yorkie, Obi, who was sitting in my lap, didn't like that at all. Normally he likes everyone, but why would he be friendly to some strange guy who was taking exaggerated movie slasher stomps towards my car? I stopped ordering our food while Obi went nuts, and I was alternating staring at this guy while glancing around to see if I had a quick exit in case the guy made a run for my car. The guy kept stopping forward, but now he started barking in a deep threatening voice like a large dog and staring straight at Obi. I was afraid Obi was going to jump out the window to attack, but my hands were frozen on the wheel. Then I got pissed. He was scaring my daughter and me and freaking my dog out. I had a sudden crazy thought to just gun it and run this idiot down. Move you idiot, your barking ass is standing between me and my quarter pounder. Of course, I never would have done that, but I almost reversed and drove off. Suddenly he stopped barking and ran off the way he came. The whole thing only took about 30 seconds, but I was pretty shaken and jittery the whole drive home. My daughter thought it was funny, but not me. Maybe he meant it as a joke but I certainly wasn't amused. This happened around 2006 when I was 11 years old. My cousin Aaron was spending the week with my sister and I over summer vacation. At some point during the week, my mom decided to take us all to McDonald's. We ordered and took our food to the back of the McDonald's to sit at a table connected to one of those super long booths along the wall nearest to the bathrooms. Sitting on the same booth, but a few tables down was an older man sitting by himself. He was probably in his 60s, a bit overweight, balding, and had huge lens 80s style glasses on. 
He was wearing a dirty t-shirt with gray sweatpants. When we first walked in, I noticed him, but he kept his head down and didn't seem to pay any attention to us, so I kind of blew him off and almost forgot that he was there. My mom had my brother in his car seat by the table and was feeding him french fries. He must have either choked or got sick because he started throwing up all over the place. My mom grabbed him and rushed into the bathroom with him, followed by my sister to help. Aaron and I were left alone at the table. All of a sudden, the old dude looks over at us and starts trying to have a conversation with us. It started with the casual, Hey, how are you guys doing? And then he said something about hoping my brother was okay. So we politely responded, thinking that's all that he wanted to say. But then he immediately started getting weird. He asked our ages, which we told him. And then he started asking our names and where our moms worked. So, being kids, we told him that also. The man then looked down at his phone and said that our mom had just texted him, saying they would be a while in the bathroom and that he was supposed to bring us home because it was getting late. Although, I knew my mom had never even talked to this man once. So, even as a kid, I knew something was off. The man then grabbed our hands and said we should hurry. At this point, we were practically being dragged outside. We got outside, and this man started leading us into an old, run-down white van. He opened the back door and said that we could stay in there for the ride. Luckily, just then, some younger guy had spotted us and instantly went over and told the manager what was going on. As this was happening, my mom and my sister also came out of the bathroom, saw what was going on, and screamed while running outside to us. At this point, we hadn't gotten in the van yet, but the man was trying to push us in. Now hearing my mom's screams, I instantly started pushing back, trying to keep myself from entering. The guy quickly gives up as the manager and my mother are fast approaching. The guy gets in the driver's seat and steps on it with his back door still open. My mom was still yelling at us and we started crying. We didn't know what to think. To this day, this experience still horrifies me. I don't know why me and my cousin were stupid enough to go along with what this guy was saying. But I'm just glad my mom showed up when she did. I live on a remote, quiet street in a relatively small town. For the sake of my safety and privacy, I will not disclose the town as I still live there to this day. It was the last day of school before Christmas break. And like any other ninth grader, I was excited to be home and play the new Call of Duty that was coming out that year. A little background here since I was in the sixth grade. I always walked home. Today was no different. I left school around 2.37 p.m., but this time I had to take a different route home as my street had construction. I remember the shortcut from when I was a little kid that I used to take to school when my road or usual route was blocked or closed due to some reason. I started making my way down the side road as I did years before when I noticed a black Ford following me awful close, but doing the speed limit probably to avoid suspicion. I took a few turns to see if this vehicle was following me. Sure enough, it was. I eventually made it home, and when I did, I told my parents, who then passed it off as being over paranoid, and that was that. Fast forward a few days, and it was Christmas Eve. No sign of that car, and no further incidents. Until 11 p.m. rolled around, and we were settling in for bed. I remember doing my routine when my dog started barking. I yelled and said, Shut up. I eventually got up and let them out. I want to say eight minutes passed when I was startled out of bed, a man screaming in pain outside my window. I looked up to see my dad with a shotgun running outside to the dogs. I rushed out of my bed to the window and just as I got there, I heard my dad yelling at this guy. And then he shot the back of the guy's black Ford speeding down our road. A police report has been filed and it's been four years since the incident. And I'm now finishing school and looking at colleges. The police never found him, and I still sleep with my dogs by my bed, so the man who tried to ruin my Christmas doesn't come back. Christmas Eve with my six-year-old son was one of the most memorable nights of my entire life. Sure, we would had a bunch of Christmases before that, but being a six-year-old marked the first time that he really started to understand the whole Santa thing. He became completely fascinated with the idea that this fat dude could just like shapeshift down the chimney. Not to mention how he could visit every single child on the planet over the course of one night. 
He started begging me and his mom to take him to Santa's Grotto so he could meet the man himself. And when it came to leaving out cookies and milk, he insisted on leaving out an entire package of Pepperidge Farm, believing the more cookies we gave Santa, the better his presents would be. It was absolutely adorable and it totally rekindled any of the festive spirit me and his mom had lost over the years. So on Christmas Eve, we leave out the whole bag of cookies, top up Santa's glass of milk and then I take him upstairs to bed. He's way excited about the possibility of Santa arriving which poses something of a problem for me and his mom. If he was still awake when we started putting presents under the tree, he might come downstairs, see us eating the cookies and arranging all the boxes, then his festive fantasy would be totally ruined in my mind. We agreed that was totally unacceptable, so we waited until like 1am when he was completely out for the count, before we dressed the scene like Santa had visited, even including a little note thanking our son for all the cookies, saying he was the most generous little boy he'd ever had the pleasure of delivering to. We were so stoked to see his reaction in the morning, so much so that even we had trouble sleeping that night. But just like our son, the adrenaline subsided eventually and we both drifted off to sleep. The next thing I remember, my son is standing by my bed, shaking me awake and whispering, Dad, wake up, wake up. I can see the little glow in the dark hands of the clock on my bedside table and they're telling me it's just before 5am. So as much as it was obscenely early in my mind, I knew I had to get up if I wanted to see his face when he opened his presents. All this is going through my head and I'm just about getting ready to slip out from under the warmth of the covers when my son says, Dad, Dad, Santa's downstairs. My first move is to look over to my wife's side of the bed but Instead of being downstairs like I thought she might be, she's lying there asleep next to me. I'm instantly struck by this uh-oh moment, thinking that if my son had just heard someone downstairs, like actually heard someone, it obviously sure wasn't Santa Claus. I remember telling my son to wait where he was as I crept towards the doorway, listening out for any sounds coming from downstairs. Believe it or not, it wasn't just his imagination. He was right. I could hear someone downstairs. By this time, his mom had woken up and she's asking what time it is. But all it took was one look for me as I reached for the little lockbox I kept my gun in and she just knew something was wrong. She was just amazing about the whole thing too. Just totally affirmed why I wanted to have children with her in the first place. She just started, come to mama come get a Christmas cuddle. And all this other stuff just completely distracting our son despite him insisting he wanted to go meet Santa. I closed the door behind me, crept towards the staircase, then felt my heart pounding as I started to descend. As soon as I saw the two people crouched down by our tree, I raised my pistol and just growled, Get out of my house! As soon as they heard me, they just bolted back out to the window they'd pried open to get the presents under our tree. I thank God they didn't put up any resistance, that they didn't even say anything before they just jumped out the window. I know of many other confrontations like that where the homeowner came out way worse, and I thank God every single day that I didn't end up as one of them. To me and my partner, it was nothing short of a miracle that the only casualty of that morning was our son's hurt feelings. He was furious that I hadn't let him meet Santa Claus, and no matter how much we tried to explain that Santa was busy and that he couldn't stop to talk, our son cried and cried, all up until we showed him the special note that Santa wrote for him. And that really did the trick, especially once I improvised the idea that Santa had written the note because he was so grateful, even though he was super busy. Now, me and my partner are still wondering how we're going to tell him about that once he's older, we know it'll be something we'll be able to smile about. I mean, no one got hurt, thank God, and I know it'll be funny to see his reaction to the truth, but in that moment, it was just about one of the most terrifying occurrences of my entire life. This took place in 2014 when I was 15 years old. 
and it's probably the most terrifying thing that I've ever encountered. Let me explain. My family and I live in Atlanta, and we'd occasionally drive up north to visit our extended family in upstate Virginia. It is a very long and boring trip there, but it was worth it as we had only gone to see them once a year and we would be staying for a few nights. This year, they had invited us to stay for Christmas as we had never celebrated it with them before and figured it would be a nice stay. To cut to the chase, we get there around dinner time on Christmas Eve and everyone was just about done setting the table for us to eat. After we all ate, my uncle proposed to us kids that we go play manhunt out in the backwoods as long as it wasn't snowing too hard. For those of you who don't know what manhunt is, it's basically like hide and seek flashlight tag. Everybody is divided into two teams. One team is the hunters while the other team were the runners, and whoever the last person standing was got a small prize. Each of us were equipped with a flashlight while my uncle kept a close eye on us. In this case, I was on the runner's team and my uncle had given my team a good minute to pick a hiding spot. I chose to hide behind an old barrel that was thrown into the woods years ago. Even though it was a little ways into the woods, it was still a great hiding spot. Eventually, my uncle had blown the whistle announcing that the opposing team was coming to find us. I ever so quickly ducked behind this large barrel about a good 25 feet away from the house. After about 5 minutes of hiding, I then began to see that the other team kept on getting closer and closer to my hiding spot, which meant that I had to move quick. I quietly walked into the woods where I was sure they couldn't see me. When I saw the dim glow of an orangish light about 20 or so feet into the woods. At first, I thought that it could have been one of the hunters. But this light wasn't as bright as a normal flashlight and the other team wasn't in the direction of this light. Being the curious kid I was, I started making my way over to it, wondering as to what it could be. My initial thought was that it was a lantern of some type, but I didn't understand as to why there would be a lantern this far out into the woods. Once I got about 10 feet away from it, right then and there it randomly shut off, allowing me to see nothing but darkness and the light snowfall. I then thought to myself that maybe I didn't need to see what that light was. Suddenly, I begin to hear heavy footsteps in the snow approach me fast from behind. With it being dark outside and still snowing, I couldn't see anyone, so I assumed it was one of the hunters. I ran as fast as I could, a bit more closer to the house where I saw everyone crowded around, including my teammates. I had asked them what was wrong, and all I remember was my dad and uncle telling me to go back inside. When we did, my mom came to tell me and my cousins that there had been a police officer that came up to the door and informed them about a few locals who reported a serial rapist in the area. My blood ran cold as she told us this, and I immediately explained what had happened to me in the woods. Needless to say, we call the police back and they have a team out searching in the backwoods. However, they never did end up finding whoever chased me in those woods, and we never found out what that light was. I haven't been back up there since and neither have my parents, and we don't plan on ever going back up there anytime soon. This story takes place on one of the best nights for kids around America, but one of the worst nights for me. It was Christmas Eve of 2019. For a little backstory, three or four months before this event took place, I broke up with my girlfriend. The event that caused me to break up with her was well, she stole over $900 from me. I caught her and all she said was, before she left, 
if this isn't over. Fast forward three months to Christmas Eve. Since we live in Texas and have a house in the hills, every year on Christmas my family usually goes there to celebrate Christmas. However, this year, I couldn't make it because I had to work. This year I was 17 years old and just got a job by a local supermarket. and had to work all Christmas Day. I had no problem being home alone. On Christmas Eve night, it was getting late, probably 11 o'clock or so. I decided to take a shower and go to bed as I needed to get up early for the next day. As I started to shower, I heard a strange noise coming from the garage, sort of like a metallic banging or something dropping. I thought it was some form of a heater because I put the water as hot as I could. I took my shower. When I finished my shower, I went to go to bed and as I did, I heard the noise again. Although this time, it was on the other side of the yard. I was confused because I didn't think there was anything over there. I went to go look outside the window and see. I looked out and didn't see anything but my backyard, completely empty. I completely disregarded it because my backyard is pretty flat and empty, and it has nowhere for someone to hide. Now it's hard to explain, but my window was fairly large, and it has a blind spot to the left where there's a corner where someone could easily hide, but I was tired and didn't think about it. As I walked off, I heard a bang, but this time it was on my window of my house. And as I looked out the window, I saw the figure of a person dressed in all black standing at my window. It made me jump, however, I wasn't too scared as I am fairly a large dude and a high school football player. This all changed when he reached for his pocket for what I assumed was a gun. I ran away from the window toward my parents' room to go retrieve my dad's shotgun. I knew he kept it in the safe and had the safe key under his pillow. As I was running to retrieve this, I dialed 911. As soon as the dispatcher answered, I heard the horrific sound of the glass shattering. I made it to my parents' room and I shut the door quietly. I whispered into the phone what was happening to the dispatcher. She said to stay on the line as the county sheriff was en route but it would take about five minutes or so. I told her I was going to retrieve the shotgun. She said that's not a bad idea, but only use it if I had to, with caution. I quickly realized my dad took the gun with him because they were going to the gun range. I informed the dispatcher that the gun was gone. She said to make sure to stay on the line. For a moment, everything was silent, and I thought that it may have been a burglar, and they got spooked when they realized someone was home. My heart sank into my chest when I heard not one, but two sets of boots walking up the stairs. I heard a heavy metal pole scraping the floor. I locked and barricaded the door to my parents' room. Then I almost passed out when I heard one of them talk. Not in any voice, but my ex-girlfriend's voice. She said, Merry Christmas, Tommy. And I heard a male voice mockingly say, We know you're in there. And he knocked on the door of my parents' room. I almost screamed and got underneath the bed. My ex then said, don't worry if you can't open the door, we'll open it for you. I heard the pole hit the door and the lock falling out of the door to the floor. I had to put my hand over my mouth to keep from being too loud. All of a sudden I heard police sirens and my ex muttering, oh shit. They ran down the stairs to run out the front door when the officer said freeze. I heard a bunch of yelling and then an officer came in and said, if you're in there, make yourself known. I called out to him saying I was Tommy and I called 911. He told me to come out slowly with my hands visible. As I left my parents' room, I saw the two being escorted out in handcuffs. The rest of my night consisted of paperwork and me talking to my parents who were making a three hour drive to come home. This incident was very disturbing to me and I'm grateful that I reacted the way that I did. Had I not, I might be dead right now.